Block 1, Audiobook Title, Taming Destiny, A Tamer Class Eyes Kai, Portal Survival Fantasy, Chapter, 00-188, by S underscore Winter, Prologue, This New Life, Now, When the Attack Comes, the flicker in my peripheral vision allows me to avoid it, barely. I've been trudging through the forest surrounding me for a few hours now, following the river as it winds its way down the mountainside. I've been keeping my ears and eyes open, having already learned my lesson about that several times over. For a while the coast has been pretty clear. Very few creatures have entered my field of vision, and none that try to attack me. I've almost started to relax, almost. But I can't forget that this place is perilous far more so than the place I've left behind. At the sound of snapping branches, I flinch. Swiftly putting my back to a tree, I stare around myself suspiciously. I'm heading through a dangerous part of the forest, a dense section of vegetation composed more of bushes than trees. There's still plenty of space to walk, but there's also plenty of cover for any ambusher. I grip my rudimentary spear more tightly and lift it so it's more of a weapon and less of a walking stick. It goes quiet for long enough that I start to relax again wondering if perhaps it was just some other prey animal with the same fearful hope as me, that it has gone undetected. I'm not that lucky. The creature, or creatures as I realize it is in reality, leap at me from the bushes surrounding me. I flail around with my spear and knife, alternately trying to knock them out of the air and stab at them. I'm not a pro in dual wielding, though, and any hits come more from luck than skill. Or perhaps we could say that they come from probability. If I flail fast and hard enough, I'm bound to hit something. I shout, in no way a high-pitched shriek. I promise myself even as the sound emerges, and curse the air blue as something bites down on my skull. Liquid runs down the side of my head as a stinging pain shoots through me. Dropping the knife, I reach up at the thing and pull. It doesn't want to let go. I have to yank several times before I get it free. I'm pretty sure a good chunk of hair has come with the wretch, but at least it's not biting my head any longer. Throwing it to the ground, I try to stamp on it but the bugger is too fast and scurries out of the way before my foot lands. In the meantime, three others have attached themselves to my leg, foot, and calf. I shout again, in a much manlier register this time, very tempted to bludgeon the painful leeches. Unfortunately, I know that if I swing my spear at them like a staff, I'm more likely to hit myself than them. This is not a good matchup. They're fast, agile, and too small for my wild spear swings to do more than hit one out of the air every so often. In the meantime, they've broken skin in multiple places and I'm starting to look painted in red. The bites aren't deep, but they're painful and every drop of blood lost inches me closer to death. Just thinking about that reminds me of one small light in this green hell that is my new reality. Casting lay on hands, a healing spell, I hope that it will help me keep going a bit longer. I need to work smarter not harder. Temporarily dropping my weapon, I slap at the creatures. Though I'd gladly take killing them, I'll willingly accept just getting them off. The little monsters avoid my grasping and flapping hands, choosing to leap away from me. I do hit two of them, but they recover and jump away as I reach for them to wring their scrawny necks. For a moment, I am free of new pain, though their previous bites sting and ache. With a brief window of space, I take a few moments to think through the situation. Moving, my attackers seem to be claws and teeth attached to flashes of green, I have no chance of determining their numbers. Hitting them out of the air isn't working, maybe playing bait would work better. If anything else, it should get them out of the bushes and allow me to have more idea of what I'm dealing with. Swiping at the knife and spear I dropped on the ground, I take two steps to put my back to a tree. There I pause tempting them to come at me across open ground rather than darting in and out of the bushes as they have been doing so far. I soon have cause to regret my decision. Now not swiping at me in flyby attacks, they settle against my flesh, biting my legs, chewing, really. The agony shoots up my legs, the sensation joining my bank of things I never want to feel again. Did that one just swallow a chunk of my flesh? At least I'm getting a better view of my attackers now. Though, there's some bizarre cross between lizards and weasels. The shape and approximate size of a weasel, but looking more like a small monitor lizard. Teeth probably like them too, but I can't see them because they're buried in my flesh. Right, time to deal with these obnoxious weasiters. Since no more parasites have leapt from the bushes to attack in the past few seconds, I guess that this pack is limited to the seven nasty creatures currently attached to my legs. Dropping my spear. I use a lightning fast movement to grab the weasiter currently gnawing on the flesh of my right calf just below my knee. It's slower to detach, 
thanks to its deeper bite, so this time I succeed in getting a hold of it. Squeezing its kicking rear legs, I pull it out perpendicular to where its head remains attached. With my other hand I stab at it over and over again until it's dead. I don't remove its teeth from my flesh, yet. I've already made that mistake once and almost paid the ultimate price for it. I succeed in grabbing and killing another before the rest realize they're in danger and jump away. They disappear into the bushes like the vermin they are. Oh no, you don't, I growl. Casting lay on hands again, I pull the dead weezitters out carefully, unhooking their needle sharp curve teeth from my legs rather than just pulling my flesh with them. Then, pretending to be weak, I lean back against the tree, slumping down to one knee. Fortunately for me, these creatures are pros at ambushes, but amateurs at spotting bad acting. They jump at me again, this time aiming higher than before. I slam one against the tree at my back when it makes the fatal decision of latching onto my shoulder blade. I know it's not dead because I can feel it wriggling but it'll have to wait until I'm done with its friends. I trap another under my elbow against my side. When it sinks its teeth into my sensitive side, I shout at the pain. Agony, really, but what's new? Then, snatching a third out of the air as it leaps at my head, I stab it with my dagger, its guts spilling out to slide down my wrist. Grabbing one of the only two still free, I manage to catch it with the tip of my dagger just as it jumps away with a chunk of my flesh in its mouth. Stab it, stab stab. Another one bites the dust. Am I going mad? Possibly. Probably. But frankly, right now, I don't care. With a growl, I slam my blade into the one trapped under my elbow, wriggling my dagger until I feel it go limp, its spine severed. Leaning backwards with my full weight and then some, I crush the one behind my back until it's stopped wriggling. Twisting round. I make sure it's dead with a knife through its skull, grim satisfaction going through me. Presuming there were seven in this pack, there's only one left alive. If it knows what's good for it, it will stay far away from me. Right now, unless it got me somewhere vital, it's not much threat on its own. I still wait for a while, my senses remaining on high alert. Nothing. Huh, perhaps it's smarter than its friends, I comment to myself, cautiously hopeful. I just wish they had been smart enough to maybe, well not attack me in the first place. Leaning against the tree, I cast lay on hands again. The promises I was given haven't exactly turned out the way I was expecting, but at least the ability to heal almost instantly is awesome. I'll need to cast it a couple more times, but it's better to let the magic of each heal over time finish first before casting again. Otherwise, at best, I waste the mana, at worst. I'd cancel some of the beneficial effects out. Too bad the spell's effects don't appear to stack. I probably need to let my health and stamina refill a bit too. I've worked harder physically in the last couple of days than I ever have in my life, but it feels, surprisingly good. Plus, from what I have seen so far, the new system I have access to now could be a bit of a game changer. Game changer, ha. Huh? Being able to see my capabilities in numbers is useful if a little disheartening, and may offer the possibility to directly improve things such as health and stamina in a way that would have been impossible on earth. And besides, what did I have to stay for on earth, anyway? Being attacked by Weezitters might be painful as hell, but at least I feel alive now. That's more than I had back there. Thinking back to the fight, how I succeeded in not shouting, screaming, or going out of my mind at the pain of literally being eaten alive, I don't know. Maybe it's just the burning anger in the pit of my stomach that grows every time I'm attacked by some other opportunistic blighter. I've made it through another fight, and my opponents have not. Taking a moment to relax, I pull out some food and water. While I refresh myself, I find my thoughts wandering back to the events which started it all. Book 1, Leap Chapter 1, Drunk. I take another swig of whiskey. The burn has long faded by now. I'm more than halfway into my NTH bottle of spirits and my throat has gone numb. Or maybe I've just stopped caring. The last few hours are blur. Maybe even days. I couldn't say how long it's been since I started drinking as if my life depended on it. If my life depended on it. Ha, huh, funny, I think, but the bitter amusement fails to even twist my lips in the mockery of a smile. What life? There's nothing for me to lose now except my heart beating and my lungs pumping, surviving, not living, family, job self-respect gone third i slur out to the empty room feeling the way it tastes in my mouth how it twists the tongue unemployed another unsavory word failure i spit i'm still thinking about it which means i haven't drunk enough i tip the bottle back but more sloshes on my face than in my mouth i curse bitterly lamenting at the world god 
and anyone else listening about the fact that, with this final death knell, my life is officially over. Pity my attempts to make sure of that permanently just ended with me descending from the roof of my apartment block to keep drinking. A failure even in that. Something flickers in my peripheral vision, just in front of my overstuffed bookshelf and I automatically turn to look. It takes my alcohol sozzled brain a good few seconds to register what I'm looking at and then, in the very educated way all drunks have, I question reality. Wassa? Standing up and stumbling forwards, I wave my hand vaguely in the air underneath the apparition, and then through it. Stop that, the ghost says am I crossly. This is difficult enough without you interrupting the projection. Wah? It's species. I murmur drunkenly, staring at the approximately 30 centimeters tall pearly white figure floating a few centimeters off my table. It looks like a man, a neatly dressed figure in what I muzzily recognize as a vaguely medieval doublet and hose. A bit like what my male co-workers and I wore at an Elizabethan-inspired Christmas party, though with less puffy trousers and a more normal height collar, even if ours were made with cardboard instead of starched fabric. As for its face. It looks rather like a stereotypical villain with a pointy beard, mustache, and a dark look that grows even darker as I prod it again. Stop that, I said. The figure barks at me. Are you, drunk? It, he, then asks. I shrug languidly. Ma a a b, I drawl. Looking around, I can't see the whiskey. If I can question whether I was drunk or not, clearly I haven't had enough. Where's Wixie? From the looks of it, you've had more than enough. The ghost tells me disapprovingly. This is the only hope for my legacy? He mutters under his breath God's help me. Sighing he speaks louder. I don't have much time. Drunk or not, listen to me now. I hold up one finger that turns into two as my eyes unfocus. Whisksy first, I tell him as firmly as I can make it. The man sighs, clear annoyance in the sound of it. Next to you, on the floor. I lean over the arm of the chair quickly almost tipping over it as my center of gravity shifts too far. I see the bottle on the floor and grab it, slushing its contents a bit as I lean back. Already down by more than half, the liquid doesn't actually leave the bottle despite the abrupt movements. I tip it back, almost missing my mouth again. By this point, I can barely feel the burn, but the alcohol content soon gets to me as the world starts spinning even more. I tip my head back staring at the ceiling marveling at the way the cracks are moving round and round and round. Now will you listen? The apparition asks with frustration in his voice. I wave one hand vaguely in the air, almost hitting myself in the face. I hope you remember at least some of this when you sober up, he mutters to himself before once more speaking loudly and clearly. I come with an offer. I need to bestow a powerful inheritance on a successor and the oracle has indicated that you are my only option if I do not wish my legacy to be destroyed within the next generation. He continues speaking, but I have lost the ability to focus, staring at the ceiling vacantly as his voice becomes background sound, the odd word filtering in but not making much sense. It's almost soothing, too much so for my drunken state to endure and my eyes slip closed without me even noticing. I keep drinking. That night, through the day, the next night, the next day dot dot the days run into each other. I only stop when I run out of alcohol and can't find my wallet to go buy more. Great chunks of time disappear without my notice, it doesn't matter, no one is expecting me for anything. I think I try to head out to the rooftop again, but can't open the door because my body isn't working right. When I finally do return to some sort of rational awareness, I wake to the world still spinning, my head pounding fit to burst, and my stomach telling me firmly that it is about to upend itself. I make it to the toilet, thankfully, and proceed to worship the porcelain god for a good few minutes. When I sit back, my stomach empty but still roiling uncomfortably, my throat feels like sandpaper and my mouth tastes like something has died in it. Brushing my teeth, twice, deals with a taste, but doesn't do much for the other symptoms. Tossing back a couple of paracetamol, I grimace as even water running down my acid burnt throat hurts. I know I need to drink to rehydrate and eat something to settle my stomach, but I really, really don't feel like it. I'm not a habitual drunk, but even when I have overindulged a bit, it's never been this bad. Normally I stop after the world starts spinning, and the worst I have the next morning is a headache sometimes a small bit of nausea. This time, though, I'd had a reason to bury my pain in whiskey, and wine, and vodka, and drum. Not wanting to make an already bad morning, afternoon, worse, my thoughts shy away from remembering why that was. Instead, I push myself to my feet, 
determined to eat something, maybe porridge? I know greasy food is supposed to be good for a hangover, but I can't cope with anything scratchy right now. Maybe if I added some butter to the porridge? Worth a try. Exiting the bathroom, the first thing that hits me is the stench. Alcohol mingles with vomit and piss and the miasma sends me right back to hugging the toilet. Repeating the previous process once I've finished hacking up my guts, I summon up the courage to brave the battlefield. Covering my nose with my sleeve. I stumble through the horribly dirty room to open the windows, if I can at least get the smell out, it'll make the world look better. Or so I tell myself. I can't face doing any more than that and next totter into the kitchen, closing the door and opening this window. At least I didn't vomit in here, though I can see a puddle of alcohol where I clearly dropped a bottle, the glass shattered and spread across the floor so I'd better be careful with my bare feet. In fact, I really should clean it up straight away but I don't have the motivation. Instead, I just step carefully around the chunks of glass I can see and hope that I'm not stepping on a whole load of unnoticeable shards. Porridge is out of the question, the microwave is close to where the bottle shattered, and so are the bowls. Instead, I succeed in grabbing a cereal box out of the closest cupboard and sit on the kitchen table, my feet on one of the seats. I pull handfuls of cereal out of the box and chew on them dry. It's not great, but after a while, my nausea does start to abate. Once the paracetamol kicks in and I've downed a good liter of water, I start feeling almost human. The pain I'd been suffering muted, the tiredness of too little sleep starts swaying my eyelids down. Already done with the day, I just lie down on the kitchen table and go to sleep, regardless of how uncomfortable it is. Memories of the ghost drift back into my mind as I drop off, but before I can decide whether they're dream or reality, I drop back into the welcoming blackness of sleep. The next time I wake up, the sun is streaming through the windows. Just by that, I can tell it's early afternoon as my apartment faces southwest. The world has, thankfully, stopped spinning. My throat is feeling a bit better, though still rather raw, and my stomach is more settled. At least, I don't feel like being sick is just a wrong movement away now. I can also smell myself now the odor of whiskey has cleared from the room. I really need a shower. I'm you also lying on the kitchen table, a fact that makes itself very evident when I start trying to shift. Apparently lying on a hard surface with my feet resting on the lower one in terms of a chair is not the ideal sleeping position. Who knew? I groan as my back makes it very loud, complained. And my knees. I'm you also cold because the window was open and I had no cover. In fact, the only thing I can say that's even slightly good about my poor decision making is that apparently I slept the sleep of the dead and didn't roll over onto the glass strewn floor. The thought of which, and the worst state of my sitting room, makes me feel like opening another bottle. No. I scrub at my face and try to give myself a pep talk. Okay, you got completely drunk. You made a mess of your apartment. Just, take it one step at a time. Go, have a shower. Yeah? A shower would go a good way to helping me feel slightly more human and less roadkill. My problems will still be problems, but at least I won't stink badly enough to make my nose want to give in its own resignation. Unfortunately, my shower is in my bedroom, which is through the glass field or through the sitting room, but I don't even dare consider that yet. I sigh. Clearing up the mess here first, then. Or maybe just enough to ensure I don't have to go to A and E with glass shards in my feet. After having succeeded in clearing a path through the danger, I reach my bedroom, jumping in the hot shower with a sigh of relief. The water feels like a benediction, washing away my cares and troubles, if only for a moment. Sadly, all good things come to an end and when my water starts cooling, I realize it's a sign that I need to get on with other things. The thought of all the cleaning I will have to do doesn't exactly fill me with glee. On my way to my wardrobe from the shower, buck naked but for a towel around my head, I notice something strange on my desk. It's sitting next to a photo that never fails to make my stomach clench, my ex and I smiling on our last holiday together before she broke up with me. Procrastination opportunity gladly accepted especially if it stops me thinking about her. The item is a disc with an emblem that I've never seen before. I pick it up to inspect the strange item. It's about the size of a coaster, but about three times as thick and heavy. Made out of metal, perhaps. The emblem is an intricate golden design on a black background. At first I think it's painted, but closer inspection proves that instead the gold is inlaid. The image is in the style of a coat of arms with three sections, a horizontal line across the center with a vertical line dividing the top half into further quarters. Looking closely, the top left section is a fox, recognizable by its pointy ears and bushy tail, inside profile, 
but with its head turned towards the front. Next to it in the right hand quarter is a hammer crossed with a sword, the hammer to the fore. Finally, the last, and the largest, section contains, unusually, a spider web. I don't know much about heraldry, but I've never heard of or seen a spider web in a coat of arms. Idly I admire the quality of the work, the spider web is especially beautifully done, each strand is perhaps only a fraction of a millimeter wide and only visible when the disc is tilted so it catches the sun. Just like a real spider web, I realize. Looking away, I see something I had missed when I picked the disc up, too curious about it to notice anything else. The disc had been sitting on something, a folded up square of paper, to be precise. Setting the coat of arms down, I pick up the piece of paper instead. Before even opening it up, I realize that the paper is some type I've never felt before. Thicker, and creamier colored than I'm used to. I guess it is some high quality material. It even makes a different sound than I expect as I open it, a deeper rasp and crackle than a normal piece of paper would. Unfolding it, I realize that I'm holding some sort of letter. The same coat of arms is imprinted in the top right hand corner, the spider web more visible here than on the disc as it is in black ink rather than reflective golden metal. The letter is handwritten, a rarity in these times, it seems. The writing is clear bold, well-shaped. If the handwriting personality analysis I looked at once is anything to judge, this man is confident, well-settled in his position in life. Of course, at least half of that handwriting analysis thing is nonsense, so perhaps I'd be better off reading the thing than analyzing the handwriting. Greetings, I will briefly reintroduce myself as, due to your, inebriated state during my visit, and the fact that you seem to fall asleep halfway through, I doubt you took in much of what I had to say. I must be brief, to send the transportation emblem is effort enough, a message is further expenditure and greater the longer the message. Expenditure which I had not anticipated after I paid the cost to project a semblance of myself to explain in person and to answer all the questions of the candidate. Nevertheless, I shall present myself again, I am Lord Nicholas of Aza Erd. I offer you a new life and the potential of power and influence beyond what you ever thought you could achieve that you ever thought possible, the inheritance that I and my family have built over the last few centuries. A powerful class, skill set, wealth, and further benefits I will inform you of in person. I have no heirs of my own and so it behooves me to choose one suitable. I have been informed that you are the only hope of my family's legacy surviving the next generation, but you will have to prove yourself worthy of it. I would rather it dies with me than that it is destroyed by a drunkard. I say this so you know I do not make this offer lightly. You have the opportunity now of deciding the rest of your life. You can walk away and forget this ever happened, imagine it was a dream. Or, you can take your destiny in your hands and decide who you will be now and in the future. Should you decide to gamble everything on the chance that you show yourself deserving of what I can bestow on you? Hold the transportation emblem accompanying this letter and acknowledge aloud your acceptance. I will warn you, the magic of the emblem will draw you across worlds and universes and there is no way to return. Any unfinished business will, therefore, remain unfinished. You have three days to decide. After this, the emblem will return to me and I will know I must look elsewhere for a worthy heir. I am aware that it would take an unusual type of person to accept such an uncertain offer of potential power in exchange for everything you currently possess, but for the sake of my legacy, I can only hope that you might be such a character, and more, that you might overcome the trials ahead and prove yourself more than unusual, worthy. My sincerest and most cordial sentiments, Lord Nicholas Titan Bendevaza Erd. I stare at the letter in my hands, my jaw slack even as my mind whirls. Cutting through the depression that I have been mired in for days is confusion, incredulity, and one more. Like the light at the end of a long, dark tunnel, I feel the faintest glimmering of hope. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 2, Hope Springs Eternal. Before, take my destiny into my own hands. It's a siren call but my doubting mind quickly pulls me back down to earth. This is a joke, surely. Magic doesn't exist, moreover, who would come and offer me something like this, straight out of a fantasy book? I pinch myself, wondering whether I'm still asleep. Wincing, I stare around myself suspiciously. No, nothing seems out of place or unusual. But if I was dreaming, wouldn't I think that? But then would I wonder whether I was dreaming if I actually was? This is becoming too convoluted. I decide that I'm probably not dreaming, but that if I am, it doesn't matter as everything will be gone in the morning. So if I'm not dreaming, it's got to be some sort of practical joke. But who would do it? And how? And why? I haven't offended anyone recently, 
I don't think not enough to plan such an elaborate, and ultimately ineffectual joke. Sure, I suppose this could be some sort of reality TV where the moment I accept the offer, a camera crew jumps out from behind the curtains to film my reaction and people across the world have a good laugh at my expense. But that seems even less probable than the letter being true, there's no one else here, I'm sure of that, and wouldn't filming my reaction when first reading the letter be important? I put that possibility aside too. So, without the motivation of making a hit TV show, why would anyone put this much effort into sending me a letter which I'm more than likely just to throw away? At least, I should be more than likely to do that. As it is, it appeals. A new life, more than anything else, is what I want. Or no life at all, but it seems like I'm too cowardly to end this one for myself. I've got nothing left in this life, nothing that I value anyway. Why not entertain the possibility of this letter being real and then actually accept the offer? Worst case scenario. I'm revealed as a fool in front of the whole world, that might actually give me the motivation to off myself that apparently I'm lacking. How much time did that guy give me to decide? I check the letter again. Three days. Well, that's plenty of, wait, three days. From when? From when I read the letter? No, more likely three days from when it was delivered. When was that? Yesterday? I search for my phone fruitlessly, it's in the hell room next door. A few moments of dithering later. I remember that there's a rarely used clock on the wall in the kitchen, normally, I just look at my phone. Poking my head through the door, I check both the time and, since it's an old-fashioned one that also shows the date, the day. When I see it, I can barely believe my eyes. It was the 20th when I walked up to the rooftop, it's the 24th now. Christmas Eve. The thought makes my mood drop like a stone and I force myself to not dwell on it or return to the same blackness which drove me to drink to begin with. Four days have just vanished in the blink of an eye. Or rather, have drained away like the whiskey in my alcohol cabinet. Which begs the question, when did this letter and emblem get delivered, or appear or whatever? I vaguely remember seeing something. A floating man? Perhaps that's the projection of which the letter speaks. Of course. It could have been some sort of high-tech hologram or something, but again, who's going to waste that kind of thing on a, newly, unemployed nobody like me? Anyway, I do have a blurred memory of a man wearing some Elizabethan-style clothing talking about, something. I'd already been drinking for a while by then, so it's really not clear. Let's be logical, I tell myself firmly. If the emblem is supposed to disappear in three days, it's clearly not been three days yet. Equally. It's clearly been a significant time since it did appear, if we assume that the guy sent it shortly after he had projected himself. Actually, I realize as I look back at the letter, we can be sure that he sent it after his projection as he referred both to the projection and my drunkenness dot in the letter. So, at a minimum, he had to have had enough time between the projection and the emblem arriving to send the letter. As long as we assume they were sent together which I figure is a likely scenario. Am I really treating this like it's real? I ask myself the question with uncertainty welling up in me. Then I shrug. What have I really got to lose? I remind myself. So, conclusion, I probably have some time to decide, but not much. But then, I realize, I don't really need any more time to decide, I've already given up on this life, so why not at least try this? No. What I need is time to pack. I dither for a moment as I consider whether to just go rather than risk the deadline passing before I've finished packing. In the end, though, the picture of my mother sitting on my desk decides me, even if I'm going to leave this world behind, I don't want to leave all of it here. And if I'm packing my most treasured mementos, I might as well pack a few necessities too. Having come to that conclusion, I pull a suitcase from under my bed and start moving around my bedroom and kitchen like a whirlwind. I first pack my few precious keepsakes, and then move on to less important things. With no idea what might await me on the other side, I just throw everything I think might be useful into my bag. Wait, I hesitate, pausing in the middle of the room. Can I even take anything with me? It's a good point. I rush back to the letter and read it again. No indication either way, unfortunately. Right. Well I'll just have to assume that I can at least bring the clothes I'm wearing as there's no warning of suddenly being teleported in the nude. If I can bring what I'm wearing, I can probably also bring at least a backpack. If I'm lucky, fat chance of that, I'll also be able to bring anything I'm holding. Taking a moment to pull a big, practically unused, hiking backpack from my cupboard, I rearrange a bit. In between times, I brave the hellscape in my sitting room to grab a few important bits. 
holding my breath as much as possible and putting my sleeve over my nose when I really have no choice but to breathe. Every few minutes, I detour past my desk to check that the emblem and letter are still there. About an hour and a half later, I'm done. I'm wearing about five different layers since I couldn't fit all my warm gear in my bag. Although it seems unlikely from what the guy, Nicholas, was wearing, it could be like Siberia wherever I arrive. In my huge number of pockets, I've stashed all my most important bits. The other less important but still important things are in my backpack which weighs heavily on my back. In my hands I'm holding the drag handles of my biggest and second biggest suitcases. It turns out that fitting a life into a few bags is actually pretty difficult. And I've only got half my wardrobe, let alone my shoe rack. At least I've fitted my favorite books in. And I've got my Kindle with me so my library is fairly safe. I pull the bags over to my desk and pick up the emblem. It's heavy in my hands, heavy both with its physical weight and the weight of this decision. I hesitate. Do I really want to do this? Go into something completely unknown? Even assuming that the presence of magic dash or sufficiently advanced technology to be called such, is real and I'm about to be teleported somewhere else. There's still a lot that could go wrong. What if this is actually some sort of scam for human traffickers or something? What if by accepting the offer, I end up becoming some sort of alien slave? I have no guarantee that this Nicholas guy is telling the truth about his motivations. And is my life really that bad? I'm a jobless, family-less failure, that's for sure. But it's also for sure that I'm young and hope springs eternal. Maybe this dark emptiness won't always be all I have to look forward to. Maybe one day I could pull myself up maybe make something big of myself. I bite my lip and then my grip tightens on the emblem. No, I've made my decision. Here's my big chance to make something of myself, to turn my desire to end my life into a desire to transform it. If I don't at least try this, I'll know that I don't have what it takes to pick myself up, and might as well just throw myself out of my window and hope I don't hurt anyone by landing on them. This is my decision, for good or for worse. Now, what am I supposed to do? Flushing slightly as I realize I've focused so much on if I should do it or not, I don't remember how to actually activate the transportation. Hold the transportation emblem accompanying this letter and acknowledge aloud your acceptance, says the letter. I'm about to do so when it occurs to me that I might be better off lifting my suitcases off the ground than just holding their handles. It takes a bit of juggling to succeed in holding both suitcases as well as the emblem and the effort it takes to lift what has to be about 40 plus kilos reminds me that as well as everything else, I've been neglecting the gym. Still, I succeed eventually and, even as my fingers strain and my face reddens from the effort, I gasp out the activation phrase. I accept. For several long moments, nothing happens. I open my eyes, realizing I've screwed them shut only to see my familiar apartment. Did I do something wrong? Or is it a prank after all? No one's jumped out from behind the door to laugh in my face and film my reaction, but maybe it's not been long enough yet. Then, as if it just needed a bit of time to get going, I feel the emblem heat up, almost burning my palm. The world lurches around me and I feel my stomach crawl into my mouth as I hear a great wind. Closing my eyes again in a desperate attempt to quell my motion sickness, I only open them again when the rushing wind calms down. What meets my gaze is completely different from anything I was expecting. My mouth hanging open, I lose the battle with my stomach and, unimpressively, empty it all over the surface on which I stand. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 3 proof of worthiness. Before, when my stomach is finally empty and beginning to feel settled, I look around again, hoping that my initial impressions were wrong. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be that way. If anything, it's worse. I don't know why, but when I imagined where I would be taken, I'd always envisioned a city, or a manor house, or even a palace. The Lord in the letter must have been what gave me that idea, I realize. This, it's not a city. It's not even a village let alone anything more palatial. Instead, it looks like there are no signs of civilization in sight. I'm standing on the lower slopes of a mountain. Above me on one side towers a great snow-covered peak, on the other side lies a valley full of trees. Either side of the mountain stretches out into a number of other, lower, peaks. The temperature is actually rather pleasant, perhaps in the slightly chilly side when the wind blows and the air is crisp and fresh. Too fresh, there's not a hint of human presence in polluting smells. It truly appears to be a paradise for the intrepid backpacker. Unfortunately, I've never been into the whole backpacking thing, and I don't think anyone would label me as intrepid. Heck, I don't even go on camping trips. I hated them as a child, 
and then there were no more childhood holidays after the incident. As an adult, I always chose to stay at a hotel, either picking a warm place for holidays on the beach, or a cold place for skiing. The only reason I own the massive rucksack I'm currently wearing is that one company I worked for sent us all off on a team building exercise in the wilds of the Brecon Beacons. Apparently going hungry, cold, wet, and miserable for a week with a whole load of co-workers who barely knew each other was supposed to foster good working relationships. And the reason I bought a whole new fancy backpack was because I was trying to impress my new colleagues. Spoiler alert, it didn't work. Perhaps it would have if my sturdy, practical backpack had been accompanied by a sturdy, practical man. But, as I've already established, camping isn't my thing. No, for me, holidays are about enjoyment, staying in a comfortable, convenient location, going out to nice restaurants and spending the days relaxing or doing some sort of fun activity. Which is why I'm currently desperately hoping that this is some sort of a joke and Lord Nicholas is about to jump out from behind a rock or something. As I think that, the emblem in my hand warms up again. Hope and nerves both rise inside of me again. What if, despite what the letter said, I'm actually about to be transported back? Honestly, I don't really know what to think about that. But I don't have the time to do any deep soul searching as that apparently isn't the reason for the emblem's reaction. Instead, it crumbles into glowing motes of dust which easily fall out of my hand. The motes drift down, but instead of coating the ground as normal, they instead take some sort of shape in the air. Under my disbelieving gaze, a wooden table comes into existence, rather incongruously placed in this completely natural landscape. I rub my eyes. I'll admit it. My mouth might also be hanging open. I touch the table tentatively, wondering if it will just shatter into dust again before my fingertips can come into contact. It doesn't of course, and I just spend a few moments marveling at my first experience with magic. Once I manage to get past my amazement at how the table had appeared, I start to explore what is actually on it. At least, I try to, but the gloves I'm wearing rather impede my ability to pick things up. Cursing softly. I strip them off and shrug off about three extra layers of clothes while I'm at it, I'm hot. Now more comfortable, I turn back to the table. There are a number of items, some of them are recognizable, if a little alarming in what they imply, others just look like strangely glowing stones of different shades and sizes. Right in the center is another piece of paper, although this is a scroll. It's rolled up with a blue ribbon and sealed with black wax, indented with the same heraldry that had been on the emblem. Picking up the scroll. I crack the wax reluctantly, admiring the way it looks like something out of the medieval era. Greetings, you have taken the first step. You're an unusual person indeed to have dared the unknown in search of a fleeting greatness. However, greatness requires a proof of worthiness, and the price for transporting you from your world to mine is not small. Thus, for the purpose of efficiency the task for the two aims shall be one and the same. Your objectives are twofold. First. Survival. You must survive in your current world for a year. However, you must do more than just survive to achieve your second objective, collecting enough energy to pay for your passage to my world. I am sure that you will be confused about this last point, so let me explain. I stop reading at that, taking a deep breath and then starting at the top again. No, I had understood what it was saying. I have to survive here. For a year, anger rises within me but I'm self-aware enough to recognize the fear that curdles my stomach underneath it. All my self-awareness doesn't stop me from feeling both emotions, though, and my thoughts are quickly overtaken by emotion. As the wave of heat rises within me, my hand clenches and the rustle of paper crunching sounds loudly in the still air. A small part of my mind notes how much more effort I have to use to crush the paper than I would expect, but most of my awareness is concentrating on my thoughts about what I've just read. This is total BS. What kind of opportunity or new life is this? I can't even see the hint of civilization anywhere. Besides my worst case scenarios of some alien version of human trafficking, if this guy Nicholas was on the level. I was expecting him to at least welcome me in person, not dump me in some deserted area and tell me to survive dash for a year. The fear curdling in my stomach quickly turns into panic, what do I know about survival? A week in the Brecon Beacons hardly counts. I've never even watched those survival reality TV shows. I curse and kick the leg of the table making the items on it wobble alarmingly. How the hell is this supposed to show my worthiness? In what? Screaming like a little girl the first time a spider creeps into my tent? No, 
that's not referring back to an incident during my previous ill-fated expedition in the wilds, really. I swear again and storm away from the table. My behavior can be best described as a tantrum as I shout, stamp, wave my arms in anger and kick the ground, venting all the pent-up anger and frustration and, yes, grief, that has been brewing in me over the last few days. Hell, weeks. I'm crying and I don't even realize it until my eyes blur enough that I can't see in front of myself clearly. This, actually, ends my tirade as I kick a hidden rock in a tussock of grass and pain shoots up my foot. Of course, when I say it comes to an end, that's only once I've cursed the air blue again while hopping on one leg. I decide to pretend that the tears are from the pain and let myself go a bit. It's not like anyone is here to see me, after all. Slowly, the pain ebbs and with it goes all the intensity of emotion which had been moving me. In its place I feel calmer, emptier, ever so slightly more settled, like perhaps, not now, and not anytime soon, but perhaps one day I might feel better. About myself. About my life. Of course, if I really have to survive in the wilds that this appears to be by myself for a year, my life isn't likely to last very long, but then I'm the stupid one who decided to accept a magical transportation without reading the small print, or even having the small print to read, as a matter of fact. Maybe that should have been my first warning. Honestly, when I think about it, I'm not angry at Nicholas, not really. I'm angry at myself. Of course it was going to turn out to be too good to be true. It always is. Anytime I've let myself get sucked into something which seems fantastic on the surface, it's always turned out to be a smelly, putrid bog underneath. This is no different. And although I know I didn't actually expect magic to be real, that's not really an excuse. Nor is the fact that I made the decision under a sense of time pressure and hungover. I'm better than that. Or I should be, at least. I sigh, my shoulders slumping, feeling exhausted all of a sudden. Well, I made the decision. And now I'm trapped somewhere with no way to go home, completely at the mercy of nature and whatever these items are. I suppose I'd better make sure I know everything I can about the situation in which I find myself, even if it feels a bit like locking the door after the horse has bolted. Still, I might find out that it's not quite as bad as I think, maybe the letter will say that there's a city beyond this valley that I need to get to or something. Picking up the crunched piece of paper from where I had thrown it in my tantrum. I smooth it out once more, continuing to read. Energy is found in all things, even on your original world. On your world, however, there was such a minimal density of it that you could not even detect its presence. On my world, energy is sufficiently present for it to be an essential part of life. Relevant to you at this moment are classes and magic. It is why the stones I have sent you are so useful. The class stone gives you the tamer class and all the advantages that come with this. The knowledge stones allow you to instantly absorb knowledge of a subject, up to a certain limit. The skill stone instantly gives you access to a skill outside your class set which you can then use immediately. All of this is only possible because of our ability to use energy. As, of course, is my ability to contact you originally, and pull you part of the way towards my world. Why only part of the way? For one simple reason. The amount of energy to pull you all the way is enormous. It would take me some time to gather and, frankly, I would need to know that you were worth neglecting all my other responsibilities for the task. As I said at the beginning, it is far more efficient to combine a test of your worthiness with the practicality of paying for your journey. To be completely blunt, you need to collect sufficient energy before the year is up otherwise the spell will take its due regardless. Given the distances involved, this would most likely cost you your life. As the anchor and initiator of the spell, I would be held partially accountable for your debt should you arrive in my world without having fully paid it, so you can see that it is also in my interests that you gain in strength. I stop reading for a moment, staring sightlessly over the top of the letter. Great, from bad to worse, I say to myself bitterly. Not only do I need to survive here for a year, but I can't even plan on just finding a hiding spot and becoming a hermit. No. I actually have to do something to gather energy or I'll be signing my death warrant anyway. Feeling sick again, I look back at the letter. Better get it over and done with so at least I know what I'm dealing with. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 4, A Treasure Trove. Before scanning the letter to find the point where I left off before, I feel my anger rekindle at the cavalier approach Nicholas seems to be taking towards my life. Sure, maybe he might have some consequences too if I fail, 
but it seems very much that the risk is all on my side of things. I continue reading. At this point, I imagine you are wondering how to collect energy to pay the debt of your passage. In short, by killing beasts. When a creature is killed, part of its energy goes to the one who kills it. Believe it or not, but the same was true on your previous world. It was just such an energy-starved place that it would take longer than you have to live currently for you to even start making noticeable progress to pay for your passage. Indeed, that is why I made the choice to pull you to your current world. It may not be populated by civilized beings, but it is well suffused with energy. A treasure trove of sorts, if you would only reach out to harvest it. I feel my heart sink. Not populated by civilized beings is the fatal blow to my last, clearly futile hopes of there being a city beyond the valley which I could travel to. Apparently I'm being abandoned to the wilderness. What was that term Nicholas used? I check the letter again. A treasure drove, he considers it. Somehow, I doubt there are chests full of goodies anywhere near me. I read on to find out what exactly has been given to me in order to even hope to survive in this unpopulated treasure trove of the world. I have provided the following resources for you, a tamer class stone, epic, orange, a system lore stone, novice, light blue, a woodcraft knowledge stone, novice, light green, a hunting knowledge stone, novice, light brown, a tracking skill stone, initiate, brown, a lay on hand skill stone, beginner, aquamarine, a survival pack including a knife, a water flask, two days rations, and some other essential items. 2x minor health potions. These resources should be sufficient to allow you to start the path to power. Given that your world seems to be one of technological advancements rather than individual survival, I have included several knowledge stones on this topic. It is kill or be killed, traveler. Harvest the energy of others or be yourself harvested. I hope to see you on the other side. My most cordial and hopeful sentiments. Lord Nicholas Titan Bend of Azaert. P.S. I suggest that you use the class stone first, and then the skill stone. Once you have received your class, you will gain access to your status screen. Check your intelligence stat before deciding how to use the knowledge and skill stones, unless you have an intelligence stat of 10 or more. I would suggest not using more than one knowledge stone per day as you will be unable to absorb the majority of the second. You would need an intelligence stat of more than 20 to absorb more than two stones in one day with reasonable efficiency. I stare at the letter, feeling numb. Then I snort, I suppose I have been given what I asked for. If my guess is correct, the things this Nicholas guy has given me are awesome, I just wish I didn't have to be in the wilderness for a year to get them. Sighing. I lower the piece of paper down and regard the items on the desk thoughtfully. Nicholas suggested using the class stone first, that's apparently the orange one. Easily spotting it among the other colors, I pick it up and turn it over in my hand. The stone is warmer than I would have imagined, almost like someone else has just been holding it. There's also some slight, buzz? Or is it like the way a rubbed balloon attracts hair except the other way around? Something like that. Either way. I don't think it's my imagination to say that I feel something that I shouldn't from a simple stone, never mind the fact that it's glowing. I figure that I should probably follow Nicholas' advice, he's the one who sent me these items after all. Okay, since arriving in this uninhabited place instead of wherever he is to receive the inheritance promised, I'm taking his words with a bit more salt, but unless I allow my most paranoid thoughts free reign. I can't really see why he would give me bad advice. If he'd wanted me to die immediately, he could have just not sent me anything. He's right in saying that without any sort of aid I'd have no idea on how to even find food and safe water to drink. Taking a deep breath, I activate the stone. Well, that's what I try to do. Turns out, staring intently at the stone is not how to activate it. Activate? I say hesitantly. Nothing happens. Gain class? Still not a start. Infuse. Osmosis. Damn you. Do something. I shout at it squeezing and glaring. My eyes go wide as there's a crunching sound and a crack appears in its surface. My stomach drops as the crack spreads and fractures further until the whole stone falls into a million pieces no bigger than finely grained sand. Fear claws at my belly. Have I just broken my only chance to survive the next year? The dust glows and suddenly starts melting into my skin. For a moment, it's like the world has paused and then the next thing I know is pain all over. It isn't excruciating, but it's everywhere. Like pins and needles, but not just in one limb. Plus, after a breath, it's not just at the surface, but under as well. I'm struck with the thought that I could almost map my entire body out, organs included, 
If I could build a picture based on the prickling sensation, while not terribly painful, it's enough to make me want to tear my skin off as my mind interprets the prickling as itchy. Then, a few moments later, the pain vanishes as if it was never there. Everything feels, off, just, wrong somehow like the feeling when you walk into a familiar place where something has changed but you can't immediately spot whether it's the furniture that's moved or the wall that has been painted a slightly different shade the feeling of wrongness intensifies as a screen suddenly appears in front of me the screen is made of mist formed in a box like shape the main part of the box is almost opaque but it fades abruptly around the edges until I can see normally with my peripheral vision. I can just about see through the box enough to tell if I'm about to walk into something, but it's definitely a better idea to stay still while using it, I think. Black words in a clear font style are printed on the densest section of the misty space. Congratulations! You have absorbed a class, Tamer. You consequently have access to your status. To see this, think or say status. You have zero status points to assign. You have three new messages. Next message, YN. I think yes and the words dissolve away, replaced swiftly after with another message. Congratulations. You have new class skills, too. Tame. Activate this skill on a being which already feels connected to you in some way and it will offer the being the option of becoming bound to you as a companion. Warning, beings with a moderate or higher intelligence level may choose to reject the bond. Dominate. Activate this skill on a being to enter into a battle of wills, success in which binds the being to you as a bonded. Certain previous actions can increase your chances of winning the battle, even with a lower willpower than your opponent. This includes, but is not limited to, having already defeated the being physically, having trapped the being so that they are unable to move, having terrified the being. Warning, if you lose the battle of wills. You will be rendered vulnerable for 10 seconds as you recover. Recommended willpower before attempting a battle of wills. 10 for a stage 1 beast. Next message, YN. Once more, I think yes even while my thoughts whirl. Congratulations on achieving your first class. You have gained access to an inventory and a map. Your inventory can hold up to 10 item slots per class level starting with 5 additional spaces per class rarity rank above uncommon. Identical items can stack up to 50. Live items cannot be stored. Please note that the storage and withdrawal of items consumes energy and will not function until you have gained some. You can access your inventory by thinking or saying inventory. Your map keeps track of where you have been. This is a passive ability which you can toggle on or off. This ability consumes a small amount of energy and will not function until you have gained some. You can access your your map by thinking or saying map. You can access a small mini map in your vision by thinking or saying mini map. Next message, YN. Congratulations. You have a new ability, absorb skill stones. One skill stone detected in range. Do you wish to absorb this skill stone now? Please note, you can choose to absorb this skill stone later by holding it and thinking or saying absorb skill stone. YN. I hesitate but think no for now. I have enough to consider right now without adding an extra dimension into it. A new message forms in front of me, close interface, return to message panel, view status summary. I decide to close the messages, thoughtfully staring into the now unobscured view in front of me. Not that I see any of it, I'm dwelling too much on what I've just read. It's a lot to take in. This whole thing with skills and status and stats seems far too similar to video games for my comfort especially when I consider that most video games are centered around fighting and killing. The same thing Nicholas is saying I'll have to do to collect energy. I've never been a big gamer, though I enjoyed a few during my teenage years and at you and I. I haven't had time to play them recently though. Not since you and I, in fact, as my focus for the last seven years has been my career. But if this is my reality now, it's a choice of either doing my best to adapt or throwing up my hands here and now and giving up. One choice definitely ends in my death, the other offers a little more hope. I try not to think of how many times I died in a video game, I don't know if I have the ability to respawn in real life and I don't feel like testing it. Sure, I was considering jumping off a building a few days ago, but I might as well give this new life a chance right? I can always quit later if it's too much for me, right? I thoughtfully evaluate the new information I've been told. The map and inventory will definitely come in handy. Directions are not my strong point, and the less I have to carry, the better. The skills sound interesting. It seems like there is a consensual and non-consensual duality to my new class. Tame is the consensual one. I have to build up a creature's loyalty the hard way, 
and they could still choose to refuse the bond when I offer it. Dominate, on the other hand, is clearly non-consensual, but I could see the purpose. I wonder whether there are any downsides to dominate, maybe where the creature could attack me when I'm least expecting it. Actually, didn't the description mention something about being vulnerable for a time after losing the battle of wills? That's a bit of a downside. If there are any others not mentioned, I guess I'll find out later, hopefully not the hard way. Speaking of not expecting it, I really am not expecting the attack which falls from the skies. One moment I'm contemplating the admittedly beautiful view ahead of me while Riley wondering if this is a catch em all type situation, and the next time lying on the ground with my head feeling like it's just exploded. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 5, Zest for Life. Before, wah? I mumble blearily, staring at the rock in front of my eyes. The rock which is covered in blood. My blood. I got hit by a rock. I can only blame the almost certain concussion for the slow progress of my thoughts. Probably only the fact that it seems to have been a glancing blow, is what saved my skull from exploding like a watermelon. I hear a rustle of feathers and turn towards it just in time to see a sharp beak coming at my face. I flinch back my head protesting fervently at the movement. It's enough to avoid getting my eyes backed out, but not enough to avoid having my nose latched onto. Jeroff! I shout, squinting through tears of pain. I flail my arms in front of me and, more by luck than design, manage to hit it in the neck. Wark! I hear and the bird lets go. The relief is temporary, now it's released my nose, it has full access to the rest of my body. I curl up, trying to avoid the painful bites as much as possible all while my stomach tries to exit my body as my head makes its complaints known. My nose would also like to register its discontent, but I have no time for that. This is not working. The bloody bird is going to win at this rate. The rock it must have dropped on my head has done half of the job for it already. The rock. Bit by bit, I shift back towards the rock, covering it with my body. I grip it with my hand, preparing even as the bird starts drawing blood even through my clothes. Summoning up all my strength. I explode into movement. Well, I'd like to say I explode. In fact, it's more like stagger to a half kneeling position, scrabble with one hand to grab the bird anywhere I can, its neck, it turns out, and flail with the rock. Once more, luck seems to be with me, I've actually grabbed it at a good point to drag its head down to the ground where I can start beating at it with the rock. I start swearing with each blow taking out all my anger and fear at the situation I've found myself in on the now helpless bird. Eventually, it stills and its body collapses, its wings going limp from where they had been battering at my body. I stop myself when the head is just a bloody mush and lean back to sit on my heels, staring blankly ahead of me. Emotions course through me, unfamiliar both in their type and intensity. Recently, all I've known this strongly are fear and grief. And, of course, the leaden dragging of hopelessness and depression that has almost consumed me more than once in the last week. This, there's fear, to be sure, the lingering twisting, curdling sense of terror. But how ironic for someone who stood on the edge of a building so recently, only a bare inch away from tumbling to my death, that the fear is of dying. A perfect opportunity to have solved all my problems by just letting the bird do its thing, and I suddenly discover that I don't want to die. I laugh suddenly feeling like a weight has been lifted from my chest. It's illogical, and ridiculous, but so many of my thoughts over the past while have been consumed with questioning whether I even wanted to continue, or just try to end my life. To suddenly be confronted with an unmistakable desire for survival is, a relief. A decision, finally. Having acknowledged that, I now realize what the other emotion running right through me is, triumph. This bird attacked me, tried to kill me, and it failed because I succeeded in killing it first. It's been, so long since I have felt the triumph of winning that I almost don't recognize the sensation. Of course, then I realize I've won by killing another living creature and I feel a moment of guilt, and not a little nervousness at this new side of myself. I'll admit it, I'm a soft middle manager. I like civilization. I like drinks and parties and holidays on the beach. I have never been even remotely interested in those survival programs dash I'm a celebrity, get me out of here is the closest I've ever come to those. I don't even kill spiders I find in my bathtub. Never in a million years would I have imagined I'd be in the situation where I had just brutally beaten in the head of some bird. I console myself that I didn't go seeking this fight, the bird is the one who dropped a rock on my head. That, of course, reminds me of the pain in my head, and my nose, 
and uncountable places in my body which are no doubt becoming dark bruises as I sit here and think. Plus, if another of those creatures attacks me with my head the way it is, both with my state of mind and my actual physical state, I'll be done for. Actually, wasn't there something about healing in the list Nicholas wrote? I check the table, and see that the flailing around of either the bird or me has knocked everything off its surface. I curse as my stomach drops. Now that I've rediscovered a zest for life, I feel like I'm scrabbling for every possible advantage I can get. I need to find those stones. Setting the table back on its legs from where it had been knocked onto its side, I search around the area for Nicholas gifts. The letter is an obvious pale spot and I grab it. It's slightly smudged by blood, but still legible, thankfully. I use the list of items to find everything and put them back on the table. My stomach only settles once I'm sure I haven't lost anything. With how disadvantaged I am already, I really can't afford to lose even one of these lifelines. The last few minutes have proven just how quickly things can turn into a fight for life or death. I take in a deep breath and try to pull myself together a bit. I may still have a stomach that feels like a pile of quivering jelly, and a probably concussed head, but that doesn't mean I can't think. Still, sorting out my physical discomfort would probably help. I knock back one of the health potions. In just a few seconds, my head is significantly clearer, and painless. My eyes widen as the implications sink in. Then my stomach sinks again as I realize that I might have made a mistake. If it cleared my cracked skull and other bumps and bruises so easily, how would it do with more significant, life-threatening problems? I have no idea of what is facing me, what if tomorrow I end up with a broken bone or something, and no potion? Come on, Marcus, I tell myself sternly. Pull yourself together, think logically, you can't change the past, but you can change the future. Alright, I'll try to think through this logically like it's just another problem at the office. Though maybe that's a bad idea as I was recently fired to be replaced by some ticketing system probably based in India. I redirect my mind away from a topic that's sure to rebind me in those chains of depression. Problem, I'm stuck far from home in an environment which I find very unfamiliar. Solution, I need to check at the resources which have been given to me and make a plan. Right, sure, I can do that. I review the item list in the letter again. Which items are essential for my survival now, and which will be more important later. I've already absorbed the class stone, and Nicholas suggested absorbing the lay on hand skill stone after the class stone. I don't know what it's supposed to be for, but I've already decided that I need to trust his advice. That seems the next step. After that, there are four more stones. Two knowledge stones, a lore stone, and a skill stone. I don't know if there's any difference between the capitals for the lay on hand skill stone, and the smalls for the tracking skill stone, or if that's just a writing error. From what I understand of the implications of Nicholas's letter, I can absorb a skill stone and knowledge stone without a problem, but can I do the same with a skill stone and knowledge stone? Do I want to take the risk? Probably not as the risk is that I lose a large part of the information from the stone, making it worthless. All of these seem far too important to my survival to do that. In fact, that's the problem. I can't really decide which one stone is the most important now, they're all important. Although Nicholas didn't put a description of the stones into the letter, I have to guess that the tracking and hunting stones are what they say on the tin, and that's going to be absolutely essential for me once the rations Nicholas has given me run out, hunting to provide the meat, and tracking to find the animals. As for the other two, the system lore stone will probably tell me more about the class system, which will be important as I progress. Of all of them, this is the only one I can put in the important later category as it doesn't seem quite as essential to my immediate survival. The final one. On the other hand, is a good candidate for the first stone I use after the skill stone, if it does what I think it might. Woodcraft could mean carpentry, literally crafting with wood, but I have to guess from what Nicholas said that it's more likely to mean the other sense of the word, being able to survive in the wood. While that might not help me much with the mountain I'm currently on, it will no doubt be invaluable in the forest that fills the vast majority of the valley I'm more likely to spend time in. Of course, before I can decide on the order, I need to check out my intelligence level. Nicholas was clear, unless I have an intelligence stat over 10, I can't absorb more than one stone a day. That said, I would imagine my intelligence is over 10, unless I start at 0 because I've just gained my class. After all, I always did pretty well at school and I left UNI with a first class degree. Plus, 
I've worked most of the time since leaving UNI and my managers have generally been satisfied with my performance. Until the last one, cost-cutting misers. Still, I might as well absorb the skill stone as I know I'll definitely be doing that first, and it might make some changes to my status. I pick up the aquamarine stone hoping that I've correctly identified the colors. Knowing the difference between light blue, light green and aquamarine was more difficult than it should really be. Thanks to the instructive message. I think absorb skill stone at the object. It takes a moment, but then it's almost like the stone turns to gel, slumping into a pool in my hand. The semi-liquid is quickly absorbed, leaving a faint glow in the palm of my hand that just as quickly disappears. Unlike the previous time, there's no pain. Instead, a sort of ecstasy envelops me, an energy running through every cell in my body and making it feel completely fresh. I regret once more taking the health potion, I reckon that if I hadn't taken it, this skill stone would have healed me anyway, it's just the impression I get. Then again, if I had been trying to make important decisions with a concussion, I would probably had made more errors. The next moment, I groan and keel over forwards as someone drives a railroad spike through my head. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 6, Lack of Wisdom Before someone isn't literally driving a massive metal spike, though honestly it feels like it right now. In reality, it's memories or perhaps impressions would be a better word, which are being forced into my head. I suddenly realize that I know all about lay on hands and how to use it. I curse out loud as I really regret taking the health potion, this is a healing skill. I hadn't realized. Sure, it might not have healed me all the way in one go, I can't tell what level it's at without looking at my status, nor how much mana I have, but I could have used it multiple times until I was healed. I only have, had, two health potions only one now. Gritting my teeth, there's not much I can do about the new wave of chagrin that washes through me. All I can do is try to do better in the future. That last health potion is going to be kept for a real emergency. Then I realize that I should be grateful that I have ongoing access to healing magic at all, I'd be in a lot worse position on earth right now after a rock to the head, even with access to doctors and hospitals. Heck, I'd probably still be sitting in the waiting room if I'd even got to A and E. Well, Time to check my status and plan my next moves. Remembering what was at the end of the final message I read, I try commanding the screen to reappear. View status summary, I say deliberately, more pleased than I should be when the screen comes back with a table of numbers. That is, until I look at it. Name, Marcus Wolf. Race, Human. Class, Tamer. Level, 0. Energy to next level, 2%. Energy absorption rate, 5U per hour. Energy towards debt. 0% Intelligence 6 Mana 60-60 Wisdom 3 Mana Regeneration Rate 75U per hour Willpower 4 Health Regeneration Rate 4U per hour Constitution 4 Health 40-40 Strength 5 Stamina 20-20 Dexterity 3 Stamina Regeneration Rate 30U per hour Class Skills Dominate Beginner 1 Tame beginner 1. Non-class skills. Lay on hands. Beginner 9. 6. I splutter indignantly, ignoring everything else. 6. How could I only have a 6 for intelligence? And how could that be my highest stat? I mean, the fact that it's my highest stat isn't in itself a surprise, I've always prided myself on my intellect. It's the fact that it's so low, and so are all my other stats. That shocks me. Did all the days at the gym mean nothing? Or maybe they did help since that was actually only one point behind my intelligence stat. I smile wryly as I note my wisdom stat, not inaccurate, I suppose. I have made some rather stupid decisions, and not just today. Perhaps I ought to think about increasing that at some point, though probably not immediately as I can't really see its benefit in the immediate future. Although, maybe that's my lack of wisdom talking. Sighing. I close the screen. I need to spend some time thinking about it and trying to work out how all the different elements function. Right now, though, I need to build up my ability to survive, and that means choosing one of the knowledge stones to absorb. Maybe my stats aren't that unexpected, Nicholas had obviously considered it likely enough to put it as a postscript in his letter. That said, he equally evidently considered the possibility that my stats could be enough to absorb more than one stone. Otherwise he wouldn't have mentioned the possibility. Anyway, I look over the stones again thoughtfully. Hunting, tracking, and woodcraft are all essential for me at the moment, 
and I'm grateful Nicholas sent them, though not so grateful it outweighs my resentment of him sending me here in the first place. I wrench my thoughts back from that dark place again and reconcentrate on the subject at hand. Based on what I summarize is the function of each of the stones, I reckon that woodcraft is my first priority, and I'll have to hope that it doesn't mean carpentry. After that, well, I'll have to decide later whether I'm going to need to know how to hunt before learning how to track or vice versa. If today is an exception and most creatures here avoid me, I'll need to be able to find them, tracking. If today is not an exception, then probably the animals will find me, so hunting becomes more of a priority. Either way, it's not a decision I can make now. Resolved, I nonetheless take a moment to reconsider, to check my reasoning for any more mistakes. Not seeing any at least not obvious ones. I take up the light green stone and absorb it as I do the skill stone. It's not a railroad spike this time, it's worse. More like the train being driven into my head, all lights and horns blazing. I reel, losing my balance drunkenly and falling. The added pain of hitting the floor is a side note to what's happening with my head. Why am I in so much pain? I ask myself blearily through the sensation. Has something gone wrong? Fortunately for me, nothing has gone wrong. It turns out that shoving about five years worth of experience with survival in the wild into my head all in one go is just a little more impactful than the vague sense of how to use a skill that I'd received before. I can understand now why Nicholas suggested that I don't absorb more than one stone a day unless my intelligence is over 10, even with all the pain, even with all the information overload. I can sense that some of it is slipping away. Too unfamiliar with even the basics of what is being shoved into my mind, some of it just isn't sticking. Fortunately for me, it's a small portion as absorbing this stone is within my capabilities. Just that said, I have to admit that I only draw these conclusions after the pain starts to subside. Ow, I groan, daring to open my eyes from where they had slid shut. The sunlight dazzles me for a moment and sends a bolt of pain once more spearing through my brain. I slam them shut again waiting for the spinning to subside a bit more but make a new attempt as soon as I feel remotely ready. My new wilderness survival knowledge is telling me that lying out in the open with closed eyes is not the best way to see the next day, or even the next hour. And it is wilderness survival, thankfully. More than just surviving in the forest, this stone has given me the knowledge of how to survive in a range of environments, all of them, of course, far from any inhabited area. Newly armed with knowledge, I find my hesitancy about the path forward clearing up a bit. I move quickly towards the table and put the remaining stones into the pocket which wasn't torn up by the bird's attack. I shrug on the extra clothes which I had pushed off at the start and then sling the pack with the other survival supplies over my shoulder, to join the other backpack I brought with me. My most important items now stored, I gaze at my bright orange and green suitcases wondering how I'm going to carry them. In neither design nor color are they suited to my new environment, but I'd rather not have to just ditch everything either. Glancing at the bird I've just killed, I wonder about that too. My new wilderness survival memories are screaming at me that this is a useful food source, but at the same time that butchering and blood are a perfect way to lure predators. I don't want to lure predators. Then something occurs to me which makes me face palm at my own idiocy. My inventory. There was that message which said I could store a number of items in my inventory, and I don't get the idea it was talking about my suitcases. Instead, I wonder if it's some sort of non-physical space like in some games I played. Surely that wouldn't let the scent of blood leak out? I consider actually butchering the bird here and then moving away but decide against it in the end, I feel too exposed here. Plus, there's no water source other than my canteen, and I don't want to waste that when I'll probably need it for drinking purposes. Instead, I try to work out how to actually access the inventory. I test with a pen, something I don't really care too much about if it is lost. Fortunately, it turns out to be fairly easy. I have to think or say inventory and then it appears in front of my eyes. 20 little empty squares. Imagining the pen taking one of the spots is enough for it to vanish from my hands, and then imagining taking it out of the square is sufficient for it to appear once more in my hands. Not useful for an emergency situation, I note, resolving to keep my health potion and knife on my person. The next thing I try is to place the bird in its entirety into the inventory. At first it doesn't work and I feel a sinking sense of disappointment. Then, I have an idea. The bird is big, and dead. It's a, literal, dead weight, but by carefully arranging its limbs and heaving with all my might, I get it off the ground. Only by a centimeter or so, but I'm impressed, 
and also in pain. Before I drop it, I quickly activate my inventory and imagine putting the bird in it. To my delight, the whole carcass suddenly vanishes. I stagger, put off balance by the abrupt disappearance of the weight I was pressing against. My inventory is still activated and I can see that one of its squares is now filled. Not wanting to try my luck, I don't verify by taking it out again, but jubilation fills me. Okay, so that's something I should make a mental note of. I need to be holding whatever it is off the ground. No putting an airplane in my inventory, if I found one, that is. And I don't know if there's any size limit per item slot beyond the 50 items stack limit. Still, for the present purpose, it's good news. A moment's work has a second and third slot filled with my suitcases. Perfect. Another thought has me pulling the precious knowledge stones out of my pocket and putting them into fill four of the 17 slots which remain. No way do I want to lose those. About to set out once more, I have another thought. I wonder. Shrugging my backpack off again, I try to put that in the inventory. I grin as it also succeeds. Even better. It only takes up one slot. This inventory is awesome. Maybe I should do the same with my new survival pack? I try it, but this time it doesn't work. I frown. Why did the suitcases and backpack work, and the last bag didn't? A loud cry rings out and I jump, reminded of where I was. No time to test out theories, not sitting out in the open as I am. I quickly fill up a few more spaces in my inventory with the bulky coats I'm wearing giving me more range of movement. I now know that the difference of speed between wearing them and not could save my life, or end it. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 7, Wealth of Information Before I cut down towards the forest line, trying to take a route that uses outcroppings to block the view of me from the sky as much as possible, and provide shelter from a rock-bearing bird if necessary. When I reach the start of the trees, fortunately with no incident, I start walking along it, at right angles to the way I had been walking before. Why? My reasoning is that I need to find fresh water as a priority and this is most likely to come from the mountain. With any luck, I'll come across a stream bubbling into the forest. If that doesn't work, I've got a few more ideas to try, but this is the easiest one. As I walk, I try to plan a bit for the future. There are lots of things that need doing, that's for sure more than I would have ever thought of before absorbing the wilderness survival knowledge stone. Nicholas gave me a knife, which, when I consider what I would have to use otherwise, is a godsend. A knife is an essential tool, as well as a useful weapon for all its lack of reach, and having a metal one will make a lot of difference. The one Nicholas has given me is practical, a single-sided straight blade about 20 centimeters long with a slightly curved tip, rather similar to a bowie knife. It even has a serrated section on the section of its spine closest to the tank, or handle which will come in useful for sawing through smaller pieces of wood. Fortunately, it also comes with a protective sheath otherwise I'd probably have stabbed myself with it already. Still, I'm going to need a good number of other tools too, and those I'm going to have to make. Not having either blacksmithing equipment or expertise, I'm going to have to go right back to basics and make them from flint. If I can find any, that is. That's another reason to find a stream. If I'm lucky, there's flint below this mountain or forest and a stream will have cut deep enough into the layers of sediment and will have unearthed some nodules for me. If not, well, at least I still have my knife. I can use other rock types to make blunt instruments, but flint is truly the best that my newly absorbed wilderness survival knowledge knows about, at least. So, I need to make tools. I also need to sort out my food supply a bit. I have the dead bird in my inventory, which is a start. While it's possible that the bird will be inedible for me, I am in a different world. After all, my newly gained instincts say that it will most likely be fine. Generally, animal flesh is safe to eat though should really be cooked to avoid harmful bacteria as much as possible. There are some animals which have levels of vitamins or toxins in their bodies which are unsafe for human consumption, but usually those have been a result of evolution to adapt to a particular environment, or ward off predators, often in that case accompanied by bright, warning colors. Carrion eaters can have levels of parasites that render their meat inedible too, but given that this bird dropped a stone on my head, I have to assume that it's a hunter not a carrion eater. Perhaps an inaccurate assumption, but I may have to take that risk. It seems likely, then, 
that the bird's flesh will be safe to eat. Being in a different world might make a difference to my theory, but the fact that I can breathe the atmosphere with no problems and its temperature is mild to me indicates to me that the natural balance of the world is not that different from what I'm used to. More affected by being in a different world is my knowledge of safe plans to eat. I've been looking around while walking and have discovered to my dismay that I don't recognize anything. If I'd been relying on my personal knowledge of plants, that wouldn't mean much. After all, I could name the fruit, vegetables, and leaves which feature in your average British supermarket, and I could probably recognize a number of trees and plants which I regularly walked past in gardens or woods, though that didn't mean I'd know if they were edible or not, but that was it. I absorbed the wilderness survival knowledge stone, however, and that is a wealth of information. Unfortunately, it was information about a world that was neither Earth, nor this one. I haven't recognized any plants so far and have to conclude that I'm unlikely to. In fact, it's been somewhat disorientating, I'll see a plant with leaves of a certain shape that spark recognition in my mind, and then realize that the color is completely wrong, or that it's a bush instead of a tree or a flowering plant where it should be a fern type. In short, there's no way I can rely on the encyclopedia of plants in my head to choose what to eat and what not to. Fortunately, my new knowledge also comes with instructions on how to test for if a plant is edible or not. The downside is that it takes a long time. I can't just shove something in my mouth and hope for the best. No, I'll have to first choose a plant, then separate it into its individual parts, leaves, stem, fruit or flower roots etc. Next I'll have to test one part for irritation on contact, then try eating a small amount, then try eating a larger amount. The problem with this is that I have to allow enough time for symptoms to emerge, about 8 hours for each test. Plus, in order to be certain whether I am or am not reacting to the plant itself, I'll have to avoid eating or drinking anything but clean water during each period. So, either I'll have to go without eating anything else for a whole 24 hour period or I'll have to spend three days testing each part, using my sleeping period as the necessary fast. Did I mention that I have to test each part of the plant separately? At the same time, I'll have to be working hard to create the tools and shelter I need. I can't help but feel a bit overwhelmed. Who knew that it took so much just to survive? Or at least, to survive without access to a supermarket and money to buy the things in it. Perhaps I should be grateful that I'm in a place where there's probably abundant food available just requiring me to work out what I can eat, there are many on earth who are in just as poor a situation and can say the same about their environment. I hope that the inventory stops items from deteriorating, it will make things much easier if I have access to an effective refrigerator. Of course, that will probably lead to its own limitations in terms of what I can put in it, but I'd take the refrigerator over a live animal pen, if I'm honest. Actually, didn't the instructions say that I couldn't put live things in the inventory anyway? Of course, before I can even consider any of that, I need to find water and a shelter, which brings me right around to my first aim. I sigh and just continue trudging on, my feet and legs already aching, my eyes squinting as they search for the glint of water. Finding water ends up taking a long time, much longer than I'd anticipated. Apparently all those films where a person is lost in the wilderness and basically just has to go through a few trees to find a stream are a lie. Who knew? At least I don't end up falling into one at the moment I least expect it like in one program I saw. After a while of drudging fruitlessly, I suddenly pause, once more something from the messages I read occurring to me. So. Apparently I have access to both an inventory, and a map. If that could show me where to find water, it would save a lot of time. Map, I say, trying not to be too hopeful. Despite my attempts to keep my expectations reasonable, it turns out that I am disappointed anyway. The map appears in front of me. Once more a misty screen is the background to what looks like a simplistic drawing that is mostly blank. There are two-sided triangle shapes in a ring around the edges of my map which I have to guess are mountains. In the space between the mountains, there are many drawings of trees, the forest, I guess. There's also a blinking dot at the edge of the forest dash you are here, I guess. Actually, that's a good feature as working out my position in comparison to everything around tends to be my biggest problem when reading maps generally. Further up the mountainside near the dot is an X shape next to what looks like a line drawing of a boulder, where I started, I have to conclude. Apart from that, nothing is recorded. No rivers, no streams, nothing. So either they don't exist, which I doubt, or I have to discover them to add them to my map. Sighing, 
I close the screen and start walking again. It would have been nice for things to be that easy, but it's not surprising that they aren't. The map should come in handy once I've discovered some useful spots, but right now it's fairly useless. In the end, the sun is starting to dip towards the horizon by the time my ears catch the faint trickle of a small stream, obvious in the quiet peace of the woods. I'm lucky. I had actually gone a bit further under the tree cover than previously because I'd seen a big bird circling high above. It's worked out well for me, fortunately. The stream is really just a trickle, emerging from a crack between the rocks, but unless it disappears underground at some point, it should lead me to something bigger. In the meantime, I use my cupped hand to scoop some of the life-giving liquid to my dry lips. The water skin really didn't last for long, it turned out. Filling the skin up again. I breathe out a sigh of relief. Maybe I'm celebrating too soon, but I have a good feeling about this. Following the stream, my good feeling turns out to be right. After a while, the stream gathers tributaries and widens. Eventually, long enough that the light is starting to dim, it reaches a body of water that might even be wide enough to be considered a rivulet. Or maybe it's just a large stream. I'm not planning on measuring it to make sure. I have a hard choice to make. Several, in fact, first. I can neither stop or walk in the dark. Frankly, the thought of doing the latter makes my bowels turn to water. If a bird could almost kill me in the middle of the day, how much more vulnerable would I be at night, either blind in the dark, or half blinded by the light if I carried a torch? Okay, decision made. I'm not going anywhere. So, that leads me to the second choice, where to make camp. And how? Should I make a fire? Depending on the creatures, they could either be scared away from it, or attracted to it. Actually, thinking through that, if it's as uncivilized a place as Nicholas indicated, the experience of the forest animals with fire should be purely forest fires, so it should be more scary than attractive, but am I willing to potentially stake my life on that? Book 1, Leap, Chapter 8, Catching Light Before the cooling breeze as the sun goes down makes up my mind for me. I'd rather not freeze. And honestly, the safety of being able to see in a certain radius is more preferable than being completely blind in the dark. I spend a few minutes preparing a fire. Fortunately, being in a forest, there's plenty of dead wood, leaves, and kindling, so it takes less time than it might have. It's still almost dark by the time I think I'm ready. I pull out the flint and steel which Nicholas provided me with. It's not actually a flint stone, thankfully. It's more of a 10 centimeter long stick of an indeterminate material. Maybe metal of some sort? Or stone? I can't work it out as it seems to have a somewhat mixed appearance. The rod is accompanied by a piece of metal attached to it with a cord. Again, practical. Of course, knowing how to use the tools thanks to absorbing the stone and its helpful memories is one thing, being able to do it is something completely different. It takes long enough for me to get the technique right that I find myself wishing I was a smoker. Sure. It would be annoying to be without cigarettes in a completely different world, and my physical stats would probably be even worse, but at least I'd probably have a lighter with me. In the end, I managed to strike the rod correctly enough to generate a spark, and then do the right things to turn that spark into a flame, which then catches on the pyramid of branches I made. It's at that point that I realize it's catching light a lot faster than I thought it would and I scramble to go and get some more branches to add to the fire. It's probably a good half an hour before I feel confident that the fire can occupy itself for a bit. I slump next to it with a sigh, only now realizing how much my feet hurt. I lever off my shoes and massage my aching soles. Fortunately, I chose good shoes and don't have any blisters, though there are a number of parts on my feet which feel quite tender. Okay, water, check. Fire, check. Next, food. I haven't dressed a bird and I'm not keen on doing that right next to my camp, my absorbed memories say that that is a big no-no. The scent of blood and offal will draw scavengers, and possibly predators, like a moth to a flame. So I guess the bird is off the menu. I start hoping fervently that what is in my inventory will be kept in stasis or something, as otherwise I risk the meat spoiling overnight, if it hasn't done so already. Anyway. Seems like rations are my only option then as testing new plants is not a good idea right now. That could be a problem. I investigated the rations earlier, and they, aren't exactly abundant. Nicholas gave me a small quantity of dried meat, dried simiva beans, as my new knowledge tells me, that look and taste like a type of nut, and some long, dried pieces of green plant, malachy leaves, a type of nutritious seaweed. Together, they will provide everything my body needs, for about two days. Three. 
If I stretch it out, I've already chewed a few bits of dried meat as I got hungry while walking and figured I have a whole load of meat in my inventory to replace it with. Of course, I'm assuming that I won't just have to ditch it when I finally get around to processing it. No, no worrying needlessly. Bad Marcus. Directing my attention back to healthier places, I withdraw a small handful of semiva beans and a single maliki leaf. I force myself to put the rest back and put the satchel out of arm's length and line of sight in order to lessen the temptation to get more. I chew each bean long enough that it's completely disappeared before I put the next one in. It's hard not to just shove them all in my mouth and probably look like a chipmunk. I'm not used to being unable to assuage my hunger. At least the beans taste pretty good, though would be nicer with some salt. The maliki leaf makes up for that, it's very salty. Almost too much, but I've lost a lot of salt today through sweat so I force my way through. Mental note, next time, maybe use the maliki leaf in a stew or something so the salt is diluted. Right now, I'd rather not risk the smells of a cooking meal attracting something tougher than me. My stomach still rumbles even after super is over. I decide then and there that my first task tomorrow will be investigating the corpse in my inventory, and hopefully cooking it up for later use, presuming it's still good. I've found the river, at least, enabling me to wash my hands tools, and anything else which gets dirtied by blood or other liquids. I decide to distract myself with my status screen, time to investigate it a bit and make some plans. I command the misty box to appear once again. The numbers appear identical to the last time I looked at it. Well, I say that, but there is a small change, the percentage of energy to the next level has gone up by 2%. I consider that thoughtfully. It's been, I guess, about 7 hours since I last looked at that and apparently I earn about 5 units per hour, so about 35 units dot dot that makes each percent worth about 17 energy, more or less. I started with 2%, does that mean killing the bird was worth about 35 energy units, or had I already earned some energy? I check the letter Nicholas sent me, sure enough, it said that Earth had had some energy, it was just in very small amounts. A thought for later. Right now, the most important thing is that if the current rate continues, it will take approximately 14 days to level up, just surviving. Maybe less, since I will have to hunt animals in order to not starve. Is that fast enough? Is leveling up something that could help me survive? I guess so. I mean, stats, skills, magic. It all sounds pretty much like a video game to me, and in video games, people get stronger when they level up. I think it's been a while since I played games but I'm pretty sure that that was true. Even in the games I played most often which were more of me managing a city or a nation, when the place leveled up because I'd done the correct actions, it gained bonuses or otherwise grew stronger or more powerful. Surely the same would be true of this? I decide to try to dive deeper into this strange display hovering in front of my eyes. I explore my status screen a bit, learning how to manipulate it with my mind. Fortunately, it's not particularly complicated. I can see my messages which include previously read ones, and my status screen, nothing else. Returning to the status screen, I try to work out what each of the stats actually mean. By concentrating on them, I find I can I start to get a sense of what they're about. It's nothing groundbreaking, more a combination of feeling and observation than a clear tool tip telling me about the stat. Hopefully the system lore stone will have more to offer me when I finally get around to absorbing it. Intelligence must be something to do with absorbing and processing information, based on the fact that it's this stat which determines how many stones I can absorb and in what time frame. Clearly from the status screen, it's also the determiner of how much mana I have, magic. I guess from context. Whether this is immediately important to me will depend on if my only other skill lay on hands uses mana or something else, and if it uses mana, how much. Of course, I can't stop the image of a fire-throwing godlike figure from blossoming in my mind, but that's a long way away, if possible at all. Wisdom. Well, given how little I have of it, I can only think that it's a reflection on my capacity to choose whether doing something is a good idea or not. Recently, my self-control in that area has been a little lacking, actually, thinking about it, it's been lacking for a while. There's nothing like sitting in the middle of the wilderness with no way home to make you reflect morosely on your past life choices. I force my mind away from the threatening black hole and continue to look at my status screen. Clearly, wisdom affects the regeneration of mana perhaps as a fail-safe system. Imagine a mage with high intelligence and low wisdom, they'd be able to throw around powerful spells, 
but they'd have enough time to regret it while waiting for their mana pool to recover. Or maybe there's another explanation. I don't know. Willpower. I can only think that it's a reflection of one's self-discipline, like not eating food that's supposed to last me for at least two days because my stomach is still growling, I tell myself forcibly making myself sit still and not go to get more beans. Would increasing this reduce the temptation, or increase my ability to resist it, I wonder in an effort try to distract myself. There's also the fact that it determines my health regeneration. Why? What does willpower have to do with getting better? Healing is about biological processes, which can be helped along by pharmaceutical agents to treat symptoms and boost the body's immune system. But it's clear that in this new reality, Willpower directly affects health regen. And a pitiful regeneration it is too, 4 units an hour. Though, thinking about that, does that mean I would have recovered completely from my head wound in less than 10 hours? Because if that was the case, 4 units per hour is actually pretty awesome. Musing about the nature of willpower, something suddenly occurs to me and I switch back to the message panel, albeit a bit awkwardly. I haven't quite got the hang of this mental manipulation yet. In my message box are two categories, read and unread messages. Of course, the latter is empty, but the former holds the messages which came up after I absorbed the tamer class stone. Reading the one about the tamer skills adds a further clue about willpower. Dominate, activate this skill on a being to enter into a battle of wills the success in which binds the being to you as a bonded. Certain previous actions can increase your chances of winning the battle, even with a lower willpower than your opponent. This includes, but is not limited to, having already defeated the being physically, having trapped the being so that they are unable to move, having terrified the being. Warning, if you lose the battle of wills, you will be rendered vulnerable for 10 seconds as you recover. Recommended willpower before attempting a battle of wills. 10 for a stage 1 beast. That sentence which ends with even with a lower willpower than your opponent, and the other which talks about a battle of wills indicate an important point. This skill scales off my willpower. Or, at least, having a higher willpower than my opponent increases the likelihood that this skill will succeed. There's even a recommendation for the minimum level of willpower to have before attempting to dominate another creature. I'm rather depressed when it appears that I can't even use one of my class skills yet. I've got a 4 in willpower. Is it the same situation for tame? I check the description again. No, it doesn't seem to be the case. The description for tame only mentions that a being of high intelligence level can reject the bond, but there may be an underlying modifier that I don't know about. It would have helped if this whole thing came with a manual. I think uncharitably at Nicholas. Then again, maybe that's what the system lore stone is but I don't dare put that higher up the priority queue than knowledge about hunting and tracking. Well, either way, my willpower sucks, so it doesn't look like I'll be able to use Dominate anytime soon, not without stacking the deck significantly in my favor, at least. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 9, Experiment Before continuing my exploration of my stats, I consider Constitution next. From my status screen, it clearly determines my health at a 110 ratio like intelligence and mana. For a moment, I wish I'd looked in my status screen while I was injured, that way I could have a better idea of what the health points actually mean in real terms. Ultimately, though, I shrug, I know that getting injured is something to be avoided, and if I am too injured, I could die. Adding health points into the equation doesn't really change anything, except that if I add points to constitution, Logically I make myself harder to kill. I mean, I'm assuming here that I can increase these values, but it seems like a reasonable assumption to make. Strength seems fairly obvious, though the fact that it determines my stamina pool is interesting. Stamina, from my understanding, is based on how I've conditioned my muscles to deal with repeated stress, so I suppose it's logical. Though, I do find it curious that mana and health are at a 10 to 1 ratio with intelligence and constitution, respectively but stamina is at a 4 to 1 ratio with strength. Dexterity must have to do with my fine motor skill capabilities. I find the three in it rather insulting, I'm capable of writing and typing, both of which require fine motor skills. Then again, I suppose at the gym that I did focus a lot more on strength training with lifting weights rather than something flexible or reactive like martial arts. I guess that's why I have the low stat here. I do find the Regan rates interesting each is different. Wisdom has a ratio of 125 with mana regeneration, willpower is at a 1 to 1 ratio with health regeneration, 
and dexterity is at a 110 ratio with stamina regeneration. Why? Maybe I'll find out with a system stone. I look at the final two stats thoughtfully. Both strength and dexterity are physical stats as is constitution. That makes the six stats equally split between physical and mental, magical. Should I be aiming to min-max, by focusing on one or two stats and forgetting the rest? Or should I go more for an even level across the board? Would focusing on willpower so that I increase my health regeneration rate to fill my health bar in less than an hour be a way to avoid being hurt badly? No, probably not. At least not in the short term, if it takes me an hour to heal to full health. That wouldn't help me if I had a cut artery. And that would take 36 points anyway which would take me who knows how long to collect, definitely not a winning strategy. Actually, that reminds me. I scroll down to look at my skills and concentrate on the entry for lay on hands, wanting to get more information on it. What a surprise, it doesn't work. The screen just sits there, stubbornly unchanged. I huff and dismiss it. Instead. I close my eyes and try to focus on the feelings and half-remembered memories that flashed through me when I absorbed the skill stone. I know that in order to use this skill, I need to be touching the subject and concentrating. I know it's not an instant fix, it significantly increases the subject's regenerative capacity, but the more serious the injury, the more time and effort it will take to heal. I also get the sense that it can't heal injuries which the body is incapable of healing by itself given time. Where this means the practical limits are, I don't know, not having much medical knowledge beyond the basics taught at school, but I guess that cuts are fine, but severed limbs might not be. And that's disturbing as hell to consider seriously. The next concept that comes through is that this healing skill can be used on oneself as well as others. I didn't realize that that was in question. Continued practice will improve efficiency and speed of the skill's effect. I open my eyes and sigh. I'm pretty sure that it uses mana, but none of the memories were actually clear about this. Eyeing my knife, I wonder if I should test it. Using something for the first time in an uncertain battle is never a good idea. I pick the weapon up and pose it over my arm, trying to psych myself up to actually cut into my flesh. I clench my jaw and fear runs through me. Fear of pain fear of it not working and having injured myself for no good reason. Actually, that's a good point, why injure myself needlessly? The way things have gone so far, I'm likely to get injured soon, even if it's only a sprained ankle. I can test it then. There's no reason to believe that my first injury will happen in a battle. Decision made, I put the knife to one side, pretending to myself that it wasn't the unwillingness to cut my own flesh that weighed the heaviest on the scales of choice. I should get some sleep. Anyway, it's been a tiring day so far, and I've got a lot to do tomorrow, better to be well rested for it. Starting to prepare my bed, composed of arranging my extra layers to provide a bit of cushioning and coverage, I suddenly realized there was something I wanted to experiment with. My inventory. Why did my backpack fit in, but the bag that Nicholas gave me didn't? Are there other criteria which I need to be aware of? Half an hour or thereabouts, of experimentation and I've come up with some answers. The reason my backpack worked and the satchel didn't was because since my backpack can fully close with zips and overhanging flaps, it apparently counts as one item. The satchel which Nicholas gave me, which is actually more of a large leather pouch with a strap, doesn't seem to count. It has a drawstring, but the leather of the mouth is stiff and even pulling tightly doesn't get rid of a small gap big enough to fit several fingers in. I decide to do some rearranging, putting the items which I think I will need at a moment's notice in the leather bag, and trying to fit the rest in the backpack. That requires me to unpack my backpack and suitcases so I can better arrange things. As I do that, I reevaluate the items based on my new circumstances. One of these I hold up with a smile. My favorite non-stick walk will definitely come in useful in the near future. Other items I shake my head at, like the packet of condoms, and the swimming costume. I debate throwing them away to make space for other items later, but in the end just tuck them away in the corner of my orange suitcase. I hate throwing things away, Murphy's Law always says I will need them the week after I've been them. I won't be in this forest forever, and if I desperately need space later, I can throw them away then. I also look rather mournfully at my candle and phone. Both probably have charge now, but that's not exactly going to last. I keep them turned off in order to save battery, but also tuck them away carefully. Putting my backpack into my inventory completes my preparations, and I find myself with little to do other than twiddling my thumbs. Sure, I've got my favorite physical books with me too, 
but I doubt I'd be able to concentrate enough to enjoy the story. Not with such an alien environment surrounding me, and the memory of already having been attacked once today. With only a knife to protect myself, I'm feeling just a little vulnerable. Actually, that's a point. Maybe I should make another weapon, one with a little more reach. If I make a spear, I could probably also use it as a walking stick. Looking around, I see a long stick which would probably work for now. It's not as if I'm trying to make a work of art here, after all. Pulling it closer to the fire, I use my knife to trim its end into a point. Fortunately, it's a bit long for my needs because it takes me several attempts to get a decent point. By the end of my carving, the spear is just about long enough. It'll do. It's not like I'm lacking material to turn into spears after all. Now done. I'm back to twiddling my thumbs again. Maybe I should just sleep. Of course, that's easier said than done when you're in the middle of a strange forest with no better weapon for protection than a knife. A forest which is remarkably loud considering it's night. Not to mention that there's a surprising amount of movement going on around me. More than once, I feel something run over my bare skin, even over my face. Insects, mostly. But once it has enough weight to be a mouse or something, that wakes me right up and it takes me a while to get back into the mode of sleep. The fire is another thing, I have to keep adding sticks to it otherwise it threatens to go out. Once more, not conducive to going to sleep. Probably midway through the night, I run out of firewood to feed it, clearly having underestimated just how much it would use. It's probably also to do with the breeze that whips between the trees. The availability of oxygen makes the fire burn brighter and hotter but also consumes fuel more quickly. Then there's the wind itself, which seems to excel in sending cold fingers through any tiny gap between the layers covering me, making me shiver every time that happens. Eventually I do fall asleep out of sheer exhaustion despite all the distractions and challenges, but even then it's not terribly restful. Not surprisingly, my dreams are filled with anxiety and stress. Drifting between a half-consciousness and a full unconsciousness. I sometimes struggle to tell the difference between reality and dream. The dream I have of standing in my boss's office as he tells me that my team and I are being replaced by an outsourced human resources outfit based in another country is far more believable than the reality of lying in a dark forest full of strange sounds. Equally, dreaming of standing at my father's grave as his coffin is lowered down into the ground is far too real. I'm more disorientated when I wake from the dream than during it. The forest in the dark is far more dreamlike, the moonlight painting patterns of leaves across the ground, the sounds which would be more at home in a jungle. Even the otherworldly smells contribute to making the environment almost unbelievable. It wasn't something I paid much attention to in the waking hours. But here with nothing else to do but lie here and experience the discomfort of my reality, the smells clog up my nose like a strong perfume in a lift. When I finally fall into black unconsciousness, the moon has long since set and the forest is quieter than it's ever been before. It seems like I've night out even the night owls. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 10, Pattern of Blood Before I wake up when a ray of sunlight hits my face. No, actually, I wake up and decide to get up then. It hasn't exactly been a restful night. I think I might have spent more time awake during the dark hours than asleep, and the graininess in my eyes attests to that. But I finally give up when the sun is actually shining in my eyes. It's a little above the horizon, high enough to have started shining through the forest and send long fingers of shadow everywhere, but still early enough that the dawn chorus is only just transitioning into the daily sounds of birds. How do I know? Apparently birds sound pretty similar even across worlds. Also something that's true across worlds, I want breakfast. Helping myself once more to a disciplined handful of beans, another handful of jerky, and a couple of dried seaweed pieces, I'm set for the day. Well, that's what I tell myself. My stomach isn't entirely convinced and keeps sending me images of pancakes with syrup or a good hearty English breakfast or, heck, even a bowl of muesli would go down nicely now. Shaking my head sharply, I redirect my thoughts to what I need to do. Quickly packing away the small number of things which make up my camp, I pause thoughtfully. Maybe this is a good spot to sort out my bird meat? I already have a fire, though it's almost completely out thanks to the hours of inattention on my part. Plus. I'm planning on moving on anyway, leaving entrails and blood here isn't going to be a problem. Deciding that it's the best idea I've had all day, I pull the bird out of my inventory. It thumps on the ground, literal dead weight, somehow smaller than I remember it being, for some reason I thought it to be the size of an ostrich when it's more like a cassowary. That said, it's nothing like the cassowary in shape, 
rather being more like a vulture but with the beak of a hawk. Actually, it's surprisingly heavy considering it could fly. I'm a bit of an amateur bird watcher, one of the few outdoor activities I enjoy, and often went on research binges about different facts of birds. From what I remember, the heaviest bird on earth that can fly is only something like 15 or 20 kilos. A cassowary is significantly more than that, adults being over 50 kilos, and an ostrich is more than double that. But neither of those have hollow bones beyond their femurs. Based on how difficult I found it to lift this bird yesterday, I'd guess that it's at least the weight of a cassowary, maybe a bit more. How then could it fly? Still musing over the mystery, I start considering how to do this. Considering how big it is, it would be far better if I could hoist the corpse up by its feet. Really, I'm not well prepared for the task, but say la vie. Supposedly, I should be able to remove the skin and feathers quite easily, but the size of this thing is daunting. I'll probably have to do this piecemeal. First of all, I inspect the condition of the carcass. There's no strong odor, at least nothing that my absorbed memories tell me is anything unexpected from a beast with feathers which never takes a bath but preens itself instead. The body is not bloated in any way. The feet are stiff and the flesh is starting to show signs of rigor mortis. The eyes are still wet and full. All these signs taken together, I have to conclude that my inventory keeps things in stasis, or at least does not allow significant decomposition. Considering it's been almost 24 hours since I killed the thing. It should be in significantly worse condition if there were no intervening effects. A smile of relief takes over my face. That's good news. Excellent, actually. It makes my food situation so much easier to manage. I decide not to cook all the bird now then. That will save a lot of time, and it also means I'll be able to cook it in different ways later. I'll still cook some for immediate and emergency use, but the majority I'll return to the inventory. I can only hope that it will stack, otherwise I'm going to have a problem. Oh well. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. So, following the memories that flash through my mind as I think about dressing a bird, I shift the bird to lying on its side and then make a cut on the underside of its breast. From there, I try to pull the skin and feathers off all in one go. Try, being the operative word. It's immediately clear that having the knowledge in my head is not the same thing as being able to actually do it. It takes me a lot longer than it should, and a significant amount of cursing before I finally manage to get the skin off. It's not in one piece, either. Still, I've succeeded in the first step. I make the next few cuts with a similar amount of precision, or lack of it, rather. I don't think I'll be getting all of the meat off this carcass. Just to test, I take three different cuts of meat from the back, the breast, and the leg, and I put them in my inventory. To my continued pleasure, they do stack. With that clarified, I continue cutting through the joints with difficulty. My hand slips in the blood several times and I have to pause and go wash it in the stream, not wanting to cut myself. It's hard work, and would be better done with an axe or saw, but a knife is what I've got so. It's only when I cut into the body cavity that I realize that I'm dealing with a corpse. Maybe that should have been obvious before, but it's when I see the heart and the intestines, and get a face full of corpse smell that the fact truly hits home. Feeling faint and nauseous, I stumble over to the stream to wash the blood off my hands and splash water on my face. This is nothing like the neat and clean packaged cuts of meat in the supermarket. Come on, Marcus, I tell myself aloud, almost startled at the first human voice I've heard in what feels like days. Actually, considering my drunken binge which made four days disappear, it's been a while since I even spoke to Nicholas. Still, get it together. You don't do this, you'll starve. So don't wimp out and just do it. Taking a few more deep breaths, I decide I feel fortified enough to continue and turn back to the body, only to see it move. I watch in fear as the bird's legs shift and its head twitches. Magic exists, so does that mean, can things become undead? I'm torn between creeping closer to investigate and running in the opposite direction. Then my eyes narrow. I've caught sight of something that puts a lie to my panicked supposition. A tail. In fact, I creep closer and withdraw the knife from where I've hooked it in my belt. Sure enough, the bird is as dead as ever, and not undead. What's making it move are three creatures about the size of a small dog which look rather like baby crocodiles with longer legs and sharp teeth. They're worrying and tearing at the bird carcass, snatching mouthfuls off and gulping them down with quick head tosses. I see red. I almost died to kill this thing. And here are these other creatures thinking they can just come and benefit from my struggle? Without thinking, I stab at the nearest creature. My blade strikes at its back, only to pierce the dirt an inch to one side of it. For a moment it's like time has stopped, 
the lizard thing and I just look at each other. The next, a blinding pain hits me. The lizard has whipped around faster than I could follow and has bitten down on my forearm. I stagger backwards and fall on my rump, flailing ungainly, my hand still clenched around the knife. The lizard is still attached, doing the same worrying technique to my arm as it was doing to the bird. I grab at it and wrench trying to get it off my arm. It's only when I succeed in freeing myself from its teeth that I curse myself and my stupidity. When the lizard came free, it took a good chunk of my flesh with it. Screaming, I slam the lizard against the ground frenziedly, only stopping when it goes completely limp in my hand and its head looks significantly flatter and bloodier. In the meantime, our kerfuffle hasn't gone unnoticed. The other two lizard things have rounded the bird carcass and are advancing quickly. One lunges and sinks its teeth in my leg. I shout again, this time more in anger than pain, and grip my knife more tightly. I've learned my lesson, I grab its tail and stab at its body with my knife. It take me a couple of tries, but I manage to sever its spinal cord somewhere between its two sets of legs my knife slicing easily through the rest of its boneless flesh. I ditch the detached half and stagger to my feet, glaring at the third lizard creature. It stares back at me for a moment and then turns tail, clearly deciding that this is not a fight and wants to risk. Yeah, you better run. I shout at its disappearing back. Panting harshly from exertion and adrenaline, I am reminded as I take a step that I still have half a lizard attached to me. Leaning over, I almost overbalance my head starting to get woozy. Blood loss, I realize as I look at the blood coating my right forearm and dripping off my fingers. Fumbling with the lizard's head, I pull its jaws open, easy now the creature's dead, and drop the head. Fortunately, since I didn't yank the jaws away, this wound is a lot less serious than the one in my arm, an elongated semicircle of sharp teeth marks oozing with blood. My forearm turned towards me, I suddenly freeze. The pattern of blood tracing over my pale skin, the bubbling of the fluid from my wound, it all takes me back 13 years to the nightmare I've never truly got over. I see her again, her lips blue and moving faintly and I try desperately to hear the inaudible words they form. No. I focus on my breathing, try to pick at three things I can hear, two things I can feel, and one thing I can smell. Wait, blood. No good, no good. Wind, rustling of leaves, smell of earth, trickling of the brook. Bit by bit. I pull myself out of my attack, trying my best to minimize the impact of the pain of my wound, the feeling of blood trickling, the smell of the red fluid in fear it will pull me back into that nightmare. As the panic loses its clawing grip on me, a new sense of urgency overtakes me. My wooziness is getting worse, I need to deal with these injuries now. I cover the bleeding wound with my hand, desperately trying to keep my precious life fluid in my body. Bandages, I need bandages. What can I use? A shirt but I need to use the knife to cut the shirt up and I'm not at all ambidextrous so my right hand being the one that's injured is the worst possible situation for me why didn't Nicholas give me some sort of first aid kit he must have known I'd be injured then it hits me I'm an idiot of course he realized that and gave me something better than bandages or so I hope lay on hands I croak weakly concentrating on sending a sense of energy to the wound. A cool stream floods down my arm from the area under my sternum and saturates the gaping hole in my arm. Under my eyes, it starts to clot over and the blood flow stops. Relief floods me, accompanied by a sudden feeling of weakness. Sparkles fill my vision which quickly shrinks, sounds abruptly coming from far away. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 11, Regeneration. Before the next thing I know, I hear bird song. Why can I hear bird song? We don't get many birds in the city. And why can't I recognize the calls? I realize that my eyes are closed. When did I do that? Opening them, I see the forest canopy above me and my recent memories come flooding back. I flush as I realize what happened. I fainted. It's understandable, I tell myself, nonetheless feeling a bit embarrassed. I lost a lot of blood and had an adrenaline rush and crash. Not to mention being in another life-death situation for the second time in two days after having gone more than 13 years since the last time. Then, to add to my woes, I also had a flashback which, again, I haven't had that badly in at least six years. I look at my arm wondering if I dream the effect of the healing, but no, the wound is still there, though scabbed over. Fortunately, I didn't land on the injured arm when I collapsed. Now less gripped by fear or adrenaline, I find my brain starting to work again. I open my status screen. Name, Marcus Wolf. Race, Human. Class, Tamer. Level, Zero. Energy to next level, 
9%, energy absorption rate, 5U per hour, energy towards debt, 0%, intelligence, 6, mana, 6060, wisdom, 3, mana regeneration rate, 75U per hour, willpower, 4, health regeneration rate, 4U per hour, constitution, 4, health, 2240, strength, 5, stamina, 1720, dexterity, 3, stamina regeneration rate, 30U per hour, class skills, dominate, beginner 1, tame, beginner 1, non-class skills, lay on hands, beginner 9, only two things have changed, no, wait, 3, I've gained energy towards the next level, my health has dropped to 22 out of 40, and my stamina has dropped to 17 out of 20, I was expecting to see something different about my mana, but that's full, maybe lay on hands doesn't use mana, or maybe my time unconscious was enough to allow it to recharge, only one way to find out, I decide, once more casting lay on hands, I'm glad to feel the cool energy again snaking its way through me to the wounds, this time, it makes my injury look several days old rather than just recently scabbed over. I look at my status screen again and grunt in satisfaction. Turns out this healing spell is just that, a spell. My mana has dropped by 10 points, but because of my regeneration of 75 units per hour, it takes less than a minute before it's already climbing. Plus, my health points have ticked up to 27. Not a bad trade when considering the vastly different regeneration rates. 10 mana points for 5 health points. I cast the healing spell again, this time deliberately not concentrating on my wounds. As a result, I feel a much more diluted coolness spread across my body. My arm injury improves a little, but it's barely perceptible. However, the punctures in my leg and the aches in my arm, heck, all over my body, really, improve significantly. I check my status screen again and make a curious noise. Huh? That's interesting. Despite casting the same spell, I've got different results. The spell took the same amount of mana to cast, dropping my reserve by 10, but my health points only ticked up by 3 this time. Is that because the effect was more diluted by being spread across my body, or because I wasn't focusing on the more serious wound? I continue casting the spell until I bottom out my reserve. Then I bite my lip, maybe it's not actually a good idea to empty my tank, clearly. I can't know that another life or death fight isn't around the corner. I make a mental note to keep at least 10 points of mana available in reserve at all times. Unless, of course, that final cast means the difference between life and death immediately. I'm not going to intentionally sabotage my chances of survival just because I want to keep a mana reserve. That would be stupid. By this point, the wound on my arm is just a red mark and the rest of my aches and pains are long gone. For a moment, my resentment at Nicholas's high-handed treatment of me fades away and is replaced by gratitude. Even back on earth I wouldn't have had access to something such as this. Mind, apart from a few specific contexts, I've never needed it either, but I wouldn't have turned down magical healing when I broke my arm falling off my bike or, no, I'm not going down that rabbit hole again, not so close to a flashback. I suddenly wonder what kind of world Nicholas lives in where he can so casually send me a stone which teaches something like this. Or maybe it's not so casual, maybe this was an heirloom which he sent me. I shrug. No point wondering about it now. If I survive the year, I'll be able to ask the guy myself. And now, I have more important concerns like finishing up here and finding a decent place to shelter for the night before dark comes again. Opening my inventory, I pull out the spear I made last night. Much good it did me sitting in some extra dimensional space. I resolve to keep it closer to hand, apparently I'll never know when I'm about to be attacked in this hellish place. About two hours later, I'm ready to go. The bird carcass has been butchered to the best of my ability, which is simultaneously a lot higher than I thought it was and a lot lower than I'd hoped. I've cooked up some chunks which I've split into two unequal piles, one for my pocket to eat during the day and one for my inventory. Through trial and error, I've realized that my inventory isn't as simple as cooked meat stacks and uncooked meat stacks. Pieces that are too distinct from each other count separately, for example a slice of meat and a joint containing a bone. Interestingly, removing the bone worked to make the joint into a slice of meat equivalent. Equally, each of the organs counts as its own separate item. Not that this matters too much to me, i already decided not to bother with them for now as there's no guarantee that the organs don't contain concentrations of something which could make me ill, or even be lethal. Still, I experimented with them just to know. I've also decided not to take the bones with me since, 
although they could be useful for various graphs, I need to establish myself first and loading up my inventory with things for later seems like a stupid thing to do. Actually, if my ex-girlfriend could see me now, she'd be amazed, I've always been the kind of person to keep things for later. I have, had, whole boxes full of things kept for years because they might come in handy later. And just to say, some of them did come in useful, just not the majority, by far. Anyway. Clearly this new world and way of existence is having its effect on me already. I also decide to leave the corpses of those nasty crocodile things behind, again, although technically I could use their hides and their bones and their organs etc. It just isn't worth the time or the effort. Everything I can harvest from them, I could harvest from other creatures. Right now, I have more important things to be doing. So, already feeling like I've done a day's work despite the sun only being halfway towards its zenith. I set off downstream. The forest is beautiful. I have to admit it. For a time, despite the difficult night I had and the attack that I barely lived through this morning, I can't help but admire the natural beauty of my surroundings. The trees are bigger than those I'm used to, and the foliage is completely different, but there's something about walking through a forest next to a babbling brook that touches a part within me. I'm reminded of why I started bird watching. At one point I used to work next to a forest and would take a walk through it during my break. One of my colleagues, a girl I kinda had a crush on at the time, accompanied me a couple of times and could identify every one of them. In order to seem smarter, I actually did some research and tried to surprise her with little facts. The crush never went anywhere, but it gave birth to an interest in the little flying creatures that share our world with us. Anyway, that's a long way of saying that I actually found myself enjoying the walk surprisingly. Of course, given the fact that I've been attacked twice in two days, I don't allow my new appreciation to stop me from keeping an eye on my surroundings. Fortunately for me, it seems like animals aren't so thick in this neighborhood that I'm tripping across them every hour. The stream grows over time, deepening and widening as tributaries join it. Greenery starts appearing on its bed protected from the strong currents by rocks that break up the flow. The land continues sloping downwards and the river starts to cut through parts of the earth rather than just flowing over it, having gained enough weight to actually start making a real difference to its environment. I greet the new change with gladness as my survival knowledge tells me that this increases the chance of finding flint nodules, or potentially even other, rarer, metal deposits. Not that I really hope for that, even if I do find iron or something, I'm in no way equipped to do anything with it, and won't be for a long time. The stream cuts more and more into the land until it's actually starting to drop as water falls at points. In one of the pools formed, I see the silver flash of fish and take a mental note of the area. Interestingly, when I check my map afterwards, the stream has been added, and at the spot near where I'm standing, there's a little symbol which looks like a fish. Maybe I can add things to the map intentionally. It's worth experimenting with later. But since I don't know if it's possible to remove things once added, I'd rather wait until there's something I genuinely want to add to it. Since I can't see anything nearby which could be a particularly good shelter, I continue on for a while later until the sun is past its highest point and my stomach is rumbling. I take a seat with my back against a rock near the stream. The rock has been sitting in the sun and feels very pleasant against my back. My inventory newly replenished with food, I allow myself to eat my fill. Of course, the combination of the sun's warmth, my full belly, and the poor night I had last night has a soporific effect and it doesn't take long before my eyelids start drooping. Just a few minutes, I tell myself, shifting into a lying down position and closing my eyes. I'll get moving soon, just five minutes to relax. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 12, Now, Before I wake feeling disorientated, my muddled brain taking a few moments to straighten things out. I'm staring up at the sun or at least, at the sun through the dappling effect of layers upon layers of leaves. Large, green leaves attach to trees. The effect is beautiful, but I soon realize that there's something wrong as I'm struggling to breathe, a constriction having tightened around my chest. My tentative thoughts of perhaps having a premature heart attack are soon put to rest as I see the real reason I woke up from my post-brandial nap, a large snake, or snake-like creature has wrapped itself around my body and is squeezing rather uncomfortably. As I start struggling a little instinctively, it reacts by swiftly burying its fangs into my shoulder, the pain knifing through me every time it constricts a little more. I sure hope this variety isn't venomous, I think as my mind races, my fear transforming into anger like a burning ember becoming a bonfire. Get the hell off me, 
I shout, or wheeze rather as it's already constricting around my ribs rather hard. Fortunately for me, I never sleep in a corpse pose dash ironic, as that's exactly what I would be in a few minutes if I did, and I've also learned to keep my knife handy by now. My spear too, but that's unlikely to help much right now. My right arm is trapped which isn't ideal, but I've learned in the last few days that I'm fairly ambidextrous when it's my life at stake. I grab the knife next to my head with my left arm and stab at its nearest coil. The position is awkward and if I'm not careful, I'll stab myself instead of the snake. Of course, the anger makes it difficult to be precise. At the same time, it does make each blow stronger. Just as my restricted oxygen starts impacting my vision, I feel something give under my knife. The majority of the snake body goes limp. I start wriggling, trying to push the dead weight off me even while the head is still hanging on in there. Succeeding in freeing myself after a good few minutes, I pull the head of the snake off in disgust and stamp on it to make sure it's dead. Take an afternoon nap in a murder forest. Great idea Sherlock, I say sarcastically to myself as I stand there panting with the effort. Well, I suppose I'm not feeling sleepy or muddle-minded anymore. Adrenaline, better than coffee. Casting lay on hands, I watch as the two stab marks from the snake's fangs heal over before my eyes. Within a short moment, my skin is unmarked. In some ways the instant heal is almost disorientating. My mind thinks the injury is still there even as my eyes say something different. There are things I could do with a dead snake and I've got a few spaces free in my inventory so I just stick it in there. I hope that what they say about snake meat tasting like chicken is right, if I ever get hungry enough to try it out. The area clear, I just take the few steps to the river to have a drink and rinse my hands. Time to go. I've been asleep for longer than I wanted. Checking to make sure I haven't left anything important behind. I continue walking downstream. The forest is still bright and deceptively peaceful. I find it hard to relax, though, waking up to a giant snake trying to kill me is not a way to find my inner calm. Even with the adrenaline gone, I'm still antsy, jumping at every rustle and crack. Man, I need to find some way to control this or I'm going to go mad in days. And I can't afford to go mad. Losing my sanity means losing my reason and losing my reason means dying. I don't want to die. It seems so ironic considering where I was standing only a few days ago, but if this deceptively peaceful battleground has taught me anything, it's that my desire for survival is a lot stronger than my desire for death. When I consider the emotions driving me to the roof of my apartment not long ago, I can only laugh grimly at the naive idiot I was then, how life has changed in such a short time. Now, despite my attempts to keep an eye on my surroundings, I still end up being attacked by the pack of Weezeters. After I've given myself some time for my health, mana, and stamina to refill, I pull myself out of my reminiscences and continue walking. I need a shelter, after all. With all the dangerous situations I've encountered so far in this world, I'm really feeling a desperate need to have somewhere safe where I can relax. Whether I'll be able to find something suitable in the next few days, I don't know but I can't help feeling that my sanity's on a bit of a knife's edge. The few weeks before ending up this world were far from stable or good for my mental state. Being in constant life-death encounters is only degrading my sense of well-being even further. The stream continues and the waterfalls start getting higher and higher. I find a couple of caves created by the backsplash of the waterfalls, but quickly decide that they're unsuitable for shelter. They're not big enough and I, and all my stuff, would just be permanently wet. As the stream descends, river now really, more and more fish start crowding the pools, and more and more animals the banks. Well, not crowding, exactly, but in the first three hours of my walk, I only saw two animals come to drink, and that was a pair of deer-like creatures. In the last hour, I saw about ten, and one of those was clearly a predator hunting the others. I pause at this point, hesitating over the decision I need to make. Should I carry on, despite there being more animals? and therefore more risk of encountering something I can't handle. The Weezeters that swarmed me not long ago are proof that I could hit something that's too much for me or that's too numerous for me to be able to cope with. Or should I carry on because I still haven't found anything suitable for a shelter? The snake, after all, was proof of why a proper shelter is an absolute must. Not to mention the many crocodiles this morning though there I suppose I was dealing with a corpse. It's not surprising other animals were attracted to the sight. It's a hard decision. I haven't found anything I could easily turn into a shelter, which means I'd need to either build my own, or go looking elsewhere. Building a shelter will take time, time in which I am not protected at my most vulnerable. Also, 
To build a proper shelter will take tools which I don't have, meaning I need to spend even more time ahead creating the tools, and the tools to make the tools. Sure, there are some quick build shelters I now have in my memory, but they're equally not particularly protective, not even from weather. Looking elsewhere without going downstream means leaving the water edge. I'm not keen to do this because I know water is going to be so essential to so many of my pursuits, and running water is even more useful. However, going downstream brings me back to my initial fear, that of encountering a predator which is much better at killing me than I am at killing it. Sighing, I decide to stop for the day. It's already almost time for sundown, and I'd rather have the time to build a little shelter for myself tonight. It will be better in terms of both warmth and protection, especially given the proximity of potential predators. I'll think about the dilemma overnight and hopefully come to a conclusion by the morning. All of which poses the question, what kind of shelter and where should I build it? Book 1, Leap, Chapter 13, Vigilance Making a decision that a shelter right next to the river doesn't seem like the best of ideas, I start looking for a spot a little more distant. I don't know what creatures come to drink here so putting myself close enough for them to catch my scent would not be a smart move. I settle on a spot among the trees about 50 meters away from the river, close enough to easily avail myself of the fresh water, far enough that I shouldn't be within easy hearing or sight range as long as I'm quiet and hidden. Which brings me on to my next job. First, I find a tree with a crook just a bit more than a meter above the ground. Piling dead leaves into a cushion, I then lay one of my coats over the mattress. Searching for a long branch. I find one that's about two and a half meters long. Perfect. I prop it up in the crook of the tree to make the backbone of my shelter. Next, I hunt for some smaller sticks which I prop up against the tree as its ribs. Continuing with smaller and smaller branches and then twigs, I flush at the walls of my shelter. After that, I find some dead, low-growing plants that look rather similar to bracken. To put the final touches on my makeshift shelter. I pile as many dead leaves over the whole structure as I possibly can. My memories tell me that this should be a pretty warm shelter and it will even stand up to a light rainfall. It won't be much use against a heavy downpour, or elongated rain, nor can it protect me if something decides to come investigating. Still, I have to hope that the plethora of natural materials will disguise my scent enough to make the structure completely uninteresting. It may seem pretty simple to make, and really, in terms of required skill and tools. It was, but it's taken me enough time that the sun is already setting by the time I'm done, and I'm exhausted. I've never done this much physical work, and I think gloomily of how much more I have ahead of myself. I try to jolly myself in thinking that I'll soon be a supermodel, but that doesn't work when I know I've got a good year before I'm going to see anyone. I dine on bird flesh, which is pretty tasty and a few of the beans. It's more satisfying than my previous night's super and the temptation to go back for more isn't so pressing. I'm cheered further by the discovery that the meat is still hot, clear evidence that time doesn't pass in my inventory, or passes very slowly. After washing up, drinking from the stream and filling up my canteen, and then relieving myself, I decide to go to bed. No doubt it's not much later than 7 or 8 p.m., an hour I would normally be spending on watching TV, or working but I'm bushed. There's little for me to do once the light disappears anyway. I still don't have a torch and I haven't lit a fire. Sliding into my shelter feet first, I pull another coat over me and then pile more leaves in the opening, almost blocking it off completely. Despite my memories telling me that it would be the case, I'm still surprised at how quickly the temperature rises in my little cocoon of leaves, and how comfortable it is. Much better than the previous night of lying directly on the cold ground with one side freezing and the other burning. It increases my desire to create a proper shelter in which I can be both comfortable and somewhat safe. I actually sleep pretty well in the end. Certainly far better than last night. Sure, I wake up a couple of times when something comes snuffling too close for comfort to my shelter and once my heart started pounding when I realized that the beast was probably less than a meter away from my face. Fortunately for me, it didn't come any closer, so I made it through the night, face intact. I hurt, though, my muscles protesting at the amount of unusual effort they've been subjected to. Casting a lay on hands, I sigh with relief as the aching subsides. Munching on bird flesh and beans again, I have plans for the seaweed. I check my status screen. Nothing much has changed. The energy I've accumulated just by surviving has pushed my progress to the next level to 15%, but that's all. Slightly disappointed, I'm about to close the screen when I notice something else, 
the amount of energy being absorbed per hour has increased from 5 to 7 units. I decide to keep checking at different intervals during the day as I walk to see if it increases further. Then, with a bit of dismay, I realize I forgot to absorb another knowledge stone yesterday. Damn it. An opportunity wasted. Still, maybe it's not so bad. I hadn't realized how much time it would take for the knowledge from the previous stone to settle. I only really started feeling more comfortable with it when I began putting some of the methods into practice. Building this shelter was actually really useful for that. It makes me question the order in which I should absorb the stones. Tracking would probably be the most useful one next as, even if I'm not intending on actually hunting creatures for now, knowing which areas to avoid would be quite good information. As for the hunting stone. Originally I planned for that to be my third knowledge stone, but as it is I've got enough food for a good few days and, frankly, I haven't got any tools for hunting. Not that I've done it before, but I can't imagine that a knife alone will be much use. No, I'm going to have to invest time into making tools, which means I need to have a stable home base. As a result, that pushes hunting down the priority list, possibly by as much as two weeks. Food will be getting a bit low by then, even if I miss lunch. But maybe if I test some of the local foliage I'll find some bits to supplement the meat. Suddenly I regret eating the bird meat as otherwise now would be a perfect time to start the test. Sighing, I once more push my regret to one side, reminding myself that it won't help anything. Even so, I can't help the way it brings my mood down. Still, I think, trying to cheer myself up, I've been attacked every day so far. No reason that that should change. Meals on wheels. Then I wonder why I even considered that the thought of regularly being attacked would actually cheer me up instead of depressing me more. Forcing myself to think of something else, I tentatively decide to absorb the system lore stone tomorrow. While it isn't necessarily something with immediate application, it might hold some key secrets to my new existence, without which I will make some, more, unforgivable mistakes. The tracking stone ends up not being as information heavy as the wilderness survival one and I manage to escape with just a bad headache that eases fairly quickly. It does make me look at the world differently, though. Things which had previously been simple marks now transformed into indications of various animals passage. I look at the ground near my shelter and find the tracks of whatever animal came close last night. Just from the marks it left behind, I can tell it's some sort of small pig or boar about 50 kilograms in weight, perhaps, rooting through the leaves in search of food. Getting closer, I sniff and my nose picks up some muskiness. Probably a young male, alone. My mouth waters a bit as I think about bacon. Shame that's still a long way off. Right. No time to waste. I've got a lot to do and the day is only so long. After packing my coats back into my inventory, I walk to the stream for a drink and quick Washington, filling my water skin. I drink deeply and then refill it. Looking thoughtfully at the pond weed, I wonder if I can actually start testing it for edibility. Not by eating it, but just by testing whether it is irritating on contact. I figure that if I just let it touch my skin, I shouldn't be risking it interacting with what I've already eaten. Plus, if there is any irritation, I know it will be the plant as I've eaten both bird meat and beans with no ill effects. Deciding that it's a good idea. I reach in and snag a leaf. Fortunately, this stuff is pretty common, so if it turns out I can eat it, I'll have plenty of supply in the pools particularly. First, I inspect the leaf. It doesn't have any telltale signs which often indicate poison, it doesn't have hairs, nor does it exude milky or almond smelling sap. It's not brightly colored either. Though, of course, those signs might mean nothing in this strange world which is why I'll have to be careful with the next steps. I rub the leaf against the skin of my inner forearm, at first gently. Waiting for a few minutes for any initial symptoms to emerge, I look around myself. It's another beautiful day, though this one is a bit more humid than the previous. Fingers of fog drift between the trees, though are nowhere near thick enough to block out the sun. Birds are chirping, and I can see a couple of animals downstream drinking. They're those deer analogs again. I say deer analogs because they have long legs and slim bodies and are pretty graceful and quick to jump away when danger threatens. That seems to be the end to their similarities, though, as they seem to be reptilian in type. Though, they're moving pretty fast, could they be warm-blooded? Is it possible? Lizards would normally be moving slowly at this time of the morning, not having had the chance to warm up in the sun. A question for later. Time's up. I check my skin carefully, looking for any hint of irritation or tingling. Nothing. This time, I rub the leaf more vigorously on my skin, 
making sure to get some of the sap from inside the leaves on me. Again, I wait for a few minutes by the stream, just in case there's a quick reaction which requires me to wash the area off pronto. After the minutes have gone by with nothing appearing, I drop the leaf in satisfaction. I'd better leave 8 hours just to see if there's any further change, but if all goes well, I'll eat a small amount of this tomorrow morning. Of course, that assumes there will be more pondweed wherever I am by tomorrow morning, but I saw a fair bit of it yesterday, so I have to hope that the trend holds true. So thinking, I set off downstream. While I walk, I take the time to notice all the little marks of animal passage. Here's an imprint in the mud at the edge of the stream, a small animal, perhaps up to 10 kilograms in weight, alone. There's the mark of a predator sharpening its claws on a tree, an ambush predator, most likely, possibly one that uses the treetops as its coverage. I look up, reflexively flinching back. There's nothing up there, but it does remind me to keep watching all around myself, not just the field of vision at eye level. My vigilance gives me enough warning to cover my face with my arm when the attack does come. Something swings at me and I dodge out of the way blindly. Stumbling away, I chance a look and see, something. It's really weird. A formless moss clinging to the branch above me with a long spiky tail that it had swung down on me. How am I supposed to fight that thing? I can't reach its body, not even with my spear, and I'm not going anywhere near that tail. The way the light glints wetly on the spikes make me wonder if they're coated in some sort of poison. I watch it warily as it curls its tail up, and then, goes still. Is it some one-hit wonder, or something? Maybe. It's certainly not trying to pursue me, just lying there in wait for its next potential prey. Seriously weird? I think to myself, shaking my head as I cautiously move away. If I had some sort of long distance weapon, I'd probably try and take it on. I'm not keen on leaving creatures that have tried to kill me alive to try again in the future. Unfortunately, that would take more time than I really want to waste. I'd rather just keep going. Live and let live. But I'll keep my eyes on the trees above, that's for sure. Rock dropping birds, mini crocodiles, ambushing black blobs. What other weirdness does this new world have to threaten me with? Book 1, Leap, Chapter 14, Skin of My Teeth About when the sun hits its zenith, I decide to stop for a quick bite of lunch. Bird meat, again, of course. I hesitate, but ultimately don't eat any more of the beans. I only have a handful left and I'm hoping that since they have only been dried, not cooked, they might actually grow. According to my new encyclopedia of plant knowledge, some of the beans only take about four weeks to grow to flowering stage, and then another week after that to produce beans. Less than that in an energy dense area. I don't know whether 7 units per day counts as high or low energy for an area, but I guess it's worth a shot. I doubt these beans would grow on earth at all. Having paused for a short time, I suddenly realize that there's a bit of a nagging feeling, like I've forgotten something, or that I need to check something. My brow furrowing, I think through my tasks for the day. What could I be forgetting? I concentrate on the feeling and am suddenly hit by inspiration. Opening my status, I see what the cause of the feeling is, I've got a new message. Briefly taking note of the rise in my energy accumulation, up to 17%, I mentally click on the message box and select the new message. Congratulations, you have worked hard on your endurance and have earned a point. Would you like to apply this to your status? Why in hell, yes, I think. Eagerly agreeing, a surge of energy goes through me and I see the 5 in my status screen next to strength tick up to 6. That makes me frown a little in confusion, I thought I got the point in endurance, but then there is no endurance in my status screen. I then also note that my stamina maximum has increased to 30 from 20. Does that mean that endurance is a subcategory of strength? Well, I suppose it must be. Being able to move and continue moving for a long time is primarily due to muscle conditioning right? Then what's the other subcategory? I guess there has to be one because my stamina went up by 10 by adding a point, but I only have 30 stamina for 6 points. Force? Liftability? I also see something else which makes my frown deepen. My progress to the next level had been 17% before, now it's 2%. Had upgrading my strength, endurance actually eaten into my progress? That settles it. I think grimly. I need to absorb the system lore stone next. But that will have to wait for tomorrow. And now, I need to keep going. It's getting late. I need to choose a place to stop for tonight, but I still haven't found anything promising in terms of shelter. I'm beginning to think that creating my own shelter is going to have to be my choice, but I haven't quite given up yet. One more day, 
I figure. Tonight I guess it's going to be another dead leaf shelter, if I can even summon up the energy to do that much, I'm tired. It's been a long day of walking, being wary, and the odd fight or almost fight. In the afternoon, I was attacked three times, three times more than in the morning. If nothing else, it's proof that the increasing energy density, which my status screen attests to, also means increased density of creatures. It's at that moment that I realize I've stopped paying enough attention to my surroundings. The hairs stand up on the back of my neck and I freeze in place. In the last 48 hours I've learned to listen to my instincts. It's fortunate I did. An ambush hits the spot where I would have been standing an instant later. The attacker comes close enough that I feel the brush of its whiskers on my slightly outstretched hand. For one moment it feels like we're suspended in time. I stare at the creature, and it stares back at me with golden, vertically slit eyes. I gain a sense of the creature in that snapshot of time and it's one of the least reptilian I've come across so far. It actually looks rather like a big cat, a lion or tiger or something similar but its nose is a bit more elongated and its tail is a plume of feathers. It also has wings, though they're clearly not anywhere near big enough to fly with, only spanning about a foot or two in length where the animal itself is about three or four feet long. It has four legs, and mottled brown, beige, and black fur transforms into scaly, clawed legs and feet about halfway down. The claws are more reminiscent of a bird of prey than a cat's but the shape of the foot is clearly designed to run rather than grasp. All that passes through my head in the unmoving instant when I am practically nose to nose with a predator which probably outweighs me, and is definitely stronger than I am. The moment passes and I whip my hand back to grab my knife as the rapture cat lunges towards me. At the same time as grabbing my knife, I dodge to one side, only just avoiding the bite. It's almost not far enough, and the rapture cat manages to snag the edge of my jacket even that unintentional yank almost pulling me off balance. I gulp, seriously thinking about trying to run. The problem with that is that the raptor cat is probably faster than I am. As the raptor cat wheels about to launch another attack, I jab at it with my spear. The one-handed attempt is more than clumsy, but it makes the raptor cat flinch which gives me enough space to stab at it with my trusty knife. Unfortunately, I don't hit it, but the attempt still makes it duck sideways. I wheel around, backing away a bit which helps me to mostly avoid its next lunge. Its teeth catch for a moment in my shirt and I take advantage to stab it in its eye. It lets go and backs away, shrieking loudly and I wince at both the piercing sound and in sympathy for the pain. In response to its cry, a series of snarls rumbles out, from the trees around me. My stomach dropping, I dare to dart a glance around me to either side since my opponent is currently crouched down and rubbing at its damaged eye with one foreleg, whimpering a bit. To my horror. I see five other shapes, only discernible from the trees around because I now know what I'm looking for. I've walked straight into a trap. To hell with this, I'm not confident about my odds against one of these beasts. No way can I do anything about six of them. Frantically, my mind flashes through the, few, options which could possibly extricate me from this dire situation. I don't want to die, a voice whimpers in my head. I growl at it mentally. Much good the sentiment will do me now. Then like a lifeline thrown to a drowning man, I have the spark of an idea. It's a chance, which is more than I could say about staying here. Backing away slowly from the approaching predators, I suddenly make a break for it when one of them looks like it's about to leap at me. Zigzagging, dodging right, dodging left, and running all the way, I no longer feel exhaustion weighing down my limbs. No. Instead they light with fiery ants crawling under my skin at the thought of those horrible teeth sinking into me at any moment. My spear snags briefly on a bush I run past so I drop it rather than risk it slowing me down. It's one weapon less, but it's not going to do me much good against six of these predators. Run 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 run. It's all I can think about. The snarling beasts at my heels are getting closer. I don't dare take my attention off the way ahead of me to see how close they are. In fact, I'm not sure I want to know but I can tell from the sound of jaws snapping all too close to my precious body that they are entirely too close for comfort. It's only been a few seconds since I started running, maybe half a minute at the most, but if nothing changes, they're going to succeed in bringing me down within the next 30 seconds. I leap over logs, dodge trees, avoid sliding in mud by the skin of my teeth, my terror gives my feet wings, but I know it can't last. As if it had heard my thoughts, one of the beasts leaps forwards just a little faster and its teeth catch in the back of my shirt. Fortunately for me, it's only barely, and when the beast yanks back, 
Its teeth rip a hole in my clothes rather than tug me off my feet. It still makes me stumble a bit. A new wave of cold fear goes through me and I manage to turn the slight stumble into a jink around a tree, but I'm already fading. I surpassed fear what feels like ages ago, my mind falling into outright panic, but somehow the terror in my thoughts still is able to kick up a level. I'm not going to make it, I'm out of breath and even the adrenaline-fueled strength powering my limbs is running out. Where is it? My eyes frantically scan everywhere around me, looking for the only thing that could possibly offer me survival to see another dawn. There. No sooner have I seen the hole between a tree's roots than I throw myself towards it, hoping that it's deep enough, and has no other occupant worse than the pack of raptor cats behind me. The entrance is tight and I throw my knife forwards rather than risk it snagging and preventing me from moving. I have to wiggle and heave myself forwards to get my shoulders through, and then again to get my bum in. Of course, with the beasts so close at my heels, that means I don't go unscathed. I feel the agony of teeth closing in my flesh, and it's only by applying my full strength that I tear myself free and succeed in pulling myself into the hole that's barely bigger than my own body curled up. Of course, I leave a chunk of my leg behind so I quickly cast lay on hands three times in succession to stop the bleeding and start healing the wound. The raptor cats aren't going to let go of their prey so easily. A snarling head appears in the hole and snaps at me, its four legs scrabbling at the ground. I snarl back at it, completely done for today and stab at it continuously with my knife. After gaining several wounds without even reaching its prey, the raptor cat backs off with an aggrieved growl. A new head takes its place and I repeat the same actions with the same result. By the time three of them have backed off, and I guess one of the other three which are part of the same pack is the one I've already wounded, the group of raptor cats seem to give me up as a bad job. Pack? Maybe I should say pride with how feline the creatures seem to be based on my brief look. With some more angry noises, I hear the pride set off. Even when it's gone silent out there, I don't move. First of all, the creatures have already proven themselves master ambushers, what's to say that they're not setting a trap for me now? Secondly, I'm not in a fit state to fight off any other attackers. There's no way the predators of this godforsaken world would pass up the chance to have a nice bloody and limping human for super. Besides, this little space isn't so terrible, and I did need a shelter. In fact, I consider even making this into a more permanent one but then decide against it. The fact that it hasn't been claimed by something else indicates there's a problem. In fact that's why I didn't investigate it earlier when I saw the hollow. I thought it might already have an occupant and had no desire to risk starting another fight. Besides, if it ever rains in this place, it probably floods. Still, it will do a good enough job for tonight. After all that excitement, I just lie in the little burrow, recovering. I cast lay on hands until my wounds heal. Then take advantage of the time to drink a bit from my canteen and chew a few chunks of cooked meat, I need it to replace the blood I've lost. Not to mention needing the time to mentally recover from, once more, staring death in the eyes. While I lie there quietly, I decide that if I don't find a place tomorrow which will make a decent shelter, I'll give up and make one. Clearly I'm starting to get into areas which are too dangerous for me to venture into. Still. Maybe I should make sure I'm not near raptor cat territory when I do choose a spot. One bright spot, though, I've earned a point to dexterity. Accepting the point means leveling up is further away, gaining a point might mean the difference between life or death if I meet another raptor cat tomorrow. Should I take it or not? Book 1, Leap, Chapter 15. So, what is this all about? The next morning dawns bright and early but I'm fully awake seconds after opening my eyes. As I learned from my snake alarm the day before yesterday, a near-death experience is just as good a stimulant as a strong espresso. This time it's a horrific cross between a snake and a millipede which makes me shriek at a pitch far higher than I would ever willingly admit to. But honestly, who could stay quiet when waking up to a long, thick creature with sharp legs wrapping its body around you? and burying its sharp fangs in your thigh as soon as you start to move. Fortunately, or not depending on how you look at it, I've been in so many of these life-death situations by this point that I don't have to have my brain fully supplied with oxygen in order to know what to do. Grabbing my knife with my right hand, I try to gain some sort of purchase on the creature's body with my left, pulling it away from me as hard as I can. Bringing the blade up to counter-attack. I shout again in pain as this makes the fangs buried in me shift. Gritting my own teeth, I stab upwards at its body, 
trying to get between the hardened scaly armor to reach the softer flesh below. It's a race between whether I will get in deep enough to damage something vital, or blood loss from my mini, mini wounds will take me down first. I cast lay on hands quickly, which helps, the slices in my skin aren't very deep, but they are bleeding rather heavily and there are just so many of them. All the while, I keep jabbing my knife finally managing to knock off a scale and stab into the flesh of the beast. By this point, the snow Pete has decided that I'm too tough as potential prey, and tries to make good its escape. I grit my teeth at the feeling of sharp feet pulling their way out of wounds, the small barbs on them doing even more damage. It's fast, all those legs a real advantage, but I'm faster. Or at least, I've stacked the deck to my advantage by grabbing its tail before it can completely disengage. It whips around to attack me again but this time I'm ready. I grab its head and shift so I can put my knee on it, stabbing again and again into the small patch which lost its scale. Bend by its tail and head, it writhes as much as it can, but not enough to make any difference to its fate. By the time it stops writhing and just twitches, clearly already dead and just waiting for the muscle spasms to catch up with reality, I'm panting and weak. Collapsing to a half-sitting, half-lying position next to my attacker, I spam cast lay on hands fighting against unconsciousness. I lose the battle eventually, blood loss taking its toll, but I've, hopefully, got myself past the most dangerous point. I just hope nothing comes to take advantage while I'm almost out of it. Fortunately, I never lose consciousness completely, nor does anything attack me while I'm helpless. I guess still being mostly protected in the hollow under the tree helps. It does confirm my decision that this is no good as a potential shelter. Though, I'm glad I decided to take the dexterity point last night, even if it cleaned me out of energy, who knows whether my new fine motor control was part of what enabled me to kill this new foe. My weakness passes after a time, my multiple casts of lay on hands both healing my wounds and helping me replenish my blood supply as I gnaw on bird meat and drink water to supply the nutrients. After some experience through the last few fights I've concluded that lay on hands can't magically, ha, huh, produce blood. But if I eat something while casting it, it will convert the nutrients and what I'm eating to blood. When I'm feeling better, I push myself to my feet and shove the beast corpse in my inventory. I figure that those legs will be useful as fish hooks at some point, considering the backwards pointing barbs which made such a mess of me. Sighing a little at the blood covering me and the numerous rents in my clothing, I crawl out of the burrow and head towards the river. I reckon these clothes are no good for anything more than bandage strips when properly sterilized, or cleaning rags. My trousers are ripped in several places from the rapture cats last night, and my shirt and jumper have been torn to pieces by this latest attack. This world sure is hard on clothing. Much more of this and I'll be reduced to wearing hides of the animals I've killed like a proper wildman, despite having brought half my wardrobe with me. After cleaning up, I eat some more bird meat. It's getting a bit boring, but I'll take boring over hunger, so there's that. Then, deciding that as long as I'm careful I should be able to absorb the next stone. Sitting near the water is as safe as I'm going to get right now so I take out the system knowledge stone to absorb. Compared to the other stones I've absorbed, I'd say it's probably between the wilderness survival stone and the tracking stone in terms of mental load, probably more towards the tracking stone than the other direction. Unlike the tracking stone, it's not because of breadth, but depth. And, I think the fact that it's also new makes it harder. Actually. I know that now. I, suddenly understand why I had to wait a day between each stone. In fact, I really should have waited more, especially between the first and the second stone. I feel a surge of regret inside me at the thought of the amount of knowledge I probably missed from the second and third stones because the first was still settling in. Shame joins it when I realize that Nicholas obviously didn't think my intelligence score would be as low as 6. He was probably expecting it to be 8 or 9. That would be sufficient to allow for one stone per day, though only just. Still, I'm glad that I absorbed this stone now, hopefully it will stop me making stupid mistakes like that again. For certain, I'm not going to absorb the hunting stone for at least two days. That should be enough time for my new knowledge to settle and my mind to be ready to accept further information. Standing up, I set off downstream again, my mind going over my new knowledge even as I keep a watch out around myself for potential attackers. So, what is this all about? In short, energy. I suddenly understand the concept far better than I ever did before. Actually, the idea in itself is nothing groundbreaking, when I had thought about energy before, I'd gone back to my school days in physics class, 
you know, kinetic energy, potential energy, chemical energy, etc., and indeed, these are indeed forms of energy, but peripheral ones, something like the aftershocks of an earthquake rather than the earthquake itself. The fact is that Earth doesn't seem to have energy energy, or if it does, it has it in such small quantities that we don't notice it. Or maybe it's what we would consider miracles? I don't know. Anyway, that's not relevant. The point is, this energy is ever-present in the world from which Nicholas comes, and, given he sent me here to collect it, I have to assume the same is the case in my present world. By itself, energy flows in and out, around and through everything, but seems to particularly collect in living creatures. The higher the intelligence level, the more energy collected, which explains why intelligence is the modifier for my mana pool. Though, on that point, the reason why wisdom is the modifier for mana regeneration is because energy and mana are not the same thing, just as the food we eat, chemical energy, has to be converted into kinetic energy for our muscles to move, so mana has to be converted from energy. That said, I'm still a bit unsure as to why wisdom would be the modifier. Either I've lost that bit of knowledge by absorbing the stone at the wrong time or it was never present in the stone to begin with. So, energy collects in everything, but living beings especially. The problem is that living beings can't do anything about that. What? But then what was that whole thing about intelligence and wisdom? Apparently, that is where classes come in. When I absorbed the class stone, I absorbed more than a status screen and skills. I absorbed a metaphysical structure and storage container that's interdimensional in a way that makes my mind tie itself in knots even considering thinking about it, let alone actually pondering on it. I quickly stop, I know where my limits are, and most hard sciences at any significant depth are beyond them. The storage container accumulates energy, either through natural absorption, which I guess is my 7 units an hour, actually, 8 now, or when I kill another living creature. Apparently part of the energy held by the victim goes to its killer while the majority is lost to the world around. So that accounts for the hikes in energy I've gained from my life death encounters. Fun fact, apparently a little energy remains in the flesh of the creature for an hour or so after its death, and so eating it within then time can increase energy gain. Extra fun fact, some parts of the body, like the organs, are more energy dense than others and special preparation can increase the amount of energy absorbed multiple times. So maybe I shouldn't have ditched the bird's organs and the corpses of the Weezers. At least I still have the corpse of that weird scaled rabbit which attacked me soon after lunch yesterday. That one in particular was a bit of a nightmare, giving me flashbacks to watching an iconic film years ago. Despite almost seeming like a harmless herbivore, it had had two sets of razor sharp teeth that latched painfully into my arm. It would have bitten out my throat if I hadn't caught a flash of movement out of the corner of my eye and managed to get my arm there in time. No way was the creature going to get away without being eaten after that. I take far too much pleasure at the thought of cooking the wretched creature on a spit. By the time I pinned it down to kill it, I was bleeding heavily in five places. Then again, Apparently whatever the inventory is made of is rather anathema to energy. My stones were okay there because they are stable, self-contained weaves of energy. Fortunate, as the thought that I might have inadvertently wiped my soul hopes of survival like a hotel key card put too close to a mobile phone makes my stomach swoop unpleasantly. Something as unstable as uncooked meat, however, stands no chance. Key point to take home, immediately cook and eat organs of worthy foes if at all possible but accept that my supply of emergency food in my inventory is not going to improve my energy stores in any way. I suddenly wonder whether my phone or Kindle have been badly affected by being put in the inventory. Deciding that the answer to that question is worth using a bit of battery, I pause, checking around myself first for danger, then dig in my backpack and pull out my phone. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 16, Killer Chickens Holding down the power button, I find myself unconsciously holding my breath. The screen stays black for what seems to be far longer than normal, but just as I'm on the verge of giving up in disappointment, it turns on. I let out my breath with sigh of relief. Letting it low just to check everything's fine, it is, I turn it off after looking at the clock. Apparently it's past 4 pm, which means that either the days here are significantly shorter, a bit longer, or in the transition between worlds. I lost a lot of hours or gained a few. Again, I shrug, though consider briefly turning the phone on again around this time tomorrow just to see. So, my phone's still working, I say to myself thoughtfully. Is that because it was in the backpack, 
or is electrical energy not affected by the inventory space in the same way energy is, or is it because the energy is in a battery? Just another unanswerable question to join the list. I'm certainly not going to test whether it was protected by being in my backpack by putting it directly into my inventory. That said, I suppose that later I could test whether an organ loses less energy by being in a backpack. Something to think about later, I guess. One question I can answer now, though, is why I want to collect energy, and why my store went down by 15% for each point I accepted that increased a stat yesterday. It turns out that just as energy can be converted into mana, it can also be converted into any other form of energy. Sounds simple, right? Not so, having an overabundance of energy regardless of the type, is not necessarily helpful, and can in fact be detrimental. Turns out that even before the class system was discovered, humans in Nicholas' world had discovered various ways of storing energy and then using it to enhance their bodies. It seems they were trying to copy animals which appear to have a natural ability to use energy to develop themselves. Unfortunately for them, the average result looked more like a victim of serious radiation poisoning, or worse, cue the discovery of the class system. Though the stone's information didn't go into detail about who made the discovery or how, it was clear that this was a game changer. Now, instead of people essentially dumping energy into their bodies, and hoping that it would improve their bodies, the class structure transforms the energy into more appropriate forms and then directs it to improve the specific stats which the class user, aka classer, has chosen. Obviously, the way that each of these stats is improved depends on the stat. The three physical stats, strength, constitution, and dexterity, are improved by changes made to the physical structure of the body. Dexterity is about the capacity of fine motor skills, but also the flexibility of the body and, to a certain extent, its fast twitch muscles. Constitution is about the body's toughness, hence this stat being the basis of the body's health pool and is characterized by density of bones, thickness of skin, durability of organs, etc. Strength can go either towards high weight or long duration, in other words power versus endurance, or a balance between the two. I have the answer for why my strength is 6 but my stamina is 30. The work I did at the gym tended to be lifting as heavy weights as I could, encouraging the build of muscles towards power, rather than endurance. Meaning that when I arrived on this world, my ratio was skewed a bit more towards the former. Thanks to receiving the point yesterday, probably from all the walking I've been doing, I now have a balance between the two. Contrary to what I thought, there are not three mental stats, but two. Willpower is apparently a soul stat, and the information on how this is improved is missing. I just have to accept that the class system somehow uses energy to improve my willpower. Intelligence is easier to understand. Energy improves the physical structures of the brain, rendering the user more capable of forming and maintaining neural connections. In short, the higher my intelligence level, the more information I can absorb and access, as I'd already theorized. My thought process should become quicker and more streamlined and my memory improved. Little wonder that this stat determines when I should absorb a knowledge stone. Wisdom is another stat which is a little hard for me to conceptualize. It's something about the connection between me and my surroundings. Something to do with my aura? It makes me think of those new age 3 huggers when I think of aura, though I have to admit that magic wasn't exactly something I ever thought could exist so, I figure I'll see how things develop. Now, improving stats happens in two ways, on level up and after effort, the latter of which I've experienced. On level up is pretty obvious, every class comes with a certain number of stat points per level depending on the rarity of the class. The most common classes award 1 or 2 points per level, the most rare can offer up to 10. The stone doesn't seem to include a list of classes and their rarity and I can't find it anywhere in my status screen, so I guess I'll have to find out upon level up how many stat points I'll have available. It seems like it should go without saying that the more points awarded on level up, the better, right? Yes. But that's not the whole story. Improvements don't come for free. Take the other method of improving the body, actually putting some effort into it. For example, when I was offered the opportunity to improve my dexterity and then it used some of my stored energy. In essence, I had worked my body hard and had already made some improvements to my agility when learning the hard way how to dodge and keep ahead of a group of hungry predators. The class system in my body recognized that, 
and also recognize that I had sufficient energy stored to support the stat improvement. Upon agreeing to the improvement, the system took the energy and directed it to finishing off the improvement had already started. Had I refused the improvement, nothing would have happened. But after more time, perhaps another few days of work, I would have reached the same stage by myself and my dexterity stat would have grown to reflect that. In short, it's a shortcut, exchanging energy for time and effort. The same is true on level up, the whole reason I have to gather energy at all to level up is because I need to accumulate enough in order to support however many stat points I will use. Thus, the downside to rare classes, someone who has access to 10 stat points on level up will have to accumulate a lot more energy than someone with a very common class. Why not just get a common class and then work out to increase stat points independent of level ups? Then, apart from the other benefits to a rare class such as more powerful skills, there's one good reason, it costs more. Increasing stats on level up is more efficient than individually, and the more stats increased at one time, the more efficient the process is. It's like the body is already awash with energy, so only a little more is needed to effectuate change. No statistics are given, but I guess it's something like if 15 U is needed for a single stat to improve, then for 10 stats done at once, it's probably only 10 U each, or less. It's a little difficult to calculate as the amount of energy required to change each stat depends on a number of factors. These include, but are not limited to, how much potential my body has to improve, how much I have already improved the stat, and whether this was done naturally or with energy, and how much effort I've already put towards improving that stat without energy. All I know is that the system lore stone says that leveling up is a more efficient means of increasing stats than working out and then using stored energy to make up the difference. Anyway, there's also a limit to how much someone can raise their stats by working out, whether that's physically or mentally. At a certain point, the human body is incapable of improving further, and energy is needed to go into superhuman realms. So, in some ways, it actually makes more sense to do as many natural improvements as possible, although it may delay leveling up, that way, when I use my leveling up stat point, S, I will be improving my body past where it could function naturally. Realizing that I'm walking through a dangerous forest without really paying sufficient attention to my surroundings. I get my head in the game and back on a swivel. Digesting the new information I have access to can wait, I've got a shelter to find. My steady progress along the river is interrupted when, having stopped to eat lunch, I suddenly hear a sound that doesn't fit my environment. The sound of birdsong and the crunch of woodland creatures minding their own business has long faded into the background for me. This sound draws my attention because it's nothing like the normal backdrop of the forest. No, this noise is more like hay snicker a giggle and not a merry innocent one either i look up and freeze not more than a few paces away something is staring at me with its head cocked to one side it looks like a chicken if chicken stood two feet off the ground had camouflage style plumage and the regard of a predator wait scratch that chickens do have the regard of a predator when they see a bug or seed they want to eat this bird's beak looks like it will do significantly more damage than a chicken's though being far more hooked and serrated. The worst thing, though, that I notice as I slowly and carefully look around myself, is that it's not alone. Apparently these killer chickens hunt in packs. Turning back to the one at the front of the pack, I don't take my eyes off it as I reach for my knife. This, is going to suck, I know it. Ah well, at least I'll have more meat to add to my stores. If I survive, that is, being surrounded by probably about 15 of the things is not a good start. The chicken opens its beak and makes that weird snick or giggle again. The next moment, it springs towards me, running with its head down and its tail out. I absentmindedly note that its tail is almost twice the length of its body. Its function comes into play almost immediately as I swing the knife at the chicken, and miss. Its tail whips it off course and suddenly it's biting my arm. I swear as its beak sinks in far deeper than it has any right to go. Its beak hooked in, it flaps its wings, giving itself enough lift to rake at me with its clawed legs. Oh, that's how this creature hunts. Then, I think, my mind racing to try and work out how to take advantage of that. It uses its serrated beak to hold on and then rips its prey to pieces. Of course, that's the least of my worries because I'm also trying to fend off the next three which are attacking me from behind with the same strategy. Clearly, another part of its hunting method is to overwhelm with numbers. I need to get to my feet, I should have a height advantage which is currently completely wasted since they surprised me while I was sitting down. Unfortunately, 
The number of chickens currently grabbing onto me is severely hampering my ability to push myself upright. Also unfortunately, my knife is proving pretty ineffectual, I just can't get the right angle to hit the things somewhere vital, especially not the ones behind me, which is a good half of my hangers on. My spear would come in useful here, but it's lying who knows where back in raptor cat territory. I regret not taking the time this morning to replace it now. It's a catch-22 situation. I need to get to my feet to get the right sort of hide to deal with the creatures, but they're hampering me so much that I can't get up. My mind races for an answer, but I'm going to have to find a solution fast, because currently this is a battle of attrition which I'm doomed to lose. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 17, Hearts Scrabbling around in the dirt, I try to find a rock or something which I can use to deal some blunt force damage. I spot a rough stick lying not far away and I still. It's a stick about 3 feet long with a larger part on one end. A growth or bull or something. Could I use that as a mace or spear or something? Worth a try. Struggling against the weight of the chickens on my body and the pain of their bites and scratching claws, I managed to get hold of one part of the branch. Dragging it towards myself. I adjust my grip to about halfway along its length and then start swinging it in both directions, clumsily, I'll admit. This proves to be more effective, the chickens gripping onto me are unable to dodge without letting go. The branch is not the perfect weapon, but it seems surprisingly sound, and has a bit of weight to it. Enough, anyway, to cause damage to my attackers which are surprisingly easy to injure, when I actually land a hit. An idea comes to mind, but I hesitate. It's a high risk. High reward strategy. If it works, it could turn the fight my direction. Equally, if it doesn't work, it's pretty much guaranteed to make me lose the fight and my life. Perhaps it's the effect of the huge number of fights I've got myself into during the last few days and the number of times I've been closer to death than I ever was on earth, but the thought has lost some of its terror. In the end, it doesn't take me that long to decide to try my idea. If I don't, I might be done for anyway. Throwing myself onto my back, I shout in pain as the action makes the beaks and claws already cutting into me slice deeper, but my momentum carries me over my shoulder and onto my knees. I keep the momentum going, getting to my feet with minimal effort. The weight of the chicken still attached to me threatens to throw me off balance, but the ones I landed on are stunned or dead and the majority of the others have either been twisted off me or let go of their own volition as I moved. Deciding to deal with my annoying hangers on first, I stagger over to a tree and bash my back against it, rubbing back and forth, ignoring the others biting and clawing at my legs for now. My actions manage to free me of the chickens clinging on behind me, though their removal still sends shards of agony lancing through me. I absent-mindedly cast lay on hands and breathe in relief as cool energy soothes the pain a little. With that semi dealt with, I concentrate on the chickens still in the game. With a tree to my back, my hide advantage, and a weapon with a much longer reach available, the rest of the fight is significantly easier. Not easy, nor painless, but now I've got my most important organs out of their immediate reach, they have to jump off the ground to get at my torso which reduces their mobility. I'm dual wielding, my knife in my right hand, my mace in my left. Together, I manage to stab the chickens that bite me, and swipe at the chickens on the ground. Adding in a lay on hands every few minutes and I'm slowly improving my condition while the chickens are one by one being knocked out of the game. They don't seem to recognize that the tide has turned, though. In several of the fights I've had so far, my opponents have realized when they've lost their advantage, and they've tried to run to fight another day. Most of the time not very successfully, but still, they tried. These chickens don't seem to have that instinct as they just keep attacking me even as their compatriots fall around me. When the penultimate bird gets slammed by my mace off its mortal coil, the final one latches into my leg with more ferocity than I've seen from these wretched birds all fight. I drop my mace and reach down to grab it by the neck with both hands, not caring that the knife makes the hold awkward. Wringing its neck. I pull it off me and throw it to the ground. I'm feeling lightheaded from blood loss and nearly at the end of my strength. But, in the end, it's me standing among twitching, bleeding, dying killer chickens. That now familiar sense of triumph goes through me, as well as a shiver of what I've come to recognize as energy. It's a much stronger sensation than I've had after my previous fights, but then these are much worse odds than I've ever had before too. The sense of triumph is good but it doesn't heal my injuries. I slump back down the moment I feel reasonably sure that there are no more chickens waiting to pounce. I've been casting lay on hands at any moment I could spare during the fight, 
so there's only two left in the tank. But, at least that means I actually survived. Casting one, I focus on stopping the bleeding everywhere. And I mean everywhere. My already torn clothes are hanging off me in shreds and there's not an inch of skin which isn't painted red with either my blood or the birds. The only good thing is that the majority of the injuries aren't deep and most of those that had been deep when gouged have had at least one lay on hands to make them clot and start healing. Pulling out my water skin, I take a long draft and then eat some of the last cooked meat I have. Oh well, at least my food concerns are no longer pressing, when adding this meat to the amount I still have uncooked in my inventory, I won't have to go hunting for a good while. When my mana refills enough to once more cast two healing spells, I cast another one. I want to keep one in the tank in case of emergencies but the second lay on hands is enough to make me walking wounded rather than incapacitated. I push myself to my feet and start collecting the corpses. Not quite 15, more like 13, but still more than enough to overwhelm most creatures. I can see why they were confident enough to attack me, and not even with a proper ambush either. Not knowing that humans tend to have weapons, they probably just saw me as easy prey. Plus, I was sitting down which probably made me look less threatening besides. Or maybe animals here are just crazy. These guys probably actually had better odds than most of my attackers so far. Anyway, I need to deal with the corpses. Remembering what I learned from the system knowledge stone, I decide to try to get as much benefit from the remaining energy in the bodies as I can. Knowing that I can't, and shouldn't, eat all the meat present, I need to pick and choose a bit. Based on the system lore stone, I figure that the organs will have the greatest density of energy. I'm a bit reluctant to eat things like the liver and kidneys, assuming these birds have those, as they're used to process the blood and may contain unhealthy concentrations of vitamins or other substances. The hearts, however, should be fine, if the blood is tainted, I'll have a problem eating any of the meat so I feel reasonably safe with the hearts. Still, before I can do anything with those, I have some other processing I need to do first including getting a fire started. Not to mention washing the blood off me and getting a new set of clothes so I'm not practically walking around in my birthday suit. Three hours later, I surveyed the area, satisfied with my work. It wasn't what I was intending on doing with my day, but I feel pretty productive nonetheless. I've gathered lots of meat which has joined the bird meat already in my inventory. I've cooked and eaten more hearts than I've ever seen in my life. I've collected lots of feathers, figuring they will come in handy later. These have taken up two slots of my inventory as apparently the soft curled feathers are counted differently from the straight wing feathers. Finally, I've got a new weapon. I've inspected the branch I used as a mace and am pretty impressed with it, considering that I've done nothing to make it more effective. It doesn't look like much, but apparently is sound enough to serve as a weapon. The thicker bowl at its base is probably the result of a growth of some sort and makes a somewhat weighty and hard lump which improves the stick's impact. It's a bit long for a mace being almost two-thirds my height, but I can either just shift my hand closer to the bowl for more control, or later trim it shorter. It was actually quite useful in this fight to use it as a double-ended weapon. I can imagine even more ways to make it more effective, primarily adding more weight or sharp pieces to the business end, but for something that just dropped off a tree, it's almost ideal. My efforts during and after the battle have had results. My energy to the next level had increased to a whopping 57% by the end of the battle. Part of that is my natural absorption, but most of it is the killing. By eating the hearts, that percentage has increased further to 65%. It just makes me grimly acknowledge that if I'm going to make any inroads to becoming stronger or accumulating energy towards this debt of mine, I'm going to have to take the fight to the creatures. That's not the most enticing prospect. I might have lay on hands, but the injuries still hurt, and I can never forget that a single wrong move could be the end of me. The thought of dying on this deserted world, unwarned, unnoticed that it's not a pleasant one. But if I don't start earning some proper energy, am I actually increasing the chance of dying? It may seem illogical, but I can't help thinking that so far I've been attacked almost 10 times just minding my own business. I figure that the likelihood is I'm very lucky that I haven't yet been attacked by something I can't handle with either my hands or my very basic tools. All of which means that with every encounter, heck, with every venture out into the woods for basic necessities, I'll increase the chance that I will encounter something too strong for me to fight off as I am now. And that means I need to get stronger, 
as fast as possible. I need to earn those stat points, and those only come from leveling up or effort. It means that when I was offered a stat increase to dexterity while digging through the chicken's bodies, I turned it down. While I acknowledge that I should benefit from the extra stat points while I can, I can't help but think that leveling up will earn me more in one fell swoop. Unless my class is really common, of course. If that's the case, I'll know not to bother saving my energy when offered stat points in the future. I hope it's the right choice. Also, if I'm the hunter, rather than the hunted, I'm more likely to be able to choose my encounter, and to choose to make it more advantageous to myself. I'd already planned to absorb the hunting stone tomorrow, but now I decide to also go hunting, if only for some easy prey. But first, I need to find my shelter so I have a reasonably safe home base to return to at the end of the day. I can't forget how I woke up this morning after all. One good thing I have managed to discover is a sort of heads up display. I had wondered at the utility of having my mana, stamina, and health in my status screen. They're not that useful if I only ever see them in times of safety, since looking at my status in the middle of the battle would seem to be a very bad idea. At the thought, my absorbed knowledge from the system stone this morning kicked in and helpfully informed me of how to make these values display themselves in the corner of my vision at all times. I fix them in the top middle part of my vision as I figure that'll be the least annoying, most helpful position. There are no values, just three bars of different colors. I quickly work at that blue means mana, yellow stamina, and red health. At least it'll give me an idea of how many more lay on hands I have available in the middle of a fight if nothing else. Plus, it'll tell me if that horribly painful wound is actually as life-threatening as it feels. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 18, The Cub and Wolf Zard. My health and stamina finally full, it's time for me to continue. Unlike the snake previously, I'm actually looking forward to trying out the killer chicken meat. Am, KFC, I can't help thinking to myself. The reality will be somewhat different, I know, but a man can dream. Then, heading back to the river, I continue walking. I still haven't seen any area that looks promising for a shelter, which is disheartening. Sure, I could make one myself, but that'll take a fair bit of time since I have such rudimentary tools available. Time during which I could be attacked and killed. Frankly, if I never have to lie another night out in the open, it'll be too soon. Waking up to a load of insects crawling all over me or a snail pea trying to make me its breakfast is enough to put me off sleeping under the stars for life. Today looks like it's going to be like yesterday, fruitless and painful, until it doesn't. Rounding the bend of the river and seeing past a clump of trees for the first time, I catch sight of something ahead which makes my heart rise into my mouth in hope. For some reason, the next stretch of the river on my side is pretty clear of trees. It's got a fair number of bushes, some of which are as tall or taller than me, but few of the massive trees I've started to get used to. The land, on the other hand, rises quite steeply from about a hundred meters away from the river. I guess is some sort of foothill attached to the mountains forming the valley in which I am situated. Perhaps 50 meters or so from where the steep rise starts, it flattens out into a sort of plateau for a small area maybe 50 to 100 square meters in total, it's hard to estimate since I can't see the whole of the area due to my perspective. It rises very sharply after that, almost a cliff, with a waterfall running over the top and cutting down past the plateau. The little stream joins the river by which I'm walking a bit lower down. Peaking my interest is the fact that if I look at the right angle, I see something that might, just might be a cave. If it is, well, starting a shelter with a cave would save a lot of time. Plus. This is an ideal placement, not too far from the river, and with lots of potential prey nearby. I pant as I walk up the hill. This is far more exercise than I'm used to getting, recent improvements aside. A few minutes later, of a steep, but manageable climb on foot, I reach the plateau. There, ahead of me is exactly what I was hoping to see, a cave. It's a strange sort of shape, though it takes me a little bit of squinting to work at why. After a few long moments, I suddenly hit on the reason. I can't work out how it was formed. As far as I'm aware, caves are formed mostly by water erosion. Sure, you can also get ones formed by an area being sandblasted or something, but mostly it's erosion of either waves, a river, seasonal floods, or rainfall. This doesn't look like it was made that way. Although there is a stream running nearby, there's no hint in the rocks above that this cave could have been formed by that, even assuming that the stream was diverted later somehow. Equally, 
It's not a shape that indicates it could have been softer rock layered between harder rock that was washed out. We're nowhere near anywhere that could create waves either. If anything, the cave looks like some giant hand came down and pushed its thumb into modeling clay to make a hollow, then smoothed out the area above and in front. Seriously, the cliff above it is sheer in a way that no other area nearby is. The inside is even and smooth, and the mouth is big and round. Like, what? The sound of rustling makes me snap to attention. Cursing myself for paying far too much attention to topographical concerns when I should rather be making sure that nothing is about to eat my face. I duck down behind one of the taller bushes, there are not being any handy trees around, and go still. Looking through the gaps between the bush leaves, I wait for whatever animal is making the noise to emerge. When it does, I can barely hold in my reaction. It's just far too cute. Imagine one of those adorable kittens and then multiply its cute factor by 10. It's also clearly going to be a killing machine when it grows up, but for now I can't stop my insides from melting. It's a leopard cub or something like that, but it's really fluffy, and keeps tripping over its own too big paws even as it tries to pounce on something that's caught its attention. Like babies of any species, it's pretty oblivious to its surroundings. Fortunately for me as I reckon I'd struggle to defend myself against something so adorable. Yes, I'm a cat person. Should I try taming this cub? My willpower is still less than 10 so I probably shouldn't try dominate. Then a thought strikes me and makes my insides feel like they've been doused in ice water. If there's a baby, where's its parent? As if summoned by my thoughts, there's a growl from the bushes opposite me and a cold sweat breaks out on my forehead. I'm dead. There's no way a piddly little knife is going to stand up to an enraged leopard mama. I pull it out carefully anyway, if I'm dead anyway, I might as well try to go down fighting. The bushes rustle, and then a dark shape blurs out of it. I leap to my feet and stab forwards with a grunt, my eyes closing involuntarily as I flinch away in expectation of white hot pain tearing through me. When it doesn't come, I crack my eyes open and dare to look at my attacker, or at least, where I thought my attacker would be. My knife is clean, and the space in front of me is empty. There's a growl and pain yowl. I look over to the side and see a ball of yellow and black fur, mixed with green and red scales. It takes me a long moment to process the information, all I can say in my defense is that my mind had started careering down one track, and suddenly I'm having to put the brakes on, reverse backwards then start down a whole new track. It's not the leopard mama, coming to slay the intruder who dared come near her cub? No, it's the cub which is in danger. Logically, what I should do is run away while the two creatures are fighting and continue looking for my shelter somewhere else. I don't do the logical action. Instead, I pull my water canteen out of my satchel and throw the contents on the two animals. The sudden shock makes them separate and I shout loudly at the attacker. It looks like a horrible mix between a wolverine and lizard, with the teeth and claws of the former, and the scaly body and tail of the later. From the way it's snarling angrily at me, even as it keeps glancing at the cub, it's got the temper of the former too. I yank the mace from my belt and swing at the attacker, growling back at it. The anger within me which has been growing for days flares to life in my outrage. Try to attack a defenseless, adorable cub. Will you? Not under my watch. The wolverzard switches its attention fully to me and the leopard cub takes the chance to scupper, half limping towards the cave. The time I spend watching the cub costs me dearly as I miss seeing the wolverzard's approach until it's already too close to whack at it with my mace without hitting myself. Fortunately, I have my knife, so I just stab at it as it latches onto one leg. I yell loudly as it buries its teeth in me, growling and shaking its head. In turn, I stab at it and it releases me and jumps backwards as it tries to avoid the blow. I succeed in drawing a line down its side, but its scales are surprisingly tough and deflect most of the attack. My own wound, on the other hand, is already bleeding heavily. Cursing, I quickly cast my only magic spell, and then flail at the creature with my mace. It dodges again, and, runs between my legs. My confusion is answered a moment later when a weight lands on my back and only my abrupt instinctive shake stops the bite from digging into the back of my neck. It pierces the meat of my shoulder instead and I feel a sense of panic rising. I throw myself onto my back, trying to at least knock the creature off, squish it if I can. Once more, the creature is just too fast, and I barely get my hand in front of me quickly enough to avoid it going from my throat. Instead, it makes gouges with its sharp claws over my face even as its teeth latch into my right forearm. It's got my forearm. I try to shake it loose but it's strong, 
and heavier than I can lift easily in such an awkward position. Its paw drags excruciatingly across my face once more and suddenly when I goes dark, ice crawls through my veins. I hope it's just blood causing the problem, because if not, but I can't focus on that right now. I need to survive the next few moments before I can worry about anything more long term. I grab the knife in my left hand. It's not as agile as my right, but it's not currently being used as a chew toy either. I stab at the beast and it releases my forearm to jump back. Of course, it's not content with doing that and makes another rush at me, going once more for my throat. This time, I'm more prepared and roll out of its way, trying to make my way to my feet. It's too fast. It knocks me over even as I get to my knees. We go rolling together, probably not looking much different from how the cub and wolves hour had looked earlier, only different colors. It snaps at any part of me it can reach and tries to disembowel me with its back claws, even as I try to grab any part of it with one hand and stab it with the other. Luck finally seems to be on my side as I manage to stop our momentum with my weight pinning it down enough to stab at its neck. For this, I have to sacrifice one hand to keep its jaws occupied, and I scream from the pain as it rages against my trap. My hand is savaged, as is my lower body from its claws, but I succeed in stabbing it somewhere vital and I keep stabbing until I feel it going limp. I use the last of my strength to roll off it and stare up at the sky crying from agony. I can feel blood pumping out of me too, it's hit something important in my belly. I have so many cuts and bite marks across me that I can barely even distinguish which parts hurt the most. My right eye is still dark, but that's not going to matter, I'm going to die in a few minutes. I've been casting as many lay on hands as I could summon up the concentration for, and I cast another one as my mana regenerates enough. That's it, though, I'm clean out, now and it'll take at least 10 minutes to regenerate enough for another cast. My wounds are still weeping blood far faster than that. I need something with a lot more oomph if I'm to stand a chance of survival. More oomph. The thought sparks off an idea and I reach weakly for my satchel. I fumble around in it with my cold, clumsy fingers, searching for the life-saving glass vial. It isn't there. Why? I turn my head with difficulty and see it. At some point during our rolling, it must have fallen out of the satchel. My last health potion, my only chance of survival right now, lies a good couple of meters away, glinting in the sun. Normally, that wouldn't be a problem. Normally, I'd just get up and walk over there with no issues. Normally, I wouldn't need to take the potion at all. This is not a normal situation, and I don't have the strength remaining to do any of that. I push at the ground weakly with my left hand. My right far too damaged to do anything but twitch feebly. I move a grand total of 2 inches, and that takes almost everything I have left. I lie there, my head spinning, my heart beating rapidly and shallowly, waiting for death to come and claim me. With nothing else to do, I let my mind drift over recent past memories. They're not pleasant memories. The moment Lucy, my long-term girlfriend, called it quits because I was more likely to marry my boss than her. The moment she killed my final hopes of getting back together by bringing her new boyfriend to the family dinner, cutting me off from the people I considered my second family. The moment I received the call about my father's death. The moment my boss told me I was fired. I felt like a failure many times. But one thing is different this time. I saved the cub. At least my death now has had more of a positive consequence than just stepping off the roof would have. Feeling far too weak from pain and blood loss, I'm still aware enough to open my eyes when a shadow falls across me. I look back upwards to see a massive shape standing menacingly over me, Mama Leopard has arrived. I'm so fucked, drifts into my mind, the swear word completely appropriate for the situation in my mind. Not that I wasn't dying before but now. There's not a snowball's chance in hell that I'm going to get out of this alive, even if the health potion were to magically levitate over to me. She's huge, and not just an am on the floor staring up at an apex predator kind of way. No, I can't get an accurate measurement of her height from my angle, but the paw that's sitting near my head is more than half the size of my torso, even were I not to be injured, she'd be able to pin me down with no trouble at all. Of course, with me as I am now. All she needs to do is step on my face and I'll be done even faster than the blood loss will take me. I grimace, chuckling darkly and brokenly, 
the agony which had dulled down a bit shooting through me once more with a convulsive movement. How ironic. Slain by the leopard whose cub I just saved. The stories I read never ended like this. A hero was always rewarded in the end. He didn't die in such an ignominious manner. With the lack of anything better to do while I die, I gaze at the magnificent beast before me. Oh well, if nothing else, I've succeeded in seeing a leopard in the flesh, I'd always wanted to go on a safari. To my surprise, the leopard doesn't take that moment to kill me, but moves off to sniff at the wolverzard. Perhaps it's obvious enough that I pose less threat than a wet, paper bag. There's a chirp from the direction of the cave and a tiny figure comes barreling through the bushes. The cub bursts out of the covering foliage and comes to rub up to its mom, already making a demanding, and heart-meltingly cute, noise. The mama leopard makes a deep huffing sound and sniffs her cub, licking its head with a tongue that's almost bigger than it. In fact, the cub doesn't even come halfway up the leopard's legs. It's completely dwarfed by its parent. Maybe its dad was really small. I pull my mind away from that disturbing train of thought, not hard to do as my thoughts seem to be escaping my grasp like water from a cupped hand, or blood from my body. Your cub is adorable, I tell the great cat hoarsely, probably a bit delirious. I figure that since I'm about to die anyway, I've got nothing to lose. I'm glad it, he, she, didn't get killed by that thing. I chuckle again though it ends with a gasp of pain. Sure wish I wasn't dying, though, I admit. I don't exactly regret saving the cub, but I do thoroughly regret that I'm the victim instead. If only I'd been smarter about the whole thing. Shows how useful anger is when dealing with a problem, right? I could have used a stone or something to attack the wolverzard from a distance, though I ignore the fact that I would have been too worried about hitting the cub instead. I could have taken a few moments to plan a better strategy at risk of being too late given how quick the wolverzard had been. The leopard moves off to sniff around the side of churned up ground and grass. She pauses over the vial of health potion. Yeah, that's a health potion, I tell her. Since I'm going to be too far gone for it soon, why don't you keep it and give it to your kid if needed? I don't even know why I'm bothering to waste my final breaths on talking to an animal, but I've got nothing better to say or anyone better to say it to. The leopard looks at me with an expression which I would have classed as thoughtful on a sentient being. Then, before my disbelieving eyes, she gestures with one paw and the ground beneath the glass vial moves. I blink. Did that happen? The glass container glints in the sun, only a few inches away from my half-decent hand, tempting me to reach out and grasp it. Is this all a hallucination brought on by my near death? The fading around my vision and my increasing sense of disconnection with my limbs make it clear that hallucination or not, this might be my only chance to survive the next few minutes. With what feels like the effort it would take to lift a car, I work my less injured hand towards the potion. My vision narrows, literally, the darkness is becoming more and more intrusive, and all I can focus on is the health potion, everything else has disappeared. Inch by inch, moment by moment, I see my salvation coming closer. It's another race. Like with the snile peed earlier, it's a race between whether I'll get the vial to my mouth before my blood loss stops me. My fingers are cold and numb, so are my arms. I don't have the strength to lift it. But I must. I have to. I tilt my head to one side and somehow get the mouth of the vial close enough wrap my lips around it. There's a stopper. Of course. I try to pull it out by fixing my teeth around the stopper and pulling on the vial with my hand, but I don't have the strength. I could cry. So close, but too late. I am crying. Wetness traces its way down my face, collecting on my nose before slipping over the bridge. No. No. I'm not going out like this. I fix my teeth in the stopper firmly, and then yank the bottle with every speck of strength that still remains in me. I feel the stopper slip loose and then pull out just enough. Shoving half the vial into my mouth, I turn my head to face the sky, letting gravity do its thing. The stopper isn't out completely, but it's loose enough that the potion starts trickling out around it. I'm so tired. My eyes flutter closed and not all the will in the world, or will, could force them open again. Book 1 Leap, Chapter 19, Please Don't Eat Me. When I wake up, I'm almost surprised. I'd thought it was too late, that the potion had been too little, too late in the style of all the best tragedies. Or had the whole thing even happened? Had I really thrown myself into a life-death struggle with a vicious creature to save a leopard cub? A cub whose mother saved my life in return? It seems too fantastical to be true, 
even for this strange life in which I find myself. I doubt its reality even more when I take into account that nothing hurts. I open my eyes. There's a break in the forest canopy above me and I can see the bright blue sky. It's about mid-afternoon, from what I can tell. Without a watch or phone to tell me the time, I've got pretty good at using the cues of light, temperature, and animal noises to orientate myself. Carefully stretching, I feel no pain, but I do feel the sensations of dirt, twigs, and grass under my hands, so I'm not still numb. Testing my feet, I can feel my toes and move them. Good. I'm not paralyzed or anything. Pushing myself up to a sitting position, I feel over my stomach. It's smooth, healed, though the rips and blood stains in my clothes attest to the fact that it really shouldn't be. Then I notice something that makes me freeze ice going through my stomach. My vision is strangely limited. I can see everything I normally would to my right side, but my left side vision is limited. I can see my nose and beyond it in a straight line, but my peripheral vision? I lift both hands and wave them to the sides of my head while looking forwards. My right hand, I can see. My left hand, no. No no no. I grab at my face and put my hands over my eyes. My right eye is reacting normally. My left eye, is not. My left eyelid blinks, I can feel my finger when I touch the eyeball, but I can't see out of it. If I close my right eyelid and leave my left open, it's as if I've closed them both. I'm, it's. I can't deal with this right now. I push myself to my feet with nervous energy, then stop dead. The leopard is there, in that half lying, half sitting position cats and dogs take. She's watching me intently the tip of her tail twitching every now and again. I'm not an expert in cat body language so I can't tell if that's a sign of annoyance or interest. Or even if body language for cats on earth has any relevance to a giant leopard several worlds away. Forgetting about my eye for a moment, adrenaline rushes through me as I go into full-scale fight-or-flight mode. Good kitty, I say shakily, lifting my hands placatingly and hunching over a little not wanting to seem at all threatening. As if something as small and puny as me could seem threatening to a killing machine like her. I start backing away, hoping I can get far enough that she will stop being at all interested in me. If she's hungry and hopes to make a nice snack of me, I'm toast. Nice kitty. Why did you save my cub? The words echo in my head like a resonant bell ringing in a vast cave. Is that saying something about how much, or, more to the point, how little my mind is filled. Bringing my pitiful intelligence and wisdom stats to mind, I can't help but feel more depressed at the thought. Then I shake the thoughts out of my head, not literally, I'm rather trying to avoid sudden movements at the moment. Human, why did you save my cub? The words are repeated, though this time there is a sense of annoyance. At the same time, the leopard rumbles for a short moment. Is it? Could the leopard? Could it? She? Be talking to me? In my mind? Given what I've seen so far, can I really rule out anything as a possibility? And ultimately, who's going to know or care if I'm wrong? I wasn't really thinking about it, I answer honestly, the sheer terror curdling in my belly preventing me from finding any sort of pretty lie. Your cup was so small and cute, it didn't seem fair that it should die just as it started to live. Well, in for a penny, in for a pound. I think for a moment, forgetting to continue slowly backing away in my pondering, and I'm tired of worlds which destroy the innocent. It's surprisingly true. And I'm not just talking about this world, either, though the kill or be killed nature of the place here is probably even harder on the young than the corporate world I came from. Of course, it helps that the leopard cub was absolutely adorable and the wolverzard was more like an escaped experiment from a mad scientist's laboratory. I thank you, human. Whatever your motives, I had thought my den safer than it is, and I would have been most grieved to have returned all too late to save my offspring. I wish to reward you, but I must know more about you in order to offer the most appropriate gift. I mean, you kinda already saved my life, I say slowly, not wanting to look a gift leopard in the mouth, but at the same time not wanting to be like Chicken Little, getting lured into a fox's den with pretty words and then swiftly eaten. You gave me my health potion. Then I frowned as my memory tells me that actually the ground moved to bring my health potion nearer to me. That's not possible, I must have been delusional at the time. Since you wouldn't have needed it if not for interceding on my cub's behalf, it does not count towards the debt I owe you. Indeed, the fact that you were brought so near death on her account, and indeed have earned a physical disability for your actions only add to the weight of the debt. I bring my hand up to my blind eye a surge of emotions once more rising. I force it down again. For now, I say nothing, just stand there hesitating. Come, the leopard tells me. Sit, 
and tell me how you came to be in this unpopulated world. She gestures and the earth moves. Again, since with this new evidence, I have to guess that I wasn't dreaming about it obeying her command before. It forms a low chair, nothing fancy, just a seat with a back and raised sections to either side which will work as arms. Suddenly, I realize the probable reason for why the cave looked so unnatural. She made it. The other problem with the chair is that it's also significantly closer to the great cat than I am now, even than where I started. I hesitate again. This seems far too much like the chicken little scenario. Come, she tells me again. I promise you safety for this audience. After a few more moments of thought, I mentally shrug and walk towards the chair. If she's lying, she's quite capable of killing me even if I ran away as quickly as I could. Humans can't stand up to a normal leopard without armor and or guns. Standing up to this massive version of one with nothing more than lumpy branch and a short knife seems improbable. I might as well play along with her. Tell me, human, she says once I've made myself comfortable on the earthen chair, how came you to this world? I start by telling her about the object Nicholas gave me to bring me here, but then that required me to go back and talk about why I'd be foolish enough to choose to accept a one-way trip into the unknown. Before I know it, I'm pouring out practically my whole life story along with all the trials and tribulations I've faced since I've been here, and the decisions I need to make about my future. It's, cathartic. I cry, I'll admit it, when I talk about what I've left behind. I shudder and shiver when I think once more about how many times I've come close to death since being here. I feel fear of the future once more grip me by the throat, but this grip is looser than it has been at other times, because instead of struggling with it on my own. I'm sharing it with someone else. It doesn't matter that that someone else is an inexplicably telepathic leopard, who might want to eat me for a late lunch, or early dinner, but just that she's listening. And when I've finished and my words peet around, I feel a deep relief and lightening of my sense of self. I've missed talking to others, I realize. I'm not the most extroverted person, and social occasions usually make me need to take several days of quiet time at home to recover, but that doesn't mean I don't like people. In fact, the opposite is generally true, though they frustrate me immensely too. The old adage of a burden shared is a burden halved has never felt so true as now, even if the one I've been sharing it with is a disturbingly intelligent and communicative giant leopard. As if on cue, a little bundle of fur bounds out of the cave and snuggles into its mother's stomach. When it stops moving except for a little shifting of its paws, I realize it must be drinking milk. At the thought, Red rises up in my face. I don't know why. It's not as if I would find the sight of kittens or puppies drinking from their mother embarrassing back home, after all. Perhaps it's that I've just spent a good hour talking to the leopard mother like I would another human that makes me suddenly ascribe human norms to her. I rise anyway. Look, I've been talking your ear off here. I'll just leave you to your, you know, I gesture towards the feeding bundle of fur to looking after your cub. Stay. Her mental word halts me in my tracks. It's not threatening in any way, it's just so full of calm, implacable command that I couldn't move if I wanted to. I haven't yet given you your reward. I'll probably regret my chivalrous impulse, but I wave my hands in the air. Don't worry about it, your company has already done me the world of good. If you just agree not to eat me, I think we're good. I chuckle nervously. My nerves turn into full-blown fear when the leopard snarls a little and gets to her feet. The little cub yowling and complained as her late afternoon snack disappears out of reach is only a little distraction from the immensity of her mother. The leopard is even bigger than I thought she was, her shoulder is above my head and her jaws could fit around said part of me without even opening wide. Her tail is switching back and forth, and her head is lowered so it's practically on level with my own. Look, I'm sorry for whatever I said. I squeak out. Please don't eat me. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 20, To Deny Reward Is To Deny The Deed. The Leopard Mother moves closer and then, nudges me with her great head hard enough that I fall back into the chair. Then, withdrawing a little, she slumps back into her previous position and her cup scrambles over her making noises of complaint until it finds the teat again and resumes drinking. I grip onto the arms of the chair with white knuckles, not sure what I can do if the great cat turns threatening again and once again wondering if her promise of safety can be trusted. I'm not going to eat you, she huffs. Dot not today, anyway. So maybe tomorrow? Very reassuring. Not. Can I ask what offended you? I ask cautiously. There's a moment of pause before she replies thoughtfully. Do you know how long I have dedicated to this cup? I shake my head. Dot more than a hundred years, already, 
and, I will spend, at least half of that again raising her into an adult, I stare, I can't help it, as far as I know, leopards don't have anything like that in life expectancy, she notices my look, my kind do not reproduce easily, and we grow slowly, it is the consequence for our power and natural longevity, I thought I had cleared out the nest of malachan near here, otherwise I would not have left my cub to hunt, I heard her cries of pain and rushed back as quickly as I could, but I would have been too late, over a hundred years and the life of my cub would have been gone in a few heartbeats, she pauses and I sense pain radiating from her, I wonder if this has happened before, or something like it, to deny reward, is to deny the deed, to deny the deed is to deny its importance, to deny its importance is to deny my cub and me, and we will not be denied, dot. Her tone is implacable, as is the hardness of her gaze when she looks at me, I nod slowly, understanding where she is coming from, in a way, it's not so much about what I did, it's about what that means for her, she wishes to reward me as a way of helping her feel like the scales are balanced again, okay, I say in the end, but I want it made note of that my life is very important to me too, so a promise not to kill me would actually be a pretty good start, in my book. At that, she huffs in a way that I take as amusement, noted. In fact, I wish to offer three gifts. The first, a gift of knowledge. While we are in peaceful contact, I offer you the response to any question about this valley that I am capable of answering. For example, I know you wonder why you have been attacked so often. This valley is sought after because it is the location of an energy geyser. The energy fills the valley and grows significantly denser as you descend closer towards the geyser. However, do not be too greedy as competition over it is fierce and there are beasts nearby that even I would be reluctant to challenge. Okay, not much that I hadn't already wondered about. But it's good to have my theories confirmed and to know the reason for the increase in energy density. I suppose it's also useful to know roughly how strong the beasts might be. Actually, when I think about it, this offers an awesome one. I just need to make sure I think of all the questions I need an answer to before Eve. Ing, I don't want to miss out on potentially vital information just because I wasn't thinking carefully enough. Second, I wish to offer a shelter, as that seems to be your current most pressing need. I, if you wish. I can give you the location of a guardian not too far from here who you might be able to seek shelter with. You would have to bribe him or impress him sufficiently, but it's within your capabilities, I believe. Alternatively, here she seemed to hesitate a little. Alternatively, I may be able to host you here if you are prepared to exchange oaths of mutual defense and a non-aggression pact. I shall let you think that over and give me your response later. After another short pause, she continues with the final gift. Lastly. I wish to give you a gift of power. Come here. I do so, barely even hesitating this time. I've learned my lesson about defying the massive predator. Dot she lifts her paw, holding it out towards me. Place your hand on my paw. Dot I do that, marveling once more at the size difference between us. Closing her eyes, she seems to concentrate for a long moment. Then, Something like a warm breeze goes through me and I get the nagging feeling that I need to check my notifications again. The leopard flicks her paw towards the chair and I take the hint, sitting back down. Check your status, she tells me, sounding tired. Just before I do so, I see her placing her head down on her paws. Clearly whatever she did took something out of her. Activating my status screen, I see several notifications waiting for me. Congratulations. You have worked hard on your willpower and have earned a point. Would you like to apply this to your status? YN. I hesitate for a moment, weighing up my desire to save energy for my level up versus my complete lack of ideas on how to improve my willpower stat organically. In the end, I decide that I probably need all the willpower I can get especially when it determines health or gene ration. Sure, I think no sensation accompanies this point, but I guess it isn't anything physical anyway. I wonder when I gained it. Maybe it was when I managed to get the potion in my mouth despite being pretty far gone. I muse. Well, I guess I'll never truly know. The next message isn't such good news. Warning. You have severe bodily injuries. You will die shortly without magical assistance. Next message? YN. Yeah, I think I figured that bit out. I think sardonically. Such a useful notification. Next message, please. Warning. You have used a healing potion which is not of a sufficient level to effectively treat all your injuries. Using this potions may cause half-healed injuries to become more resistant to magical healing in the future. Do you wish to use this healing potion anyway? You have 5 seconds to decide. 
no response will count as a positive response. YN, warning, you have used low quality healing potion. Dot. All your injuries have been healed to the maximum efficacy possible for this potion. Not all injuries have been fully healed. Please seek a healer's advice. Next message. YN, so that's what happened with my eye, because as far as I can work out, everything else is healed. I'll have to test whether lay on hands does anything. But something in me doubts it from that whole resistant to magical healing thing in the previous message. Still, I suppose I'd better be grateful that the default if no response option is to go ahead with the healing potion, otherwise I'd definitely be dead right now. Congratulations, you have worked hard on your constitution and have earned a point. Would you like to apply this to your status? YN, let me think about that. Duh. Constitution keeps me alive, no way I'm turning that down after my recent experience. Sure. I know I'm trying to accumulate energy for leveling up, but I have to still be alive. To level up. My recent encounter with the wolves art has definitely shifted my point of view on that. I move on to the next message. Congratulations. You have gained a blessing. Nanda's blessing, enduring will. Ananda is a mighty and proud creature. Their will is powerful enough to force mountains to bend and oceans to empty. In thanks for your heroic act, Kalanthia, Prime Nanda mate has bestowed on you a small part of her mighty will. Plus 10 willpower, plus 20% to willpower. No new messages. Close message? YN. I close the message and access my status screen. Status screen. Name. Marcus Wolf. Race. Human. Class. Tamer. Level. Zero. Energy to next level. 53%. Energy absorption rate. 11 U per hour. Energy towards debt. 0%. Intelligence. 6. Mana. 6060 wisdom 3 mana regeneration rate 100 u per hour willpower 15 plus 3 plus 20 percent health regeneration rate 18 u per hour constitution 5 health 45 45 strength 6 stamina 30 30 dexterity 4 stamina regeneration rate 40 u per hour class skills dominate beginner one tame beginner one non-class skills lay on hands Beginner 9, from a paltry 4, 5 with my earn point added, my willpower has now jumped to 18. Dot doing the maths, I work out that the 20% was applied to the whole of my base stat, that is, after the 10 points were applied. Looking at the way it's laid out on the status screen, I have to wonder whether it will affect future willpower points too, because if so, well, that could make it pretty overpowered. Already, it's 3 times both of my highest stats. And it's 6 times my lowest. I also noticed something else, although I increased my constitution by a point, my health pool has only gone up by 5 points. My maximum used to be 10 times my constitution, now it's 5 points less than that. Unless the ratio has suddenly changed, I guess I've got my answer about a chopped off limb or something, even this new world can't do miracles. I really, really hope that this blindness is temporary, or that I find something which will heal me. The middle of this kill zone is not a place where I want to be disabled. I make a mental note to add some more points to constitution. As soon as I level up, that is. And that's another choice I need to spend considering once more. Direct all my effort to leveling up and ignore any other stat increases offered, or accept stat increases at the risk of delaying my leveling up. In a way, it would be easier to decide if I know I have a safe place to sleep or not. That brings me on to the choice I've got to make. Stay here with a killer leopard, follow her advice to try and bribe some guardian to let me stay with them, or set out on my own. There are certainly risks associated with staying anywhere near a killer leopard, rather obvious ones given the description. Though, if that message about a blessing is anything to go by, she might actually be a Nanda or Prime Nanda or something like that instead of a leopard. Actually, Given the fact that she is several times bigger, and can do magic and telepathy, thinking of her as a separate species is probably helpful. So, Nanda it is, until I'm told anything different. Anyway, back to the topic. So yeah, there are risks of becoming leopard Jiao if I stay anywhere in the vicinity, but there's one major thing that makes me hesitate, do those risks go away if I leave? I mean, I'm not a big cat expert, and even less of a Nanda expert. But as far as my absorbed tracking knowledge tells me, predators tend to have a pretty large territory in which they hunt. A giant cat probably has an even larger one. I might have to travel for days, even weeks, to get out of it. And there's no guarantee that she couldn't follow me out of her claimed area if she particularly wanted to. So, in short, 
although the risks are lower if I leave, out of sight, out of mind, they aren't eliminated. That said, if she wanted me dead, she's had ample opportunity to make it so. Not that I could stop her from killing me now, but all she would have had to do earlier was simply not give me my health potion. I was already more than one foot in the grave when she arrived, thanks to the wolf's art. Moreover, she's given me a gift already which is a significant upgrade to my willpower, that's not the action of someone planning on eating me as a snack later. No, in a way, my main worry is that she might change her mind at some point in the future. Without warning, there would be absolutely no chance of me doing anything about it. However, set those concerns against the potential of the cave as a shelter, especially if the Nunda, what was her name? I quickly checked the message again, Calanthea, apparently. So yeah. If Calanthea allows me to make some screens or something against wind and bring in bedding, it could make the cave pretty comfortable. Certainly a much easier and better shelter than anything I've seen so far, I can really see the potential for this place becoming a proper base. Plus there's the other aspect, just as much as a giant predator is scary to me, it's probably scary to almost all the other animals around here. The fact that she had left her cub here alone to go out and hunt is evidence of her belief in the den's safety. Of course, it turned out that that safety was misplaced, but when I think back to her words, she seemed to be unaware that there were any more of those wolverzard creatures, what did she call them again, around to pose a threat. Now, does that mean I would never be attacked again here? No but it does seem to reduce the possibility for sure. Does that mean that staying here is the best option, even though I would potentially have the equivalent of a sort of Damocles hanging above my head every day? Book 1, Leap, Chapter 21, Arrangement The option of going to a place of Calanthea's recommendation, I don't really spend much time thinking over. I don't know anything about this guardian, I don't know whether I would be able to bribe him, nor if whatever rules he had for his pattern it would be palatable, nor, in fact, whether the defense he could mount over his territory would be worth the hassle. Plus the aforementioned problem of still being within the Nunda's reach, should she wish to hunt me down. So no, either I stay here with Calanthea and her cub, or I keep going and try to find a place of my own. The final consideration to add to the balance is if I did go off on my own, how would I do it? It turns out telepathy isn't as clear-cut as spoken words and impressions of images can accompany the thoughts. Although Calanthea didn't outright say it, I got the sense that the energy geyser she talked about is in the base of the valley, on an island at the center of the Great Lake that stretches most of the way between a river mouth on one side and where it escapes the valley on the other side. In short, if I continue following the river, I will get into areas with greater and greater energy density. Excellent, might be the thought here. I want to grow in strength and increasing the amount of energy I absorb is a great way of doing that. Sure, except for the fact that every other Rex, Rover, and Ratatouille will be thinking the same thing. Calanthea's warning about not going too far too fast resonates with what I had already been thinking. So, if I wanted to keep going, I'd have to move away from the river, thereby potentially causing myself a problem down the line. Thought through like that, it seems like my best option is to stay here at least until I'm strong enough to get significantly closer to the energy geyser than I could now. If I can guarantee my safety from the current residents, of course. So, in hopes of doing that, I turn to Calanthea. She's recovered from whatever she did to give me that blessing. Given how tired she looked afterwards, I wonder whether that phrase has bestowed on you a small part of her mighty will actually means she genuinely and permanently gave me a part of herself. If so, no wonder she's tired and that partially makes up for the fact that I've lost half my vision for the foreseeable future. Pun not intended. Still, she looks recovered now, or less tired at least. She's watching her cub play with her flicking tail, but as soon as I shift, her head flicks towards me in a fraction of a second. Those golden predators eyes fix on me sending primal fear down my spine. Um, I start, a lot weaker than I intended to sound. Come on, Marcus, I tell myself. If she wanted to kill you you wouldn't stand a chance anyway, so just go for it. You talked about me possibly staying here. How would that arrangement work? In what sense? That's a good question, I admit, and I don't really know the answer. Taking a moment to think, I try to work out my confusion and form it into words. You're clearly a powerful predator, I say finally settling on bluntness for the sake of clarity. I'd imagine there's little to threaten you around here. Why would you require a pact of mutual defense? How could I defend you? A good question, 
human, she says finally, her mind voice sounding, amused, first of all, do not fatally underestimate yourself and overestimate me, I am more powerful than you, yes, but I still have my weaknesses. It may so happen that one of my weaknesses can be covered by one of your strengths. Okay, that makes a little sense, but I'm still not convinced. Additionally, I might be powerful, my cub is not. That dot is a lot more plausible. But when you're with your cub, she will be protected by your power, I point out. Maybe it seems foolish to essentially argue against my own interests but I want to truly suss out her motivations, and the limits they would pose to me if I chose to stay here. I cannot always be with her. For all my power, I must still drink, I must still eat, and taking her with me would put her in more danger. I see, I say slowly. So in effect you want a babysitter for your cub while you fulfill your own needs. I do not want you to sit on my baby, she retorts, a snarl that I can hear faintly in her chest heard even in her mental voice. I flinch a little at the sound but remind myself that she hasn't killed me yet or even made an attempt to do so. It's a term my people of use, it means someone who stays near a baby, either awake or asleep, to guard and look after them in their parents' absence. Oh, she responds, seemingly appeased. I have not encountered this term before. In that case, yes, I would like a person to sit on my baby. I don't bother to try to correct her. We both know what she means, now at least. That has a different spin on things. Not only does it give me more idea of her motivations, but it reassures me that she's not necessarily planning on eating me at a later date. If she wants a guard for her cub, that's an understandable reason to keep me around. There's just one problem, but I might actually already have a solution, depending on her. You say you have to go hunt, do you necessarily have to be the one hunting, or do you just need the food? She eyes me for a moment, and let me say that that is a very different experience from a giant leopard, Nunda whatever, whose eye is not that much smaller than my hand, compared to just your run-of-the-mill manager or union member. Even the militant unions, I require sustenance. Where it comes from is not really important. Then how about I hunt for you? I get that you need to go drink water, but what if I could supply you with as many carcasses as you need? Then you could guard your cub. She didn't respond for a moment, clearly assessing me in some way. Why would you offer such a thing? It'd surely less effort to guard my cub for a time than to spend the whole day hunting for me. I can take down much bigger prey in significantly less time than it would take for you to accrue enough smaller prey. That's true, I admit, except for the fact that I'll probably be spending a lot of time hunting anyway as I need to grow stronger. I'd like to keep the hearts as well as some of the meat for myself and I may need to harvest some of the skins or claws or bones or other inedible bits for various things I need to make, but the, uh, lion's share of the meat could be yours, if you want. She says nothing for a long moment. It is an interesting offer, she admits after a while. Perhaps we should make an arrangement based on mutual defense and non-aggression, and then try out your suggestion as an additional arrangement. If you cannot supply enough meat for me, your role will return to sitting on my baby while I am hunting for myself. Does that seem fair? Yes, it does, I agree. Actually, more than fair, really, especially as I'm talking with a non-human predator. Though, I have one question. She waits expectantly. What exactly does a mutual defense and non-aggression pact mean to you? Perhaps a stupid question, but if I've learned anything from years of constructing contracts, and by that, I mean writing down what the contract needs to say and then sending its lawyers to turn into incomprehensible legal speech, it's that anything not established at the start is game for unintentional misunderstanding and intentional misinterpretation. Not that I'm expecting this Nanda to feel the need to jump through a technical loophole to do something to me, but I'd rather a misunderstanding doesn't come around and by me, quite literally. Non-aggression, that neither of us should act in any way that intentionally harms the other, applying to physical, mental, or spiritual attacks. She took on a look that was distinctly amused. I will do my best to impress upon Lethany that you are not to be chewed or ambushed, but I cannot guarantee her good behavior. Understandable, I admit, considering she's a baby. Not that I've ever had a puppy or kitten, but friends have had them. I remember one of my best friends at school coming in with long scratches on his hand. Apparently his kitten had dug her claws in a bit too hard during a game. Thinking of that happening with a leopard, or Nanda. Up, even as cute and fluffy as this one is, yikes. The Nunda continues, her tone regaining its seriousness. Mutual defense, that should you encounter myself or my cub under attack, that you should come to our assistance to the extent of your capacity, 
though not with the expectation that you should die in our defense. She pauses for a moment, then looks at me with a cold, hard stare. And let me tell you, no one does that kind of stare better than a feline. That said, I cannot guarantee your safety were my cub to die under your supervision and you were to survive the attack. Noted, I reply grimly. I shouldn't really expect anything else, the whole reason she was suggesting this was to look after her cub. So how do we ensure that we each stick to the agreement? I ask a little tentatively, I don't exactly want her to think that I'm not planning on following through, but at the same time I don't want to find out at the worst moment that she wasn't. Have you never heard of a vow? There's puzzlement in her voice as if this is common knowledge. And now she's said the word, I realize I do actually know about vows. The knowledge comes, of course, from that stone I absorbed. Apparently such things as binding verbal agreements do exist in Nicholas' world, enabled, naturally, by energy. The vow takes energy to create, usually a fraction of the two individuals' energy store. The fraction is different depending on many factors, including the importance of the agreement to the two individuals, the power balance between them and myriad others. If the agreement is broken, either there's a backlash of both amounts of energy on the offending party, or the offended party absorbs the energy stored by the bond in compensation, the choice is up to the offended party. I don't know how the bond knows whether it's broken or not, nor do I know how it stores it in the first place. Somehow, it just does. Either way, although it's not a foolproof solution, it's a pretty good guarantee as those go, certainly more useful than some contracts which aren't even worth the paper they're written on, even when they are purely digital. That said, having automatic consequences which enact themselves in the case of a rupture avoids the necessity of courts, not a bad idea. Okay, that sound like a good idea, I agree. I think carefully, is there anything else I'm missing? It's hard to know what unknown circumstances aren't covered by what we've already discussed because they're just that, unknown. However, if nothing else, my experience has taught me that I can't plan for everything, and that there's always a loophole someone can exploit. The fact is, the Nunda feels that she needs me, and as long as that's the case, I'll be reasonably safe. And for her, it's not like I'm much of a threat to her, though I could arguably be such to her cub. The threat of her vengeful retribution, however, will keep me in check around her precious offspring, something I'm sure she knows. So, how do we do this? I ask. Deciding that since my mind has been made up, I might as well get on with securing a home base. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 22, Literal Life Saver Am I to assume by that comment that you wish to stay here? She questioned calmly. I nod, then, realizing she probably can't read human body language any better than I can read hers, I affirm my agreement verbally. Very well. Simply focus your attention and intentions and follow my lead. I'm not quite sure what she means by focus your attention and intentions, but I guess I'll work it out. I, Calanthea, mate of the primal Nanda, agree to a pact of mutual defense with this human. She pauses, I'm me. I get the hint. Marcus Wolf, I fill in. Marcus Wolf, if he should come under attack in my presence. I will render him as much aid as I am capable of without putting myself at risk of immediate death. This pact shall continue until we both agree to its dissolution. She then looks expectantly at me. I do my best to repeat her words, filling in her name where appropriate. At least I've confirmed that it is her name, as I'd strongly suspected. Next, she continues with the non-aggression pact, and I repeat her again afterwards. I, Marcus Wolf, agree to a pact of non-aggression with Calanthea mate of the primal Nanda. I swear that my acts shall not intentionally bring harm to her or hers, including physical acts, mental acts, and spiritual acts. This agreement shall continue until both of us agree to its dissolution. That done, I relax, suddenly feeling safer than I have since I entered this world. Surprisingly, Calanthea doesn't look as satisfied as I would have thought considering that she's now engaged a babysitter for her kid. Instead, she fixes me with another hard look. I feel sweat break out and wonder with a hint of panic whether this is when the she drops. I warn you, Binder, that should you use any of your bindings on myself or my cub, I will willingly take on the consequences of breaking these packs. Okay, that wasn't what I was expecting. Nor do I really understand what she's taking about. Unless, is this something to do with my class? I ask hesitantly. Her stare intensifies. You are a human who thrives on bending others to your will and binding them with chains of devotion or control. You are not strong enough to succeed in binding me. And I will not stand for you binding Lathany. Huh, 
I guess it is about my class. I hadn't even thought about it, I replied honestly. I haven't even tried those skills out yet. I hesitate. Is it, do you want me not to use them at all? I don't really know how I feel about that idea. I mean, I haven't even tried the skills out, but it seems kind of a waste not to use them at some point. Besides, I had kind of thought that these skills were ones that would help me survive. If I had a tamed animal who could fight on the front line, I could stand back and fire arrows from a distance, for example. But I'm not sure that I want to use them so much I'd leave the first place I found where I might sleep safely at night over them. Fortunately, it doesn't end up being an issue. What do I care of other, lesser creatures? Question mark she tosses her head in contempt as she responds. I care about myself and my cub, if all others are weak enough to fall to you. They deserve to be bound. Dot apparently the law of the jungle is about every creature for itself. In the end, I have mixed feelings over her evident blessing over me dominating all others as long as she and her cub are left in peace. Oh well, something else to deal with later. So, what now? I ask. Now, do whatever you wish. I have fed sufficiently, despite the interruption to my hunt, and shall not need to eat for another two days. You are thereby released from having to fulfill our agreement to sit on my baby until then. Okay, I say slowly. So where will I sleep, in your cave? She paused for a moment. You may sleep in our cave if you wish, but I would not like to accidentally mistake you for an intruder or snack during my sleep. No, I'd rather that doesn't happen, either, really. Dot. The very thought of waking up to a dreaming Nanda eating me is horrifying to say the least alternatively i can expand the cave a little to provide you with your own space although i thought it was normal for humans to build shelters for themselves it is i admit but i don't have all the equipment or materials that would normally be used for that so it would be more convenient for me to have a natural shelter which i can adapt to my needs i see she stood and walked back to the cave the nanda cub lithony following in little bounces and intermittently pouncing at her mother's tail. Too cute. At least I'll have plenty of dopamine bursts from watching her antics, I suppose. I follow a little more unsurely, since she hadn't given any indication that she wants me to do so. The cave is bigger than I'd thought, its mouth only just high enough to let the giant leopard pass, but then opening out both wider and higher past the mouth. There's a pile of leaves and other bedding on one side of the cave and a pile of bones on the other. I'm torn between disgust and interest at the last. I can expand the cave downwards, or backwards, or make a little cave to this side, she said, flicking her tail towards the side with the bones. I give the question due consideration. Downwards is out, if there's any significant train fall, I don't want to risk being flooded. Backwards means potentially walking past two sleeping nundas every time I want to enter and leave. Sideways means being near a pile of bones. Would it be okay if I move these bones somewhere else? Calanthea gives a cat-like shrug. Move them out, if you prefer. They're only there because Lathany likes playing with them even after they have been stripped of meat, but she can play with them outside just as well. Okay, that sounds good. Can I have my place over here, then? I ask, pointing to the side of the cave nearest the bones. Calanthea gestures nonchalantly and I immediately see a difference. It's not an instant fix, a hole doesn't suddenly appear. No, it's more like there's a dip where there wasn't one before, and then it magically, excuse the pun, deepens until I'm looking at a mini cave not that different from the one Calanthea clearly made for herself to begin with. Is this sufficient for your needs? She looks at me expectantly as she asks the question. I step into the hole and give it due consideration. The space is frankly bigger than I would have hoped for if I tried to create a shelter, even a relatively fancy one. The ceiling is high enough that my head doesn't brush it once I've ducked through the cave mouth which is about shoulder height though it's only about a hand span above. It's wide enough round that I could choose to lie down in any direction and still have a little space to spare. Just one thing, is there any chance of creating a hole to the outside? Perhaps at this height? I ask, indicating a height about halfway up the wall closest to the exterior. The nun gestures once more and a hole bores its way through the rock. It's a good foot through the wall which definitely gives me a sense of security. Okay, perfect. I say with satisfaction. There are still multiple things I'm going to have to do to make this into a proper home, but this is an excellent start. Especially so since I haven't had to put in any backbreaking labor or time that I could spend elsewhere, although I suppose I did almost die for the opportunity, so I guess it evens out. Thank you, I tell Calanthea, 
and she nods regally before returning outside with her cub and leaving me to it. The first thing I do is simply sit down. It's been, well, it's been quite a roller coaster ride over the last few days, heck, the last few weeks, all taken into account. Although I've had time to process everything, I realize I haven't really. Back on Earth, I spent far more time wallowing than processing, and the continued blows of my ex's announcement, plus the death of my father and then being fired didn't exactly leave enough time for me to come out of one downwards plunge before I hit the next. And then ever since I've been in this world, I've been working more off survival instincts than much else. Yes, I've thought things through, but all my thoughts have circled what I need to do next to stay alive just a little longer. Now, after pouring out everything to Calanthea, probably telling her more than she actually wanted or needed to know, I feel strangely lighter. Like somehow I'm managing to come to terms with the fact that I'm in a new world where everything wants to eat me and giant leopards can talk and do magic. Dot. That's not even touching on the fact that I've been half blinded, something which makes me shiver every time I think about it, which is why I'm trying to stay away from it mentally. Dot and not thinking about it is hard when every time I misjudge a distance, or have to turn my head just to see something out to my left reminds me about it. Another good reason that this place may be a literal lifesaver, more than it already is. This place is certainly an improvement on my last one, it's already waterproof without any effort on my part, and out of the wind. Plus, with the knowledge that I'm protected by the presence of a giant predator, I actually feel a little safe. The paranoid part of my mind keeps reminding me that said giant predator could turn around and make a snack out of me. But another part protests that there's a vow in place. Actually, speaking of that, I should have received a notification or something. I check my messages and sure enough, congratulations. You have created a vow with Calanthea, primal nundimate. This vow is of mutual defense. The duration of the vow is indefinite until both parties agree to its dissolution. You have used 20% of your energy store to bind the agreement. Should this agreement be broken by you, the energy you have used will be given to the other party to be used as they see fit. Next message, YN. Congratulations. You have created a vow with Calanthea, primal nundimate. This vow is of mutual non-aggression. The duration of the vow is indefinite until both parties agree to its dissolution. You have used 30% of your energy store to bind the agreement. Should this agreement be broken by you, the energy you have used will be given to the other party to be used as they see fit. Close message? YN. 20% of my energy store? 30%? Does that mean what I think it does? I close the message and navigate to my status screen, letting out a despairing groan when I see it. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 23, No Doctor. Or optician. I stare at my status screen, feeling shocked at the amount of energy that was taken. I'd guessed it might be the case when I saw the messages, but hoped that I was wrong. Sure enough, when I look at my status screen, I can see that there's 50% less energy towards the next level. After having reach, Ed, more than two-thirds of the way to the next level after the chickens and wolves are, my energy has taken a nosedive down to the bottom again. Status screen. Name. Marcus Wolf. Race. Human. Class. Tamer. Level. Zero. Energy to next level. 7%. Energy absorption rate. 11 U per hour. Energy towards debt. 0%. Intelligence. 6. Mana. 60-60. Wisdom. 3. Mana regeneration rate. 75 U per hour. Willpower. 15 plus 3. Plus 20%. Health regeneration rate. 18 U per hour. Constitution. 5. Health. 45 45 strength 6 stamina 30 30 dexterity 4 stamina regeneration rate 40 u per hour class skills dominate beginner 1 tame beginner 1 non class skills lay on hands beginner 9 with less than 10% energy gathered towards my next level i'm almost back to square 1 then again i notice that the energy i'm absorbing every hour has increased to 11 units so it's not all bad still I wonder why such a great chunk of my energy was taken, is it because I'm so much weaker, and probably lower level, than Calanthea? Or is it because I was in a weak position, needing what Calanthea was offering more than she needed what I was offering? Or is there another reason? Once more, it's a question I have no answer to, so I just divert my mind onto other topics, primarily among which, what do I need to do to get my new shelter ready for the night? Well, I have bedding but it would be nice to have some sort of cushioning, 
the leaves worked pretty well the night before last and last night wasn't too bad in the burrow, but this is a solid rock floor. Then, I want to create a fireplace, but that will take a bit longer as I need to find clay somewhere, probably by the river, I'd imagine. I've still got some cooked food in my inventory, so no immediate rush for that. Of course, I'm going to want to make this more homey in other ways, I can imagine shelves with items on, hanging plants and animal sinew to dry out for other crafts, maybe even stretching a hide on a frame to make leather. The downside of that last one is, of course, the smell. Oh well, we'll deal with that when I get to it. And now, it seems like my immediate need is to sort out a bed of some sort. I don't really feel like going out looking for that bracken stuff I was using before. So I decide to just make a nest from what I already have in my inventory. Pulling out my backpack and suitcase, I rifle through them both looking for warm, soft clothing. I didn't bring a blanket, which feels like a major oversight now, but I did bring a whole load of t-shirts, jumpers, trousers, even a dressing gown. Arranging a whole load of clothes on the floor with my dressing gown wrapped around them, I make a reasonably soft somewhat lumpy bed. Using the same jacket for cover that I've been sleeping under the last few nights and I figure I've got something for at least the night, maybe longer. Now that I have a proper shelter, I'll actually be able to do more than just create things for survival, though those things come first, of course, and top of the list is leveling up. But that's for tomorrow me to think about. And now, I have something else to think about, my sight. I haven't yet tried lay on hands. And that seems like a bit of an oversight. I chuckle darkly at the unintentional pun. Anyway, I haven't tried my healing spell, and though I'm doubtful, I figure that I might as well give it a go. Casting lay on hands, I feel the tingle run through me. Unlike every time I've done it before, the tingle doesn't focus on any particular area or areas, it just runs up and down my body as if looking for an injury before fading. I know before I open my eyes from where I unconsciously close them that it hasn't worked. Sure enough, my left side is still dark, and if I close my right eye, I can't see anything. Damn, I feel like there's a lead balloon inside me, dragging down on my stomach. I was really hoping that that would solve my problems. Then I have a thought, what if I focus in on the eye specifically? Historically, Undirected lay on hands have offered a low level healing over the whole of the body whereas directed healing has always done a better level of healing, though in a more concentrated area. With hope rising in my heart, despite knowing it's still a bit of a long shot, I try casting lay on hands while concentrating on my injured eye. I feel a tingle in the area, then it fades. Opening my eyes proves once more that it's been a useless attempt. I slump back on my bed. So this is it. Is it? I'm going to be half blind for goodness knows how long? At least until I get to Nicholas World, possibly beyond, especially if it turns out that healing gets more and more difficult the longer it's been since the injury, which it probably does. It's depressing, and more, it's worrying. It's hard enough to survive with two intact eyes and full peripheral vision. How am I going to make it without even full sight? Despite my worries, I'm tired. I don't care that it's still light outside. I'm going to sleep. Dot closing my eyes, I prepare to do just that. However, just as I'm drifting off, my relaxed brain shoves an idea at me which wakes me up properly again. The second time I tried lay on hands it was different from the first time. The first time, it was like the spell couldn't detect an injury. The second time, there was definitely more reaction. What if the spell simply didn't have enough time to do what it needed to do? Time, or mana. It's a bit of a leap. So far I've been able to partially control the amount of mana I use, but I've never used more than 10 units, and the time has never exceeded a few seconds. How am I going to overcome that block? It takes a good few tries to extend the amount of mana used to more than 10 units, and I only really do it by accident. Instead of just mentally saying lay on hands, I instead focus more on my mana bar, imagining it draining down and the blue indication in my vision vanishing into my body and from there into my eye. That first time, I'm too distracted by my mana bar actually seeming to obey me that I don't focus on my eye and the energy instead runs all the way around my body. More than a tingle, this time it's almost like an electric shock. A small one, not really painful, but definitely more present than what I'm used to. It also uses a good half of my mana in one go so I have to take some time to recover after that. I use the time it takes me to regenerate to think through my approach. I wonder whether it would be useful to try to think about how the eye functions. I figure it probably can't hurt unless it distracts me from concentrating on moving the mana from my bar to my eye. I'm no doctor, or optician, 
so my knowledge of the eye is rather limited to what I learned at school. I know that light enters through a lens which is what allows us to focus on near and far objects. Then it passes through the pupil which is a hole surrounded by muscles, the iris. Or maybe it goes through the pupil first and then hits the lens? I don't remember. Then the light hits the back of the eye upside down i'm pretty sure that images being upside down is a thing that the brain has to deal with then there's the optical nerve at the back of the eye which goes to the brain and a whole load of blood vessels which keep the eye healthy oh and other liquids and so on which keep the eye as ball shaped rather than flat Ew. once my mana regenerates i cast lay on hands again but this time really concentrate on drawing blue from my mana bar and imagining it flowing from my hands as I seem to automatically imagine my hands being the access point for the mana, though I know that doesn't make much sense, up to my eye. There, I try to trap it temporarily. It's hard and I almost lose control of the energy a few times when my eye starts burning and spasming in pain. It's like I've stuck an electrical rod in my eye and it's on pulse. As soon as I feel like there's no more mana to draw, I immediately start trying to think about how the eye functions while stopping the energy from escaping at the same time. How? I can't explain. It's a feeling, an instinct more than anything visible or tangible. As realistic as holding lightning in your hands, but somehow I know that something's happening, even though all logic would say it should be impossible. I don't know if it's working, I only know that it hurts. Dot, but I don't dare stop because what if it is working? What if I stop and find that I've regained half my vision? Because knowing how painful this process is, I can't see myself daring to restart it, especially if there's a risk that I could go backwards and lose what I've gained. Right now, there's nothing to lose. If I fail, I'm no worse off. So I don't stop. I keep concentrating on my eye until it feels like it's already melted in its socket. That if I were to open my eyelid, there'd be nothing there but an empty hole. I keep concentrating even as my brain aches from the fierceness of my focus. I keep concentrating even as the pulses of energy become weaker and weaker, then die completely. Even then, I don't dare stop concentrating until every hint of anything mystical has vanished. Only then do I dare relax. But I don't open my eyes. After what I've just been through, I think that finding out I failed would be too much for me right now. I keep my eyes closed trying to summon up the courage to find out for sure one way or the other. And as I do that, my exhaustion creeps upon me and I lose the ability to make a choice. Dot. Dot. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 24, Self-Care. I sleep deeply, and for a long time. I wake up at some point when it's dark and quiet, my stomach grumbling. Fortunately, the inventory seems to have a little of its own light, it's odd because it doesn't light up the area around me. But I can see the items held inside it fine, so I take out my canteen and a couple of handfuls of meat, giving myself a midnight super, or whatever the time is. My hunger and thirst satisfied, I drop back into sleep, not waking until the next morning. I'm finally roused by the sound of birds and the light filtering into my cave from the mouth and the whole Calanthea board for me. Awake, I don't exactly leap into action. Lying still while blinking at the ceiling as my conscious mind catches up with what's been happening. So, massive leopard-like creatures called Nundas which can both talk and do magic. Nope, nothing abnormal about that, why would you think it? It fits right in with reptilian mammal or reptilian avian crossbreeds and classes with skills and magic healing spells. Magic healing spells. I sit bolt upright, my hands clutching at my face. My eyes. I can see. With both of them. I wink one and the other my vision becoming limited each time, but no longer am I left in darkness with my right eye shut. I slump back down on my bed, small chuckles that devolve into relief-filled hysterical almost sobs. I'm so grateful that it worked, that all the pain wasn't for nothing. But at the same time, why did it have to be necessary in the first place? What kind of place is it where becoming half-blinded is just an everyday possibility? I shake myself. I might be safer than I was yesterday. But I need to remember that I'm still in a world which will kill me more easily than I can say Jack Robinson if I let my guard down even the slightest. Falling apart is going to help exactly no one. So, what should I do? Calanthea said she doesn't need a babysitter for another few days, so I've got a bit of time. I can either work on making this shelter more of a comfortable place, including making the tools necessary for the task. I can work on improving my weapon situation, giving myself more range also requiring making tools first, or I can go hunting and collect more energy and corpses which will give me resources necessary for the other two tasks. Or I could do nothing and take the day off, 
giving me a chance to detox from all the stress chemicals which have no doubt been filling my body over the last few days. Wanting to have all possible information to hand, I check my status screen and my eyebrow shoots up as I see my current energy store of 16%. I earn 9% overnight, apparently, which means I slept for, I do the calculations quickly, about 14 hours. Seriously? I was that tired? Sheesh. Then again, I suppose I haven't really slept properly since I've been here and I've been running around getting half killed and not eating properly either. I have to say I feel a lot better now, though. Maybe that's a supporting argument for just staying in and relaxing for a day. Read a book, enjoy the sun. I've got enough food for several days, and water's not hard to access. And if I'm accumulating energy even while doing nothing, I'm even arguably making progress. It would probably do my mental state some good, and allow me some time to make proper plans. Okay. I've managed to convince myself. So, that's what I do all day, nothing. Or rather, a day of self-care. I pull a couple of my favorite feel-good novels out, find a good position in the sun, and relax. Nothing tries to kill me, nothing tries to eat me. Not if you don't include the baby Nanda which seems to see me as a new toy she'd like to play with. And by play with, I mean chew and pounce on. Fortunately, her mother distracts her with something else after not too long allowing me to go back to my reading and chilling. It's not a complete waste of a day, by the time I go to bed, I'm relaxed in a way I haven't been since the last time I went on holiday. When nothing is trying to eat me, this world is peaceful in a way Earth really isn't. Or at least, in a way my life in a capital city wasn't. The only sounds are those of nature, the sun is warm and benevolent, and the food is organic, albeit boring. Plus. I've gained another 11% energy bringing my total up to 27%, and I have a plan for the immediate future. In the end, I've decided to do a bit of hunting. Enough, at least, to push me to the next level. It shouldn't take too long, if I gained 45% just from the killer chickens, and then an additional 8% by eating their hearts straight away. It shouldn't take me too long to get to the next level if I don't accept any more status points. Plus, although I'm still not too sure of the day length, Though I'm increasingly sure that it's slightly longer than that of Earth's, if I go by a day length of 24 hours, I should gain approximately 15% just from absorption. In short, although I don't really want to face opponents like the killer chickens again, hunting is still likely to be much more profitable energy-wise than anything else, but whatever I do, my energy store will still be increasing. Once I've leveled up, I'll take a bit more time to get to level 2, and if any status points are offered. I'll accept them. I've spent quite a bit of time today considering different approaches, and this seems like the best one. My reasoning is based on the time I've spent absorbing and combing through the knowledge of the system stone. I've had the time to learn some interesting facts, and use them to draw conclusions about Earth. Apparently, 10 is an important number on Nicholas World because it's the average starting status value for an adult. On a side note, it's unknown what the actual starting status values are as the only way of truly seeing one status is to absorb a class and that can only be done after puberty has finished, for some reason. Which, since girls tend to finish puberty before boys, means they get a bit of a head start. But anyway, starting status values. These can also vary depending on what the person has developed prior to gaining a class. As I experienced, someone who has worked hard on physical conditioning will have higher starting values in those stats compared to someone who's skipped leg, and arm, and abs, day to work hard on their mental abilities. In the former case, their strength might be up to 15 whereas in the latter, their strength could be around 8. Starting with an intelligence level near, if not above, 10 is a reasonable supposition, hence why he seemed to expect the possibility. However, the point is that these are normal values for Nicholas World. As much as it rankles, I don't think my poor starting values are anything to do with me specifically, I wasn't so obviously deficient among my peers on Earth. No, I think it's more to do with the almost complete dearth of energy on Earth, we're probably almost all weaklings compared to Nicholas people. I'm basing that theory on cobbled together memories from the stone with memories from Earth. Unless Nicholas people, despite seeming to be humans to all intents and purposes, are some super-powered alien species, energy has to play a role. For example, strength. One of the fleeting memories I've inherited is of a farmer-like figure hog-tying a cow-like creature and heaving it into a cart, by hand, alone. Now, I'm no expert in cows, but unless it's some sort of miniature calf, 
which it wasn't, it's got to weigh upwards of 800 kilograms, probably even over a ton. This cow looked pretty well built, so I'm going to peg it as approximately 1000 kilograms. Now, men in the Olympics lift a good 300 kilograms, I think someone may have lifted over 400. I'm pretty sure that people have lifted way over that one way or another, perhaps as much as a ton. But those are going to be very special people possibly even unique. This farmer isn't. He's probably not even trained for it except for the normal labor on a farm. He also doesn't have a class, but he's being used as an example of a person who has nationally increased their strength to around 15 points. That makes him stronger than average, even by Nicholas World standards, but he's not so much stronger that he's their equivalent of someone in the Olympics. Just as on Earth, at least when farming was more labor-intensive, Farmers are generally tougher and stronger than people who spend their days in intellectual pursuits, and their physical stats reflect that. At 15 points, this farmer would be considered to be in the 75th percentile. I know this because, first of all, the stone told me, but second of all, because the other world's equivalent of scientists have run many, many tests. Although it's not possible to actively read the stats of someone with no class. Good old earth style testing still works. By comparing people with a class with people without a class in different tasks, the scientists have managed to determine that the absolute maximum a person on Nicholas World can reach without having a class and thereby leveling up is 20 points in each individual stat. After that, energy is necessary, no amount of hard work will raise the stat above that threshold. Which comes on to my theory that in fact energy helps the inhabitants to increase their range of naturally possible stats even when no classes are involved. I mean, when it comes to strength, before I arrived, I could bench press about 70 kilograms on a good day. My record was a 72. There's a big difference between that and a ton. My strength was 5 when I arrived, and, given that I was lifting on the upper side of expectations for my age, I've got to guess that the average strength of an adult human is around that possibly even a 4. Given that I doubt even Earth's top weight lifters would be able to lift that cow with the ease the farmer showed, he wasn't even straining all that much, for heaven's sake. I guess that my version of humanity tops at a bit lower than that, probably around 12 or 13 points. There's a big difference between that and 20, and the biggest difference I can see between the two worlds is the availability, or not, of energy. Anyway, this may only be for strength, I don't know if the other stats have a similar difference because the stone didn't have memories about them. I guess strength is the most easily observable stat and whoever created the stone thought an example would be educational. It was, especially because I'm now certain that energy is an essential part which I've been missing all my life. Another piece of evidence about this is how the cost of shortcutting a stat point increases at certain thresholds. Of course, the stone isn't clear about the exact cost as we're dealing with percentages here. And as previously established, what 10% means to a person with a common class is a very different story to someone with an epic or higher class. However, the stone was very clear on the fact that after reaching 10 in a stat, using energy to shortcut the process of increasing without leveling becomes more expensive. By the time it reaches 15, that cost increases again. Realizing that made me understand why the system stone was so adamant that leveling is more efficient for stat gain than earning points though that only seems to be after a certain point. I don't yet know how many points I will earn on leveling up, but at this point, I use about 15% to shortcut a stat point. So, I would need to gain more than 7 stats on level up to make it more effective than simply working on the stat and accepting the point when it's offered to me. After reaching 10 points in a stat, I will only need to gain more than 4 points to make leveling up more effective than working out. Get above 15 and that number of points drops to 3. Taking all that into account, it seems logical to increase my stats naturally, well, naturally plus a boost of energy, until they've reached 10 points in each category, rather than trying to level up, unless I have a class which gives me 8 or more points on level up, but given how rare those classes seem to be, I'm not going to bank on that. Except there's one other bit of information I ran across today which throws a spanner into the works of that resolution. Skills. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 25. They're real. There's one good reason for me to level up as quickly as possible. Apparently I get access to a selection of skills at specific level intervals. My first skill selection is at level 1, hence my desire to reach at least that level. After then, the next skill selection is at level 5, then level 10, level 15, level 20, 
and then subsequently at intervals of 10 up to 100. There's no information about levels after 100 making me wonder if there is anything after that point. Surely yes, but then the whole class thing seems to be pretty artificial, so maybe not. Anyway, just like the thought of comparing myself to both people on Earth and Nicholas World, None of this will be an issue if I don't survive the next year. After all the time thinking through what to do in the future, my next step is clear, absorb the hunting knowledge stone. After I've leveled up and chosen my level 1 skill, I'll get to work on making this cave more of a home, and on developing some tools for things that will make my life here a bit more comfortable and easier. Hopefully that will be a good opportunity to earn some stat points. Another good reason to go hunting first, I'll be able to explore the area around. Hopefully identify some good places to find the various resources I'll need. Plus, the corpses of the animals I hunt might contain some of the bits I'll need. Snoo will be absolutely necessary for one. I also realized during the day that my efforts with my eye have been fruitful in more than one sense, apparently using lay on hands to heal an organ was enough to catapult it into the next category as it's increased to novice 3. I bring the message up again to look at it in more detail as I'd only quickly skimmed it before. Congratulations! You have advanced a skill past beginner. Lay on hands is now novice 1. You are now able to channel healing by using your remaining mana to lengthen the healing time. This requires full concentration to be engaged while the mana is acting on the wound. Close message? YN. I close it switching to the second message I'd received. Congratulations! You have discovered a new aspect of your skill, lay on hands and have advanced its rank to novice 3. You are now able to increase the efficiency of your skill by applying your anatomical knowledge. By concentrating on the wound and focusing your will on how it should be when healed, you can maximize the benefit of your skill. Warning! Incomplete or incorrect anatomical knowledge used to direct this skill may lead to unintentional consequences. Close message? YN. I close the message, musing again over the new information. It's not really anything I didn't know before, or at least nothing I hadn't guessed. What I'd done before by drawing on my mana bar is apparently called channeling and merely lengthens the healing time at the expense of needing to concentrate. What I did by imagining how the eye works was apparently applying my anatomical knowledge, which allows the spell or skill, to work more efficiently, I guess because it knows what to do straight off, but has the flip side that if I tell it to do something wrong, it won't know any better and I could mess myself up more. I'll have to be careful, but if these new functionalities could save my life, they'll be well worth it. It's also good to have more information on how to evolve a skill, and why it's a good idea. The information from the system stone was that use and evolution of the skill are key to increasing its level and thereby effectiveness. My experience last night has proven that, and even given me a clue, evolving a skill may require using it in a different way rather than just repeating the same action again and again. I'll have to experiment with my other skills later. At the moment, they're only sitting at the first level, so they still have a good way to go. Either way, it's going to be significantly easier to achieve my objectives of finding resources and creatures to hunt with two intact eyes. On that happy note, I close my eyes and drift to sleep. The next day, as planned, I absorb the hunting knowledge stone. An instant headache blooms. I'm very glad that I waited to absorb this stone as, from the wealth of information that is downloaded into my brain, I know I would have been unable to effectively assimilate it before. That said, as I go through my new knowledge, some of it does overlap what I've already learned, adding a depth to my understanding. Parts of the tracking skill where A plus B equals C like the depth of claw marks on a tree added to the height of them indicating the height and the size of the animal, now carry with them a greater meaning, in this case the size of the animal according to the range for its species indicated its age, sex, health, and therefore whether it would be a good idea to hunt or not. Of course, just as with the wilderness survival knowledge, some of these facts are no doubt not applicable to the creatures I'll actually be hunting, I hope that enough of the facts are correct that the knowledge will help me more than hinder. Other parts overlap with wilderness survival such as butchering, now I know not only how to actually separate the different parts of the animal, but I also know the signs to look for to avoid diseased animals or ones with parasites. The last bit gives me shivers, along with the knowledge of how to avoid parasites came mental images of what those parasites look like, and what they do to their unfortunate hosts. Frankly, I've been pretty lucky when it comes to drinking the water straight from the stream, I could easily have picked up something bad either parasite or bacteria. I should probably boil the water before drinking if at all possible. Some areas, 
however, are completely new, such as how to set traps. This particularly interests me thanks to one of my heretofore unused skills, Dominate. I suddenly realize that I can actually use that skill now, thanks to Calanthea's gift of willpower. If I can bond with some powerful creature, it will make my life a lot easier and traps will make that prospect a lot safer to attempt. Also included in this knowledge packet are how to make and wield a number of weapons essential to hunting, something I'm very glad to have since I'd never studied archery, spear wielding, or fletching, nor had I ever aimed to become a bowyer before being stuck here. When preparing for the day I start packing everything away into my inventory as has been my habit so far, but then pause. Do I really need to take everything with me? That's what I've done for the last few days, but then I've also been traveling for that time and sleeping somewhere different every night. Plus, won't I need the space in my inventory for my kills and any other useful resources I find? In the end, I leave my big orange suitcase behind, but I take my backpack and smaller lime green suitcase. I do clear a bit of space in my backpack, just in case, but I'm not keen on leaving my most precious items somewhere without my surveillance, for sentimental reasons as well as survival ones. Even though I'm pretty sure Calanthea isn't going to let just anyone walk into her cave. So, with nerves causing butterflies to flap around in my stomach, I set off out of the cave. Calanthea is sunning herself outside, laughing playing nearby. Just going off to hunt, I say cheerily, doing my best to cover my nervousness at actually going out intentionally to find dangerous situations. Dot seems counterintuitive to my desire to stay alive, but there we are. That's the crazy world I live in now. Success to your hunt, Marcus Wolf, she tells me calmly. I wish I could bottle some of that and take it with me. Still, no point stalling. I walk down the hill and start searching for signs of something that I could reasonably hunt, just because I'm being illogical and actually seeking out things that could kill me instead of staying where the only thing I have to worry about is a giant predator that I couldn't defeat even if it did try to eat me doesn't mean I'm going to be stupid about this. Wait. Something seems wrong about that sentence. Anyway, I'm going to pick and choose my prey. To minimize my risk. Dot deciding that the banks of the river would be a good place to begin my search, I start scanning the area. It doesn't take me much time to spot some evidence of the passage of different animals, my knowledge from both the tracking and hunting stones aiding me. I dither and hesitate, dismissing the idea of following one track after another. This one looks too big, this one too small. These tracks indicate a group of animals may be too numerous. Semicolon these a single animal, but probably a predator. Finally, I pick at random, spinning around and pointing to an area of the river. Stealing myself, I investigate my narrowed choice. Not going for the predator, instead I pick a small group of tracks which probably belong to a small group of grazers. As I follow them, misgivings start to rise. They are bigger than I thought just from their prints. The branches bent and damaged to either side as they head into denser ground coverage seems to indicate that, at least. Still, I push on, I have to hunt something. After a while, I start hearing the creatures. A snuffling, rooting sound. Actually, it's rather familiar. It sounds a bit like the creature which woke me up the night I spent hidden in a dead leaf shelter. It's probably not the same creature as I have moved a fair bit away from there but maybe there are lots of this type around. Taking more care when placing my feet, I head closer still. When I lay my eyes on my quarry, I'm surprised, I have to admit. At first I'd had the idea of some small creature with delicate paws. Once I'd seen the size of the animals and heard the snuffling, I thought of a pig. This is neither. The body of the creatures reminds me of a porcupine, though these quills are far shorter. More like a hedgehog, perhaps but they lay like a porcupine's. I don't doubt that the creatures are capable of moving them to stand upright in defense. In color, they are more of a murky brown than the black and white of a porcupine, and their snouts are more lizard-like. So far, most of the creatures I've come across since arriving seem to have had either reptilian or avian influences. The majority have probably been cold-blooded too, at least, the temperature of their blood has been lower than mine. Calanthe is the only mammal I've seen so far. Well, there are also the insects which aren't reptilian or avian, or mammal, but that's obvious. My potential prey have a little horn on the end of their snouts and it's this they are using to dig a little through the ground. I'm suddenly struck by the thought that a number of tasks would be easier if I had my own mobile plow. Although I don't need to break ground to build a shelter at the moment, I do need to plant the some of the beans. I'm you also going to need clay, probably from the river, 
and finding some type of edible tuber would be great. Actually, since these creatures probably eat the last, they might be ideal for that task, though their definition of edible may not match mine. But how would I capture them? And wouldn't that defeat the purpose of going on the hunt, to get energy? I have another misgiving now I've actually set eyes on the group, its composition. I'd known from the tracks that there were two larger animals and two smaller ones, but I'd thought it was two males and two females. It's not unusual for the different sexes to be different sizes, after all. Alas, the reason is far more contentious than that. It's a family. Mother, father, though I'll be damned if I can tell which is which, and two youngsters. Not babies, not precisely, but definitely juveniles of some sort. Their color is more faded, and they approach the task of rooting through leaves and dirt with more playfulness than their parents. In fact, as I watch, one of them misjudges how much effort it will take to uproot one plant and gets its horn stuck in the ground. Cute. I swallow and withdraw behind a tree. Can I do this? Can I take the parents away from the youngsters either by killing them or capturing them? Could I kill the juveniles? Even when I played games which happened to center around killing animals or people, and there were young ones in the game, I unconsciously avoided killing the children or babies. And that was when I knew that they were just bundles of code. This they're real. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 26, The Aggressor. It's an issue I have to face. Unless I restrict myself to only killing seriously wounded, ill, or very old members of the species, I will have to kill healthy members at some point, and all of those healthy members are potential mothers and fathers. Heck, I may end up killing a pregnant female at some stage, quite unknowingly. I do seriously consider only calling those which are likely to die anyway but dismiss the idea after a while. In the end, I have to recognize that I need to accumulate energy, or by the end of the year, I will die. Sorry, but the lives of a few animals don't outweigh my own life in my eyes. But can I apply that ruthless thought process to this family? No. I can't bring myself to kill them. If I only kill the parents, I'll probably be condemning the juveniles to death as they wouldn't still be allowed to hang around with the parents unless they needed to. The idea of killing the parents and then using dominate on the juveniles does cross my mind, but I decide not to in the end, I'd feel far too guilty every time I looked at them, knowing I'd been the cause of their parents' deaths. I've had too much experience with that particular strain of guilt in my life already. I withdraw quietly and carefully so I don't draw the family's attention and accidentally bring about the whole scenario that I'm trying to avoid. I keep the thought about using dominate on one of the species in the back of my mind, if I ever come across the tracks of a solitary, what shall I call them, poor cupid? Reptiline? No, if everything is reptilian, I'll run out of names if I begin them all with rep. Poor cupid, it is. So, if I ever come across the tracks of a solitary poor cupid, I'll see about capturing it. I follow my tracks back towards the river with a strange sense of calm. It feels good to have made a decision. I'll kill and capture healthy animals, that I know for sure. What I also know for sure is that I will do my best to avoid taking away parents from babies. Plus, that works better with my hunting knowledge, if you regularly kill the next generation, one day there won't be any more of that species left. In the end, I pick the tracks of a single creature, not wanting to repeat the same scenario as I just encountered. They weren't precisely the perfect tracks, the creature seeming a bit bigger than I would have preferred, but then I remember how different the poor cupids were from what I'd expected based on their tracks. Maybe that will happen again? As I'd thought. My tracking and hunting knowledge from another world can be rather misleading at times. It takes me perhaps a couple of hours to catch up with a creature I'm tracking. It's not moving that fast, but it had a significant head start on me. Approaching, I see a creature that reminds me of a chameleon crossed with a snail. That said, it's not slow, as one would expect from a creature like that. It has the curly shell of a snail, and a long body covered in scales. Unlike a snail, though, it doesn't crawl across the ground leaving a viscous trail behind it, but has feet rather like a chameleon's. Six of them. Two sets of legs have knee joints, or possibly hip joints, facing forwards, the rear set has the joints facing backwards. One would think this would add an ungainly sense of movement to the creature's gait, but it was not at all the case, though the extra set of legs does add an interesting sway. Now, how am I going to do this? The creature is not nearly as slow as a snail, what if I attack it and it runs away? Or what if I attack it and it attacks me in return? I wish I had a bow and some arrows, even Flint would do better than nothing. Then, it hits me. Flint. Sure, I don't have a bow and arrows, 
but there are ranged weapons all around me, ones that my ancestors used to great effect for many years. Retracing my footsteps a little so that I'm not likely to scare my prey off the moment I start casting around for stones, I pick up as many fist-sized lumps as possible. Once my pockets are full, I pick up the creature's trail again. Unfortunately for me, I know I'm not the most athletic of people, so I think I'd better get as close as possible before starting. Taking a couple of careful steps forward, I pause. Maybe better get my ammunition ready first. Putting a stone in each hand, I do a final once-over, nodding my head when all seems as it should be. Then, continuing my careful stalk forwards, I find myself wincing every time I step badly and a branch cracks or a leaf rustles. The worst thing is, I know how to walk quietly through this landscape in my head but my body hasn't yet learned how to follow instructions. I know it will come with time, I just hope I'll have enough of that. It seems like the Snillion, well, what else can I call it, doesn't have the most acute of senses, as it only seems to raise its head from the bush it's chomping on at the worst of my branch cracks. Its head, incidentally, is rounded and looks rather like some herbivorous dinosaurs in one of those old children's cartoons. While I can't rule out the possibility that this creature has some sort of defense mechanism, I do feel more of a sense of confidence about approaching this quarry than my previous, and that's not even taking the moral dilemma over the babies into account. I take my time lining up my first shot. It's a rough stone, which will hopefully do more damage than a round, smooth stone would. Then again, it also has more wind resistance. So, if I'm very lucky, it will hit the snooly on sharp points first, but frankly, I think I'll be content if I just manage to hit the creature at all. Extra points if I get the body. My focus narrows, and I launch the rock at the snooly on. Wonder of wonders, it hits. Unfortunately, it hits the shell and bounces off without causing more than a loud cracking sound. In an instant, the snooly on's defense mechanism engages. To my good fortune, it's not an offensive one. Instead, just like the snail I likened it to, the Snillion vanishes into its shell with an amazing flexibility. Almost as quickly as I could blink twice, the Snillion went from unaware to protected. Its curled shell sticks up in the air, rocking forwards once or twice as it gets used to its new position, perhaps 20 centimeters nearer to the ground than it was a second ago. By this point, I'm very curious about this creature. I walk over to it, a little cautiously in case it lashes out the moment I get close and place my hand gingerly on its shell. It's cool, warmer in an area where a ray of sunlight is shining. The creature when I arrived had been about a meter long with its legs being approximately 30 centimeters long when fully extended, but 20 centimeters in the normally somewhat bent position. Its shell added an extra 30 centimeters to its height, which had made me think I was dealing with a bigger creature than I actually ended up with. Now, it's just the shell around 30 centimeters high and almost that wide at its base. Its length is probably more like 40 centimeters, creating something of an oval-based, blunt-tipped cone. How a creature probably around a meter long and 10 centimeters or so in diameter manages to squish into this thing, I don't know, but the proof is in front of me. I push the shell a little, gently at first, and then harder. It rocks from side to side. Nothing happens. I'm very curious now but wary at the same time. I back away a bit, and then start throwing rocks at the motionless shell. I miss more than I hit at first, but my aim does improve. Nothing happens except for a rocking shell every time I hit, until one hit to the top lands with enough force to knock the creature over. I jump back in case it's capable of sending out some sort of ranged attack, but after rolling a little, the shell settles and becomes motionless again. Once more gingerly approaching the creature, I look with fascination at what? in a snail, would be its foot. In this case, their feet as the six feet of the creature seem to have locked together to create a solid barrier. I'm starting to understand this creature's place in the food chain. Much like other defense specialists, like the snail I thought of earlier, and a tortoise, this creature doesn't have speed on its side, nor does it have strong natural offensive ability. Instead, it's a walking fortress to probably most if not all of the creatures in this forest. It would need something with significant crushing power to get through the shell. I'm sure Calanthea would cope, but I'm equally sure she wouldn't bother unless she was unable to find anything better. And that's probably exactly the niche this creature exploits, being too tough for creatures its own level to deal with and not being an enticing enough target for those which can actually pose a threat to it. Based on its size, I reckon that the attacker would have to be able to open their jaws more than 30 centimeters at a minimum, 
as well as then apply bone crushing force to get through its shell. That's more than most of the creature on earth could boast, possibly more than any of them could cope with. Well, maybe a crocodile could cope, but then the Smulion would have to literally crawl into its open mouth for the crocodile to apply its immense pressure when snapping its jaws shut. Otherwise, I suppose there could be birds that are capable of lifting it and dropping it upon a rock to crack open the shell, but again, it's not that big, but it's probably big enough to cause difficulty for most birds. Plus, it's in the forest, not on the mountainside, meaning that one of those birds would have to come in past the forest canopy to find it. So in short, a pretty good defense mechanism. Unfortunately for this Snowleon, it's met me a mammal capable of using tools. Feeling a bit sorry for the creature that is defenseless against man, I still approach, hefting another stone in my hand. What defense is a tough shell when facing against someone with patience and a hard rock? Speed might be a better defense, but then again, humanity's ancestors were also capable of defeating that with patient, enduring pursuit. By about 10 hits in, I stop feeling sorry. This blighter is a tough nut to crack, or rather, a tough shell. I'm making a difference but I was expecting it to crack like an egg in a few hits, instead, it's only starting to show signs of cracking after 10. I did try another approach when I'd seen no benefit from my effort after 5 strong hits with a rock. Seeing its interlocked feet as a potential opening, I tried to pry them apart with my knife. Unfortunately, I don't find that I get very far with that approach. The hairline gaps between each foot are barely wide enough for my knife to slot in and I don't have anything like the leverage power I'd need. I even try whacking their feet with my mace, but the interlocked pad just seems to absorb the force of my hits with little trouble. Stymied, I return to my previous strategy. This time, though, I decide to use my mace for its extra power. By the time I reach 16 strokes, the Snidleon makes a move. I back away quickly as I see it emerging from its shell. It's not nearly as quickly leaving as it was in withdrawing, but I still keep my distance in case it's got something up its proverbial sleeve. I watch cautiously, preferring to potentially lose my prey than get injured, again. However, attack seems to be the last thing on this creature's mind as it heads straight for the nearest tree. Realizing it means to escape into the foliage either above or below, I go back on the attack. With its entire body now visible, I don't attack its shell again, but go straight for the head. It avoids my first two blows and even tries to latch onto my leg in a last ditch attempt to protect itself, but I dodge easily and finally manage to bring down my mace on its head. Victory is mine, but I don't get that same triumphant thrill which I did every other time I overcame my foe. I bite my lip as I try to figure out why. In the end, it strikes me that in my previous encounters, I was the victim, and when I won the struggle, I fought against the odds and aggressors which tried to pull me down. Here, I was the aggressor, and one with an advantage which my prey couldn't defend against. There's little glory or achievement in patiently beating at a shell with a rock or mace and then bashing in the occupant's head as it tries to escape. If anything, it makes me feel like the bad guy rather than the hero. I try to make myself feel better for repeating my reasons for going on the hunt in the first place and reminding myself that aiming for battles where I will probably get hurt at the minimum is not a good way to attempt to preserve my life. I remind myself that my ancestors would have chosen easy prey over hard prey 10 times out of 10, that's why they're my ancestors instead of dying before they could have progeny. I still feel guilty. I hesitate over butchering the corpse, but then eventually kneel down next to it. If it's a sin to have killed the creature in the first place. Wouldn't it be even more of one to just leave its carcass lying there abandoned? And if I end up muttering apologies and a little prayer over the body before digging in with my knife, who is going to know? Book 1, Leap, Chapter 27, Predator By the time I decide to head back to my campsite, I've had three successful hunts, and two unsuccessful ones, excluding my encounter with the poor cubics. Despite wanting to try out my class skill now that my willpower's over 10, I didn't in the end. Most of the creatures didn't seem worth it, and the one that did was far too aggressive for me to try. I have to marvel at the wildlife in this new world. At first I thought that everything here was either reptilian or avian, but now I'm wondering whether mammals have developed, or something like them. At least, I don't know if they give birth to live young and feed their young on milk, after all. Sure, that might seem strange since Calanthea is clearly a mammal. Though I wasn't there to confirm that she gave birth to live young, of course. That said, Calanthea is just so different from every other creature I've met here so far that I find it hard to liken her to them at all. I don't know if it's because, apart from the size, 
she looks so similar to a leopard on earth, or whether it's because it's the opposite, she's capable both of magic and conversation, telepathic, but conversation nonetheless and is therefore completely set apart from all these other creatures who are just, animals. Calanthea aside, I can confirm that two out of three successful hunts were warm-blooded, and only one of these had scales, though these were more along the lines of a pangle and than a lizard. The other had a rather coarse and bristly fur coat which, unfortunately for me, hit several venomous barbs. Added to these were two short but sharp tusks on either side of the creature's mouth which, while not envenomed in themselves, were used to great effect. Often, dodging the tusks meant exposing myself to the barb-covered tail. I have to admit that I was in a pretty bad way after killing the large badger, boar-like creature. The venom seemed to be an anticoagulate since my wounds bled more freely and took longer to close up. Lay on hands saved me, but my health did drop down to 5 units. I'll also admit to needing more than a breather after that to get over the near-death experience. Although I faced a few of those so far, facing them without my backup health potion in my satchel feels different. More, desperate. I try and ignore the worry because what other choice do I have? Of the two unsuccessful hunts, one was because I decided to back off when I caught up with a creature. It wasn't that big, but it looked rather well defended with sharp teeth and claws and an impressive jaw structure that looked more like a T-Rex than anything else. I'd probably take it on if I had a proper ranged weapon, or something with a long handle that I could use to keep it at a distance, but with only a knife, a sort of mace, and no armor. No chance. I failed the other for one simple reason, it ran away and it was too fast to catch. I'd tried my luck at one of those reptilian deer things, but as soon as it got wind of my approach, far sooner than any of the other animals, it disappeared into the surrounding foliage, its long tail balancing it from behind and its long, thin legs eating up the meters. So yeah, again, without any sort of proper ranged weapon, or a trap to immobilize it, I'm not likely to succeed with that creature anytime soon. Still, I'd only come close to death once in five hunts, that's got to be a record for me. And if nothing else, it indicates that as I thought, taking the fight to the creatures is much safer than them bringing the fight to me. I'll still take my wins where I can find them. Though, speaking of wins, my energy gain hasn't been as profitable as I'd hoped. Perhaps my estimates had been skewed by the killer chickens, gaining 45% in a single fight is clearly just as much as windfall as it had been an almost lethal encounter. 13 deadly carnivores which almost killed me despite the advantages I had of height and weaponry really aren't comparable to my experiences today. In total, I killed 3 creatures during the day. One was barely a threat and netted me a grand total of 1% for killing it. The Pangal in Keen was more of a threat, but barely so, and earned me 2%. My most challenging fight earned me 5%, bringing me to a total of 8% energy gain simply from hunting. I added another 3% by eating their hearts, and let me tell you that sap time out of the day when it came to building the fires and then cooking the meat. I also earned another 6% just from absorption, bringing my day's total to 17% gain. It's something that's for sure, but it's not a lot. There's a reason for that which comes to me from my system knowledge as I ponder the question. Carnivores can absorb energy from their prey just as much as I can, herbivores only have a natural daily absorption. Therefore, prey animals will generally be worth less energy than predators, although a herbivore which has survived for many years might have absorbed more than a carnivore which is still young. Equally, there are certain plants which are energy dense and can offer a significant boost to a herbivore, but these are rare. At least, they are in Nicholas world, who knows if that holds true here. Either way, two of the creatures I killed today were definitely herbivores, I'm not so sure about the poison badger because although it was a tough fight, its abilities seemed to be more defensive than offensive. Then again, I suppose if it had killed other creatures in defense, even without eating them it would still earn more energy than another herbivore. I already had some energy in my store, so when I look at my status screen, it tells me I'm up to 50%. Halfway there. If the next few days are similar in terms of gain, it'll take me another 3 days to level up. I feel frustrated at that, it shouldn't seem very long, 3 days felt short when it was a long weekend, for sure, but my time in this world has proven that 3 days can feel very long indeed. Then again, I do accumulate energy even while I sleep, so maybe it'll be a little less than 3 days. Plus, the more hunting I do the better I'll be at choosing prey and following its tracks. That should mean more kills, meaning more energy. As I trudge home tiredly, I consider whether it's better to hunt easy, 
herbivorous prey which is relatively safe but not very profitable in terms of energy, or hunt more of the poison badger type creatures or carnivores which are a lot more dangerous, but are commensurately a lot more worth the time. Or, what if there was another option, something which I'm going to have to get good at anyway if I want to start taming or dominating powerful animals, traps. The hunting knowledge I absorbed has given me quite a detailed understanding of traps, and there are several designs which I could put into practice even with the lack of equipment I have. The only problem is time, and resources. Almost all of the traps require cord of some sort and that will take time to make from either bark or sinew. Those traps which don't require cord, require digging a hole, again, time consuming. So maybe not traps right now. Maybe I just have to be patient and hunt for 3 days with this ineffective strategy, and then once I've got my first level, and first chosen skill, then I can rethink. I'll be going on a crafting kick at that point anyway, I'm missing my apartment and its creature comforts so I want to spend some time making my little cave into as much a home away from home as I can. Not to mention crafting a few things to improve my combat capabilities, I really need to upgrade my weaponry. Some armor wouldn't go miss either, but that seems rather far off with the tools I have available right now. By this time, I've got back to the cave. Calanthea and Lathany are already inside as night is falling. Strangely enough, I get the feeling that they're diurnal rather than nocturnal like leopards on earth are. Just more proof that they're not actually leopards. Marcus Wolf, Calanthea starts as she sees me. I freeze on my way to my cave and look over at her. She, thankfully, ignores my suddenly thudding heart. It's not that I think she's going to suddenly pounce, but my instincts can't forget that this is a massive predator who could kill me without even really trying. I'm sure I'll get used to it, but for now anytime she notices me. A shot of adrenaline goes through me. I must hunt tomorrow. I need you to watch over Lathany. Okay, I reply. What else can I say? I agreed to be the living babysitter, after all. It's a bit frustrating, though, given that I'm already chafing at the length of time it will take me to level up. I'll still get the daily absorption. I try to console myself. I'll need to go and get some water though, I add, realizing that I forgot to fill my canteen on my way up. Very well, she agrees but it must be a short trip as I will need the day to hunt. I shall wake you if you sleep over long. Is that an offer, or a threat? I can't decide, but ultimately conclude that it doesn't really matter. Calanthea's put her head down and is ignoring me again, the conversation is apparently over. I shrug a little and then duck into my little alcove. Lying down with a sigh of relief, I eat some food while I check my messages. I've been offered two points for strength, one for power, one for endurance, and a point each for dexterity and constitution which I decline with disappointment. Much as I'd like to increase my stats, and indeed need to for survival, it would just elongate the already annoyingly long time I have until I can level up, though, it was a close thing with the constitution point since that would have a direct effect on my ability to survive what this world throws at me. I'm tired. Sneaking around the woods all day with intermittent life and death battles is apparently rather exhausting. Who would have guessed? Yawning. I just lie down and try to sleep, although I could probably read outside by the light of the two, yes, two, moons, I'm too sleepy, though, if there's anything that makes it immediately clear I'm in a different world, it's the two pale orbs hanging in the sky and moving independently, one seems to be quicker than the earth moon and appears more frequently, the other seems to be slower, taking more time to cross the sky, but then not appearing for almost another 24 hours, actually, Without a watch, and reluctant as I am to turn on my phone with no chance of recharging it, I still have no idea of the actual day length. I'm pretty sure it's not 24 hours though, probably a few hours longer. I've come to that conclusion because I'm going to bed at dusk and generally waking up with dawn without feeling tired. That indicates to me that the night is at least 8 hours long. Then, I'm always really hungry by the time the sun hits its zenith and completely exhausted by the time it's hitting the horizon. Of course, those could also be due to the amount of physical activity I'm doing which I'm not at all used to, but I think there's more to it. In the end, I shrug. I have too many other things to think about to waste time questioning something that has such little relevance. At least I'm getting a decent amount of sleep without cutting into the day too much, that's more than I had at work. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 28, Cat Toy. The next morning, I wake to the sound of a chest rumbling growl. Ah, my alarm clock. 10 out of 10 for waking me up. The adrenaline rush of hearing a large predator growling menacingly gets rid of the grogginess straight away. Are you ready now, 
Marcus Wolf, she asks, a note of impatience in her voice. Just give me a moment, I groan, rubbing the sleep out of my eyes. I changed last night, but only into new clothes, so I don't need to do anything there. There was something though, water. I'll just get some water and then I'll be all yours, I tell her quickly making my way out of the cave and down to the river at the foot of the hill. As soon as I get back, Calanthea pauses to lick her cub's head, then lopes off. Lathany watches her go with a plaintive wail, but doesn't try to follow. She soon shakes off the melancholy and starts romping around the clearing at the top of the hill. Of course, I very quickly become pulled into her games and have to defend myself semi-seriously against the clawed and toothed bundle of fur which leaps at at me unexpectedly from behind bushes or after a period of much more obvious stalking. In between, she gets distracted by insects and small animals. Acting on yesterday's resolve to start boiling my water, I manage to find some time to make a small fire out in the open where I can still see the cub. She's curious about what I'm doing so I have to distract her with a few sticks while the fire gets going and then again once I've got my wok on to heat up with the water inside. Once the liquid's bubbling, I quickly tuck the hot pan into my alcove and pull the fire apart, keeping Lathany away until the sticks are cool. She seems to have a bit of a knack for finding trouble. I also have a moment of panic when she dives after a small animal near the edge of the hill and falls off. Rushing over, I see she's rolled down about halfway so I call for her with a slightly frantic note to my voice. She looks up at me, then down at the forest curiously. I call again and she looks back at me, hesitating for a moment longer. Then, perhaps deciding that the forest can wait for another day, she bounds back up and leaps at me, knocking me down. In the end, babysitting a leopard cub turns out to be a lot less relaxing than I thought it would be. She's a bundle of energy and doesn't sit still for a moment, until she conks at all of a sudden barely making it back into the cave before she's making cute baby snores. By this point, I could do with a nap myself, but decide that it might not be the best of ideas as I'm still on guard. Instead, I settle at the mouth of the cave, enjoying the sun while still fully aware of anything moving nearby. I pull out one of my books and read for a little, enjoying the time to relax. When Lathany wakes up she starts romping around and I put my novel away with a bit of regret. Fiddling with a stalk of plant rather similar to the grass of my home world, I'm amused when the bouncing flower stalk attracts the cub's attention. She bats at it for a while and I oblige her knee to play, making the heavy flower dance and twist in the air, then on the ground. She looks just like an overgrown house cat, the way she pounces and slaps at it. When she finally manages to get a good grip with her claws, she pulls it in close, rolling on her back and biting at it. I have an idea, grabbing some long thin grass leaves, I braid them in a plate. It's a little awkward, my head knows exactly what to do, but my fingers are terribly clumsy. The braid isn't nearly as neat as my memories say it should be, but it's not like I'm expecting this to last very long. Making a couple more braids, each one better than the previous, I pick up a few leaves and bits of grass. Binding them together into a little bundle with one braid, I tie the others to it and to each other. Finally, I grab one of the white bones that Calanthea and Lathany have already gnawed clean. Tying the loose end of my braid to the bone, I brandish my creation gleefully. Success! I've made, a cat toy. Lathany looks at me with her head cocked on one side, perhaps wondering what's made this strange looking creature so excited, but she soon learns how fun a dedicated cat toy can be. I use the bone to make the lure dart over the ground, bounce in the air and evade Lathany's pounces at the very last moment. It's surprisingly fun, for both of us. We play until we're both tired, and the improvised cat toy has been torn to shreds, then slump at the cave mouth. Lathany lies next to me, one paw touching my leg. It's very cute. Calanthea arrives back when the sun is on its downward trend, but has only got about halfway to the horizon, her chops still stained with red. Lathany's livened up again by then and goes to greet her with happy chirps. The nun mama ducks her head to nuzzle her cub and breathes in her scent for a few moments. At least, that's what I assume she's doing when she pauses, her head near Lathany. Good hunt? I ask as she moves towards the cave and, by default, me. Good enough to last me a few days, she replies lightly. I thank you for watching over Lathany. Sure, I shrug. She was no trouble. Calanthea pauses next to me for a moment then rubs her head against me gently, well, gently for her, it almost knocks me flying, then continuing on into the cave, she curls up on the bedding and Lathany starts playing with the twitching tip of her tail, good, she finally says, 
responding to the comment I'd almost forgotten I'd made, so distracted with her head butt, or head rub or whatever. I shall not need to hunt again for another three days. Okay, great, I comment, not sure how else to reply. When she says nothing more, I turn my thoughts on to what to do now. There's not much time left in the day, certainly not enough to go hunting. That said, I could do with dealing with my bounty from the last few fights. Although I took the hearts from the killer chickens and my prey yesterday, I didn't do much else, and I haven't done anything with the other carcasses in my inventory. Probably better do that as I'm running out of space. Going down to the river, I pull the corpses one by one out and deal with them. It's only in doing this task that I realize just how many creatures I've killed since being here. Good thing there's no risk go here. I muse Riley to myself. I'd probably have been in court for being a mass murderer of animals, or something. They're pretty varied too, and I collect some resources which I think will be quite useful. Scales from the pangol and kin which might be able to be turned into armor of some sort, barbed hooks from the snile peed, a watertight shell from the snileon, as well as a surprisingly long back sinew from the same, venom glands from the badger boar thing, though I only managed to get about half of them intact a rather ragged rabbit skin, a slightly less ragged snake skin, bones and meat of all types, of course, and fangs of different shapes and sizes. I end up with six slots full of different meat, the killer chicken meat stacks with the other bird meat, for some reason, and the snake and the snilepede also stack together. The snileon meat, however, is kept separate as is the pangol and lizard thing. My hoarder tendencies are coming out again, when I know how useful so many of these things can be. I don't want to leave any of them behind. But ultimately, I can't keep everything in my inventory, I don't have space, and I have no real way of preserving things outside of it. So, anything likely to rot soon apart from meat has to go. I keep some of the bones for boiling plus anything like fangs, barbs, and feathers which are unlikely to go off. They're in my inventory for now, filling all the slots. I'll pull them out later to keep in my alcove. Sinew, of course gets kept and I start planning on how to dry it, however I look at things, I'm going to need a lot of cord and sinew is probably the best place to start. That or bark, but I haven't yet spotted anything particularly suitable. After I've finished processing the carcasses, I'm in a bit of a state. I decide that washing off the blood and guts and other icky substances is most definitely necessary. About to strip off and jump right into the stream. I hesitate, perhaps getting naked and vulnerable right next to where blood has soaked into the earth of the bank is not the best idea. Heading upstream a bit, I get out of immediate proximity to the mess. In the end, I find the perfect spot for a bath. It's a naturally carved basin, obviously created by the water swirling around for some reason, but it's ideal for taking a bath without worrying about being swept away. Not that the stream is really strong enough to do that for me but Lathany would probably have to be careful. Something to consider if she decides to take the forest exploration a bit further next time. Stripping off my clothes, I leave my shoes and trousers on the bank but bring my shirt with me into the pool. The water is cool, but not overly cold. Enough to make a free zone of chill go up my spine, but not much more than that. Keeping my head on a swivel, I shift deeper into the pool and start rinsing my shirt. Blood got all over the sleeves and a few sprays hit me on my chest and face, so the shirt is pretty ruined, really. At least, if I'd been intending on going to a meeting that would be the case. Here, I don't think that the animals will care if I have blood stains on me, and at least these clothes are still mostly intact, unlike the others I've been wearing so far since being here. Still, I'd rather I don't stink of blood all the time, not only is it not particularly pleasant for me, but it's likely to attract creatures I don't want, and scare away creatures I do. Unfortunately, Cold water isn't the best for getting rid of blood stains, but it suffices to wash away the worst of the liquid, at least. The water is much more effective in cleaning my body, but even there I struggle at times, especially my hands which dealt with the fatty bits of meat as well as plain blood. It doesn't do anything for my hair, though, which by this point is starting to itch and feel greasy. Still, it's the first time in this world that I've had the chance to submerge myself in water and it's good to feel the accumulated grime of days wash off me. By the time I've finished cleaning, I look a whole lot better, but my skin doesn't really feel that clean. And I smell better, but not great. I suppose I've been spoiled by deodorants, shower gels and shampoos. Ah, sandalwood. Funny, really, I reflect as I sit back in the pool and stare up at the sky above. A bit dangerous as a position, I know, 
but hopefully a few minutes won't kill me, literally. Anyway, it's funny to think that my girlfriend used to complain when I didn't have a shower in a couple of days, but I never noticed my own smell. Now, I really can smell myself, and I wish I couldn't. Maybe I can create some soap at some point. Probably should. Who knows how many different types of bacteria are proliferating on my skin in this very moment. And now, though, I take a few moments just to watch the sway of the branches above, listen to the babbling of the brook, and feel the current of water flow past me. By the time I decide that I've had enough of a soak, night is already closing in. I squeeze as much water out of my shirt as I can, deciding not to bother putting it back on afterwards. Pulling my trousers on is a bit difficult as I have no towel to dry off but I succeed. Rinsing my knife, I put it away too. I take advantage of the opportunity to grab some more water in my canteen. Then, heading back up the hill, I use the last of the light to quickly start a fire outside to boil my water. While it's heating up, I arrange the non-inventory items before munching some cooked bird meat. Once the water has started bubbling, I put out the fire, not wanting it to cause a problem while I'm asleep. Finally, I drink some tea without tea leaves and fall into bed completely exhausted as always. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 29, Leveling Up. I'm staring at my status screen. I can't help it, I'm at 99% progress towards the next level and I'm just waiting for that number to tick over to 100%. My progress has been much quicker than I had expected it to be considering I was only looking after Lathania yesterday. This isn't because I've had a fortunate encounter with Energy Rich, but Easy Bray. No, it's due to my lacking calculations. Turned out, when I estimated 3 days, I forgot to account for the energy I absorb while inactive. I'd thought about it, been grateful that even while I was looking after a cute nundicub I'd still be making progress, but I didn't actually factor it into my calculations. I have been more fortunate in today's hunting, partly because 2 of the 3 creatures actually hunted me rather than me having to chase them down. In the end, I've gained 14% by killing 4 creatures and eating their hearts, better than the 11% of the day before yesterday but it's not ultimately this which has made the difference. When I checked my status this morning and realized I was already up to 77%, I have to admit that my eyes boggled a bit. By the time I killed my last beast and saw that I was up to 96%, I decided to call it today and head back to the cave. Over the last 20 minutes or so, I've got to have checked my status a hundred or more times. Anxious not to miss the moment I become able to level up. The only thing that overzealous checking has taught me is that I don't turn 11 units on the hour, every hour, no, it ticks up by one unit at regular intervals. I guess I could probably set my watch to it, if I had a watch, that is, May. It's not like I need to catch a train or anything, a few minutes here or there isn't going to make any difference. Anyway. I suppose the most important thing is that I actually have a relatively easy way of working out approximately how much time has passed between point A and point B as long as I look at my status screen at the start and end. There, a free zone of excitement runs through me as I see the progress percentage has changed. Funny, I don't feel any different. If it wasn't for the number in front of me, I wouldn't know anything about being able to level up. There isn't even a notification that tells me. Well. I guess I'll just have to keep an eye on the number in the future so I don't miss the opportunity to level up next time. Focusing on the box with the 100% in it, I think level up as hard as possible at the screen. A new notification appears, the status screen disappearing briefly. Congratulations, you have gathered enough energy to push your body to the next level. Would you like to level up, YN? Yes. I almost shout in my eagerness. It's a little embarrassing, actually. Even if the only ones around to hear are Tunundas who probably don't care. The words blur and reform. To level up, please choose the stats you would like to increase. You have 6 points available. Warning, if you do not assign all points now, you will be unable to use them later. You can choose to delay your level up, but you will not store any further energy until you do. Do you wish to continue to level up? Yes, I say, forcibly calmly this time despite my heart starting to thump hard and my status page opens in front of me again. Different from before, each of the stats has a plus sign next to it, and there is a 6 at the top of the page. 6 points, significantly better than it could have been, but still less than I hoped, especially considering what I've had to go through to get to this point. Making my choice doesn't take much thought, 
I've spent plenty of time today thinking and planning about where to assign my points depending on the number I have available. I'd secretly been hoping that I'd have at least 9 so 6 is a bit of a bummer, but I had made plans for if I only had 2 or 3 available, so at least it's better than that. I've considered and discarded multiple strategies. The system stone has made it clear that a min-max strategy taken to the extreme is not feasible since all the stats work together but everyone seems to have one to three stats they focus on more than the others. It makes sense for a farmer to have more stat points in the physical stats, compared to a scholar who would have the reverse distribution. They wouldn't go as far to call the other set of stats dump stats though, as this would have negative effects on their chosen stats. For example, a farmer who puts all his points into constitution, dexterity, and strength would find that they are incapable of thinking through their activities of the day as well as unable to build bonds with their animals and their land, and unable to motivate themselves to do anything. The scholar with the reverse strategy would be in for frustration as their mind moves far faster than their body is capable of keeping up with, and would find themselves constantly beset by various malaises due to their poor constitution. So I need to keep my stats reasonably balanced but it is very tempting to put more stats into my physical abilities as those are what are keeping me alive at the moment. Strength will improve my ability to do damage to my opponents, dexterity improves my dodging and precision, and constitution, well, it's in the name. The only thing that stops me from just putting two points in each physical stat is the fact that dexterity and strength are relatively easy to train, the others aren't, at least not where I am now. Constitution is best trained by surviving experiences that might easily have killed me, my experience with the wolves are a case in point. The problem is that such situations can easily get out of hand and just plain kill me. Intelligence is relatively easy to increase for people who have access to a library or teachers, for me, not so. Wisdom seems to always be a bit difficult to work on actively. As for willpower, if the knowledge from the system stone is to be believed, and I really, really hope it is, otherwise I'm completely sunk, then even people in Nicholas world aren't quite sure how to train that. So, ultimately, I make the decision to shore up my weaknesses a bit. Willpower isn't really an issue at the moment thanks to Calanthea's blessing, so I don't put anything there. Instead, I split the points unevenly among intelligence, wisdom, and constitution. One, three and two points respectively. It's fortunate that I don't second guess myself as it seems to be impossible to remove a point once chosen. When the final point has been added, the status screen disappears and is replaced by another message. You have chosen to increase your wisdom would you like to increase your breadth or your depth? Breadth, depth. I look at the message with bafflement. Breadth, depth? What is it talking about? For once, the system stone knowledge is no help as nothing surfaces from whatever I absorbed. Either it was never there to begin with, or I lost it in the process of absorption. Guess I need to consider the question myself, then. Breadth, a word similar to width. Depth, that's a little more self-explanatory. If we were talking about a lake here, I'd know exactly what it was trying to describe, but it's a little less clear when it comes to wisdom. Then again, maybe my image of a lake is helpful. Perhaps breadth is about a wide sort of wisdom, and depth is a deep sort? I'm not sure that actually helps me in any way. I breathe out a frustrated sigh. Perhaps Calanthea would know, but when I try to move, I realize I'm rooted to the ground. It sends a flutter of nerves through me, just as well I did this back at the cave instead of out in the woods. It seems that I'd be helpless against an attack if one came. In the end I don't spend any more time debating over the meaning of the words. Ultimately, I decide that I'm having to be a bit of a jack of all trades here, so breadth is more likely to suit me than depth at the moment. If the implications go deeper than that, I'll have to just figure it out later. A problem for future me. I make my choice and the box disappears, but a moment later reappears with the same message. I click on breath again with a frown. When the box disappears and reappears a third time, I start wondering whether something's gone wrong. Perhaps it doesn't like me choosing breath. I try selecting depth and this time the box disappears not reappearing again a moment later. I've only got enough time to briefly consider the fact that I chose to add three points to wisdom and was offered the same choice three times before a strange feeling goes through my body. It's almost like a lightning bolt in its power, but it's not painful, just, 
strange. Then the prickling starts and I regret my thought about there being no pain. I grin my teeth as the prickles become more like pins and needles. And then those pins and needles stop pricking me and start stabbing me. At the point when I think I'll lose the battle against my voice and scream, it suddenly cuts out and the most heavenly feeling descends. All I can liken it to is having a painful massage which you hate at the time, but afterwards, once the aches have gone away, you feel so relaxed and loose and at peace with yourself. Like that, except times 10. I bask in the moment of bliss, my eyes closing. Of course, it's far too short. And the next thing I know, I'm puking up my guts. I'm not sure that's actually a metaphor. As I stand, I realize there are more lumps in the mess than the food I ate several hours ago would account for. Plus, there's the whole color and smell. It's black or really dark brown, and smells like a dead animal which has been left to putrefy in a sewer for a couple of weeks. It tastes even worse. Retching just at the taste and smell of it. I stumble away on legs that are as limp as a wet noodle. Once I'm far enough from the puddle of vile, substance, I use some water to rinse out my mouth and chew on some bird meat to try to clear my taste but, incidentally, the killer chickens do actually taste like chicken. A quick dip into the system lore memories informs me that what happened is actually normal. While frustrated that I apparently missed this part of leveling up despite going over the knowledge I absorbed about leveling up while waiting for my energy store to tick up to 100%, I'm you also relieved that I'm not about to keel over dead. Apparently part of improving the body means clearing it of impurities formed by diet, living conditions, even genetic defects. It'll probably happen a few more times, obviously, the number of times varies depending on the individual and their previous living conditions, but after a time, my body should have cleared its impurities and then I'll just be building on steady foundations. Unfortunately, right now I've just puked vile gunk just in front of Calanthea's cave. And from the rumble she's making, she's not very happy about it. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 30, Fade. Sorry, I tell her sheepishly. I'll clean up. I was just leveling up. There's a huff and the rumble cuts out, but no words. Matching action to words, I do my best to clean up. It's unpleasant, but after I've hauled away as much as the mess as I can, and have buried the rest with earth, the smell clears fairly quickly. Sitting back down in the fading light. I pull up my status screen and look at my new stats. Name, Marcus Wolf. Race, Human. Class, Tamer. Level, 1. Energy to next level, 0%. Energy absorption rate, 11 U per hour. Energy towards debt, 0%. Intelligence, 7. Mana, 70-70. Wisdom, 6. Mana regeneration rate, 150 U per hour. Willpower, 15 plus 3 plus 20%. Health regeneration rate, 18 U per hour. Constitution, 7. Health, 70-70. Strength, 6. Stamina, 30-30. Dexterity, 4. Stamina regeneration rate, 40 U per hour. Class skills, dominate, beginner 1. Tame, beginner 1. Non-class skills, lay on hands, novice 3. It's all much as I'd expected including the fact that my constitution ratio is back to 110 after restoring my vision. My doubled wisdom has doubled my mana regeneration meaning that I regain 2.5 units per minute. Effectively, that means I could cast a new lay on hands every 4 minutes. Much better than previously. With the extra point in intelligence, I also have additional lay on hands casts in the tank. My health points have been increased by 20, more than half of what I'd had previously. Combined. These three factors could save my life. Maybe another cast of my healing magic would have made the difference in the Walsard fight, or maybe my higher health points would have meant that I didn't get as low to begin with. Either way, I suddenly feel a lot better about my survivability in the near future. One thing worries me, though, I still haven't made any progress towards my energy debt. Is it that the energy debt is so big that even enough energy to level up isn't enough to reach 1%? Or, more concerning, is it that energy gathered towards leveling up doesn't actually count towards the debt? I push this question away too, I've only been in this world for a few days, I've got time to worry about it later. Ultimately, I'm satisfied with my advancements. Sure, they could have been better, but they could have been significantly worse too. Right, now my aim is to stay at level 1 for a while and try to earn as many natural points as possible. I figure I'll accept as many points as I can the energy coming mainly from my daily absorption. Since it's actually possible to increase my stats without using energy as a shortcut, even if I don't have enough energy I'll know I'm still making progress. Speaking of progress, 
there should be something more for me that comes along with my level up, my new skill. I'm a little surprised that it didn't flash up like the message about assigning my stat points did, but maybe is not considered part of the level up process as much as just a side benefit. Now I think about it, there's that nagging feeling of a message waiting for me. Opening up my message box, I click on the new message available. Congratulations, you have earned one skill point. Would you like to see the selection of your available skills? or save the skill point for later. Skill list, bank. I pick the obvious choice. A short list of three available skills forms itself on the blank space hovering before my eyes. Fade, one. An essential skill for the stealthy attacker, Fade offers the ability to be concealed from others' awareness by using a mixture of bodily control and magical concealment. At lower levels, this skill works fully only when you are unmoving. As skill levels progress, your ability to move while staying concealed improves. Note, this skill works primarily to conceal the user from sight. Concealment from other physical senses scales with willpower, concealment from esoteric senses scales with wisdom. Stun, 1. Release your remaining mana in a single, directed blast from your hands to render your opponent unmoving for between 1 and 10 seconds. Note, the effects of the blast depend on both the amount of mana remaining, and distance from the epicenter of the discharge. The disparity between your willpower and that of your opponent will also partially determine the length of time the target is stunned. Maximum effect can be achieved at full mana and when touching the target. Track, 1. Notice and be able to follow marks which show the passage of your target. This skill scales with intelligence. You have one skill point available. Either choose a skill to use your skill point now, or say bank to store the point for later and close the skill selection menu. Two skills I really want, one skill that overlaps far too much with the knowledge I have about tracking anyway to consider choosing. Well, at least it makes narrowing down the possibilities to two easier. As for the other two options, they're hard, in part because they indicate the direction that I could take my build in. Fade is clearly more of an ambusher's aid, and would definitely complement the archery I'm planning on engaging in. Stun, on the other hand, is much more of a close-range skill. Or, of course, an emergency escape tactic. I find it interesting how most of the skills I've been offered have been based on the mental, soul stats. Only Fade mentions bodily control which I would guess links to one or more of the physical stats, but even that scales off wisdom and willpower. Not what I'd expected. Anyway, I need to choose one skill for now. Fortunately, I know that at level 5, I'll be offered the skills I passed over this time plus some other options, so I can always choose my second favorite then, if nothing better has appeared. So, fade or stun, the choice of saving the skill point for later doesn't appeal. I need these skills now and if I can't have both now, I'll at least have one. As for which one, in the end, the choice is evident. An emergency lifeline might be a literal lifesaver, but I can't base my tactics on plan B. I actually need a plan a first. Using range was how humans moved past cavemen, range is how I'm going to survive this forest arena. Although, I suppose that with sufficiently high support stats, stun could be used at range too. I pick fade before I can overthink it. I open my status screen again and look at the lines below it that talk about my skills. There's a new addition, as expected. Class skills. Dominate, beginner 1. Tame, beginner 1. Fade. Beginner 1. Non-class skills. Lay on hands. Novice 3. So, now time to test my new skill. I wonder how to do so for a few moments, before just shrugging and standing still. I think fade and then just wait. Nothing seems any different. When I look at myself out of the corner of my eye I can see everything just fine. Is it not working? I hesitate for a moment before poking my head in the cave. Calanthea? I ask tentatively. There's a huffing sound and she lifts her head from where it's lying on her massive paws. Can you tell me if there's any effect to this? To what? In answer, I reactivate Fade. Calanthea huffs again, but this time I detect a slightly curious sound to it. She stands up and pads over to me, sniffing at me and twisting her head one way and then the other. So? I ask after the silence draws on. Shifting a little, her eyes fix properly on me again. A strange sensation, she tells me. I could hear you and smell you. But when I looked directly at you, my eyes told me you were not there. Huh. Interesting. What about when you didn't look directly at me? I ask, curious. I could catch a glimpse of your form, but only because I knew you were there. There was something about the energy around you which tried to convince me you were something other than what you are. Thanks, Calanthea. 
I say after a few moments of thinking. I just got this new skill and was testing it out. Ah, the benefits of being human, she says sagely, turning around to curl back up on her bedding. I notice Lathany snoozing away in a little heap nearby. Something in her words catches my attention. Do you not have skills? Perhaps it's a little intrusive, but the question just slips out. She looks at me for a long moment, her golden gaze unreadable. No. Beasts, however advanced and powerful we are, don't have skills, those are the purview of humans alone. Humans, she says, in a world which is apparently uninhabited by the same. Just more proof that wherever Calanthea is from, it's not here. But that's beside the point. So what do you have? I mean, you made my cave with magic or something. She turns her head a little and huffs, her version of a shrug. I think beasts advance as we gain more and more control over energy, first that of our own bodies, and then that of the outside world. No beast's control is exactly the same as another's, unlike human skills. With that, she puts her head down on her paws, obviously done. I'm curious but don't want to bother her with my questions so I just thank her again and then go back outside to leave her in peace. Very interesting. If I put it in earth comparisons, it sounds like, well, if we compare energy to cookie dough, beasts are using a knife and humans are using a cookie cutter. They might approximate the same shape, but the cookies made with a knife are always going to be slightly different whereas the ones made with the cutter will be identical, unless the cookie dough sticks in the cutter, but maybe that's taking the metaphor a bit too far. Well, at least I know the thing works, and I understand its limitations a bit more too. I'll still need to be quiet, and it will be better to approach prey from downwind. Plus, creatures which don't rely primarily or at all on sight will probably not be much affected. I guess it wouldn't affect heat sensing abilities either but I get the impression Calanthea doesn't have those. Still, the fact that it worked to an extent on something as powerful and intelligent as my Nunda protector indicates how well it will do on other creatures. It's a bit disconcerting that I can't actually tell whether it's working or not except by its effects. I can imagine that when I use this to hide from some creature, I'll be at risk of soiling my pants, not knowing if I'm hidden in plain sight or not. At least breathing doesn't seem to count as moving. It would rather limit the amount of time I could use the skill if I had to hold my breath. Now, what does it use as fuel? Stamina or mana? I activate it again, watching my status screen to see how it affects me in numerical terms. The bars always in my vision are good for approximate measurements, but not for finer detail stuff. After several goes, I discover that it mostly consumes stamina, but also a bit of mana. It seems to be a 1 to 4 ratio, so for every minute I'm in fade. I consume 1 unit of mana and 4 of stamina. As my stamina is the much lower value, that currently limits my skill use to 8 minutes at maximum, taking into account my stamina regen. Not all that useful now, but if I dedicate some points or training to the endurance part of strength. With my level up done, my skill picked and tested, and my new stats experimented fault with, it's now time to pick up some resources for my first priority tomorrow morning creating a chimney. It may not be necessary for survival, but being able to light a fire in my little cave without worrying about dying from smoke inhalation seems like luxury. A luxury I desperately want. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 31, Pressure. I've been going without a fire most of the last few days. In fact, I've only really Lee T. 1. To boil water once a day and to cook the hearts of beasts I've killed and that only because I know the energy in it will be wasted if I wait or put them in my inventory. Even after finding a safe spot, I haven't wanted to risk upsetting Calanthea with smoke filling the cave or Lathany accidentally burning herself either in the fire itself or on the embers left behind. I've been living off the meat I'd cooked in bulk previously, and that's not too bad, to be honest, since my inventory keeps it hot, but I'm running low on that and, honestly, could do with some variety. I carefully keep my mind away from all the things I miss. Pizza, pasta, cookies, cheeseburgers, damn. Evidently, trying not to think of the pink elephant failed miserably. Now I've found a spot I'm likely to stay in for a while, I want to work out which of the local plants can be eaten, and then we'll probably start cooking with them in hopes that they will give a bit of variation to my diet. But to do all that, I need a chimney which will direct the smoke to the hole in the wall that Calanthea made, and that means I need clay. Fortunately, 
With the hunting I've done over the last few days, I've also been able to identify a number of really important resources, a likely spot for river clay being one of them. It's a good hour's walk from the cave, so I probably have just enough time to go there and dig some out before returning for nightfall. Once more, I thank God, or Nicholas, for my inventory. The thought of otherwise having to make multiple trips makes me very grateful for it. As I walk, I keep my eyes open, both literally and figuratively. There is so much to see, between fauna and flora, that I could probably walk this same route a hundred times and still find something new every time. Suddenly, something I see makes me pause. Tracks, of a porcupig. A single one. They aren't old, the creature is probably not that far away. I bite my lip, considering. Do I follow them? If I do, there's no guarantee that I'll have time to fetch the clay, but the possibilities. In the end, I make a snap decision and refuse to let myself second guess it. I follow the tracks, almost automatically by this point shifting into a quieter, sneakier gait. Even as I step quietly through the forest, I marvel at the difference between this and the first time I tried it. I won't deny that I still make some noise, when the ground is covered in dead leaves, I still haven't quite grasped the technique of not crunching them a little, but it's a lot less than at the beginning. Well, I suppose I have had a lot of practice. The niggling sensation which normally indicates a message waiting in my inbox suddenly appears as I start to hear the noise of the poor cuba wrestling and rooting through the leaves. Debating with myself, I end up deciding to check, who knows, it could be something important that makes me abort my hunt. I tuck myself behind a tree, after making sure that there's nothing visible up in the branches above and likely to drop on me. Then, opening my message box. I read the new notification. Congratulations. You have earned a skill, stealth. Read skill description? YN. I roll my eyes a little as I choose to see the skill description. Does anyone ever say no to reading a description of the skill they've just earned? Actually, I think suddenly, since when is it possible to earn skills? Question mark I thought we gained access to skills only at certain level intervals. Though, when I think about that fact, I realize that actually nothing I learned from the stone says that this is the only way to gain skills, it's just the only way that's specified, huh? So I can gain skills outside of being offered them on level up somehow. Cool. Actually, the more I think of it, the better it becomes. Skills have proven to be an important part of my survival strategy. If I hadn't had lay on hands from the get-go, I'd have been toast on the second day here. Fade seems pretty useful and I'm about to try one of my other skills now. Up until now, though, I've been limited to the initial skills I was given and what I can choose on level ups. Now, though, if I can develop the right kind of skills somehow, my likelihood of survival will shoot up. I guess I'll have to figure out how to do that later. And now, let's see what I've just given myself. Stealth, passive and less actively turned off. At the cost of a little stamina, you are harder to hear and to detect especially when staying still. When faced with something that will cause a disturbance, you will have a better understanding of how to either stealthily avoid the area completely, or step on it in a way which will not alert an observer. Higher levels of dexterity increase your chances of being successful and being stealthy. As stealth improves, you can either choose to blend in better with the dark or with the colorful. Both of these effects use Monet to create. Close message? YN. Not much dissimilar from what I'd have imagined of a skill called stealth. Although slightly disappointing, apart from the last two lines, it just basically sounds like what I've been doing to a greater or lesser extent since I arrived in this world. Or at least, since I absorbed the survival stone and realized I needed to do it. By this point, I'm starting to be able to realize. Before, I step on a crackly leaf or crunchy twig, and then take evasive measures. Still, I guess the skill might just make the task easier. Though if it drains my stamina and stops me from using fade as much, I'll probably turn it off. That's an interesting point, though, I haven't heard of a skill that is passive unless you want it off. All my other skills, I have to activate, well, actively. Dot so, what? If I improve this skill then I'll become a heart attack on legs, padding up to old grannies on silken feet and scaring them into the grave. I make a wry gran and my own morbid humor. I do hope, though. That the last two lines of the description mean what I think they do, either shadow magic or magical camo would be awesome. Dot though perhaps magical camo would make fade rather unneeded. Ah well, we're too far away from that to worry about it, I think to myself, closing my screen down. And now, not wanting to risk my hunt with an untried skill, I deactivate it, 
but activate fade. Creeping closer to the poor Cupig's location, it soon comes into view. As I'd thought, it's rooting through leaves, the small horn on its snout easily flipping them over. It's chewing something crunchy, fully engrossed in its meal. A good opportunity, I decide. Now, how to do this? The two biggest concerns I have are its quills and it potentially running away. If I had a net, I'd be able to snag both of those with no problems, but I don't. That said, if I'm willing to make the sacrifice, I have something else that would probably work. I wrestle with myself, but ultimately decide that it's worth the pain. Grimacing a little, I withdraw my jacket from my inventory. I'd put it in there for later when the temperatures drop, but it seems like I've found another use for it. I just hope that I'll be able to repair it at some point. Holding the jacket, fade still active, I step forward one pace at a time, approaching the poor cubic from behind. Three meters between us. Two meters. One. I throw the jacket's soft side down over the quills. The poor cupic startles as it feels something land on it and whirls around quicker than I had expected. We're face to face, both frozen for a moment in surprise. Then that lizard-like snout lets out a snarl and lowers so I'm facing the small horn. A moment later, the creature charges and I only just manage to throw myself out the way. I push myself up as quickly as possible, the poor cupic already sliding to a stop. There's no time to think. I have to just act. Diving on the poor cupid would probably be a death sentence at any other time, but my jacket is doing its job and, although I can feel the quills beneath it, my jacket is stopping them from rising. My weight pushes the creature to the ground, stopping another form of attack, although it might have done some damage with the momentum of the charge, down on the ground with me pinning it is a different story. It still does its best to break free, thrashing and trying to buy me. It's a mess for a while its front paws flailing around, its mouth snapping at anything in range, my hands trying to find a space which isn't either quill or biting mouth, and my face trying to stay away from the various body parts threatening it. Fortunately, my body weight is pinning its back legs and middle section, otherwise it would be even more difficult to manage than currently. Come on, dominate. I spit out in between curses. Nothing happens. Dominate. Damn it dominate exclamation mark my eyes meet the horizontally slip pupil golden ones of the poor cube begin suddenly we both freeze the rest of the world fades away and it's just the two of us staring at each other we're frozen unable to move towards or away from each other or at all really instead there's a sense of pressure a pressure which mounts every moment not a pressure that comes from above but from between us it's uncomfortable and every instance that passes makes it even more so. I push back, not physically, but mentally. It's more instinctive than thought out, but there's a part of me that refuses to be crushed, that sets metaphysical hands against the weight and pushes. Dot the pressure lessens, slowly at first, and then faster and faster. Suddenly, I can move. I step forwards, following the sense of receding pressure. Bit by bit I move closer to the still frozen poor cubic. Our gazes are still fixed. Even when we're only a few centimeters from each other, the sense of pressure is still there, but I can feel that it's not directed at me. It's like I'm standing holding a powerful hose jetting out water. You can feel the power in the hose, the sense that if you let go it will spray everything, including you, but that at the moment, you're the one in control. And the poor cube begins in the direct path of the stream of water. Of course, there isn't actually any water nor any physical evidence of the pressure I can feel. No evidence at all except for what I see in the poor cupid's eyes, what I feel emanating from the creature in front of me. A determined resistance that crumbles bit by bit until finally, it gives in. I see the sad acceptance flood the creature's gaze and it dips its head in what feels like acknowledgement, the first time it has moved since we entered this space. And with that, the world snaps back into focus, the sudden vibrancy almost a shock to the system. Book 1, Leap Chapter 32, Biological Digger For a moment, I feel disorientated and blink quickly at the suddenly bright light piercing my eyes. Fortunately, neither effect lasts long and I'm soon fighting fit again. Though, if that's the result of a successful dominate, at least, I'm pretty sure it was successful. What would it have been like if I'd failed? The poor cupid is still alive, I can feel it breathing steadily but all that frantic fight has left it. Has it worked? Only one way to test. I withdraw slowly, ready to shift my weight back onto it at any sign of it deciding to restart the wrestling match. By the time I'm sitting back on my heels, there still hasn't been any movement beyond breathing. I look up towards its face, wondering if it's unconscious. Not so, 
Those eyes are looking at me calmly. The sad acceptance I'd seen there in our battle has gone, and I'm not exactly an expert in poor cubic body language, but what I do read there makes me wonder. It's relaxed, waiting, watchful, and there's a wariness there, but mostly just waiting. For what? For me to kill it? For me to leave? Or, for me to give an order? If my skill has worked the way I'm expecting it to, this creature should now be under my control. Stand up, I say eventually unable to help the slightly questioning lilt to my voice. When the poor cubic shifts, I can't help myself from quickly regaining my feet, my hand on my knife hilt. Fortunately, for both of us, it just stands up and then waits quietly, mostly unmoving. Okay, that's pretty cool, I admit to myself, a sense of glee building in my stomach. Let's try something else. Walk over to that tree and then back again, I order it, pointing at a tree a few meters away. Without complaint, the poor cubic obeys the letter of my command. Okay, now dig in that spot, I tell it, once more pointing at a spot on the ground near where it had been rooting before. Once more, it obeys my command to the letter. What I do notice is that it digs in the spot to which I pointed it, and nowhere else. Stop. I was wrong before. This isn't pretty cool. This is damn awesome. I've now got a biological digger under my command. And I've tested out one of my class skills and it's just as good as I was hoping. After detaching my jacket carefully from the poor cupid's quills, grimacing at the number of rips and holes in the inner layers, I set off towards the river clay area, casually ordering my new follower to, well, follow. Reaching the area I'd spotted yesterday, I'm able to confirm that, indeed, it's a spot that contains river clay. It's something of a floodplain. I think the inner part of a river bend which is low enough to be flooded when the river is swollen with recent rainfall, but high enough not to be underwater all the time. Either that, or the river smoothed over time, cutting more deeply into the other bank and eventually leaving its old course mostly dry. Either is possible, really, or both. The point is, it's been underwater long enough to have accumulated the fine silt which makes up river clay, but it's dry enough for me to access it. With my new biological digger, it probably takes a third of the time to accumulate a good amount of clay than it would have taken me by myself. I pack the clay into my inventory, filling one slot until it refuses to accept any more, and then fill a second. I'm no great judge of clay, the memories I received being more about uses of clay than assessing its quality, but it seems decent enough. A good number of rocks and stones as well as the finer silt which is really what I want but that's always going to be the case. It's not like popping down to my nearest art shop to order a bag of pottery clay, is it? The large quantity of impurities just mean more processing will be required to make usable clay out of, essentially, river mud. As for the quality of the clay itself, the proof is in the pudding, or in this case, the firing. When I reckon I've got enough to be getting on with for now, and knowing I can always come back here later, I tell my new pet to stop and follow me again. It does so docilely, trotting at my heels, its head reaching about the height of my knee and its quills just about mid-thigh. As I walk home, I feel like I'm riding high on glee and excitement. Visions flash through my mind of a legion of beasts, protecting me, hunting for me, working for me, making life so much easier and more comfortable than it has been ever since I arrived here. And best of all, they probably won't complain, and they certainly can't decide to quit my employee because I haven't raised their salary recently. I look back at the pork you began to accidentally meet its gaze again. A sense of unease niggles at my belly and I look away again. I don't know what that was about. The sense of unease continues to be present throughout my walk back home, becoming more urgent whenever I happen to notice the poor cupid's presence. Eventually, I do my best to ignore it following me not wanting to deal with the sensation more than necessary. To distract myself, I decide to test my new stealth skill now I'm not in the middle of a hunt. As I move carefully through the forest, I notice that my newest skill is both more and less than I thought it would be. Less, in that I admit I harbored some secret hope that despite what it said in the description, it would still be some epic tool which would make me the stealthiest stealther who ever stealthed, or something like that. More, and that I'd also feared that it was basically just describing the skill I had learned with the promise of future awesome improvements. In reality, I don't even notice it working until the moment when I suddenly realize I'm about to put my weight on a stick that's bound to crack loudly. I've already shifted my weight forwards, so it's either step on the stick or fall over, which will create as much if not more noise than just stepping. Then, the fraction of a second before my foot lands, something happens. Some minute adjustment is made and although I do step on the stick, 
I don't put any weight on it and it remains unbroken. Knowing this is an example of my skill activating, I quickly check my stamina pull by pulling up my screen, the little bar in my peripheral vision really isn't accurate enough for this sort of thing. It's at 26 out of 30. That means this little maneuver probably consumed 3 or 4 units of stamina. Probably more on the 3 side as I'm also walking which does consume stamina over time, even if it's only small amounts. Well, that's not too bad as long as it doesn't activate when I'm really low, even though if I combine it with fade I'll be bottoming out quite quickly. Unless I aim to put more points into strength, endurance, or dexterity as a priority. Then a thought strikes me. It didn't specify the amount of stamina that would be used, what if there is no standard amount? What if it changes each time? I have reason to believe that could be the case, lay on hands changes its mana consumption depending on the severity of the wound and how much focus I put into it. I decide to test it, which ends up being a bit of a frustrating exercise. The main problem is, I don't know when the skill's more active part will suddenly activate so I end up stomping on a lot of twigs and noisy leaves before my test gives me enough data to work with. In the end, I conclude that I'm right, stealth does change its consumption. It seems like how much it takes ranges from a single unit to, maybe, six units. It's, as always, hard to get absolutes here, but I have to guess that one unit is the lowest as that's my result once and the system doesn't seem to like fractional numbers. As for six, it's the highest that I get during my test. But since one of the main factors seems to be how much concentration I'm paying, I can't really test fairly since I have to be aware that the test is happening in order to notice how much stamina has been used. Anyway, the cost seems based essentially on how much effort it will take to redirect my body to avoid making the noise. That means that if I notice before I've shifted my weight, and consciously decide how and where I should move to avoid the issue, the stamina cost is minimal. If, however, I only notice the issue once stealth has intervened, it costs me more. Makes sense, I suppose. By the time I've finished testing to my satisfaction, the hill's in sight and I'm quickly climbing it, my spiky follower still at my heels. Glancing at him briefly brings back that uneasy feeling which I had managed to put to the back of my mind while testing out my new skill. Cresting the hill, I walk towards the cave mouth still musing over why exactly I'd be feeling uneasy at finally putting into use one of my class skills. It's getting dark, and it's darker besides in the cave. Still, there's enough light for me to make at Calanthea's shape and I murmur a quiet greeting. Used to my words usually attracting a huff or nothing at all, I am surprised when she actually responds verbally. Greetings, Binder, she purrs. Have you brought me a snack? Grinsler are small but tasty. For a moment, her meaning is as clear as mud. Then, as I glance around me and my eyes alight on my follower, I understand. Oh. Oh. In hindsight, maybe I should have considered the giant predator that I live with before bringing my tasty looking new pet home with me. Then again, this was always going to happen because I reckon any creature I'll be able to claim in the next year will probably count as prey for the Nunda. Um, no, I say, searching for words. Can you not eat this, uh? What did she call it? Grendel? No, Grinsler, that's what it was. This Grinsler, please. I've, um, bound it. I want it to work for me, not be eaten. Very well, she sighs. Make sure that your bound does not pose a threat to Lathany. Sure. Actually, on that point, are you planning on going hunting anytime soon? I shall need to hunt again in two sunrises. Okay, thanks for letting me know. I pause for a moment, trying to think whether there's anything else I needed to say. And then, deciding not, I bid Calanthe a good night and head into my cave alcove. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 33, Bound. The poor Cupid, Grinsler, whatever, follows me into my alcove, though the darkness inside combined with its murky coloring makes it almost impossible to see. In fact, it's only by the odd shine of its quills in the shaft of moonlight entering my cave through the hole in the wall that I can see the creature at all. I imagine rolling over in the night and smacking into those quills point first with either my hand or my face and shudder a bit. No. But equally, I don't want to send it out into the night and risk it being eaten by a nocturnal predator without me even knowing anything about it. Not to mention it would be a bit of a waste of a jacket. Stay just inside the entrance to the cave. Sleep if you can. The poor cupid looks at me for a moment and then trots off. I peek out of my alcove to see it silhouetted against the sky, lying down at the entrance to the cave. Looking in the other direction, I see Calanthea watching me, her golden eyes catching the light. Say, Calanthea, 
You seem to know a bit more about this whole, binding thing than I do. Do you know how my new, bound, understands me? Enough to follow orders, at least. It's something I've been wondering ever since the thought occurred to me on the way back from the clay pit. It's not like animals on earth are born with some innate understanding of language. Heck, not even humans are born able to speak the language of their parents. Everyone has to learn, one way or another and even the smartest animals aren't able to use language in the same way as humans. Yet the poor Cupid has followed every single command, even ones like stay just inside the entrance to the cave which would require understanding of both the entrance and cave I'm talking about, as well as what stay means. Not to mention the distance of just inside. But the creature managed to do it perfectly. Not to mention Calanthea, of course and her ability to communicate telepathically with words. That just seems too crazy to be real, except it undoubtedly is. Why should your bound not understand you? That is the purpose of the bond, to communicate your desires and ensure compliance. Okay, one, I don't understand how you understand me because I'm speaking a language, words, which probably doesn't exist in this world, and two, what do you mean by to communicate your desires and ensure compliance? Your two questions have the same answer. You may be using a language which I have never encountered, but it matters not, we are communicating mind to mind, so your human words are no obstacle. The same is true with your bound. A what now? I ask slightly rhetorically. Shaking my head, not in rejection, but to try and clear it a bit, I try to form a question which might help me to understand more. We're communicating mind to mind? I thought that's what you were doing, and I was speaking out loud. No, she replies, sounding a little as if she thinks I'm just a bit slow or stupid. Your words mean nothing to me. I receive the meaning of your speech by catching the thoughts that you project and then you receive my meaning because I place it in your outer mind which transforms it into words for your own benefit. For creatures unused to mental communication, I believe speaking out loud enables the thoughts to travel far enough for a telepath to catch them. Those more competent with it have no need to make sounds aloud, and communicate all they wish by thoughts alone. Okay, I say slowly, my thoughts a whirl. While it kind of makes a bit more sense than a giant leopard in a world far different from my own understanding English, it's still hard for me to grasp. Can I learn to do that? Calanthea tosses her head. Perhaps you would need significantly more understanding of the world around you, and the ability to reach out with your mind beyond yourself to touch the aura of your co-interlocutor. Something to aim for, perhaps. Still, it hasn't quite answered my other question. So how does all this link to the poor Cupid? Sorry, Grinsler, being able to understand me. You can't tell me that it's a telepath, surely. The Nunda whiffs at an amused breath. No. We could hardly say that. As I said before, your words are irrelevant as you are in fact communicating your command mentally. But how? It's dark, but even so I can see, Phil Calanthea looking at me disapprovingly. Come now, you forged a link with your bound and do not even know what you have done. The, the battle of wills? I guess, that whole experience coming back to the fore of my memory. Indeed. You engaged a free creature in a battle of wills and overcame it. The will of the Grinsler has bowed to yours and accepted the chain of your dominance. The chain works to communicate your desires to your bound. Once more, the sounds you make aloud are irrelevant except in that they help you to focus on what you wish your bound to do. The chain of my dominance, it sounds rather terrible, I think. As the unease rises once more. What did you mean by ensure compliance earlier? I ask, my mouth feeling rather dry. Is it, is it linked to the chain of my dominance? Indeed. You have proven your will to be greater than that of your bound, and as long as this is the case, the chain shall hold tightly to your bound's will. Should your will weaken, or should your bound's will grow faster than yours, you may find the chain loosens and weakens. Too much of a difference and it may break entirely. I don't know how to think about that. Though, while I've got Calanthea here, is this will the same as willpower? Not exactly, she replies before pausing. Will is based on willpower to a large extent, but can be impacted by outside factors in a way willpower cannot be. For example, if you are cold and someone offers you heat, your will will be weakened in a battle of wills, but your willpower remains the same. Okay, that kind of makes sense. In fact, that explains why trapping a creature before starting the battle of wills makes a difference in outcome. Is your curiosity satisfied? Oh, I say, realizing I've stood there in thought for a longer pause than normal in a conversation. Yes, thank you Calanthea. She doesn't speak again, 
and all I hear is a slight sound of her readjusting her position. I step into my cave, mostly feeling my way by now. Pulling out my canteen and a handful of meat, I eat quickly, the food almost tasteless in my mouth as I consider the new information I've received. Clearly Calanthea knows a fair bit about my class, and I don't think I'm imagining the slight coloration of distaste underlying her mental voice. Or should that be thoughts? That just by itself is something difficult to grasp. It's hard enough to accept that a giant leopard can speak into my mind, it's even harder to conceptualize that it's not even words that either of us are apparently communicating with. But it does make sense of the fact that a dumb woodland animal can understand even simple commands with no training. That brings my thoughts onto the thorny subject of what exactly I've done to the creature. I'm not sure what I'd expected of Dominate, but I can't help but think it's not this. I feel, I feel like the bad guy. Realizing that makes a weight lift from my chest. The act of putting a name to the uneasiness curling within me actually alleviating it to a certain degree. I took an animal from the wild and have forced it to follow me, to obey me. I've, well, if it were a human, the only term that would be appropriate would be enslave. Since it's not a human, the term doesn't quite fit, but the feeling does, to an extent. The poor cubic had a life in the forest. It may not have been a long one, for all I know. It would have been eaten this very night had I left it. It may also have been destined to live to a ripe old age having sired, or born, I can't say I've actually checked if it's male or female, dozens of little piglets, or whatever they're called. We'll never know now. But then, wasn't that what humans did with all the animals we domesticated? The original wolves that eventually became dogs, the original beasts that became domesticated cows and goats and sheep. How did that domestication happen? Over time, for sure. But isn't that just an elongated process of changing the animal's destinies? The animals gave up agency in return for security, freedom in exchange for food. It may not have been a conscious decision, but it was an exchange nonetheless. This, this isn't quite the same, I admit to myself quietly. I haven't offered anything to the poor cupid, I pinned it down and forced a battle upon it that it didn't ask for, and that I positioned myself to win from the start. And even if I could release it, Though Calanthea didn't say anything about that, I wouldn't because of how useful it could be. That thought makes me shiver a little, feeling like my foundations have been rocked a bit. I'd always liked to think I was a nice guy, a good guy, really. Someone who would stand up for the innocent if it was demanded, someone in whom the hero was just sleeping, ready to awake in the right circumstances. I've suddenly realized that's not true. Because a hero would immediately swear off using this tool of animal enslavement. A hero would willingly take the hard road, spending time to win an animal's loyalty and then you stay, if indeed that were even necessary by that point. That's not what I'm going to do. The last few days have taught me that I'm a survivor. I've learned that I have so much more capacity to keep going, to withstand pain and keep fighting than I would have ever imagined in my cushy life as a corporate drone. And when the chips are down, a survivor uses any tools at his disposal. He doesn't care about fair fights, about even odds. He places traps and ambushes, and aims to disable if he can't kill immediately. He survives. A hero doesn't, not necessarily. But then he doesn't really need to as there's always some deus ex machina which guarantees his ultimate survival even if not his happiness. There's none of that for me, I learned that in my one and only act of heroism against the wolves art. Yes, I did actually survive, but it was through the luckiest of circumstances. The chances of a similar set of circumstances coming into effect the next time I decide to be a hero are vanishingly small. No, much as I would like to think of myself as a hero, I'd like to be alive significantly more. Maybe when I grow in power and survivability, I'll be able to be more heroic. But for now, I'm a survivor. And when a tool is unsavory, but offers better odds of survival, a survivor uses it. So, I'm not going to swear I will never use Dominate again. I'm not going to even try to release my current follower, Bound, was the term Calanthea used. What I am going to do, for my own peace of mind if nothing else, is swear to treat my Bound well. It may not have been a voluntary choice on my Bound's front, but while it serves me obediently, I will make sure that it has everything it needs, that it comes out of the experience better than when it went in. I make a promise to myself that I will never use Dominate without need, nor will I use my bound as cannon fodder, assuming that they wouldn't balk at a suicide mission anyway. The vows I make to myself relax a sense of uneasiness inside me enough for me to start feeling sleepy. I lie down on my bed and pull my jacket, blanket over me. After the long day I've had, sleep creeps up on me quickly. Book 1 Leap, Chapter 34, 
smack in the face. Walking out of my cave the next day, I feel a mixture of glee and guilt at the sight of my new bound still lying at the entrance. It's awake, looking at me with calm eyes, not seeming to be railing against its loss of freedom the way I would have. Though that could be another function of the bond, for all I know. I remember my resolution of the evening before and look at it squarely. I'm sorry, I say first, taking myself a little by surprise. It was hard to start, and I hadn't intended on apologizing to start off with, but somehow it seems, right. I'm sorry that I took you out of your life, that I captured you and, bound you to my will. I did it because I need your help. In return, I promise I will do what I can to make your life better and easier than it probably would have been. I pause, hesitating a little, before deciding to go ahead. As a sign of this commitment, I give you a name. Here I hesitate again, not having actually chosen one. I'll call you, Spike, I end up deciding. It's not the best of names, rather too descriptive to be funny or cute, but it'll do. At least it'll be easy to remember. There's a moment in which the poor Cupid, newly named Spike, doesn't move or do anything really, before it seems like something clicks. For a moment, something else appears in Spike's eyes, an emotion too complex and too fleeting for me to even have a hope of decoding it. Then the moment's over and it's like nothing happened. I get a nagging sensation, but ignore it for now, I can always check my messages later. Hopefully Spike will respond to the name from now on. It should, if my understanding of what Calanthea said last night is correct. Now, first things first. Are you hungry, Spike? Surprise surprise, no response. Maybe that was a bit too complex. How about, if you're hungry, stamp twice with your front foot. If you're not hungry, stamp once, I say, trying to concentrate on what I want it to do, an image coming in my mind of it stamping twice for yes and once for no. Spike stamps twice. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, I say. Are you thirsty? Stamp once for no, twice for yes. Spike stamps twice again. Seems like the concept has been proven. Alright, let's go and get some food. Follow me. I head down the hill to the river and invite Spike to drink as I fill my canteen, drink deeply, and fill it again. I'm hungry too, but I've decided that now would be a good time for me to start expanding my diet to more than just meat. In the river, clinging onto rocks and growing thickly in spots where the current isn't so strong is the same type of pondweed that I tested a few days ago. I'd meant to continue testing it. But considering what I've been doing with the last few days, I couldn't work up the motivation. Now, though, I'm starting to get a bit sick of just meat, and even slimy pondweed seems at least slightly appealing. I reach in and grab the nearest plant. I'd tested the leaf before, so I'd better do the same now. It's logical since the weed is mostly leaf, so that would be the most efficient thing to eat, if it's edible. I pull off a fragment of leaf and then hesitate. Do I cook it or eat it raw? It's more likely to be edible cooked, but then I won't be able to say for sure it's edible raw, even if the test goes well. Then I think, would I want to eat it raw? And the answer is no, but then I'll have to make sure I always have a supply of cooked stuff in my inventory which is not practical. Perhaps it seems a little stupid to be spending time debating about cooked or uncooked bondweed, but sorting this out in my brain now will set the trend going forwards. In the end, I decide I'd better bite the bullet and do my first test uncooked. The reasons for this are simple, uncooked pondweed is in much more plentiful supply than cooked bondweed. If it's edible uncooked, it's almost certain to be fine when cooked, though I will have to be careful when combining it with other foods. Finally. I frankly can't be bothered to set up a fire right now and wait for the leaf to cook. So, taking a tiny piece of the leaf, I brush it gently against my lips. The skin is so sensitive there that any symptoms should be quick to show up. When a couple of minutes go by without a problem, I place the piece of leaf in my mouth and then perch on a boulder. I don't chew, I don't swallow, and I pay particular attention to the sensations in my mouth. Is that prickling I feel on my tongue? No, it's just my tongue drying out. I decide after a moment. Time passes. Without a watch, I don't know how long, but when I'm pretty certain that at least 15 minutes have gone past with no issues, I move on to the next step, chewing. Similarly, I chew for approximately 15 minutes, paying attention to my symptoms. The pondweed isn't exactly tasty, it's got a bland, slightly bitter taste, maybe a bit like spinach, but I suppose that's better than tasting horrible. So far, so good in terms of the symptoms. Now the dangerous bit. Swallowing. I suddenly find myself sweating, 
the absorbed knowledge of four not helping my nerves as memories flash through my mind of everything that could possibly go wrong with ingesting something poisonous. In the end, I managed to swallow, but only by taking a big gulp of water with the fragments of leaf that remain after so much chewing in my suddenly dry mouth. Right, that's it. If I get any symptoms in the next eight hours, I'll have to do my best to make myself vomit. If not, it's a good indication that the plan might be okay to eat, though I'll have to do further testing, of course. My stomach growls. Unfortunately, I won't be able to eat any breakfast or lunch. Nothing but clean water for the next 8 hours or it could interfere with my test. It should be okay as long as I keep myself busy. Many are my vices but overindulgence of food is one that's rare for me. It's not the gym or a super healthy diet which has kept the pounds off, it's the tyranny of my work-life balance, or the lack thereof. It isn't, wasn't, unusual for me to skip lunches I often forgot to take something with me and rarely had the time to go and buy something, let alone the time to eat it. In fact, it wasn't unheard of for me to skip breakfast too when I had to go into work early or was in a rush in the morning for whatever reason, meaning that I didn't eat until I got home. In short, I can handle a bit of fasting. Or at least, that's what I tell myself. I carefully avoid the thought that my work before this was only a fraction as physically demanding as my life now. If I keep busy, it'll be fine, I tell myself dismissively. Still, just because I can't eat doesn't mean my follower can't. And besides, I need to work at what he, or she, eats for future reference. Okay, Spike, go find some food, I tell him or her. Come back to me when you're satisfied. The poor cupid looks at me for a moment before turning and starting to snuffle through the leaves around. I keep an eye on his, going to go with mail unless I find out differently, progress, noting what he finds at the same time as looking around me. So far, it seems like he's primarily herbivorous, but is perfectly happy to eat any insects or worms he comes across. At one point while we were walking, he dug up a load of tubers which looked kind of similar to long potatoes. Actually, I suppose they looked kind of like sweet potatoes, but with thicker, paler skin. I grabbed a couple and put them in my inventory too. Maybe I should try cooking these once I'm done testing the pondweed. From what I can see, if they're connected to the foliage spike dug up to get at them, they're reasonably common. Besides, I could always try cultivating them just as I need to do with the some of the beans I've saved. I look at the sun. It's already halfway to its zenith and I do want to get some more things done than just following my new pet porcupig around. He'll be okay to roam around, won't he? It's a dangerous world around here, but he's clearly survived to becoming an adult so. In the end, I put that question against the fact that, as a herbivore, he probably spends the majority of his time finding stuff to eat and that I don't have the time every day to follow him around and protect him while he finds Nosh. If I can grow enough food to feed him without him needing to leave my side, great, but that's not the case at the moment. Spike, I say and he pauses, looking back at me. I'm going to go back to the cave. I want you to continue looking for food until you're satisfied. When you've had enough, come back to me. If you feel you're in danger, make a loud noise. As I give the command, I focus hard on what I want him to do. It seemed to work well enough earlier. Feeling moderately satisfied, I suddenly realized something, I've never heard a porcupig make a loud noise. I don't even know if they can. Just, before I go, make the loudest noise you can. For a moment, I think he hasn't understood me, but then he lets rip with what might be the worst noise I've ever heard. I'm very glad that I asked him to demonstrate, because it sounds like he's dying. No, in fact, that he's being tortured to death. If I'd heard that for the first time when I wasn't right next to him, knowing that he's fine, I think I would have had a heart attack. Right. I say faintly, my ears ringing. Good. Um, so, I'll see you later, then. With that, I turn and stumble away. Of course, it's not a great idea to go walking in the forest without having all my faculties operating properly. It's a reminder that hits me smack in the face, literally. Well, not quite literally, it smacks me in the chest. Distracted as I am, I only catch the faintest of flickers in my peripheral vision before it hits, not enough to dodge. The hit is painful, not particularly from the impact itself, but from the spikes all over the dark colored ball which strikes. They pierce my thin clothes like needles and blood spills when the ball withdraws. Still disorientated, it takes me a moment to realize that the ball is attached to a long, dark cord hanging from above. Looking up, I realize it's the same creature which I saw before, 
The difference is that last time I managed to avoid its attack. It's out of reach of my knife, or even my mace. I start wishing for a spear or bow, but unfortunately, wishing isn't going to make them materialize. Baring my teeth angrily, I instead grab some stones from the ground and start throwing them at the creature. Its reaction is to curl up tighter, bringing its tail up to help protect it too. I'm not making much progress, it seems. But I also can't really see the creature's objectives. The strike was painful but the wounds are not likely to make me bleed out anytime soon. How is this supposed to do anything? When my vision blurs a little, I think it's from a drop of sweat dripping into my eyes. When it blurs again, and for more than a fraction of a second, I realize that it's more concerning than I'd first thought. Now I realize the creature's objectives, it's not all that dissimilar from a venomous snake, injecting its poison into its prey then waiting for the prey to succumb. Casting lay on hands immediately, I feel a swoop in my stomach as it seems to have little effect. At least, it doesn't feel like the previous times I've been poisoned and felt lay on hands sweep through my veins like a wave of coolness to wash away the poison. This time, the healing magic heals the wounds of the initial strike but then it just fizzles out, as if there's nothing else for it to heal. I feel panic start to take over. Even if I manage to get a lucky blow and kill this creature, Unlikely from what I've seen so far, I can't throw rocks at the poison creeping through my veins. I don't have a health potion, or any sort of anti-venom. If my body can't fight this off on its own, I'm dead. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 35, From an Unexpected Source As the poison takes over, I feel my limbs weakening and my stones strike with less and less force. Finally, I lose the ability to keep myself balanced and fall over. By this point, I've given up on trying to kill the creature and have turned to stagger off towards home, my only hope that Calanthea might be able to help me in some way. Unfortunately, by this stage, I only managed to make it a few paces before going to my knees and then falling flat. With my last strength, I turn my head to one side so I can at least breathe. Much good that will do me, though. After a while, I realize that although the poison has been able to run unopposed through my body, it's not actually killing me. I can still see, though my vision is blurrier than normal. My heart pumps, albeit more weakly, and I can still draw in breaths, though it's a much more laborious task than usual. In short, it seems to be designed at weakening muscles, but only to disable, not to kill. In fact, fallen here on the floor with nothing else to but hope the poison wears off quickly, I notice that my stamina bar is completely empty and strobing. A poison that attacks stamina? Of course, that only leaves one more conclusion that once the prey has been rendered helpless, the predator then comes to feed. When I see a black blur shift in my peripheral vision, my neck muscles too weak to move my head, I resign myself to finding out exactly what it means to be eaten alive. My salvation comes from an unexpected source. The creature has shifted around to my head at this point, not starting with my feet as I thought it might. I'm not sure how to feel about this, though relief is rather the prevailing emotion. I don't want to die, but if I have to, I'd rather it be over quickly. Going feet first while I can still feel every bit of sensation seems to be particularly tortuous. Even more tortuous, however, is how slow the creature is moving. Its sloth-like pace allows me to feel fruitless hope that I might recover from the poison in order to make a last-minute break away, only to be disappointed at every moment. This means that when a body comes and imposes itself between me and my attacker, I can actually see it the blurriness of my vision having mostly cleared up. Seeing is believing, they say, but I can barely believe what I'm seeing here. Spike, the porcupine is standing between me and my attacker, hissing menacingly, his quills stuck up threateningly. The black creature hesitates, but then starts moving forwards again, seemingly planning on pushing past my guard. Spike isn't having any of that. He whirls around like lightning so that his quills are pointing directly at the dark creature. There's a moment when he seems to focus, frankly, he looks like he's got constipation. Then, my attacker gets a face full of quills as they are propelled away from my follower's backside. It makes a noise for the first time, a kind of confused churring sound and it backs up a bit, pawing at its face. Spike turns around again and once more hisses threateningly at the animal. My attacker pauses, quills still stuck in its face clearly deciding whether I was worth fighting with a poor cupid over. Eventually, it seems to decide in the negative, and turns to lumber slowly away. Not surprising in the end, as it seems to be a one-trick wonder, from what I can see, it has no real combat ability, and doesn't even have speed on its side. The reason for it aiming for my head is also cleared up as soon after, 
I start regaining control over my muscles. It seems that the paralytic, or whatever it uses, is pretty short-lived, so it has a limited time frame to make sure that its prey is out of the game. The nagging feeling resumes and I have a feeling I've gained a stat point out of this experience. That knowledge pales in comparison to the tumultuous feelings I have when I look at Spike. You saved me, I say quietly. He, of course, doesn't reply. I don't know how I know it, but I do. That me dying would actually break the bond between us and set him free. Knowing that, the question is, does he? Probably, at least to whatever capacity he has in understanding such things. If I know it instinctively, I can only guess that he would too. It just seems fair. Yet he saved me. Well, for whatever reason, thank you, I say, trying to make sure my gratitude goes through whatever link we have. There's a moment where I feel like we are connected, beyond the link created by Dominate. That is, the net's broken as he turns away and resumes foraging. I stand up, brush myself down, and cast a quick lay on hands to deal with any lingering damage. Casting a last glance at my foraging follower, I then turn and resume walking back to the cave, this time paying a lot more attention to my surroundings. Could there be some sort of protective element to the bond? Or was it what I said to him earlier today and giving him a name? Or are poor cupids just naturally protective? Either way. I'm glad I didn't attack that poor Cupig family a few days ago. The quills are bad enough, but if they can actually use them as a ranged attack as well. Still, at least that puts my mind a little at rest in terms of his safety while foraging for food, although I know that there are plenty of predators which could take him down either through force of numbers or sheer size. The fact that he has some natural defenses as well as inoffensive attack improves his chances of survival. It doesn't take me long to get back to the foot of the hill. We didn't wander far as the main purpose of our walk was to let Spike forage for food, not to cover ground. Fortunately, I succeed in making it back without being attacked again. That's two strikes, I think darkly as I remember the ambushing creature. One missed, one hit, the next one will end up with me as the victor, I decide. But to do that, I need a ranged weapon. Well, after I've sorted my fire situation, maybe my next task should be to create a bow and arrows. Speaking of time to get to work. Although walking through the forest with Spike had been relaxing, I'd also taken the time to note down a number of resources, one of which was something I'd been keeping an eye out for, Flint. Heading back to the river, I walk along it until I find the spot again. Easy enough now I know what I'm looking for. Inspecting the cache, I find a smile spreading across my face. The nodules to the side of the river look exactly like what my absorbed memories tell me they should. A white waxy sort of stone on the outside, with darker patches showing here and there. One nodule that's actually been broken open by something is instantly recognizable. It would have been even without the wilderness survival knowledge I was given. Glancing around to make sure I'm not suddenly about to be jumped, I crouch down and start filling a couple of the slots in my inventory with good-sized flint nodules. I would have preferred to only use one slot, but apparently that means they have to be within a certain size range, otherwise it automatically goes into another. Since I don't need any small stones, I go for medium and large sizes. After I'm satisfied with the number of nodules I've collected, I note the area down on my map for future reference. Then, I keep heading along the river, but don't break away from it to walk up the hill to the cave. My next task is going to require a fair bit of water, so better to do it near the river. On my way back, I spotted a bush with leaves the size of my head, so took a moment to grab a few. These come in helpful now as I spread them out to make a workspace. Kneeling down, I take some clay out of my inventory. As I would noted before, it's full of stones so I start rubbing it between my fingers, working out the ones that are likely to interfere with my work. I'm not making a pot at this moment, so the clay doesn't need to be as fine as for that, but stones which are too large are likely to still cause problematic faults over time. As I do that, I add water until the clay reaches the right kind of texture. Then, as I finish a handful's worth, I press it into a ball and return it to my inventory. By the time I feel I've processed enough clay to reach my objectives, Spike has finished munching for now and has returned to me. For a time, he just sat watching me, but eventually he curled up nearby and went to sleep. It's, cute. I admit it. Not nearly as cute as Lathany, but then few things could be. As I finish up, I wake him gently by saying his name. He opens his eyes and blinks at me. Let's go, Spike. I tell him, have a drink if you need to. He doesn't, so I guess he's all sorted. We head up the slope. I pause at the entrance, 
looking down at my knee high bound. Do what you like as long as it doesn't cause damage or disrupt Calanthea or Lathony. For a moment I feel a sense of doubt that such an open-ended command would be understandable enough for an animal like Spike. Whether it's understood or not, he just curls up in the sun and to all intents and purposes goes back to sleep. I go into the cave which is currently empty, Calanthea and Lathony must be playing somewhere else. Entering my alcove, I look at the wall thoughtfully. I want to make something that's going to be multifunctional, but I'm rather hampered by the lack of metal. Still. I should be able to make something decent. In addition to the clay I've been preparing, I also took a bit of time yesterday while collecting the river clay to also collect flattish stones. Fortunately, I guess that there's shale or something in the mountain as there were many flat stones with evidence of layers when looked at sideways. I carefully pull a whole load of these stones out of my inventory and pile them close at hand. Starting with some clay. I create a sausage about a centimeter in diameter and arrange it so it's in a semicircle with a radius of about 50 centimeters. Taking the stones one at a time, I arrange them on top of the sausage so they're end to end with only a small gap between them, and press down. Creating another sausage, I repeat the process, though try to offset the stones so that each layer isn't stacked directly above the previous. It's actually quite a fun puzzle, finding the right size stones to fit the context. I wasn't expecting it to be as enjoyable as it is. I pause when the wall is about 15 centimeters high, looking thoughtfully at what I'd created and thinking about how I'm going to use it. Then, as an idea occurs, I go outside briefly, hunting for a stone of a certain size. It takes me a few minutes to find one that I think will be suitable, but once I've got it, I return to my cave. Putting the stone against the front of my wall. I carefully ease out stones until I've made a hole just a little bigger than the stone. Using more clay, I fill in the sides of the hole until it's a snug fit for the stone, or reasonably so, at least. This should allow me to control the airflow into my fire better, especially when it's just getting started. Having a fire choke in the first few minutes because of lack of air is annoying. Plus, it'll make cleaning easier. I'll be able to just sweep out the dead coals and ashes onto a leaf or something and then carry them outside. A much easier arrangement than the one where I'd have to crane my wrist awkwardly to try and grab everything. Returning to the rest of my fireplace, I hesitate as another thought strikes. Cooking. My wok has a single handle which won't make it easily suspendable so it will have to sit on something. A possible solution comes to mind and I start doing my best to prepare for it without knowing whether it will actually work. It's not something that comes from my survival knowledge, but I'm applying my understanding of different areas to try and make something that works. We'll find out, I'll put in alternatives in case my idea doesn't work out. So, in preparation, the next layer of my fireplace wall uses stones which are significantly wider than the previous ones. I arrange them so they're flush with the other stones on the outside, protruding in towards the fire instead. They're a little precarious at the moment. They're unbalanced weight pulling them down on one side, but hopefully that will sort itself out as I continue building. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 36, Round the Twist. I continue building my fireplace using the same strategy of molding a thin sausage of clay, choosing shards of shale, press ing down gently, then rinse and repeat. It takes me a while, but I can't say I really notice the time passing. I have to break some of the stones into smaller pieces by banging them carefully with one of the flint nodules I picked up, and sometimes they end up a lot smaller than I intended, but even the small stones find a place in this 3D puzzle of mine. As the walls reach knee level and then beyond, aiming for the hole in the wall which is about hip level, I begin narrowing my chimney, not wanting it to continue being as much as 50 centimeters in radius. Ideally, by the time I get to the hole in the wall, the radius will be 10 centimeters or so. It's at this point that I also start getting a little worried about my structural integrity. It seems okay, but I don't want to realize it's not because half the wall has fallen down, so I use sticks here and there to help prop the walls up while they dry. Building upwards. I run out of shale just as I reach the hole in the wall. I honestly can't be bothered to walk all the way back to where I found the last lot, so I, improvise. There are a couple of pieces of slate that I'd set aside as chopping boards because they were unusually large and, being shale, are nice and flat. One of them is big enough for my purposes, so I pick it up and place it on top of my chimney. Not high enough. I'm used to myself. The level of the wall is only up to about a quarter of the way up the hole 
so lying the slate flat means that there probably isn't enough ventilation. What about tilted? I try it, tilting the slate up so its top edge is above the hole, and bottom edge is touching the top of the front of my chimney. Maybe. It's a bit short, so I'll still have a gap between the top of the slate and the top of the hole in the wall, but it's better than lying it flat. As the situation stands, though, there are far too many holes at the top of my chimney where smoke could escape into the room since an angled slate is by no means airtight. To fix this, I work with pure clay and some of the stones I pulled out of the clay when preparing it. My aim is to build up the sides of the chimney to essentially fill in all the gaps between the slate, the wall, and the rest of the flue. Stepping back after I finished, I give it a critical look. It's not perfect, my immature nature when it comes to either building or pottery comes through clearly, but it hasn't fallen yet so that's a good start. Plus, although I hadn't planned it, the fact that the slate roof of my chimney is removable will help with providing an alternative cooking arrangement in case my earlier brainwave doesn't work. I can suspend things from above through the hole with a simple structure using five branches and cord. Yes, I'll probably then get smoke in my cave, but possibly not. If the draw of oxygen is correct, air should be pulled in at the bottom and then pulled out of the cave by the movement of air outside. I guess I'll find out. The clay is already starting to dry, so I build a fire in my new fire pit. I'll need to keep an eye on it for the next while, making sure it doesn't burn either too hot or too cool as it will hopefully help my clay dry and harden. In the meantime, I start on the idea I had earlier. Taking some more sticks out of my inventory, I use some bark to tie them into a grid pattern. Then, putting the grid, which is by no means sturdy, onto one of the big leaves, I cover it liberally with clay, cutting out the spaces between the twigs, but leaving the sticks covered with clay. Then, after making sure it's not stuck to the leaf below, I leave it alone to dry. Hopefully this will work, but if not, I've got a bit of time. I need to keep an eye on the fire so I can't go far, but I've got some time for now. A good opportunity to start the easy, the boring task of twisting cord. I'd been lucky today while walking with Spike, I found a fallen tree which was a perfect source of bark fiber and harvested as much as I could. In the end, I managed to fill two inventory slots with fiber, and now seems like a good time to twist it. Cord is something I desperately need, so it's not a waste of time to get going on creating it. It's hard at first, taking me a while to get the knack. Eventually, though, I find that my fingers are managing to twist the fibers together and I'm even starting to know when to add the next set of fibers to create a cord which is smooth. My first few attempts were, lumpy, to say the least. Eventually, I actually untwist my first attempts in order to redo them with a smoother texture. It hurts my fingers, not having the right kind of calluses to deal with the rough fibers, but I ignore the irritation. My regeneration will deal with any damage soon enough. And if it doesn't, I can always use lay on hands. After a good while and a couple of meters of decent cord later, I feel the nagging feeling start up again, reminding me that I never checked my messages. Deciding that now is as good a time as any for a break, I put my cordage project down. In fact, I wouldn't mind having a snack. My stomach's telling me it's been a while since breakfast. As I munch, I open my message box. Congratulations. You have worked hard on your wisdom and have earned a point. Would you like to apply this to your status? YN. I accept, of course. It doesn't indicate whether it was depth or breadth that was increased. Do I only choose those on level ups? And how did I earn it in the first place? I go on to the next message while I ponder the question. Congratulations. You have worked hard on your constitution and have earned a point. This has been applied to your status. Next message close messages. Huh, that's different. No option to accept or not. Moving on, I see a similar message. Congratulations. You have worked hard on your dexterity and have earned a point. This has been applied to your status. Close messages? YN. By this point very confused, I close the message and shift across to my status screen. Sure enough, I can see I've gained a point in constitution, wisdom, and dexterity. Name, Marcus Wolf. Race, human. Class, Tamer. Level. 1. Energy to next level. 14%. Energy absorption rate. 11 U per hour. Energy towards debt. Percent. Intelligence. 7. Mana. 70 70. Wisdom. 7. Mana regeneration rate. 175 U per hour. Willpower. 15 plus 3. Plus 20%. Health regeneration rate. 18 U per hour. Constitution. 8. Health. 80 80. Strength. 6. Stamina. 30 30. Dexterity. 5. Stamina regeneration rate. 
50 U per hour. Class skills, dominate, beginner 2, tame, beginner 1, fade, beginner 2, stealth, beginner 2, non-class skills, lay on hands, novice 3. But why? Unless, a thought occurs and I close my eyes as I concentrate on the memory from the system stone. Using energy is a shortcut to increasing stats, but it's not the only way. People who don't have any access to energy increase their stats all the time through hard work. Heck, everyone on earth, for one thing, maybe that's what's happened here. In terms of my point to dexterity, I've just been working on a task which requires a fair bit of dexterity to do well, and I've improved significantly in it. In addition, working with clay is also rather dexterous, as have been several things I've done since I've been here. Perhaps all the work has added up and given me the point? What about the other two points? I try to remember back to when I felt the nagging feeling before. I'm pretty sure one of the times was soon after I was attacked, and fought off the poison it infected me with. Perhaps fighting the poison was a sufficient catalyst to earn a point in constitution, especially considering all the other times I've been injured and recovered in my time in this world. I don't know how it works exactly. But the system stone was clear that constitution is essentially what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. While that's not always true with physical, and mental, trauma on earth, apparently the presence of energy on Nicholas' world, and here as well I guess, makes being hurt a different story. Actually, that makes me wonder whether emotional or mental damage might improve wisdom or intelligence. Either way, I probably shouldn't try it out, my past has traumatized me enough, Thank you very much. As for the point of wisdom, I think that happened this morning sometime. Oh, yes, I remember. It was after that little talk with Spike. So something about that triggered wisdom. That's, not really very useful, actually, as I have no idea. What about that little talk seemed wise? Was it the fact that I was trying to get along with a being which has no choice but to follow my orders? Or was it because Spike has no choice that wisdom was triggered? me showing empathy could be a wise trait? Or was it because me being nice to him then meant that he would help protect me later? But how would I even know something like that? And I still don't understand the two subcategories. Or how they affect anything since, unlike with strength, my mana regeneration doesn't seem to be impacted by one or other of the subcategories. There must be a reason for and a consequence of my choices, but nothing in the system stone talks about it. I huff in frustration. Wisdom and willpower are my least favorite traits, to be honest. All the others are fairly clear as to how to improve them. Not so the two big W's. All I can do is try to keep track of when they rise and then attempt to draw some conclusions from that. As I consider my screen once more, something else strikes me. My energy. It's too high. I haven't killed anything since I leveled up, and although I've been absorbing energy naturally, it hasn't been enough hours for my energy store to have risen that much. Add to that the fact that I increased at least one stat, I'm not entirely sure whether the ones I didn't have any choice but to accept actually cost me anything, but I'm going to guess not. My reasoning is that having as much energy left as I seem to after having increased my stats by 3 points is even more unbelievable. So where has this extra energy come from? I mean, I am not complaining but it would be nice to know so I can do more of it. Racking my brains, there are only two possibilities that come to mind. One, that despite not killing that ambusher, I gained credit, and two, that it has something to do with my dominating spike. Of the two options, I lean towards the last one because surely a single ambush predator wouldn't be worth so much energy that not even killing it would net me enough to increase a stat with more left over. Well, I know how to narrow down the possibilities, at least, and it's a thought that fills me with dark pleasure. All I need to do is sort out a bow or some sort of ranged weapon that will put me on more even ground with the wretched thing. Just before closing the screen, I notice that Dominate has risen to level 2. Good, I suppose. I still don't really know whether skill level makes much difference to the skill itself. Fade has also risen to level 2 as I've been doing my best to use it at various intervals, including while I'm sitting here, twisting bark fiber but equally I haven't noticed any real change to it. Stealth has also risen to level 2, though I haven't really been using it much apart from during the testing last night. Just another question which I guess I'll find out the answer to later. Checking on my work with my fireplace, I'm pleased with most of it. There's one spot where the stones are bulging out a bit, the weight from the top forcing them out sideways. I push them back into place and then spend some time trying to figure out how to prop that section up. My clay-covered grill of branches is fairly dry, at least, 
it's stiff enough for me to lift without it bending or falling apart. I prop it up above the fire. It's almost in the fire itself, but not quite. Sitting back, I pick my half-finished cord up again, quickly putting it down again when my previously unnoticed blisters protest the action. I grimace as I look at my fingertips. Yeah, no. I cast a quick lay on hands, smiling as the blisters fade away as if they were never there. Back to the grind. I guess. Too much of this and I'll be going round the twist. Ha. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 37, A Good Edition. When I get absolutely sick of twisting bark fiber and watching clay dry, I decide to move on to a different, equally important project. Walking out of the cave, I find Calanthea sitting outside. Hi, Calanthea? She turns her head towards me and cocks it curiously. Do you mind if I make some changes to the land around here? I want to plant some things. Go ahead. Marcus Wolf, she tells me neutrally, not seeming particularly interested in the topic now, perhaps because it's to do with plants. Okay, thanks, I reply, waving at her as I start walking around. Some of the beans like sunlight, but they also like their roots to be kept moist, like beans on earth. That means I either plant up here near the cave as it's very sunny here, or down near the river where it's moist. Out of the two, I'm more able to control the moisture of the soil than the sunlight on its leaves so I decide to plant near the cave. Plus, that gives me easier access. Actually, thinking about it, I'll probably have to protect them from marauding animals. Or maybe Spike will be able to do that. Speaking of, once I choose my spot, it's Spike's job to do the task that I dominated him for. Digging. Calling him over, he gets up from the sunny spot where he's been lazily sunbathing, trotting over to me. He stretches as he gets to me, opening his mouth widely in a yawn, giving me a very good look at his teeth. These are actually sharper than I'd thought they would be, a good two-thirds of them pointed. Not like Calanthea's of course. Spike has canines, or some teeth that look like them, but they're further to the front of his mouth than mine are. They're a bit longer proportionally than mine are, but nothing like Calanthea's killer fangs. Behind his canines, he has some other smaller triangular teeth, and then right at the back, he has some molars. These are mostly similar to mine, probably for the same reasons, but they're also a bit pointier. I don't get enough time during that brief yawn to see whether the molars fit together top and bottom, but I guess they'd have to. I've confirmed that Spike is definitely herbivorous, but given the other teeth he has, I have to guess that he's an insectivore as well. Based on what I've seen so far, I doubt he's a predator of anything bigger than an insect, he's just not quick enough to catch small animals which are usually fast moving and anything bigger than half his size would probably be too much to handle. It's interesting to make guesses about Spike's diet based on his teeth, but not what I'd been planning to do with my afternoon. Doing my best to give clear instructions, I set Spike to digging a furrow. Deciding to experiment a bit, I try to push images at him mentally of what I want him to do. I don't know whether it makes much of a difference, but for sure he follows the instructions very well and my little vegetable plot is quickly established. As predicted, Spike's horn breaks up the ground nicely, and he even clears up the roots in that area which will help me further. Of course, that wasn't some sign of proactivity or predicting my needs, he was just beckish and the roots look tasty, but it's still useful. Once he's cleared a surface area about twice as long as he is and half again as wide, it's time to dig deeper to give the sum of a bean's roots some already broken earth to grow through. I check on my chimney a few times while he's working to deepen and lengthen the trench, and I'm pleased with how it's coming on. The clay has hardened nicely and I can only see a couple of minor cracks. Since I'm not trying to make it watertight, I don't mind about the cracks, though I'll probably smooth on a bit more clay when it's cool to make sure they don't compromise the structure's integrity. Ultimately though, the clay is just filler and the stones should bear most of the weight by themselves. If I trusted my dry stone walling skills, I might have tried to build without clay, but I don't so haven't. Briefly checking on Spike again, I realize that he's almost done. Deciding to kill two birds with one stone, I fetch an item from where I've stored it in my alcove, then wait for Spike to finish. Hey, Spike, are you thirsty? I ask. About to remind him about the two taps, one tap system, I'm surprised when he taps twice without prompting. Huh, smart. Something to bear in mind. For now though. Okay, let's go to the river, then. Down by the river bank, he takes a long drink and I fill my canteen and my wok, the item I retrieved. It's the first time I've tried to test putting an open container of water into my inventory and I'm pleased when it works, 
though a bit confused too. Why does an open container of water get accepted when the open sigil didn't? Is it because it's a liquid, or because there's only one item inside? Or is this something special about water? Hit by a brainwave, I try to put water directly into my inventory, imagining pouring it into one of the slots. Unfortunately, this doesn't work. So an open container of water is acceptable? And water without any container isn't. It would be good to eventually get an explanation for how this whole inventory thing works, sometimes it just seems so illogical. Placing the walk carefully just inside the entrance to my alcove, I head back out to the trench. I pull the five remaining summerville beans out of my satchel and push them gently into the soft, disturbed earth of the trench. I'm careful to not bury them too deep. Apparently they like to be about 5 centimeters below ground level. The depth that Spike has dug down to should be perfect for them. The trench Spike has dug is about 25 centimeters at its deepest point. That should mean that the roots of my, hopefully, growing some of the plants will have an easy job, to begin with, at least. Having covered the beans up, I use my canteen to water them in. The greedy soil absorbs the water quickly and, unfortunately, my canteen isn't all that big so I have to return to the river twice before I properly douse them. Actually, that's a thought, maybe I should create a bigger water container out of my new clay. I'm going to need to water these plants every day, probably, so in the interests of saving time, being able to carry more water at one time is a good investment. On the other hand, it's a big investment of time, creating a watertight jug is a far cry from creating a rough chimney, not to mention the fact that I'd have to fire it which involves digging a pit and then making sure the fire burns at the right temperature for the right length of time. Well, I'll see how arduous the watering is first, then decide whether it's worth creating a bigger container just for this. My planning done, I take a moment to look at the rich, disturbed earth. It's always amazing to think that a tiny seed can turn into a massive plant, even an oak comes from an acorn. The thought brings back a memory unbidden. My father used to like gardening, and would spend many hours in the backyard taking care of the plants. I remember that I had to grow a bean for school. I must have been 8 or 9 at the time. Water and warmth, that's what these need right now, Marcus, I hear him saying to me, his voice so clear that I could swear he's next to me now. But not too much of each. And when the roots start coming out, they'll need something to hold on to, so use a bit of that kitchen towel to wrap the bean. Sniffing. I roughly swipe away a tear that threatens to fall. I wish I'd spent more time with him gardening. I wish I'd done a lot of things. No use crying now, I tell myself, speaking aloud angrily. He's dead, and that's all there is to it. And you're in a different world and need to get your head back in the game. Looking around, I spot Spike looking wary. I tense and look around quickly, my adrenaline kicking into gear. Are we about to be attacked? Here, not seeing any signs of danger. I frown and look back at Spike. Then, a flash of realization hits me. He's not wary about being attacked. At least, not by any outside creature. He's wary about being attacked by me. Hey, I tell him, jittling my tone. I'm not angry at you, I promise. I'm, angry at myself. It's true, I realize. I'm angry that despite what happened to my mom as a teenager, I didn't spend enough time with my dad. I wasted time with allowing him to push me away with my teenage troubles, with being unwilling to overcome the generational divide. And now he's dead and I don't have the option anymore. The grief threatening to pull me into a black depression once more, I forcibly direct my thoughts to more useful, immediate concerns. At least Spike looks more relaxed, clearly whatever message he got was enough to ease his fears about being attacked. Spike, I want you to guard this area. When the new shoots come up, I want you to make sure that nothing damages them. If they're threatened by something that you can't handle, let me know, but otherwise drive the other creatures off. Kill them if you want to, but make sure the plants stay safe. Once more, I accompany the words with images and a sense of importance, since that seems to improve Spike's capacity to understand what I want. Then I consider something. You can go and eat and drink when you need to, but make sure you don't leave the plants for very long. It's hard to know if my followers definition of very long is the same as mine, but short of doing the guarding myself, I figure I don't have much choice but to trust him. And ultimately, growing the sum of a beans isn't a question of life and death, I'm sure I'll find other things to eat here, and besides, meat is readily available, even if boring after a short time. They would, however, be a good addition to my diet, 
full of fiber and lots of nutrients which meat doesn't tend to have, there's a reason why Nicholas included them in my ration pack. After the poor Cupid has taken up a guarding position, while still relaxing in the sun, I head back indoors to try and do something else about my food situation. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 38, Interdimensional Amazon The first thing I check is my experimental cooking arrangements. The chimney is looking pretty good, and seems to be directing the smoke out of my cave rather than into it, which is good. Not so good is the draft that the fire is creating by pulling air in from Calanthea's cave. I'll have to do something about that. Not now, though. Now I check the grid I've been baking just above the fire. It seems pretty sturdy so I use a couple of thick sticks to lift it so it's sitting on the little shelf-like protrusions just above the fire. Here goes. I lift the wok up and slowly, gently place it on top of the grid, ready to take it away if I have any hints that either the grid or wok are likely to crack. There are a couple of hair-raising moments when I'm convinced that at least one of them is about to crack or fall off the protruding ledges it's all balanced on, but in the end, everything goes well. Eventually, the wok, half full of water, sits on the makeshift grill I've created, everything whole. I sit back on my heels, unable, and unwilling, to prevent the grin from cracking my face in half. Perhaps this should pale in comparison to killing creatures that were trying to kill me, or hiking my way through more forest than I've ever seen in my life, but I don't care. I'm proud of what I've done here, especially considering that a few days ago I couldn't have even lit a fire without a lighter. I can still feel the grief that had bubbled up earlier pulling at me but with the successes of the present, its gravitational pull is lessened, and I can push it mostly to one side. Now for the next step. As the water slowly heats up, I add in the malachy leaves I've been saving up. They're far too salty as they are, but that's all to my benefit now. The dried out leaves float at first, but as they become more and more waterlogged, they drift down to the bottom moving only with the bubbles which have started to form at the bottom of the walk. I don't want to leave the setup in case something happens and I lose my precious resource, so I continue my home renovation. I start on another important task, dryers. In order to create a bow and arrows, I need sinew. Dried sinew. I've got plenty of the fresh stuff in my inventory, but I need it to be dry before I can pound it and separate out the different fibers. Not to mention that I'll need to dry other resources too. Actually, that reminds me to find some arrowwood sooner rather than later. And now, though, I actually need to set up a drying rack, or something like that. In fact, what I end up doing is creating a very, very rudimentary drying rack. I need to leave the cave for a bit, but don't want to risk Murphy having his way and something going wrong as soon as I leave the area, so pull the walk off the fire temporarily. Heading out of the cave, I go down to the tree line and find a tree that has lots of straight shoots growing out from the base like a willow or hazelnut tree. This tree clearly doesn't belong to either species, but it's what looks like it will suit my purposes. Choosing a few shoots around the width of my thumb, I hack at their bases with my knife until I'm holding five branches taller than I am. Hacking at the tops, I cut them down to my height. An axe would really make this task easier and I make a mental note to add making one to my to-do list. Snapping a few other thinner shoots, I pack all my harvested resources into my inventory which has increased to 30 spaces since leveling up, something I'm glad to note. Next, I search for something I can use as a binder. Settling on some sort of vine that's climbing up a tree like ivy or some sort of creeper, I gather a few strands and pop them in my inventory as well. Back in my cave, I stoke the fire again, adding more fuel. Next, I carefully place the still hot wok back on the fire and then pull my newly gathered materials out of my inventory. Thus prepared. I start creating my basic rack. It's really very simple, but despite that takes far more time than I would have expected. Mostly the delay is caused by it being more difficult than I thought to make the vine binder do what I want it to do, at the same time as keeping the branches in the right positions. By the time I finish, I've sworn enough to make a sailor blush and finish off by declaring that if the thing falls apart at the wrong moment, I'd rather hang the sinew outside and guard it from inquisitive creatures than put myself through this frustrating torture again. Then I think that I could have just used my bark fiber cord instead of a vine binder and I curse loudly enough to make Calanthea rumble in annoyance. Sighing in frustration, I rub my face with my hands in an effort to calm myself down. Just because the memory from the survival stone used tree shoots and vines doesn't mean I have to especially when I've already prepared something specifically for situations like this. Anyway, at least I have, I hope, 
a workable dryer. It's basically just two pyramids of three branches tied at the top in a very bottom heavy X shape, kept standing by the seventh branch connecting the two pyramids at their crossing points. Using the smaller branches, I've reinforced the lower parts of the pyramids with cross beams, incidentally also creating places where other branches could be fed between to create more rungs. For now I don't do that because of where I want to place my dryer, over the fireplace. Moving it into place so the pyramids stand either side of the chimney, perpendicular to the wall, and the cross beam is a good foot above the top of the chimney, I release it gingerly. The structure sways a little as it settles into place, but, despite my pessimistic predictions, it doesn't actually fall. One step done. Work when one is trying to survive in the wilderness seems endless. There's always something to do. In this case, it's preparing the sinew for drying. I don't feel like waiting around for ages for the liquid in it to evaporate, so I'm going to do as much as I can to speed up the process. The first step is my rack. Hanging it above the chimney should give it a warm, dry atmosphere to encourage quick evaporation of the remaining bodily fluids. Now I'm going to cut it into smaller pieces so that it loses water more quickly. Using my knife against a chopping board of a thick branch I picked up at some point, I slice along the grain of the different pieces of sinew, making slices that are about 1 cm thick, and then however long the piece of sinew is. Having gathered them from a variety of animals, there's an equally great variety in length. Still. Even the small pieces could be useful, for glue if nothing else. Using my newly made bark fiber cord, I attach the thin pieces of sinew to a long, reasonably straight branch, ready to be propped above the fire once the clay has dried sufficiently. That done, I check on my cooking. The water level in the wok has reduced, but I want to actually dry it all out completely. I debate over removing the malachy leaves, but leave them there for the time being. Once the water level has dropped by half, I'll take them out and then leave the salty water to crystallize. So, chimney, check. Fireplace, check. Cooking area, check. Some of the beans planted, check. Salt, in progress. Cord production, started. Sinew drying, in progress. I'm feeling pretty pleased with what I've managed to accomplish so far, and there's still a bit of time left in the day. Well, what are my next objectives? My current aims are to make my living situation more comfortable. Having created my fireplace actually ticks several boxes there. First of all, it's a cooking area, meaning I can now start having fresh, hot meals on a more regular basis, a definite plus in my book. It also warms up my room, meaning that I hopefully won't be waking up in the middle of the night anymore needing to pile on another coat because I'm cold. As a further benefit, it provides light in the dark, making navigating my alcove easier as well as potentially letting me read a book, something that I miss doing before bed. I'd like to improve my sleeping situation, wanting to sleep on something softer than barely cushioned stone, but anything that will properly address that will take too long. I could haul in some softish undergrowth like an equivalent of heather, but it will stop being soft fairly quickly especially once it's dried out, meaning I'd need to replace it fairly often. Plus, it's likely to be even lumpier than the cave floor which actually is pretty smooth. Ideally, I'd create a feather mattress. Feathers are certainly not in low supply. The problem with this is that I'd need something to hold all those fluffy feathers, and at present I have no material to use as a tick, or thread to sew it together, or needle. I huff. Life is surprisingly hard when you can't just head to the closest commercial center to buy everything. Even though I technically have all the resources around me that I need, there's a whole lot of labor that has to go into processing them. I mean, I'm grateful for the stones Nicholas gave me, but I'd probably have traded all of them in for the chance to access an interdimensional Amazon. So, my pile of assorted jackets and other clothes is still probably the best I can do for sleeping at this point. Honestly, that's probably all I need to do for home renovations for now. Sure, shelves would be nice so I can put stuff on them, but I'm fine living out of my suitcases. I love electricity, internet, and a portal to a good hotel room, but those seem a bit out of the realms of possibility right now, even for this strange world where magic is real. No, probably the best next step is to create some weapons and tools. My knife and mace have done a sterling job up to now but I could do with both a bow and spear. A bow will be great for attacking and ambushing enemies at range, and a spear will help me keep more distance from my opponents. My mace is good for crushing and is perfect for dealing with multiple attackers at once, but it's not really good for keeping my enemies at bay. Hopefully with the addition of a bow and spear to my mace and knife, I'll be well equipped for whatever I have to face. Actually, 
while thinking about it, I might as well try to upgrade my mace a bit, or replace it if that would be better. At the moment it's just a branch with a knot that makes it heavier one end than the other. If I could attach a stone to the end with the knot, that would make it significantly more damaging, especially if the stone is sharp in some way. In order to do these tasks, though, I'm going to need to create some tools first. An axe, for certain, because I will need to cut wood for both my spear and bow, not to mention the arrows I'll also need to make. Besides, it'll probably be useful for creating firewood now that I actually have a fireplace. I'd better also create a shard that's capable of carving to a certain extent. I'll need something a bit more delicate than my knife for some of the finer shaping tasks and creating a bow and arrows. Then, of course, there will be all the arrowheads. I foresee a lot of flint napping in my future. So far I haven't spotted any trees which would be suitable for creating pitch, so I'll have to try and work around that, and if I spot any evergreens or sticky resin, I'll collect some then. Alternatively, I can create glue out of the remains of the sinew I was chopping up this morning. Though, I don't really want to boil that in my wok, so maybe creating a clay pot would actually be a good idea. Yes, creating perhaps three clay pots of different sizes for different purposes sounds sensible. Decided, I get up and stretch then prepare myself to settle into a long session of pottery making. The sooner I get started, the better, the clay pots will need to dry before they're fired, so I'll be able to do other things during that time. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 39, Bribe Creating my clay pots definitely ends up taking longer than I'd expected. Just forming the first one takes the rest of the time until dusk. Gauging my tiredness level. I decide to continue by the light of my fire. The downside there is that in order to see what I'm doing, I have to work quite close to the fire, which means my clay dries out more quickly than when I was working further away. That, in turn, means that although I managed to finish the second pot, I've run out of water in my canteen. It will be so much better when I have a bigger container in which to hold water. The canteen isn't bad as the water supply for a single person for most of a day, but it really doesn't last much more than that. Without cooking water, and with my only current cooking container, my wok, being used to crystallize salt, I'm back to eating pre-cooked bird meat, despite technically having my cooking area sorted. I'm you also pretty thirsty since I didn't think about the fact that using my only cooking pot for salt production would mean no water to drink. In the end, I might have to take a chance and drink the water straight. But that will have to be tomorrow, I'd rather eat a boring meal and be thirsty than go to the river in the dark, who knows what sort of beasties are there lurking. Still. I do have the luxury of reading a bit of one of my favorite books before falling asleep. At least, I read a few pages before deciding that I'm far too knackered even to read. As I fall asleep, I muse that this has been the first day so far since I arrived that I haven't been attacked at least once. It makes a change to not have that roller coaster of adrenaline rushes, but I can't quite decide whether I'm more relieved or disappointed. I fall asleep before I come to a conclusion. By the time I wake, Sun is streaming into my cave through the small gap left between the top of my chimney and the top of the hole in the wall. Marcus Wolf, I hear Calanthea say, her tone a little impatient. I have a feeling before she speaks about what she's about to say. I must go to hunt. Are you awake enough for me to leave Lathany in your care? Yup, called it. Shaking the grogginess out of my head, I respond as soon as I've got my thoughts in order. Yeah, let me just get some water first, okay? I'll be quick. She lets out an impatient grumble, but doesn't refuse my request. Hurrying out, I go down to the river as quickly as I can while still keeping an eye out for any ambush predators waiting for unwary prey. The water tastes good as I drink some at the riverside, also snatching some pondweed while I'm there. Hopefully I've avoided picking up something nasty again. Walking back with haste, I muse at the fact that I rarely see many creatures around this spot probably something to do with them recognizing the presence of a much more powerful predator not far away. Still, better safe than sorry, and I still keep a wary eye on the trees around and above me in case there's a creature that's missed out on the memo. Fortunately, I make it back without incident. Once more Calanthea disappears off into the distance and I'm left with an energetic and rambunctious Nanda cub. We play for a while the makeshift cat toy making a reappearance once I have a chance to recreate it. She seems more adventurous this time, though, I have to keep distracting her from going off the edge of the hill to explore. At one point, I teach her how to play fetch, throwing a stick for her to find and pounce on. Well, I say fetch, 
but it's more pounce on and not to death. Natural I guess considering she's a lot more feline than canine in nature. Still, she enjoys it. She enjoys it even more when I shift the branch through the grass and she tries to pounce on its scent. By the time she's tired and lies down for a nap, I feel like doing the same but decide that I'd be better off actually getting something done. My salt has crystallized overnight, the heat from the fire burning itself down to embers enough to evaporate the rest of the water. I'd taken the malachy leaves out long before going to bed, so what remains is a load of green-tinged crystals. Jackpot. Searching around for something to put my greenish treasure into, I suddenly hit on an idea. Digging in my suitcase, I find a small Tupperware box in which I had stored dice. Why did I bring my dice with me? I have no idea, but I'm grateful for it now. Ditching the dice out of the box, I clean the bark off a stick and use it to lever the crystals off the wok. I could use my knife, but I don't really want to risk damaging my wok's surface. It works, though I might have a few splinters of wood in with my salt. Oh well, I'll try and avoid them when taking a pinch. Now. Time to make something more interesting than just cooked bird meat. Covering the base of my wok with water, I dump in some uncooked bird meat and the leaves from the pond we died grabbed earlier. I've been continuing to test the weed and, by this point, I'm pretty sure that it's safe. Sure, I haven't actually tested it cooked yet, but I doubt that will be a problem. Covering the wok with its lid, I let it cook while continuing to make some more bark fiber cord. I haven't seen Spike since first thing this morning. I sent him off to go and get some food and to come back when he's finished like yesterday. By the time Lathany wakes, I've finished cooking my stew and have started grilling some more bird meat since my stocks are running a little low. I cut up some pieces of meat and lay them on my grid, watching them sizzle in the heat of the fire. The sounds of fat dropping into the flames punctures the background noises of birds and the light breeze, but it's a soothing, homey kind of sound. I only realize the little Nunda cub is awake because... Turning away from the fire to cut up some more meat in preparation for when what's on the grill is ready, I notice a small movement. Whipping quickly around, I'm fortunately fast enough to knock her paw away from the fire where she's millimeters away from getting burned. No, Lathany, I say sternly. It's hot. You'll hurt yourself, and then your mama will hurt me. The mini Nunda gives me a forlorn look as if asking why I'm being so cruel as to deny her sticking her paw in those beautifully dancing flames. She reaches for the fire again, but I make a chiding noise which makes her hesitate. Looking at me again, she continues moving ever so slowly. Lathany, I warn her. She pauses once more, then as I don't stop looking at her, she finally looks away and settles back on her haunches. I turn back to my mate but keep an eye on the cub in my peripheral vision. She creeps back towards the fire, staring into it and licking her chops. That makes me consider, what if she wasn't being attracted to the fire but by the cooking meat? Hey, I say to her gently, reaching in with the two branches I'm using as tongs and snaring one of the pieces which I reckon is almost done. And even if it's not completely ready, Lathany's supposed to eat meat raw so I hardly think that it being mostly cooked will cause any issue. I do blow on it until it's cool enough for me to hold with bare fingers as I don't want to be responsible for her burning her tongue, though that would be a good lesson for hot. Offering the cool piece of meat to the baby leopard, I'm surprised when she doesn't suddenly die for it. Instead, she looks at me almost questioningly. Sure, you can eat this, I tell her. Not sure if it's necessary but figuring it won't do any harm. She then moves forward with a bounce and takes the meat surprisingly gently from my fingers. Chewing it at the side of her mouth, she looks as pensive as a large feline can, her head cocked on one side. Then, seemingly deciding that she likes it, she gulps the last bits down and pokes her paw towards the fire again, not, I notice, trying to actually touch the fire but making a rather clear sign of what she wants. Smart cat. Then again, maybe I'm underestimating her intelligence, her mom's perfectly capable of communicating telepathically, after all. Though Lathany can't send thoughts to my mind, perhaps she can still pick up at least some of the thoughts I'm sending. Which then begs the question of why she doesn't do what I want her to do more than half the time. Stupid question, she's a cat. Or something vaguely related. I think, stands to reason she'd only follow my instructions if she wants to. Though, it's like a light bulb pings above my head as I get an idea. What if I use this cooked meat to get her to stay away from the edge of the hill? Something in it for her, something in it for me. Let me finish cooking this lot and then get the next set on the grill and I'll give you some more, I tell her, trying to focus on my thoughts the way I do with Spike. It seems to work. At least, 
she's not trying to poke the fire anymore, but is sitting there patiently. It turns out that using cooked meat as a bribe works better than I'd thought. We play outside, and every time she follows one of my instructions, I reward her with a small piece. I'm even more convinced that she actually understands most if not all of what I say but just chooses whether or not to follow as she doesn't seem to have any difficulty in earning her rewards. I don't want her deliberately doing things I don't want her to do just so she can get a piece of meat when she obeys me, so I try to give her the opportunity to earn a reward at other times too. It turns into a fun game that both of us enjoy. Fortunately, I'm able to keep up with putting more meat on the grill than gets consumed, so I do replenish my stocks a bit. Besides, I still have a fair amount of raw meat so trading a bit of cooked stuff for an easy way to stop Lathany wandering into danger is a good trade for me. I'm playing with Lathany, teaching her to come when I call when Calanthea returns home, her muzzle still stained red. I don't notice her at first, for a huge leopard-like creature, she is surprisingly stealthy. When I spot her, she's standing next to a large bush, still as a statue and watching what's going on with her golden eyes. Hi Calanthea. I say casually. Did you have a good hunt? She doesn't reply, not telepathically anyway. Instead, she snarls. For a moment, I think that she's spotted something dangerous and automatically look around as I reach for my knife. Nothing. Looking back at Calanthea, I feel a shiver of fright as she's used the distraction to close the distance between us. Now only a couple of meters away and still moving fast, I can see she's snarling at me. My hind brain kicking in, I back away quickly my knife unconsciously appearing in my hand as if by magic. Of course, my backing up speed isn't anywhere near a match for an angry Nunda, though why she's angry, I don't know. She covers the last distance between us with a little leap, her paw landing on my chest and pushing me over. The world blurs around me and the next thing I know, I'm lying on my back winded with her heavy dinner plate sized paw weighing down my chest. She's snarling in my face. Her bared fangs close enough to me that I can smell the rotten meat stench on her breath. Calanthea? I choke out with the little air I have left. What are you doing? My knife has been knocked out of my hand at some point in the last second, and I see it lying in the grass, just out of reach. What am I going to do? Book 1, Leap, Chapter 40, Bounds of the Vow. I warned you, Binder, she snarls in my head, her telepathic voice matching the audible sounds she's still making. What? I choke out completely confused. Warn me about what? What have I done wrong? I warned you not to try to bind my cub. My scrambled mind tries to make sense of her words. She's calling me binder, that's something related to my tamer class. Does she think I'm trying to dominate Lathany? No dot it suddenly makes more sense. Calanthea thinks I'm trying to tame her. And from a certain point of view, I suppose I can see why coming when called is something humans teach their dogs to do as one of the first things. But that wasn't my intention. I swear Calanthea, I wheeze out, trying to ignore the horrible smell of all the dead things she's been eating. If I don't want to join them, I need to be able to explain myself fast. I'm not trying to tame Lathany. Then why were you trying to command her obedience? It's not like that. I protest calming slightly. I might still have a large predator pressing down on my chest but at least she's letting me talk. Knowing that I haven't actually done what she's accusing me of gives me hope that I can get through to her. Look, can you move away a bit please? It's a bit hard to talk with you impeding my breathing. She eyes me for a moment. If you don't like my answer, is it going to make any difference whether you're foot away from me or right on top of me? I've got no chance against you, and we both know that. A pregnant pause elongates awkwardly. But finally she shifts back so she's not actually pressing down on my chest anymore. I cough, sitting upright and rubbing the sore spot. Talk, she commands me. Now I've got my breath back, I'm happy to oblige. I was cooking meat, she indicated she wanted some and then liked it when she tried it. I'd had some problems earlier in the day when she wanted to explore more than just the top of the hill and seemed reluctant to heed me when I told her it was unsafe. I figured that if she had a bit more motivation to follow my instructions, it would help. That's what I was doing with the meat. I swear it was only with the intentions of helping her keep safe, not to tame her or anything. I'm a bit breathless again by the end, my fear driving me to speak as quickly as I could. Calanthea looks at me silently for a long moment. Slowly, 
the continuous snarl dies down and her lip lowers to cover her teeth again. You mean to tell me that this was all for her safety, that you have no designs in chaining my cub to you? I shook my head. No intentions of using either dominate or tame on her, I promise. I just didn't want her to get ambushed by something in the forest because I hadn't been able to stop her from running off. Last time wasn't such an issue, but this time she has only just been listening to me. I didn't want to risk that next time she decides not to listen at all. She makes a thoughtful noise and finally relaxes, allowing me to do the same. My heart finally starting to slow down now it's clear she's not going to kill me. Actually, weren't those vows we took right at the beginning supposed to stop this sort of thing? Unless knocking me flat on my back doesn't count as an attack, or her believing that she was defending her cub was enough justification to respond within the bounds of the vow. I don't know. But for sure this experience has rattled me a bit. I apologize, Marcus Wolf. I, was hasty in my judgment of the situation. I had not realized that you were having difficulty preventing Lathany from putting herself at risk. I understand, I guess, I say. Though I thought the vows were supposed to be something we could rely on in these kinds of situations? I ask, deciding to voice my thoughts in case Calanthea can shed some light. She tosses her head in her shrug. Vows can be unpredictable when it comes to definitions of harm, and the conditioning that binders undertake prior to actually casting their chains wouldn't necessarily be detected. And by the time that the chain is cast, it is too late. Should you chain Lethany, even killing you wouldn't remove the scars on her soul. Scars? I ask, troubled by the implications. All bindings leave their mark. The chains of a binder must be released consensually or they leave a great wound on the soul. And if they're removed consensually, then the bindings do not trip away and take some soul with them. But that doesn't mean that they do not leave their mark. All connections once severed lead to some sense of loss. Huh, interesting. And I can kind of see it, relationships, whether they end well or badly, always lead to the sense of a vacuum once the person is no longer there. I quickly direct my thoughts away from that black hole. I've lost too many people one way or another to be comfortable pondering such topics. So, I start again hesitantly. Can I continue giving Lathany meat bits as a reward? As if speaking her name conjures her, the cup comes and rubs her head against her mother briefly before bouncing back over to me and pawing at me again, giving me pleading eyes. I raise my eyebrows at Calanthea, gesturing towards the demanding little Nanda as if to say case and point. Calanthea makes an amused huffing sound. A cute chirping noise emerges from her, the sound completely incongruous with such a large, deadly predator. Lathany immediately bounds back over to her mother and they rub against each other again. Calanthea starts washing her rigorously and Lathany just braces herself against the force of the licks. I watch, allowing the cuteness of the scene to help wash out the fright-induced chemicals rushing around around my system. It's true that this sudden attack has made me question whether I want to stay here, efforts made to make this place into a home aside. Ultimately, though, what other choice do I really have? If I leave here, I'm back to the plan of creating a shelter somewhere which is preferably not in some super predator's territory, and I'm not really any better off than when I arrived. No, I just need to remember that Calanthea is, at heart, a protective mother, and so if I ever seem like I might be a threat to her cub, she will end me, vow or no vow. I promise myself to be more careful and consider a bit more how my actions might look to her mother before doing anything with the baby Nanda. Released from my babysitting duties, I decide to head out, feeling like I need a bit of distance. Before going, I remove the meat that's pretty much cooked off the fire, popping it in my inventory, and then just make sure there's nothing around the area which is likely to catch light. I cover the lower part of the fireplace with the stone just in case but figure that the worst that's likely to happen now is that the fire may go out. That's sorted, I make sure that my knife and mace are easily available in case of attack, and then walk down the slope and into the forest. I've got enough flint gathered for now, and the place where I found it is marked on the map for later. No, right now I need to find some sort of handle for my axe to be. If I spot some wood that might be useful for a bow and arrows, I'll mark it on my map and come back later for it. Equally, if I spot any resinous trees, I'll mark those on my map, or really any other useful resources. It takes me a surprisingly long time to find something suitable. Most of the wood I find is either half rotten, too short, or too thin to be useful. Of course, I could cut something that would be more suited, but that would require me to actually have an axe first. It's starting to feel like a bit of a catch-22 situation, 
needing an axe to make an axe, when I find something that I think might just work. Lying on the ground is a branch that's fallen off the tree above me. The difference between this and previous trees is its size. This is a bit of a local giant, and its branch is just as much bigger in comparison to other fallen branches I've seen so far. More useful for me is the fact that the branch is broken, something heavy having stepped on it and snapped it through. Making a middle note to avoid those tracks if I ever see them while hunting. Something big enough to snap a solid branch bigger than my upper arm in diameter without even trying is not something I want to take on, I inspect the chunk of wood resulting from the break. The leftover chunk is still double my height, but I think I'll be able to cut it down to size, though I hope it won't dull my knife. On the upside, the grain changes at its base, where it had originally been connected to the tree. It's my hope that if I can create the hole from my axe blade just below the knot, this will stop the branch from splitting under pressure when I swing the axe. Trying to slip the branch into my inventory, I'm actually surprised when it fits. Convenient. Even better, I notice that a tree not far away from the giant seems to have resin dripping out of it. It doesn't look like an evergreen, but the fluid beating around an injury to its trunk is sticky and viscous. Looks like resin to me. Eyeing the mark and the tracks leading to the branch, I figure that this damage was caused by the same thing that snapped the branch. Definitely don't want to face that thing, whatever it is. I open my map and make a mark for later, closing it with a grin on my face. Feeling satisfied with my finds I decide to head back home on a meandering path, without any immediate objectives, I figure I can just explore a bit. Of course, that's when I get attacked. Again, something drops on me from above and I don't react quickly enough to avoid it. Feeling it on my head, large and spiky, I immediately shake my head frantically, the sensation bringing back a sense memory of having a tarantula on me. I'd been terrified for years after a friend's birthday party at the zoo where they'd given us a tarantula to hold. I hadn't wanted to do it, but the other boys in the party had mocked me for being a wimp and so I'd reluctantly agreed. More fool me. It would have been better to just be made fun of for a bit rather than being unable to be within a foot of even a small spider for years. And even now, I don't want to touch the things, though I can deal with sitting near one. As long as I keep my eyes on it and it doesn't make any threatening moves in my direction. The thing falls backwards off my head and I quickly try to put some space between it and me. My breath coming quickly already from panic, I throw myself into a twist and back away almost tripping stupidly over my own feet. It's only then that I get a good look at what the thing actually is. It turns out that spider wasn't such a bad guess. At least, not if I could consider this thing a spider in the same way as a mole rat is a cute little harmless mouse. In fact, it's more like some horror movie where the amalgamation of a spider, monkey, and snake. Essentially, it looks mostly chitinous and has six legs each of which ends with a clog pincer and is attached into a bulbous spider-like body. Behind the legs is a long prehensile tail that is currently curled up over its head but, unlike a tail of a scorpion, looks like it can actually twist in all directions, perhaps even curling around a tree branch. I'm pretty sure it's got a poison stinger, from the look of the spike attached to the end of the tail. On the front part of this monstrosity is a short, but still slightly flexible neck attached to a mouth like a snake's complete with two long, backwards-facing fangs. In short, a memory worthy of therapy. Unfortunately, since none is available, I'll just have to settle for killing it with prejudice and hoping that I won't have more nightmares. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 41, Nightmare Eyeing the nasty chimera warily. While backing up, I wonder how to kill it. I don't exactly want to get anywhere near its venomous bits, because you can't tell me that those fangs are just as likely to be venomous as the tail but my knife and mace are both close-range weapons. Then, once more, I remember that, a, my inventory still contains a slot full of flint nodules, more stones available on the floor as well, and, b, I also have that branch I picked up for my axe which might do as a spear at a pinch. Plus, the only real advantage in my favor is, once again, size. t, he creature is big for a spider but it's still only about as big as a large cat or small dog. The spider monkey snake thing lunges at me. It's quick, the six legs not just there for show. I don't think running away will be feasible, I think it's probably faster than I am. As a strike from its tail comes at me, I realize I need to get my head in the game. Throwing myself sideways to avoid the creature, I grab a stone in each hand as I push myself to my feet. I throw one of the stones, missing as it dodges agilely. It's almost on me again and I dodge backwards, 
throwing the other stone at almost point-blank range. It hits and the creature makes a horrible shrieking sound, but the thing is still tenacious enough to latch onto my leg with its fanged mouth. I shout in pain, the curved fangs digging right into me. At the same time, I'm convinced that I can feel its venom pumping into me, even though I probably actually can't. Fear isn't usually very logical. After my experience with the black blob and finding out that lay on hands isn't a catch-all for poison, I'm a little paranoid about getting hit with it. I catch its tail as it tries to strike me again, and, pulling my knife out, I stab it frantically. Its pincered legs scrabble against me, cutting into my vulnerable flesh, and turning my jeans into ribbons at the same time. I don't let go, and neither does it, not until it just suddenly goes limp, all life leaking from it with the eagerous substance that appears to be its blood. Very aware that whatever venom its fangs undoubtedly have is still probably pumping into me, dead or not, I quickly pull its head forwards and out, my stomach turning at the sensation of tugging and sliding. I dump the creature on the ground and sway on my feet. I don't feel so good. Quickly sitting down before I can fall down. I cast lay on hands, hoping and praying that it will work. The venom burns in my veins, I'm pretty sure I'm not imagining it this time, and I feel weak and sick. In fact, I end up dumping the contents of my stomach onto the ground next to my head as my body reacts to being poisoned. I break out in cold sweat and my throat goes dry. When my vision starts wavering, I become really worried, did I not catch it quickly enough? Is lay on hands, even at novice rank? not strong enough? Or is this poison another one that's somehow immune to my healing magic? I can't really do much more, though. I don't know what this venom is doing to me, so I can't use the more focused version of lay on hands to offer better healing. All I can do is just keep casting and hope I have enough mana in the tank to deal with the damage. It feels a bit touch and go for a while, but eventually, my surroundings fade back into full color, my body no longer needing to concentrate so much on the poison attacking it. I still feel sick and weak, but I've been on death's door often enough recently to know when I've pulled back from it. When I'm able to get to my feet and start walking slowly, I decide to just go home straight, no point chancing my arm. I'd planned to leave the corpse of the horror movie reject, Spawn Cake, Monspike, where I dropped it before but a few steps away, I reconsidered. What if I could use its venom on my arrows? I hesitate, but eventually turn back to put the thing in my inventory. It's worth a shot. Pun not intended. Heading back, I keep casting lay on hands as soon as I get enough for two in the tank, and slowly I start feeling better than death warmed over. I pick up the pace a bit and reach the cave as night is falling. After what happened earlier, I feel a bit awkward and wary walking past Calanthea. She probably realizes, no doubt I'm releasing fear pheromone that she can smell, never mind the fact that she's a telepath. Either way, she does me the favor of ignoring me, allowing me to sneak past without exchanging a word. My grilled bird meat tastes good especially when I sprinkle a few grains of salt on it, nothing like a life-death struggle to increase one's appetite. I suppose it's the realization that I'm still alive and my opponent isn't that adds a bit of spice to what has become very boring otherwise. I'd felt too sick after my encounter to feel the usual triumph, but satisfaction fills my belly, both physically and emotionally. Exhausted by the events of the day, I go to bed soon after eating and fall asleep quickly. I suppose that after the stresses of the day, it's not surprising that I have nightmares. Honestly, it's probably more surprising that I haven't had them earlier. My nights so far have mostly been blissfully empty of dreams that I remember. Anyway, tonight, though, it's a return to those good old nightmares I really don't miss. Fearful visions that leave me panting with a pounding heart and cold sweat all over my body. They're not all logical, mostly fragments of being attacked, being chased, teeth tearing into me. Claws ripping me apart. Calanthea has a role, but no more than any of the other monsters, some of them monstrosities I've come across in this world, others I've never seen while awake. My dad's there too. Sometimes he is with me, running away from the monsters. Sometimes he's pulled down and killed first. Sometimes he pushes me into them. I wonder what that says about my opinion of my father. A therapist would probably have a great time trying to analyze them. No. That's not right. A therapist would just drive me mad with asking. And how do you feel about that? Dot I've had enough therapy sessions in my life to know how it goes. But there's no therapy here. I'll just have to deal with my own demons. Fortunately, there's no alcohol either as I have a feeling I would have dived back in the bottle to get me through the night, if I'd had the chance. I used to love the dead of night, 
when all is quiet and still. Sometimes when I was young I'd wake up for some reason at some strange hour and wonder if witches were out flying on their broomsticks, the witching hour. I'd read several books where the hour between midnight and one was a time of magic, of creatures emerging which otherwise stayed hidden, or of normally ordinary kids being able to do extraordinary things. Then my mom had the accident and that magical time turned into a nightmare. Instead of being filled with magic and wonder, I started spending long hours in the middle of the night stuck in a matter of my own thoughts. Nasty, accusing voices would entangle me in a web like a fly struggling against a spider. My strategy of filling every moment of the day to push the voices away didn't work between midnight and dawn. Although therapy helped me regain a sense of peace with myself, the middle of the night never returned to the time of quiet, watchful, liminal space that it had been before my life first took a nosedive. At best, I managed to sleep through it. Right now, Though, I don't feel very sleepy after such disturbed sleep. Hit with a pang of longing, I pull my backpack out of my inventory and rummage in it, my sense of touch finally finding the slim device it's looking for. Turning my phone on, I'm dismayed to see the level of its battery. Despite having been off for basically the whole time I've been here, it's already below 40% in battery charge. I mean, it wasn't fully charged before I arrived in this world. But I wouldn't have thought it would lose battery charge less quickly. Perhaps there's something about the inventory which drains the battery. Either that or my battery's age is working against it. Biting my lip, I decide whether to turn it off again, or not. In the end, I decide to use it. The current power's not going to last the length of time I'm stuck here, for sure, and I highly doubt I'll be able to create the kind of stable electricity it would need to charge. Even if I found the right kind of metal and was able to make wires, I don't think a potato battery would cope with my phone's greedy consumption. I might as well use it while it still has battery left. For a long time, I flicked through the photos and videos held on my storage card. It's bittersweet, seeing pictures of my ex, my dad, Lucy's family who had almost become my family before she broke up with me and I couldn't bear to face them even various colleagues who I'd gone out to drinks with. I watch a video which I'd managed to take of my dad unawares, when he was watching his favorite comedy. I took it because it was one of the few times since his diagnosis that I'd seen him laugh until tears ran down his cheeks. My eyes blur as I replay the video again and again. It's only a few seconds of video before he caught me taking it and laughter was replaced by a frown, but it's a very precious few seconds. When my screen goes black, it feels like I've been punched in the gut. Have I drained the battery that fast? Maybe I should have turned on airplane mode, preserved its battery just a bit longer. Regret fills me, along with its common accomplice, guilt. If only I'd... No. No. I've worked too long and too hard on my mental health to allow myself to be pulled back in. I let it happen before, too much shit happening with no one around to help me keep my head above water, and look what happened. I got to the point of suicide, and then made a stupid decision to leave everything behind and come to this hellhole. I'm not guilty, I whisper severely to myself, trying to remind myself of the conclusions I came to after years of therapy. I didn't kill her. I didn't kill him. The accident wasn't my fault. The cancer wasn't my fault. I didn't do anything to cause either situation, and I did all I could to help them. I repeat the words over to myself like a mandra, feeling like they're hollow in the dead of night. But I have to believe them. I have to. I can't afford to lose my motivation, not here. I've rediscovered my zest for life, and I can't let the tide of depression pull me back down. Marcus Wolf, what ails you? The voice in my head makes me jump, but for all that, it's a relief. Calanthea's clear tones cut straight through the sticky sludge of my thoughts like a bell would cut through the mournful howl of wind. Sorry, did I disturb you? I reply after a moment, my voice scratchy and thick. I woke because of the waves of distress emanating from you. I don't believe we are under attack, are you ill? Not physically, I admit. Then, because it is the dead of night, and because the ball of tangled negative thoughts and feelings demands to be released, I continue. I just, I miss home. I miss my, I miss my family. The ball of emotions within me pulses once more and I swipe at my hot eyes. There's a long pause. Come, she commands. I hesitate, not wanting to face her, not wanting to leave my cocoon, just, not wanting to move. Come, she commands again after waiting for a few moments. Her tone is unmistakably authoritative. I can't resist it, especially not now with my willpower at such a low ebb. Crawling out of my cocoon of jacket, blankets, 
I head out of my alcove and stand awkwardly near the hole which is my entranceway. Closer, she commands, and I wordlessly obey. What else can I do? Sure, I can walk out of the cave. I doubt she'd follow me. Not with Lathany sleeping cuddled up to her side, visible to my eyes only because of a shaft of moonlight. But honestly, I don't want to be alone. I, really, don't want to be alone. As I get closer, she lifts one of her forelegs and hooks her paw around me. The paw by itself is the size of my torso, highlighting just how big she is. Gently, as if I'm a cub like Lathany, she pulls me in close to her, prodding and poking me. She guides my body into an arrangement where I'm snuggling up to her shoulder, held in the circle of her foreleg and against the side of her head. It's, surprisingly comfortable. Warm, for sure, and fluffy. Really fluffy. I mean, not as fluffy as a kitten, or even a cat. She clearly is an outdoors creature, but still far softer than I would have expected. It's also a bit of a change, from threatening to kill me earlier today to cuddling me now. But everything that has happened since I've arrived in this world, I think the fact that said giant leopard doesn't hold grudges is probably the best news I've had all week. Sleep, Marcus Wolf. She tells me. And I do. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 42, An Exercise in Frustration. Napping Flint is an exercise in frustration. I decide after the fifth time this morning the stone I'm trying to turn into an axe head splits in the wrong place and completely ruins my progress. On the positive side, I have a number of flint shards which will be useful for creating other tools and weapons later. On the other hand, I've made no progress towards my goal and it's already lunchtime. I didn't make any last night either, since I'd been so tired. On that note, it was odd to wake up half smothered in fur because I was being cuddled by an apex predator. Warm almost too much so, but weird. I'm grateful that Calanthea was there for me in the middle of the night, I don't know how much damage I would have ended up doing to myself otherwise, be it physical or mental. But the fact that she was there, that she cared enough to intervene. All I can say is that I woke in a much better frame of mind than I could have expected after the night I had. At least, I was in a decent mood until the vexation caused by this damn flint napping started getting to me. I decide to take a break before I start screaming. I don't know what's more frustrating, trying to mediate between a stubborn boss and a stubborn union leader, or this. Honestly, I'd vote for this. I might have felt like cursing at the stubborn assholes who clearly refuse to see reason, but I'd never actually done it. I, V, already used more curse words this morning than in the last month. Dot and yes. That includes the day of my arrival in this world. Making an axe is going to take forever at this rate. I decide to take some time to make, and some of my frustration out on making, the haft for my axe. Being far too long, it needs cutting down to size. Since I have no other tools at the moment, I have to use my knife which is far from ideal. It takes even more wrestling with and I almost chop off a finger a couple of times in the process, but at least I can see myself making progress unlike with the axe blade to be. After a period of time, I have something that roughly resembles a tool haft. It's thinner at the end where I will grip it, and I haven't changed much about the bowl like in since I can't really think about making the hole before I've created the axe blade. I sigh. Hey ho, let's go. I tell myself, though even my inner voice seems devoid of enthusiasm. I summon up my super boosted willpower which I still can't believe was a measly for when I started. I mean, I'd managed to get through school, and you and I, and keep on at my job for years, including awkward meetings where I had to tell someone they're fired. Or, in one memorable case, that they're going to be facing disciplinary measures for being caught having sex in a toilet during work hours, with one of their clients to whom they had been giving favorable rates. I shudder at the memory. If nothing else, trying to get my mind out of the past motivates me to continue with the devilish napping despite the memories in my head saying that I had supposedly created flint tools hundreds of times, my hands definitely disagree, and it takes all my focus to try to achieve my goal. When I finally finish my axe blade, I can't help but leap to my feet and cheer. I know this isn't the end of the job, heck, I'm going to have to make more axe blades in the future as this one chips and breaks over time. Still, it feels like a massive achievement and I decide to celebrate that with a good stretch. Another three or four hours later, it's heading on for late afternoon, so I've spent far more time on this task than I'd anticipated. Really, someone good at flint napping could probably knock this out in half an hour, an hour tops. Me? 
I've taken probably about 7 hours when I consider the time I was actively working it. My result isn't pretty, but it's a chunk of flint with a sharpish edge to it, so it'll do the job. I hope I've taken a couple more breaks to check the drying of my sinew, cook some more meat, and even make a small clay bowl when I really couldn't take any more of the damn flint napping. In short, it took a long time and my hands and arms are feeling pretty achy from all this activity I'm not used to. Plus my back from sitting on the ground bent over for elongated periods of time. Still, I feel proud of my work. I finally beat the dreaded flint napping devil and got something I can use. Sure, I went through more flint nodules than I'd like to think about but I could feel my movements starting to align more and more with my memories. Proof of that is when I check my messages and see that I've earned a point in dexterity which I don't even have to pay for with energy. I check my stats, feeling proud of what I've achieved so far. Name, Marcus Wolf. Race, Human. Class, Tamer. Level, 1. Energy to next level, 41%. Energy absorption rate, 11 U per hour. Energy towards debt, percent. Intelligence, 7. Mana. 70 70 wisdom 7 mana regeneration rate 175 u per hour willpower 15 plus 3 plus 20 percent health regeneration rate 18 u per hour constitution 8 health 80 80 strength 6 stamina 30 30 dexterity 6 stamina regeneration rate 60 u per hour class skills dominate beginner 2 tame beginner 1 fade beginner 2 stealth Beginner 2. Non-class skills. Lay on hands. Novice 3. Although it's only been a few days, perhaps more than a week, I've lost count. Honestly, I'm in a much better state than I was when I arrived. Then, my highest stat, intelligence, had been at 6. Now, that's almost my lowest stat value, being only one point above dexterity and strength. I have double the number of health points, something which is rather relieving and a significantly better health regeneration rate, mostly thanks to Calamvia's gift. Plus, I'm already more than a third towards my next level, thanks to my daily absorption. Okay, I got a few points from that weird crossbreed creature yesterday, but only a few, the bulk of my energy has been earned by just existing. It's good to know that I'm still making progress, especially when my attempts at making an axe blade have been so frustrating. On that point, I suppose I'd better get back to working. Getting up, I stretch to release cramping, tired muscles, and go back outside. Regarding my axe blade, I consider what to do next. I'm going to need to finish preparing the haft for certain and now I've completed my axe blade, I have an idea of the whole size I need to make. That said, it's almost guaranteed that I'm not going to be able to create a hole so perfectly sized for the blade that the sharpened rock slots in without difficulty and stays in place despite swinging it into trees. Normally using hide and pitch it would be the best idea in this situation, but I don't currently have either. Well, I do have some hide in my inventory, but it's untreated so it's likely to just rot. I'm definitely not going to delay my axe by as much time as it would take to treat the hide I have. In the end, I decide to sacrifice a part of an already torn shirt to wrap around the flint blade to help hold it in place. On another note, this world seriously has something against my wardrobe, I'm struggling to find clothes to wear that don't already have holes and blood stains on them. Actually, thinking about that, I ought to have a wash and repair day some point soon, which means making soap, and a needle, and finding something to use as thread. It's really never ending. I'm fortunate that at least this place is warm through most of the day, if I'd needed to wrap up against the cold, I'd be in a significantly worse position right now than I actually am. It would be good to have some pitch too, and I have actually got all the ingredients available. That's if we consider nowhere to find them is available. Maybe that's what I should do with the rest of today. Go back to that place where I found a tree with sticky sap on its trunk. Probably a good idea, though I hope I won't have a rematch with that spider thing, or one of its relatives, at least, since the original is most definitely dead. Hopefully the pitch, the cloth, plus the bark fiber cord I'm going to tie around it top bottom, and over the blade in a crisscross manner, means the napped flint stone will stay in place when I pound it into trees. I might as well plan to make soap at the same time since there is some crossover of ingredients needed. Man, it will be so good to have clean clothes, 
and to be clean myself since all I've done in terms of cleaning myself since my arrival has been dips in the river to wash off the blood stains. I feel grimy, like the dirt has actually ingrained itself in to my skin and won't shift for anything less than a harsh attack with soap. So, in terms of ingredients, I need resin, charred plant fiber, and animal fat for the pitch. For soap, I need ash and animal fat. For both I'm going to need containers. For the pitch I'll need a filtering bowl for the resin, a container in which to char the plant fiber. I'll probably use a bit of the bark fiber I'm twisting into cord, and somewhere to actually mix and keep the pitch. For the soap, I can either create a quick and dirty bar which just requires mixing ash with animal fat, or I can try and do something more properly. In the latter case, I would need a filtering container with a hole at the bottom to allow the lye solution through, something to gather the lye solution, something to boil the lye solution. Actually, thinking about it, the last two uses could be a single container. Then I also need somewhere to render the fat, and then a mold to form the soap bar. The mold should be pretty easy to make, that could just be made of wood. Actually, so could the filtering container, thinking about it, as it doesn't need to go in the fire. So maybe I'd only need two different containers that could go in the fire. In total then, I need at least seven different containers, four of which need to be pottery as they need to go in the fire. Or I could use my wok for one of them, but I'm hesitant to do that, I don't want to damage it or render it unable to be used as a cooking utensil. As it stands, I have two medium-sized pots and one bowl currently drying. So, I guess I only need something suitable for charring the fiber as the pots I've made so far won't really do the job. I'll also need to make another bowl for my own use, but perhaps that doesn't need to be now. I can just eat straight from the wok as I've been doing so far. Actually, maybe I don't need a bowl, I've got that shell from that Snulian I killed a while ago. It's been sitting in my alco for a while, unused despite its watertight nature. The main issue is its shape, because it's conical. It doesn't stand up very well. I would tried using it for water, and it does help when watering my beans, but if I could use it as a bowl, I'll just have to eat like the Vikings were reputed to drink, all at once without putting the container down. If I have soup left in the shell, I can just put it back in my inventory. Strangely enough, it doesn't seem to spill there. I'll still need to make more pottery and maybe it would be a good idea to fire all my pottery at once. Then use the ashes from the fire to create the soap. But before I can fire the pots, they'll need to be dry which will take a few days. Plus, although I have the time right now to make the last pot I need for my project, I don't have the clay, having only intended when gathering it to make the fireplace, I'm lucky that it's stretched this far already. I'll need to head back to the clay pit near the river soon to collect some more clay. If I'm going to collect resin today, maybe I should plan a trip to the clay pit tomorrow morning, then spend part of tomorrow to make the last pot, actually, since I'll be firing several at the same time. I might as well make several pots since there's no guarantee that they will all fire without cracking. I decide to take Spike with me since his horn will be useful in speeding up my collection. Besides, the some of the beans haven't yet sprouted so there's nothing for him to actually guard at the moment. Then, while I wait for the pots to be ready, I might as well prepare as much as I can for my future bow and arrows, i.e. creating my bowstring once my sinew is dry enough and napping flint heads. I grimace at the thought. Still. That's tomorrow and the days after tomorrow. Right now I need to go and collect resin before the sun starts seriously heading for the horizon. I briefly consider switching up my tasks and fetching the clay tonight as that's the more urgent task, but then dismiss the idea for one simple reason, time. The clay pit is further away from the hopefully resinous tree and there simply isn't enough time before dark for me to go there and back and collect enough clay for my needs. Resin it is. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 43 flailing master. I stalk carefully through the forest back towards the tree. The shadows are already lengthening, but mid-afternoon here means there's still plenty of time until night falls. I took over an hour to reach the cereal last time, but I wasn't exactly moving fast, instead meandering while looking for an appropriate branch to turn into an axe haft. Dot when I came back last time, I wasn't at my best having just been attacked. So, I figure I should only take half an hour or so to reach it at my current speed. Sure enough, by the time I reach the area that I recognize as being near the tree in question, it's only taken about that long according to the amount of energy I've absorbed, that's my way of telling the time, these days. Searching around the area a little, I feel glee as I see not just one resinous tree, nor two, 
but, four, dot they're all next to each other, perhaps three of them offspring, or sprouts, of the first, or perhaps all of them remnants of another, larger tree. There isn't enough size difference between them to indicate which might be the most likely possibility, though the fact that they are all similarly sized indicates that they were all planted at similar times. And then any thoughts musing about how and why trees are growing flee my mind, I'm suddenly far too occupied with the fact that my foot has suddenly sunk into the ground up to the knee. I shout in surprise and pain as the ground gives way underneath me, my right foot plunging into a pit. A pit, it soon becomes obvious, which is not natural. Chirping battle cries piercing the air, I'm bombarded before I know what's happening. What is with this area and getting attacked? I bemoan to myself. It takes me a few moments to gather my senses and start attacking with my knife and mace. Moments in which the battle does not go well for me. There are two sets of attackers, one set up in the trees, one set down below. The group up in the trees are ranged and the ones below are more melee. Covered in feathers, my assailants look surprisingly similar to the reconstructed images of feathered velociraptors I've seen. They have long toothed beaks which the ground troops soon start using to attack me and the ranged attackers us e to spit mud at me. Perhaps mud spitting doesn't seem particularly impressive. But, the speed at which they're succeeding in sending the attacks, is, enough to sting my skin. At first the mud doesn't make much difference, but as it builds up, I feel it weighing down my limbs and making me feel wearier than I should be. I try to shake it off, but it sticks on stubbornly. At the same time, the sharp beaks and claws of the ground velociraptors tear at my clothes and skin. Against someone half my size, they'd have already won, as it is, I'm not in a good state. Not at all. I flail around with my mace to try to keep the ground attackers at bay, but my stuck foot limits my mobility. Another downside is that it also brings my body and vulnerable organs closer to the creatures which, for all their numbers and strategy, are only as tall as the average medium-sized dog. And unlike a dog, since they're bipedal, they can't reach up much further than that. Unlike the killer chickens I fought before, these guys are feathered, but have no wings. The feathers coat their forearms but don't extend backwards very far. In short, if I can get myself back to my normal height, I'll have a significant advantage over the ground velociraptors. As for the ranged ones, I can probably reach a few, and the rest I'll just have to throw rocks at, once the ground troops are dealt with. Annoying as the mud is, it's not immediately life-threatening, the sharp-toothed beaks of the ground creatures potentially are, even if I don't bring my vulnerable torso into their range. They could still get in a lucky bite and open an artery in my legs. Deciding to concentrate on getting free of the hole, I do my best to ignore the bites and slashes of the creatures now surrounding me as I put my hands and good foot on the ground, using them as a stable base from which to free my other foot. It's painful to pull my foot back and I'm worried I've twisted my ankle. When it finally pops free, I wince at the sight of the cuts and bruises already blooming on my skin. The walls of the hole were not exactly smooth. A. L. Though they hadn't been deliberately made worse the way I probably would if I dug a pit trap, as I'm sure by now this was a trap. It. S. Still a hole in the ground. With plenty of roots and stones. Dot. My ankle. Isn't. Sprained, at least, and my quick lay on hands sends healing to start dealing with the injuries incurred both by the trap and by the undefended attacks that connected from the creatures surrounding me. My mobility regained. I grin savagely at the velociraptors, a knife in one hand and my mace in the other. Now who's the easy prey? I ask them rhetorically as I start swinging and swiping. I'll admit that it probably looks fairly ungainly from the outside. I'm a flailing master, but I don't care. For all their obvious intelligence and viciousness, like the killer chickens, these velociraptors aren't durable. One good hit with my mace is enough to take a velociraptor down. My knife isn't quite as effective as it actually has to hit the right spot to work, but once I get a rhythm going of stunning a raptor and then stabbing it, I find that the attackers almost melt away. Once more, it almost seems like a replay of the killer chicken fight, only this one has the added complication of ranged attackers which, while only annoying, do mean that I have to spend a lot more energy on maintaining my mobility than I'd prefer. Just like the chickens, these Velociraptor lookalikes are pack fighters, using surprisingly intelligent ambush and hit and run tactics to take down prey. If I hadn't been human, I'd probably have gone down a long time ago. But I am human which means that not only do I have weapons which multiply my damage dealing capacity, but I also have healing magic. Consequently, instead of a quickly over blitz attack, 
the raptors are suddenly having to deal with a battle of attrition. And, like with the killer chickens before them, these creatures are not so good with elongated battles. By the time I've cut my ground attackers down from probably around 10 to 3, they decide they've had enough of this and turn to retreat. Not having any of that, I swing my mace and knock one of them hard enough that I hear the crunch of its fragile rib cage breaking. Then, going after one of the two remaining, I'm suddenly hit by an absolute deluge of mud. It's like the creatures in the trees above have doubled their assault. All I can do is hunker down and try to protect my head from the sticky, heavy mud. Then, as abruptly as it started, the deluge peters out, and then stops completely. Wiping some of the mud off and smearing it onto the ground, collecting a good number of dead leaves and twigs at the same time, I look up at the ranged squad. They're tired, panting like that last attack was a final all-in move. Not giving me a second glance, they're also trying to flee, moving along the branches in which they're sitting in something only slightly faster than a shuffle, jumping from branch to branch. Anger boils within me. They think they can pour mud on me and then just leave. Question mark not likely. Grabbing stones from my inventory. I start throwing them. My increased dexterity shows as I actually manage to hit my targets almost as much as I miss. I couldn't have done that before. Getting attacked sends the ranged raptors into a bit of a panic and they increase the speed at which they're running away. Clearly they weren't expecting that, and why would they? I haven't shown any ranged abilities up until now. A couple of raptors are knocked out of the trees and I rush after them to swing my mace and end their lives. I manage to get three more before they get too far away for me to justify chasing them. Grabbing the bodies and just dragging them, I return to near the tree where all this had started. Slumping to the ground, I take a few moments to recover. I'm not terribly injured as I've been keeping up with pumping healing magic through me at various intervals. As I sit there, my health regen plus continue lay on hands tops me up the rest of the way in just a few minutes. My stamina took more of a beating than my health, if I'm honest. I should probably consider putting more points into strength, endurance, in the next level up or start training for a marathon. Still, I'm covered in mud, which does not make me happy. Add that to the fact that another pair of trousers has been rendered to shreds and I grumble out loud as I start digging out the hearts of the velociraptors, tossing the rest of their corpses into my inventory as I go. In total, I got 13 of the creatures, and probably about 10 or 12 got away. Hopefully they won't be back for revenge anytime soon. I build a quick fire and a rudimentary spit with two twigs with forks stuck tail first into the ground. Another twig serves as the spit itself and I shove the hearts onto it as a strange kind of kebab. While the meat cooks, I go to do what I'd actually come here to do, collect resin. Fortunately for my sanity, I hadn't misinterpreted what I'd seen and all four of these trees have sticky aromatic resin dried on their bark. The chunks will definitely need processing before I'll be able to use them for pitch, but I reckon it will all work out in the end. My harvesting over, I'm feeling a lot more peaceful by the time I sit down to munch the hearts. They're not well cooked, one side is rather overdone and the other only barely done since I struggled with getting the spit to turn over and stay there, but I don't care, they taste like victory. In that moment I realized something that disturbs me a bit, I'm starting to like this. Or, maybe like is the wrong word. And maybe this is too general. It's just, there's something about this world which is real. In a way my previous existence wasn't. I live on a knife's edge between survival and death. At any moment, it wouldn't take much for me to die of starvation, thirst, or injury. And somehow that makes the rest of life sweeter. The food I eat is bland in comparison to the sweetened, salted, and fried food of my past, but it has a taste which all of those lacked the taste of freedom. In this new world, there's no boss to tell me what to do. No alarm clock to wake me up in the mornings. No landlord demanding rent. No bills demanding payment. Nothing to stop me from just walking into the forest and going wherever I please. Instead, I have to make my own decisions, and the reward for making the right one is living one day longer, or having something that adds a little bit of luxury to my life, like my fireplace. I have to build things with my own hands, put my blood, sweat, and tears into every labor. And in doing so, I've regained a sense of value for everything. It's freeing, but not in an irresponsible way. I can't afford to be irresponsible, but in being given complete responsibility over my own existence, I've gained a sense of satisfaction deeper than any I'd felt before. Given the choice of going back to my previous life, it's hard to know what I would choose. Last night proved to me that I miss home, 
but I'm not sure home actually exists for me anywhere. The old adage says, home is where the heart is, and my heart is gone. Earth holds nothing but the bitter ash of regret and destruction in many ways, but I can't say for certain that I would reject the siren pull of the safety, comforts and ease of modern life. On the other hand this place has danger around every corner, but it feels, fresh in a way, like the only history here is what I've brought with me. Walking back home, I paused to just jump in the river to wash off the mud before heading up the slope. Deciding to butcher the carcasses later, I change into dry clothes, spreading my wet ones out near the smoldering fire in my fireplace. Then, slumping down onto my bed, I check out my energy gain. A good 44% increase, nice. When I'm done with munching on my bird meat and drinking a bit of my soup, I decide not to move instead making myself more comfortable on my jacket nest and pulling out a book from my orange suitcase. I could, and probably should, continue with making bark fiber cordage, or begin to whittle my soap mold with my knife and a chunk of wood, but I don't. After the fight earlier, I feel like having an evening off tonight. I'm going to read a bit by the light of my fire until I become too sleepy. Just like I always used to back before classes and life-death encounters were a part of my life. Hopefully I won't have any nightmares tonight. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 44, Wisdom. The next morning, I skipped testing the root spike found a few days ago. I've been taking advantage of the more relatively relaxed days to start the whole testing process, and so far with decent results, but considering I was attacked yesterday by the gang of velociraptors when I didn't even go that far from home. I don't want to risk being caught again today. It's never fun fighting on a mostly empty stomach. I've got more days of crafting ahead of me, so I'll have time to test the root later. I'll be trying to eat it next time, and have already cooked it in my wok, leaving it in my inventory until I'm ready for it. With the 10 more spaces I gained leveling up, I have a fair amount of space for storage these days. Just as well since my needs seem to be multiplying. Ultimately. I want to discover at least 5 edible vegetables. Pondweed seems to be fine, and hopefully this root will be able to stand in for potatoes, certainly, the state of the cooking water after I boiled it proved it's full of starch or something similar. Then I just need 3 more to give myself a chance of eating well rather than becoming malnourished. Something with vitamin C in is a must have since I don't want to be getting scurvy. Wait, is scurvy a problem for people with high constitutions? An interesting question. Constitution affects health points, but what does that mean? Is it just a defense against poison and injuries, leaving diseases and nutritional imbalances to wreak havoc? Surely not. As, although my status screen only shows constitution affecting health points, the system knowledge stone tells me that constitution actually improves the body's functioning. That means improving the efficiency of different organs, the durability of my bones, and the reactivity of nerves. Surely that means that it also improves the capabilities of the immune system? Nicholas World doesn't seem to have investigated this, judging by the lack of information. But isn't it logical to say that the immune system is just as likely to be improved as organs? And if higher constitution affects the efficiency of organs, doesn't that mean that it can tolerate lower than ideal levels of vitamins? Or higher? Again, not questions I have answers to, but I'll probably discover the conclusion sometime. Hopefully not by getting scurvy or the plague. Actually, on that side of things, I suppose that it's unlikely that any viruses carried by the creatures around here are likely contagious for me since I'm from another world entirely. One upside, I guess. And I didn't get sick or even have a stomach ache from drinking water straight from the stream without boiling it, though I am boiling it now just in case. That alone seems to me an indicator that I'm not likely to catch something from creatures around here. On that note, after filling my canteen with boiled water from my wok, I first take a good drink and then summon Spike. Heading off down the slope, I fill my walk at the river to collect water for boiling later. Then, walking quickly, but as quietly and inconspicuously as possible, we head back to the clay pit. For once, we manage to actually make a trip into the forest without being attacked. That's not to say we see no other signs of life. We see plenty. But any animals we cross paths with are more scared of us than we are of them and we don't end up in another fight. Perhaps it's my size, all the creatures we run across are smaller than me and, in the animal kingdom, size really does matter. Except for venomous creatures, there, poison is the great equalizer. The quiet journey gives me a bit of time to consider something. It's still concerning that I haven't turned any energy towards my debt yet and I'm leaning towards the idea that just turning energy in general doesn't count. First. 
because it seems ridiculous that enough energy to get me a good four fifths of the way towards level 2, despite having bought several stat points, wouldn't even register as 1%. Second, because my other experiences with the system seem to indicate that energy is a usable resource, rather than some ethereal, abstract number. I mean, the system stone was quite clear in indicating that we have to gain energy to level up not because some god or higher authority says we have to, but because the energy is genuinely required to change our bodies. Actually, I've even started wondering why a leveling system is even required except that it seems to also provide clear thresholds for when we can gain access to more skills. Though if we can gain skills in other ways. Anyway, back to the point. So we actually use the energy we gather, it's more like a purse of money than a cryptocurrency wallet. In the first case you can actually see and use the money directly, in this case to buy stat points either with leveling up or with additional effort, in the second, you can see numbers on the screen, but they seem to change unpredictably and have little bearing on what you can actually use them for. Except that you can pay for things with cryptocurrencies, maybe is not the best of examples. But that aside, if the energy is being used to make me stronger, it can't be used to propel me across universes which, according to Nicholas's letter, is what it's going to be used for. I decide to try something as an experiment. Seeing as so many other things seem to be based on thinking about them. The first time in my life I've actually been able to say that thinking has real results, I try concentrating on my desire for my energy gain to go into my energy debt rather than towards my next level. I concentrate hard enough that a furrow digs into the skin between my eyes and my eyes shut by themselves. I repeat the thought several times to try to increase the chance that something actually comes of my efforts. When I'm confident that the idea is as embedded as I can make it, I relax and open my eyes dodging abruptly to the side as I realize I'm about to collide with the tree. Maybe next time I should do this sort of thing standing still. Anyway, time will tell as to whether I've actually done anything or if I've just been thinking hard with nothing to show for it. Back at the riverbank close to home, I release Spike to his eating, guarding duties. He managed to find me a few more roots at my request during our walk, so at least I've got plenty of testing material sitting in my inventory. More immediately useful. I also have two slots full of river clay. Kneeling by the river, I process the clay, needing a much finer grain to make my pots than the natural stuff provides me with. I need it to be even finer than the clay that I used initially for my fireplace and find myself teasing out even quite small stones. It takes time, like everything in this supermarket free world. Honestly, I understand why people in the past had far fewer possessions and tended to take more care of them when you have to dedicate hours to replacing a pot or a plate instead of just popping down to the local shop, breaking it would be much more serious. By the time the sun is approaching its zenith, I've processed all the clay I collected, two inventory slots reduced down to barely half of one being filled, it just goes to show how much of the clay had been stone. Still, I should have enough clay to be getting on with. Deciding to actually start making the pottery at home. I take a good drink before filling my water canteen again. Heading up the slope again, my stomach growls loudly. Half grinning at the sound, I decide to pay attention to my bodily needs, so munch on some bird meat for lunch while sitting outside the cave in the sun. Then, my belly sated, if not full, I settle down for some pottery making in the shade. Deciding to start with my charring pot, I create the base first manipulating a piece of clay until it's flat with slightly curved up sides. Taking another piece of clay, I flatten it. Wetting my fingers, I draw them along the edge of the sides and then add my next piece of flattened clay, blending the joint until there's no sign of it. Continuing the process, I work around and up, around and up, until I have a small pot about the size of my two hands if I was holding something between them my fingertips just touching. I leave a small entrance for things to enter and leave, adding a little lip so that I'll be able to use it for liquids later. Checking that there are no signs of where I've joined the clay pieces together, I try to smooth the inside as far as I can reach through the hole. I can't reach well enough to smooth the interior with a river stone like I did with the previous pots so I hope it'll work well enough. Putting the pot aside with the others to dry slowly. I start making some more forms. Another few pots in case the ones I've made so far crack. A couple of plates, jugs, and bowls both large and small. After having a small brainwave during the day, I even finish up by creating a small stand for my snail shell bowl. It's nothing pretty, 
but hopefully it will solve the issue of me not being able to put it down until I'm finished. By the time I'm finished, the sun is close to the horizon again. It's been a long day, but fruitful. I hope the proof will be when I fire the pottery pieces. At least pottery making proved to be less frustrating than flint napping. In fact, I can see why some people would choose to do it as a hobby. Not for me, though, especially not now when there are so many other things to do. Still, it was coming to do, despite Lathany sneaking past her mother to come and investigate what I was doing. She almost gave me a heart attack when her curious prodding almost toppled three of my newly made pots. Deciding to use the rest of my light to work on another tool, I head back out of the cave to sit in the sunlight, bathing in its warmth after the coolness of the cave. I take a moment to just be. Down below at the foot of the hill, the sun only enters as fingers of light through the shifting canopy above, but here on the top it has free reign. I raise my face to the sky and feel the play of warmth across my skin. The breeze drifts across my skin, its caress almost a kiss. The symphony of the creatures of the forest surrounds me without being overwhelmingly loud, the sound of the evening significantly different from that of the morning. The smell brought on the breeze is that of trees, grass, loam and the faint hint of decay. The mix of pleasant and unpleasant is a good metaphor for nature in general. It's in a state of unusual serenity that I find myself. Pottery making, beyond simply calming, is almost meditation, requiring enough focus to prevent sinking into past or future thoughts and troubles, but at the same time is monotonous enough to lull my thoughts into peace. My mind feels clear and light, no fears for the future or worries about the past weighing it down. For once, I'm living in the moment and it feels, good. As I withdraw my axe half to be in the blade I worked on yesterday from my inventory, I feel a sense of nagging which I've come to associate with a notification waiting for me. Congratulations. You have come to understand a little more about wisdom and have earned a point. Would you like to apply this to your status? Why? N? I hesitate. I wasn't expecting this. Well, it seems like I have a little more idea about how to work on wisdom, it seems channeling my inner Buddhist monk. Or was it the Tibetan ones who refused to kill any creature, even an insect, believing them all to be brothers and sisters? Or am I mixing it up with the Native American brother-son, sister moon thing? I shrug, it's not as though I'll ever be able to find out, is it? Either way, clearly it was my feeling of connection with all the flora and fauna of this world which prompted this increase in my wisdom. Perhaps meditation will help. Not that I've ever done it, but I've picked up a few things by osmosis from my ex about it. Though she got everything from Vogue so. Anyway, all those thoughts are beside the point. Should I accept it or not? It's not really a hard question. I've increased my wisdom from where it started, but it still has a long way to go to even be considered normal for Nicholas World and the more points I can earn by myself, the more level up points I'll be able to assign freely. Thinking yes at the interface, I sense the point being applied. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 45 good times. In my state of serenity, I start wandering down the hill towards the stream. I look at my surroundings and notice that they are ever so slightly different from before. Dot the world around me has a myriad facets which I've never really paid attention to. I can see the links between different things more easily. I admire Ho. W the play of light over the earth not far from my feet is causing the insects to move in a certain pattern. I watch as some pellets left by a small animal probably last night I note absently, are, clearly, food for these same insects and are being swiftly taken apart and carried back, presumably to their nest. I have to focus to see these connections, and they take time to see and decipher, but it's a difference to the way I viewed the world before, if only a minuscule one. I check my status screen and yep, I'm down by 12% energy storage. It's changed from before when it used to take 15% to increase a stat but maybe that's because it takes more energy per percentage point rather than taking less energy to increase the stat itself. What I do notice is that the energy dead is, finally, showing movement, that area on my status screen now shows a gain of 1% towards my energy debt, 1%, in a day. And my energy store hasn't changed except to go down by 12%, now sitting at 73%. On the one hand, it's good news. If I dedicated all my energy to the debt, I'd be finished with it in less than a hundred days, just based on energy absorption. Assuming that creatures killed also count towards it, I'd be done in even less time. I'm fairly confident that the energy gained from kills also counts given that in the letter he left me, Nicholas seemed quite keen for me to go hunting. If I focused all my energy towards paying off the debt, 
Though, this little experiment has proven that I wouldn't make any steps towards improving myself. Sure, I could keep gaining stat points until my energy store runs out, and then afterwards I could gain even more if I worked hard enough, but I don't think that's the most efficient way of doing things. If working in the corporate world has taught me nothing else, it's that money makes money. Those who have money can invest it in places which offer a return on investment with little effort on their parts. Those without money have to leverage their own time and effort for gain, which limits their earning capacity. I'm not saying that this is the same story. I can't send energy out to earn more energy, but the higher level I am, the more powerful creatures I can kill, the more energy I can earn. Though actually, that raises the question, can I send energy out to earn more energy? through my bound? I mean, if I dominated or tamed five different creatures and sent them out to kill others, would I get any energy from that? Perhaps something to test later when I have more bound. More combat capable bound, that is. Another factor of my decision about earning energy for my passage to Nicholas's world is the hope that once I'm more powerful and durable, I'll be able to head into the more energy dense areas. That should mean that even my hourly energy absorption rate will go up. Sure. I'm presuming that the energy debt is a static quantity, rather than a percentage of my effort. I don't have any proof for that, won't, until I can earn enough energy to raise the energy accumulated towards my debt at a significantly faster rate than currently, but it makes logical sense to me. Some evidence I have that supports my thoughts is that the fact that the percentage cost of raising a stat point has dropped since leveling up. Conversely, the amount of energy required to increase the percentage of my energy store has risen relatively easily noticed when calculating how many percentage points I gain just from daily absorption compared to the past. Those two facts put together indicate to me that some things under this system require a static quantity of energy rather than a relative percentage. So, to summarize, although I could complete the energy debt in a hundred days as I am now, potentially in the future I could complete it in 50 days, or maybe even less. So, I'll need to take a balanced approach not completing it too soon when it will just put a break on my progress, but not leaving it too late either as that could be a terminal mistake. It does mean I need to pay a little more attention to how long has passed, maybe making marks on a piece of wood I keep in my inventory will be the best solution. Deciding to do my figuring out somewhere safer than just next to the river, I walk back up the hill, picking up a long stick as I spot one on my way. Settling next to the, the cave mouth again in the sun, I pull out my knife. Now, how many notches should I make? I ask myself. I'm pretty sure about two weeks has gone by. Let's see. The day I arrived and was attacked by the bird. The day after with the crocodile things. The day after and the rapture cat panic fest. I think the killer chickens was the next day. Oh yeah, that was when I was attacked by that snake millipede thing. Good times. I scratch my head for a moment. What happened next? Oh, of course. The wolves Ard and Calanthea. Or was that the same day as the chickens? I can't remember. Then I've looked after Lathany twice, and I think there were three days between the babysitting days. Oh, and the day I took off. And the day I leveled up. Plus this is the second day since I last looked after Lathany. I count up the days. So, 12 days? Maybe 13, maybe 12? Ah, I'll go with 14. I'd rather risk being a little early with my dip than a little late. Conclusions reached plans made, and my first efforts to record how long I've survived so far done, I decide to continue with my axe. Looking down at the two halves thoughtfully, I debate with myself on what to do next. With a blade now made, I know how big I need to make the hole. How to do it is a different question. Looking at the more prepared haft, I thoughtfully consider the quickest and most effective way of making a hole. I don't have a drill or a chisel. I could use one of the flint flakes from my napping as a chisel and a rock as a hammer but I don't think that would be the most effective, or not at first, anyway. Especially since the flint would be more likely to just chip and break. In the end, I decide to use fire. It's easy enough since I've already got one burning almost 24 7 in my fireplace. Actually, thinking about that, I ought to go and collect some dead branches to keep it going overnight. I'll do that after this. I probably should have done that while I was down by the river instead of being mesmerized by the connections of nature but too late now. Heading back into my cave, I put the tip of my knife in the fire. I don't stay holding it as the fire is hot enough to soon burn my hands, but after wrapping my right hand with a cloth, I take the knife out of the fire once it's glowing a bit. Pressing the hot metal into the middle of the space where I want to make the hole, 
I smile when I see a little smoke start to rise. The wood is dense enough that it doesn't catch light. That's fortunate as it's not my intention to send all my work up in smoke. Instead, the smoldering helps me to carve out wood more quickly and easily than otherwise. Once the knife cools down, I return it to the fire, only to repeat the technique. It's a slow process still, the burning helps, but isn't anywhere near as effective as even a crude stone drill, let alone a modern electric drill. Still, I keep at it, taking breaks every so often to stretch my limbs and make some more bark fiber cord, my current go-to for busy work. By the time the sun is almost touching the horizon, I'm making pretty good inroads, but I take a break to go and collect some firewood. I can continue doing this in my cave once darkness falls properly, after all. Putting thoughts into action, I quickly venture into the forest line to scour it for dead wood. Fortunately, being a forest, there's plenty of that around. It helps that it doesn't seem to have rained for a while as everything is very dry. I keep going until almost full dark follows. When something swoops past me, barely seen in the dusk that's more dark than twilight, I jump and decide to head back. Knowing all the other things that are around in this forest, I'd rather not chance my arm, or head, by wandering around in the domain of nocturnal creatures. My eyesight has improved a little with my constitution stat but not enough to make me an advert for eating carrots and definitely not enough to compete with a creature who makes the night their hunting time. Dot. Hurrying home, I keep a sharp eye, and ear, and every other sense, out for anything that might consider me a little snack to start the evening with. Getting home, I head into the alcove and prod the smoldering embers in the fireplace back into flame. Carefully feeding the fire with fuel and blowing to ensure it gets enough oxygen, I soon have a merry blaze flickering in the center of the clay chimney. With its light, I start sorting out the firewood I collected, piling the items into three different categories, light, medium, and heavy. That way, I should be able to easily lay my hands on whatever the fire needs to keep going. Of course, that all takes a fair amount of time and by the point that I'm finished, I don't really feel like continuing with the axe haft. Instead, after having a dinner of stew. I just lie back in my bed and think. If knowledge stones create new neural links and give access to new memories, would it help to go through those memories? Reinforce the links? Could that actually be a way of increasing intelligence? Surely yes in that creating and reinforcing neural links is generally an indication of intelligence, and nothing of this system so far indicates to me that it works against what scientists on earth already know quite the opposite. So maybe if I dedicate a bit of time to going through all the information I've learned from the knowledge stones, as well as perhaps things I learned at school and at work that might be relevant to my life now, I could increase my intelligence stat. It's worth a try, at least, and so I get to work. I fall asleep still going through memories, though my cataloging has shifted from just going through useful memories to playing a reel of the highlights in my history. It feels good and means I slip into an easy sleep full of pleasant, if nostalgic, dreams. Book 1, Leap, Chapter 46, This Big. As usual, I wake with the sun. Testing a small chunk of my potato replacement, I look forward to the time when I'm able to eat enough of it to actually make my stomach feel like there's something in it, rather than the emptiness which follows my breakfast with it now. I've got high hopes for this thing, if today goes well, I'll be trying a greater quantity tomorrow morning and then, hopefully, after that I'll be able to try adding it to my stew of bondweed and bird meat. Honestly, without any sort of seasoning apart from a very small amount of salt, it's not great. But if I can have a starchy tuber to turn the thin liquid into something more soup-like, it will improve the situation. Once I've found some basics to eat, I can try looking for things that will flavor my food a little, but honestly, it's not a priority at the moment. As I eat, I muse about the lack of waste I now produce. I used to fill a bin bag every week or so, even living on my own. And that's not even including the amount of recycling that I produced as well. Another bag every two weeks. Now. What I don't eat or use came from nature, so I just return it to nature. Bones and useless hide I drop in the forest to be stripped clean or eaten away by scavengers. Discarded flint shards are just left to lie where they fall, immediately becoming part of the forest floor. Even my fires don't produce much waste, and I'm collecting what they do produce to use for the various crafts that require ashes. Bits of food neither I nor Spike eat like the stems of the pondweed plants are currently building up in a hole I got Spike to dig for me. When it's half full, I'll cover it over and start another one, 
probably planting seeds or these tuber things in the first hole once it's had a bit of time to compost. The circle of life right there. It's a very different story from modern life where I was so disconnected from nature around me. It makes me think more deeply about humanity's place in the world. Right now I'm back to basics, all the way back from the cyber age to the stone age, with only a metal knife and some modern fabrics to prove that anything else ever existed. Once more, I can't help thinking that there's a part of me that's comfortable, content with my place here, for all the hard labor that it entails. Speaking of hard labor, time to get going again since I've finished my tuber. What to do? My clay is going to take a bit of time to dry, several days at least. Once it is dry, I'll need to fire it, so for that I'll need to make a pit and collect enough firewood to keep the fire burning for hours. That's going to take time, but not days. Well, the pit might. But I'm going to get Spike to help with that. As usual it's a bit of a catch-22 situation, it would be easier to collect firewood if I could chop chunks off bigger pieces that I find on the ground, but for that I need my axe, and I won't have my axe before I've made the pitch which requires the pots to be fired. I sigh in frustration. I'll just have to cope with smaller pieces of dead wood, but that means I'll need more of it. At the same time, I need to make my flint arrowheads at some point plus process the sinew for attaching the feathers to the arrows, not to mention to make the bowstring as well. Lots of things to do, what's the best order? In the end, I decide that I might as well start digging the pit as that's likely to take the longest time. Well no, the flint arrowheads are likely to take the longest, but I won't need them until after all the other things are done, so I've got time. Walking out of the cave, I greet Calanthea. The giant leopard reminds me that tomorrow is my babysitting day. I shrug and agree. It doesn't impact me hugely, I still need to dig my hole. Maybe Lathany will find the hole interesting enough that she won't be trying to explore down the hill. I make a mental note to spend some time roasting extra pieces of meat for her in case she needs a bit of bribery. Hopefully Calanthea won't overreact again now she knows I'm not trying to tame her cub. Spike? I call and then stop and listen. Nothing. He must be off foraging. Oh well, I'll just get started by myself then. Grabbing a stick out of my inventory which I set aside when I realized it might be good for something other than just firewood, I look at the ground around me thoughtfully. I don't want to put this pit anywhere it might pose a danger to a certain under cub. But at the same time, I don't want to go far from the cave as I'm going to have to keep a sharp eye on my rudimentary kiln when it's lit. In the end, I pick a spot not far from where my chimney opens onto the outside. Using my digging stick, I start breaking the ground. It's hard work, and sweaty especially when the sun rises higher and starts warming me up even further. It's also slow work, far slower than it would be with a shovel, let alone with some sort of mechanical digger which could probably do my job here in 10 minutes or less. I have to use the digging stick to break up the ground, and then my hands to scoop the loose dirt out of the hole. The first bit is the hardest as I have to break through the net like roots of the ground covering plants. With a spade it would be easier as I'd be able to cut them. Here, I have to basically just use the stick as leverage and my hands to do the rest. Needless to say, the skin on my hands takes a beating between the rocks, roots, and blisters from my hold on the stick. Actually, by the time I pause for lunch, I feel like a big ball of pain. My hands are the worst, of course, but my knees hurt from skin being pressed into rough ground, my neck is burned, and my back aches from being in the same position for a long time. I stretch with a moan. The change of position both a new pain and relief from pain. Checking my stats I can see that I've even lost a couple of points from my health bar. I'm curious about what my health regen is like so I don't actually cast a healing spell on myself as I go and get food. Munching on some meat hungrily in the blessed shade, I watch as my hands, washed clean of dirt, slowly repair themselves. I do end up casting lay on hands by the time I finish lunch because they're not healing fast enough by themselves for me to be able to pick up the stick again without wincing. Still, the fact that I was able to see a visible improvement in my injuries in such a short amount of time is impressive. Perhaps superhuman healing isn't so far off after all. I keep going as long as I can, eventually giving up somewhere after mid-afternoon from sheer exhaustion. I'm a lot more used to hard labor now than I was when I arrived, but it's only been a couple of weeks, after all, Rome wasn't built in a day. Still, I've made some progress and the speed of advancement only grew when Spike returned and helped me out. I've stripped the turf from a circular shaped area, about 2 meters in diameter, 
the size of my future pit. I've placed the sods of earth around the edge of the hole to delineate it a bit. I'm planning on doing the same with at least some of the soil and then forcing sticks into the pile to create something of a barrier to a certain cub. I watch the cub in question with an indulgent eye. Laffany's been very interested in what I've been doing all day. Currently she's scrabbling in the dirt, investigating the various bugs and worms which have been revealed by the removal of their ceiling. As I watch, she pokes at one bug with a curious paw. Unlike the other bugs which ran away as quickly as possible, often turning themselves over in their haste, this one just raises its mandibles and stands its ground. Um, Lathany, I wouldn't I start saying as she squares up to it eagerly. Poking at the creature again, she is surprised when this one bites back, its mandibles sinking into her fur and, probably, pricking her skin. She's more surprised than hurt, but panics, especially when she shakes her paw and the bug stays attached. Making cute little sounds of distress, she dances around flailing her paw back and forth. She honestly looks ridiculous. It's a big bug, sure. But she's bigger than any house cat, it just looks so small in comparison to her that it's unbelievable that this little thing should have such an impact on her. Still, I muse even as I rush forwards, it's probably as ridiculous as a full grown adult panicking over a bee or a wasp or a spider. I shudder at the thought, my own feelings of fear only deepening at the memory of that spider horror that attacked me a couple of days ago. Lathany, calm down, it's okay, I say as I move forwards. Hey! stop and I'll get it off you. She doesn't pay me any attention, still bouncing all over the place. Still, the situation resolves itself when the bug loosens its grip and goes flying away into the bushes thanks to Lathany's flailing. What is amiss? Calanthea's voice makes me jump. I see her peering out of the cave, weariness in her posture. Lathany makes a plaintive wail and runs towards her, cuddling into her leg as soon as she gets close enough. A bug bit Lathany. I tell her mother. She finally managed to shake it off just now. The cub sends me what can only be a betrayed look. Somehow, I know exactly why I earned that look. I swear, it was massive, this big, I add, holding my hands out to indicate something small dog sized. Lathany's gaze shifts into something more satisfied and she turns her head back into her mother's leg. I wink at Calanthea and shift so I now show her the real size of the creature. I see, Calanthea says sounding amused. Perhaps you should be more careful around bugs, my cub, she continues, obviously projecting to both of us, however that works with her weird mind-to-mind -mind communication. She and her cub withdraw back into the cave with a final glance around to, I guess, check there are no threats. I put my digging stick back into my inventory and then sit down in the sun for a little rest. I'll probably go and collect some firewood with the rest of my evening, but I need to recoup my energy a little. Book 1, Leap. Chapter 47, Time Looking up at the sky, I try to estimate the time. Having paid close attention to my energy gain by absorption over the last few days, I've concluded that there must be between 27 and 29 hours per day. Settling on 28 as the average, and also easily divisible, number, I decide on a clock face with 14 hours on it. Based on the idea that the zenith of the sun is at 14 o'clock p.m., and other for midnight is 14 o'clock am, I estimate that the sun usually rises around 5 or 6 in the morning, and sets between 9 and 10 in the evening. That makes a day length of between 17 and 19 hours, and a night of between 9 and 11 hours. Ha, no wonder I'm feeling well rested at night, but just as equally completely exhausted by the end of the day. Even if we assume it's the shorter end of the scale, and I'm not convinced it is, I'm active for 17 hours. And not just mentally active, but intensely physically active as well. Sure, I've worked long hours at work as well, but rarely more than 14 hours in a day. So 17 is a bit of a jump, especially since I'm not just sitting at a computer but often actually in a life or death situation. Just as equally, I tend to need about 7 hours a night to feel well rested so the fact that I'm getting at least none explains why I always wake up naturally with the sun despite being by nature more of a night owl than an early bird. Is this even as long as the days get here? I have to wonder if this is spring, summer, or autumn. Surely it's not winter, or indeed if there are seasons here at all. It's actually a more relevant question than it might first appear. If winter is coming, I need to prepare for it. Actually, I stand up and walk over to the cave mouth. Peering in, my eyes adapt slowly to the dim light. It's a quicker adaption than it used to be. Though, I guess I have my increased constitution to thank for that. Lathany is snuggled in to her mother, though she's moving rhythmically, 
probably drinking milk. Good, she is not asleep. Calanthea, I start softly. She shifts a little, but otherwise doesn't move. Yes, Marcus Wolf, she invites after a moment. I was wondering, are there seasons here? I mean, changing of day length, temperature, weather? Yes. Okay, that's informative. I take a moment to think through my next question. What are they like? Is the temperature change drastic? Does the weather change dramatically? Calanthea huffs slightly. Outside this valley, the changes are more obvious than inside it. Here, we have a protected climate where the main change is day length. However, even that does not change significantly, perhaps the day in the dark season is as short as the night in the bright time. The main change with the weather is that there is significantly more rain. I sense her distaste for the wet, but keep my amusement to myself. Along with her words come the sense of wet moving to dry and back again the river widening its banks and then narrowing again. The sky overhead moves between overcast and clear and the temperature varies between chilly enough to be grateful for fur in the mornings to warm enough that fur is only tolerable in the shade. Right, thank you, I reply, genuinely grateful for the information as well as the impressions sent along with it. Good to know that I don't need to worry about preparing to be buried under meters of snow, at least. Though, one more question. So which season are we in now? The bright or the dark? Or an in-between one? And how long does each season last? I lied. Two more questions. We are past the brightest point of the year, but not by long. Okay, so in that case, if I say that the summer solstice has a daylight period of 18 hours and a night period of 10 hours, does that mean that the winter solstice has a daylight period of 10 hours and a night period of 18 hours? If so, that's really not too bad. I'm used to London and it's less than 8 daylight hours at the darkest, so at least 10 is an improvement on that. As for the length of the seasons, Calanthea continues, it is hard to approximate in terms that your human mind will comprehend. Perhaps, she flicks her tail thoughtfully. If you consider the cycle to be as long as you are tall, the time since you have been here is the equivalent of your shortest finger. The brightest time and darkest time are equal distances apart and the temperature is coldest in the short time following the darkest night just as the warmest time is the period directly after the brightest day. The rain comes in the period surrounding the darkest night, perhaps the equivalent of your knee to your foot, though it is not constant, simply annoyingly frequent. The driest time directly precedes the start of the rain. It's an interesting way of describing time, but effective enough. I can't get an exact idea of how long a year is here. But if we approximate that 2 weeks is the equivalent of around 5 cm, and then divide my height of 177 cm by that, we get approximately 35 times 2 weeks. Hence, we can estimate the year length to be around 70 weeks. I suddenly have a thought, I'm supposed to survive in this world for a year. Which year? Are they talking about an Earth year of 365.25 days? Or a year on this planet of approximately 490 days? Actually even more than that in Earth's terms considering that the day length here is longer than on Earth. Or, even more panic-inducing, a year on Nicholas world which could be significantly longer, or significantly shorter? I absently thank Calanthea again for the information, returning outside to chew it over. A sense of fear rises in my chest at the thought of the answer being Nicholas world, and of me overestimating how much time I have to earn the energy. I check my status screen, noticing that I have some messages to investigate. I'll look at them later. No, nothing on my screen. No countdown, no indication of how long I have to earn the energy. Nothing. I close the screen and force myself to breathe. If I don't know the information, I can't make plans based on it. I'll just have to make plans based on what I do know and try to earn the energy for my debt as soon as possible without stymieing my progress. Wait, a thought suddenly strikes. The system stone. Maybe that would have the information I seek. I focus on the knowledge I absorbed from the stone, trying to trigger some sort of latent knowledge about Nicholas' world. To no avail, no new information comes up to smack me in the face. Still, I'm not completely disheartened. I worked out a theory about Earth based on circumstantial evidence in the memories I absorbed, it's possible I can do that again. It'll take longer than I'd like to spend while the sun is up to do that, though, so I put it off to ruminate in the back of my mind until this evening. In the meantime, I check out the messages I saw I've received. As expected, they're all about stat gains, though none of them are offering me the point for free, unfortunately. Congratulations. You have worked hard on your strength, 
endurance, and have earned a point. Would you like to apply this to your status? YN, congratulations. You have worked hard on your strength, power, and have earned a point. Would you like to apply this to your status? YN, congratulations. You have worked hard on your constitution and have earned a point. Would you like to apply this to your status? YN, two points in strength, I whistle in appreciation. Still, I suppose all of these make sense. If my theory of day length is right, I've probably spent about 8 hours in intense physical effort, the length of time improving my muscle endurance, and the repetitive actions themselves improving my muscle power. As for constitution, I suppose I have been putting my body through the mill today. A muscle twinges to remind me of exactly what I've asked of it and I wince. I pull up my status screen mourning the fact that my energy toward the next level which had been almost into the last fifth of the way to level 2, has dropped significantly. Still, since I don't have a skill to shoot for, the next one being available at level 5, I don't feel too bad. Yes, 6 more stats to assign would be good, but I've just gained 3 through hard work and an injection of energy so. End of block 1